Chapter 1 The dark sliver of a distant Starliner crept into view. A blue needle of ion efflux, pushing it across the immense sweep of a brilliant orange sun. Like a million such suns in the core region alone, this one lacked any world with a civilization or even a sapient species, and it was too inconsequential for any name except an obsolete imperial survey number. With so much emptiness, so many planets untouched, it seemed to Jaina Solo that there should have been no need for fighting, that there should have been room for all. But comfort was always easier to steal than to earn, peace easier to break than to keep, as her mother so often said. And so the Yuzhan Vong had invaded a galaxy that might have welcomed them with open arms. It was a mistake the aliens had yet to understand, but one day Jaina knew. One day the Jedi would teach them. R2-D2 chirped an inquiry from the droid station at the rear of the Jade Shadow's flight deck. Stay connected, R2. Jaina did not turn around. They still haven't sent the signal, and Mara needs her rest. The droid whistled a lengthy objection. Jaina glanced at the interface readout, then threw her hands into the air. Fine. If that's what she said, go wake her up. R2-D2 unplugged and whirred off toward the passenger cabin, leaving Jaina alone on the flight deck of the Jade Shadow. Even in a standby orbit, with all systems powered down and the ion drives resting cold and quiet, the vessel felt more like a suit of form-fitted battle armor than a seventy-ton starship. The flowform seat, drop-deck helm and full-view canopy, gave her the sense of floating in open space, while a new retinal tracker kept the heads-up status hollows centered just below her plane of vision. Communications and countermeasures could be controlled from an array of glide switches on the throttle. A similar set on the stick managed sensors, weapons, and shields. Even the life support system could be regulated by voice with an astromech unit plugged into the flight deck droid station. It was the perfect cockpit. And when the time came to have her own ship, Jaina intended to duplicate every detail, especially the seating arrangement, with the pilot alone down low in the front, and the navigator and co-pilot seated side by side behind her. She liked that part the best. Jaina's reverie was interrupted by a sudden sense of deep disquiet, an unexpected stirring in the force that soon built to a strange feeling of frenzy. She opened herself to it further and experienced an instant of terrible longings and ravenous hunger, not quite evil, but dark and feral, and brutal enough to make her gasp and withdraw from its touch. A cold sweat running down her brow, Janus lit the throttle comm switch to intercom, and called Mara to the flight deck. While she waited, she studied the sensors. There was nothing unexpected, but Jaina knew better than to place too much faith in the instruments. They had put the shadow into orbit around the orange sun's closest planet, a rubble-ringed magma ball little more than twenty million kilometers from its star. Without R2-D2 at his station making constant resolution adjustments, all she could see was electromagnetic blast. Catching a glimmer of movement in the canopy reflections, Jaina glanced at an activation reticle, in the front of the cockpit. A small section of plex alloy opaqued into a mirror, and she saw the willowy form of Mara Jade Skywalker slipping onto the flight deck. Mara's cascade of red-gold hair was a tangle of sleep snarls, but her complexion was no longer quite so ashen, nor her green eyes quite so sunken. Jaina stood and, feeling a little like a child caught with her hand under the candy dropper, turned to vacate the pilot's station. Mara waved her down. Sit. You're entitled. She dropped into the navigator's chair, sweetening the filter-scrubbed air with a hint of talc and stericline that seemed to cling to her, even with her new baby thousands of light-years away. She lifted her chin toward the distant starliner. That our two troublemakers? The transponder identifies it as the Nebula Chaser, Jaina said. R2-D2 plugged back into the droid station and confirmed the identity with a chirp. But there's been no rendezvous signal, and a moment ago I felt something, uh, 
strange in the force. Mara nodded. It's still there. But I don't think it's our passengers. It doesn't feel right. Nothing feels right about this, Jaina said. A thousand-meter Corellian cruiser with a customized Horsch Kessel sublight drive. The nebula chaser had already traversed half the face of the orange sun. It was now the size of Jaina's finger, with a blue efflux tail three times that long. They still haven't signaled. Maybe we should give them one more orbit, then duck behind the planet and blow ions. Mara shook her head. Luke's right about these two. They're getting people killed with their saber flashing. We'd better snag them while they need the ride. She pulled her crash webbing over her shoulders and clipped the buckle. But let's be ready. Power up. Me? Though Jaina had piloted the shadow before, her aunt had done all the flying on the way out. Perhaps because it had been Mara's first real chance to fly her beloved vessel since giving birth to Ben. Or perhaps because she had simply needed to keep her mind occupied on her first trip away from her new son. It's your ship. I want to sleep some more anyway. You won't believe what a luxury that is until you have a baby. Mara was silent for a moment, then added sternly, And that's not a suggestion. Check. Gina's laugh was a little wistful. At nineteen, she had certainly been on dates, but the war had kept her too busy to pursue any serious relationships. Even now, she was only on temporary leave from Rogue Squadron, until the anti-Jedi sentiment in the Senate faded. Like I'd have time? Jaina reached over to toggle the ion drives active, but stopped when R2-D2 whistled an alarm. The heads-up display hollow contorted through a maddening array of colors and shapes, then settled on the image of a tiny, tube-shaped craft swinging toward them well beneath the luminous haze of the sun's orange corona. That explains their silence, Mara said. Though the navigator's station lacked a heads-up hollow, the seat was surrounded by a complete set of conventional displays. Can we take it, R2? A message appeared on both displays, sternly informing Jaina and Mara that the representation was not to scale. A series of sensor readouts began to relate the craft's true size, velocity, and probable hull composition. Jaina whistled softly and glanced through the tinted canopy, where the new arrival's speckish silhouette was streaking up behind the nebula chaser. Looks like a frigate analog, Jaina said. What do you want to do? The only thing we can. There was a note of caution in Mara's voice that would have seemed foreign to her before Ben's arrival. Damp down all systems and wait. In Captain Pollock's private quarters aboard the Nebula Chaser, the Rar sisters stood shoulder to shoulder in front of the off-bridge vid console, their long headtails, Leku, writhing nervously as they watched a large piece of Yorick coral detach from the frigate and start toward the Nebula Chaser. Pocked and lumpy, the smaller craft looked more like a mined-out asteroid than a boarding skiff, but the sensor displays showed the heat signatures of at least a hundred warriors inside. There was also some other creature, larger and colder, but the sisters needed no sensor readings to know this. When they reached out with the Force, they could feel the same hungry presence that had touched them as the frigate appeared from behind the sun. Whatever the Yuzhan Vong were bringing across, it was attuned to their galaxy in a way its masters would never be. Alima isolated the creature's heat signature and asked the computer to find a match then turned to see Numa already at the captain's bunk, laying out their disguises. A pair of diaphanous dancing shifts, some face paint, and not much else. Having spent the last year leading a fierce resistance movement on the occupied world of New Plimpto, the sisters were certainly the object of the boarding party's search. Fortunately, their enemy would be searching for a single human woman, instead of two Twi'lek dancing girls. In their role as the resistance leader, they had taken the precaution of never appearing together and always in disguise. 
with their leku hidden beneath the cowl of a Jedi robe. By the time the sisters changed out of their jumpsuits and returned to the vid console, the Yuzhan Vong were disembarking in the docking bay. With bald, sloping brows and saggy eyes rimmed underneath by drooping blue membranes, they were half a head taller than a typical human, and much heavier. Their brutal faces had been reshaped into leathery masks of disjoined cartilage and torn flesh, and their powerful bodies were adorned with religious tattoos and ritual disfigurements. Most wore shells of living Vandun crab armor, and all carried the ubiquitous Yuzhan Vong amphistaff, a serpent that could change on command into a cudgel, razor-sharp polearm, or poison-fanged whip. The most hideous of the warriors, a stoop-shouldered brute with only dark cavities where there should have been a nose, pushed arrogantly past the guards surrounding Captain Pollux. You have Jedi aboard? No, Pollux lied smoothly. Is that why you stopped us? The warrior ignored the captain's question. You come from Talfalio? Or Sakoria? You can't believe I would tell you that, Pollux said. The last I heard, our whole galaxy was at war with you. The retort drew a grudging sneer of respect. We are only a picket ship, Captain, and you are carrying refugees. You have nothing to fear from us, provided you tell me now if you have Jedi among your passengers. We have none. Pollux did not look away when he answered, and his voice did not crack. Even civilian starship captains knew the Yuzhan Vong were blind to the Force. Feel free to search. The warrior cracked a smile. But I do, Captain. I do. He glanced toward his boarding skiff, and in his own language ordered, Duin Turvaxen. A seam appeared near the back of the craft and began to open, the York coral puckering outward like a set of pursed lips. A pair of yellow oval eyes appeared in the darkness, and Alima felt the hunger in the force grow more distinct. Then, when the aperture had opened a half-meter, an ebony streak shot from the portal and clattered to the deck in a ripple of darkness. Clouds of fire, Numa gasped. The creature, the Voxin, Alima guessed from what she had learned of the Yuzhan Vong language, began to pat around the deck on eight bandy legs. Though it stood no higher than a human waist, it was more than four meters long, with a flattish head and an undulating body covered in black scales. A line of coarse sensory bristles ran down its spine, and a white barb protruded from its flickering whip of a tail. The beast circled the captain and his weary guards only once, then went off toward the rear of the docking bay. In the vid screen, Pollux fixed his gaze on the Yuzhan Vong warrior. Why have you brought that... That thing on my ship. The warrior knocked Pollux to the deck with a backhand slap. You can't believe I would tell you that. He laughed. Though Pollux's guards did not appear in danger of attacking, the captain signaled them to stand down and returned to his feet with as much dignity as possible. Alima rotated an idle narrow beam antenna toward the dark planet where their rendezvous craft would be waiting then keyed in a secret Jedi comm channel and began to broadcast what they were seeing. The proximity of the orange sun would interfere with the signal, but signals could be enhanced, and it would be better than nothing if she and Numa failed to escape. The Voxen circled away from the shuttles and wandered the docking bay for a few minutes more, then exited into an adjoining passage. The sisters lost sight of it, until Alima found the right scanner, and by then it was padding down the main boulevard as though it had been riding slidewalks all its life. Along one side of the passage raced a company of Yuzhan Vong, their distrust of lifeless technology keeping them on the stationary band at the edge of the broad corridor. Eventually they gave up trying to keep pace and spread through the ship in small groups. Alima activated a surveillance lock on the Voxen 
and for the next hour she and Numa watched it roam the Nebula Chaser's primary activities deck, occasionally circling a petrified refugee or cocking its head at some eruption of machine noise. Finally, it leapt into a decorative water fountain and began to circle the statue of a Calamarian star urchin, its sensory bristles on end, and its yellow eyes fixed on the ceiling. With a drooping feeling, Alima turned to the hollow pad and called up a three-dimensional schematic of the nebula chaser. After a few adjustments, it grew clear that Captain Pollux's cabin was directly over the creature, ten levels above. Unpleasant, Numa said. The tips of her leku flicked sharply. It seems to have an idea of our location. That makes no sense. Alima reached out with the force and felt the same hungry stirring as before, but now much stronger and distinctly below. Unless it's using the force to track us. A shudder ran down Numa's leku, and she glared at Alima out of the corner of a slanted eye. You do have a way of springing to the most alarming explanation, sister. Alarming, but no less likely. Alima pointed to the vid screen where the Voxen was bounding down the corridor toward the nearest lift tube. Numa studied the image for a moment, then said, You seem to have a point. Perhaps we should shut down. They took a moment to meditate, then began to pull in on themselves, shutting down their presence in the force. When they could not even feel each other, Alima looked back to the vid screen. The Voxen had just reached the lift tube. It slapped the activation pad with a front claw, then pushed its foresection into the cylinder and allowed the repulsor current to pull its long body up into the shaft. She traced the lift to an officer's deck outlet less than a hundred meters away, perhaps twice that distance by the time the creature found its way through the corridor grid. No good, sister. It still senses us. She turned toward the satchel holding their jumpsuits and lightsabers. We can catch it as it steps out of the tube. Then what? Numa asked. The Scarheads will know Captain Pollux was lying to them. They'll know anyway when it comes scratching at his door. Sorry there was no time to change back into her jumpsuit. Alima pulled her lightsaber from the travel satchel and activated its silver blade. And I'd just as soon take a few Yuzhan Vong with us. No. Numa reached over and shut down Alima's lightsaber. I won't have that. Not after New Plimpto. Frustrated by the planet's stubborn resistance, the Yuzhan Vong had released a life-destroying plague that wiped the whole world clean. The sisters and a few thousand others had waited out the destruction inside a small fleet of intrasystem ore freighters, then sneaked into space after the enemy abandoned the dead world. They're Yuzhan Vong, sister, Alima said. Do you think they'll just forgive the captain's lie? Hardly. Numa returned to the console. We must make them think their creature is wrong. She called up a hologram that showed the Yuzhan Vong frigate floating half a kilometer beyond the Nebula Chaser's docking bay. At only two hundred meters, the enemy craft was a mere fraction of the Starliner's size, but the weapon nodules bristling along its flank left no doubt about its destructive capabilities. Alima saw at once what her sister was thinking. We'll pick our escape pod on the way. She returned her lightsaber to their travel satchel and tossed the bag to Numa, then grabbed a data pad from the captain's bunkside table and comlinked it to the off-bridge vid console. The sisters left the captain's suite and scurried toward the opposite end of the officer's deck. At the lift tube, Alima consulted the data pad and found the Voxen splashing through a damp deck basin two levels below. Its yellow eyes were fixed on the ceiling, tracing their path. It knows we're moving, Alima said. But its sense of distance is poor. Numa was ever the optimist. Where are we going? Alima called up a display of midship escape stations, then chose the one most directly opposite the Yuzhan Vong frigate. Engineering Deck, Bulkhead 42 
She performed a sectional security scan and found a team of Yuzhan Vong smashing a droid in gravitational control. We'll have to trick a squad of scarheads. Alternate? Alima checked the other escape stations, then shook her head. Nothing, unless we leave the chaser's sensor shadow. Out of the question. Numa's leku curled inward at the tips. We'll have to go bare. Bare? It was the term they had used on New Plimpto for caching their weapons and disguising themselves as slaves. You must be bright sick. I'm not leaving my lightsaber behind. You would risk the lives of everyone aboard. Numa pulled her lightsaber from their travel satchel and twisted the handle open, then plucked the Adagan focusing crystal from its mount and secured it over her navel with a few drops of flesh glue. Through her filmy shift, the golden jewel looked like a dancer's decoration. Do you think such selfishness worthy of the memory of Desharakor? Alima coiled her leku, then let them slap against her back. Though not exactly their master, Desharakor had certainly been the sister's deliverer. During one of the Jedi's rare visits to Ryloth, she had recognized the Rar sisters' innate force talents and rescued them from one of the darkest real dens in Kalaun, then arranged their transport to the Jedi Training Academy. Alima sighed and held out her hand. If we must... Numa placed Alima's lightsaber in her palm. Alima removed the Adagan crystal and secured the silver jewel over her own navel. They tossed their Jedi robes and the remains of their weapons into the disintegration chute then stepped into the lift, descended twenty levels to the engineering deck, and left their satchel on the floor halfway across the tube threshold. Though a far less obvious act of sabotage than smashing the actuation panel, it was just as effective. A collision over right circuit would hold the tube static until the safety hazard was removed. Time to look flighty, Alima said. She called up a banal emota drama on the data pad, and the sisters started toward Bulkhead 42. As they advanced down the corridor, they peered into each room they passed and called loudly for someone named Travit. When they reached inducer control, a Yuzhan Vong warrior stepped out to confront them. With only three long scars on each cheek and a single disfigured ear, he was clearly a warrior of low rank. The sisters pressed themselves against the corridor's far wall and, doing their best to look shocked and repulsed, started to ease past. He blocked their way with a lowered amphistaff. Where do you go? To see Travit. Numa made her voice sound frightened and tentative. He works in the coil room. The coil room? The Yuzhan Vong echoed. Alima shrugged and glanced back to her data pad, as though unable to resist the emotodrama. His workstation. A second Yuzhan Vong, with the crooked nose and scar-laced face of a minor officer, stepped into the corridor. He scrutinized the sisters briefly, and, seeing there was no place beneath their dancing shifts to hide a lightsaber or anything else, pointed back the way they had come. This ship is under seizure. Return to your berthings. Numa and Alima put on looks of fear and confusion, and remained where they were. Obey, the subordinate said. We can't, Alima said. They sealed off the staff deck, Numa said, and they closed our lounge. See? Alima called up a schematic of the ship and shoved the data pad at the officer. We don't have any place to go. Do not pollute me with your profane devices. The officer knocked the instrument from Olima's hand and smashed it beneath his heel, then motioned to someone inside the room. Bring the infidel machine shaper. A third Yuzhan Vong appeared in the doorway with a bruise-mottled human female. One eyelid had split open and covered the side of her face in coppery-smelling blood. You have one called Travit in your squad? 
Numa saw her sister catch the engineer's eye and give a barely perceptible nod, using the force to plant the suggestion that the woman knew Travit. Taking full advantage of the Yuzhan Vong's insensitivity to the force, Alima reached out and felt the presence of more than a hundred beings in the immediate area, most of them frightened, a few angry or in pain. She did not feel the invaders, of course. The Yuzhan Vong were as invisible to the force as it was to them. But she did feel the Voxen's hungry presence descending toward them. It had found another lift tube. After a moment of confusion, the engineer finally said, There's a Travit in engineering, but he's not on my crew. The officer considered the two sisters, no doubt trying to puzzle out the proper procedure for dealing with them. Alima decided to help him along by simply assuming the answer she wanted. A subtle means of enticement both she and her sister had put to good use in the real dens of Kalaun. Engineering is just down there, isn't it? At Bulkhead 42? That's right, the engineer said. Bulkhead 42. Alima stepped to her sister's side and eyed the amphistaff, blocking their way. The subordinate looked to his officer, who scowled and waved him down the corridor. See to it in return. Not waiting for the warrior to lead the way, the sisters slipped past his amphistaff and started down the corridor. The bulkheads appeared to be simple structural arches that spanned the passage every ten meters, but each one contained a thin, durasteel door that would descend automatically at the first sign of a pressure drop. The doors could also be triggered by voice, but the crew had wisely refrained from using the code to seal off the Yuzhan Vong search parties. As they scurried down the corridor, Alima reached out with the force again and felt the Voxen behind them, on the same level and coming fast. They were at Bulkhead 33, still ninety meters from the escape pod. I'm cold, sister. Alima rubbed her bare arms. Do you feel that chill? Quiet, their guard ordered. Their complaints are an insult to the gods. Alima's palm ached for her lightsaber. The faint clatter of claws on metal echoed down the corridor behind them. She looked over her shoulder and saw a distant ripple of darkness bounding down the sterile tunnel. What's that? She gasped, finding it difficult to pretend she did not know. What's it doing? Numa glanced back, then let out a convincing shriek and raced down the corridor, flailing her arms. Alima screamed and started after her, leaving their astonished guard to stomp after them, yelling for them to stop. As they passed Bulkhead 38, he cried out in astonishment, then yelled something angry in his own language as the Voxen bowled him off his feet. Alima did not even glance back. Close Bulkhead 38, she yelled. Authorization code Nebula Rubentine. The Bulkhead door clanged down behind her and sealed itself with a hiss and told deeply as the Voxen slammed into it. Alima knew that closing the door would draw attention from the Yuzhan Vong commander, but so would allowing the Voxen to catch them. She hoped that the thing had broken its neck, but there was no such luck. It was up and slamming itself into the Durastil almost instantly. They passed Bulkhead 42. Numa turned toward the outer wall and slapped her palm against the escape bay door pad. Attention, you have requested entrance to an escape pod launching bay. The computer spoke in the same cheery female voice it used to announce dinner seatings. Are you sure you wish to proceed? Yes, Numa said. If you proceed, an alarm will sound in the security. Override alarm. Code Pollux 816, Olima called. Confidential departure. Override accepted. As the launching bay's iris hatch swirled open, a soft pop sounded from bulkhead 38, and Alima knew the hermetic seal had been broken. Her first thought was that someone on the bridge was raising the door, but then she heard the muffled voice of the female engineer. The door rose and the voxen came scurrying down the corridor, sensory bristles on end, white tail whipping back and forth. The creature's yellow eyes were fixed on the floor and it was licking the air with a long, forked tongue. And Alima's hand ached more than ever for her lightsaber. Ready the escape pod, 
Numa ordered, pushing Alima into the launching bay's bluish light. Now, sister. Alima found herself looking into the nozzle of the escape pod's primitive rocket engine. It was barely a meter across, just large enough to start the hundred-person capsule toward the nearest habitable planet. In the corridor, Numa called, Close bulkhead 42. Authorization code Nebula Rubentine. The bulkhead emergency code is temporarily suspended. The computer returned in its sweet voice. Please report valid emergencies to any engineering supervisor. Override, Numa ordered, and disarm safety sensors. Code Pollux. As Numa finished the authorization code, Alima slipped past the rocket nozzle to the side of the pod. A sickening crunch sounded out in the corridor, but she could no longer see what was happening outside the bay. She pressed her palm to the escape pod's activation pad. The hatch slid open, revealing a starkly lit interior crammed with ten cramped rows of acceleration chairs. There was no cockpit or viewport, only a droid pilot stationed at the craft's single control panel. The droid pointed to the chair farthest from the door. Welcome to Escape Pod 421. Please take your seat and wait for the other passengers. There is no need to prepare for a cold launch. Alima would have preferred the speed of a hot launch, but the flare of rockets would be noticed on the bridge. And however faint their fast, dwindling hopes of escaping unnoticed, she still had to try. On my command, authorization code Pollux, the override authorization code has already been given, the droid said, turning to its duties. There is no need to repeat the override authorization code once the launching bay is entered. A wet, burping noise sounded from out in the corridor. Then Numa screamed. Alima stepped out of the escape pod and saw her sister staggering into the launching bay, arms raised to cover her face. She missed the center of the hatch and stumbled over the rim, then fell with her feet across the threshold. Her face and chest were covered in sizzling brown mucus, and her leku were thrashing against the durasteel floor. Alima did not experience Numa's pain, as she had heard sometimes happened between Force-sensitive siblings, but she did receive a heightened impression of her sister's thoughts. Numa was afraid of being blind, but more than that, she was frightened they would be unveiled as Jedi and cause the deaths of yet more innocents. And she was angry. Angry at her own carelessness in letting the creature surprise her. Sister! Alima sprang toward Numa and saw the voxen pinned beneath bulkhead 42 struggling to pull itself forward. Though its torso was pressed almost flat, she was astounded to see it moving at all. Bulkhead doors had safety sensors precisely because they closed with so much force. They had sensor overrides because it was sometimes necessary to crush anything beneath them to save the ship. As Alima neared her sister, the creature swung its broad snout in her direction and sprayed a jet of brown saliva through the hatchway. Prepared by the attack on her sister, she opened herself to the force and, with an almost unconscious wave of her fingertips, sent the stream washing back toward her attacker. The voxen, fast as a blaster bolt, closed its eyes and turned away before the mucus struck. Alima hardly cared. Numa's thoughts were growing disorganized and distant, her cries fading to groans. Alima grabbed her sister beneath the arms, smearing her own fingers in the burning mucus, and tried not to think about what the stuff was doing to Numa's face and eyes. Find your center, sister. She pulled Numa into the launching bay. Let the force flow into you. Numa fell completely quiet, her mind alarmingly calm, and then the calmness vanished, leaving in its place only a lingering peace and a vague sense of emptiness. Alima cried out and started to look down, then felt the mucus burning into the bones of her fingers and knew she did not have the courage. Alima carried her sister's body around to the escape pod hatch and glanced back toward the door, where the voxen, still trapped beneath the bulkhead, continued to watch. One side of its head was covered in the residue of its acid mucus, the scales beneath pocked and smoking as they continued to dissolve. The heads of several amphistaffs appeared in the narrow gap next to the creature's head and began, hopelessly, to pry. A part of Alima, the part not mourning her sister, the part that was still a Jedi Knight, 
realized her last faint hope of slipping away unnoticed had vanished. The Yuzhan Vong would hear the whir of the closing hatch and feel the thump of the pod separation. Still, she could do nothing but go on. Pollux's life was forfeit. Even if she surrendered, she knew the Yuzhan Vong better than to think the commander would forgive his lies. But it would take time to destroy a ship as large as the Nebula Chaser. Perhaps, if she launched quickly, the frigate would be forced to pursue the escape pod instead of attacking the Starliner. It was her best hope. Her only hope. She looked back toward the hatchway. Close launching bay. The Voxen's snout, all of the creature Alima could still see, turned toward her and opened half a meter. A deafening shriek filled her ears, then the fist of a powerful compression wave slammed her in the stomach. She suddenly felt dizzy and sick, and in the next second she was slumped against the escape pod, cradling her sister's dead body in her arms. She felt something warm trickling out of her ear, and touched it with a fleshless finger. When she lowered her hand, the tip of the bone was red with blood. Alima tried to rise, nearly ratched, then dropped back to her haunches, head spinning and stomach churning. Still holding Numa in her lap, she kicked her way through the escape pod door. Launch, Alima gasped. Launch right now. The pod hatch closed, the lights dimmed, and that was all. The capsule remained eerily silent and still. Puzzled, Alima dragged herself past a row of acceleration chairs and looked forward. The droid pilot was facing her, vocabulator flashing rapidly as he endeavored to explain proper launching procedure. Alima could not hear a word. Override, she yelled. Authorization code. The escape pod shot forward, hurling Alima into a Durasteel chair mounting. She had already given the authorization code. Jaina missed the launch. She was staring at the heads-up display, trying to bring the shadow's comma ray into perfect alignment with the nebula chaser's tight beam antenna. With the Starliner drifting dead only twenty million kilometers in front of an orange sun, the task would have been difficult under the best circumstances. With the presence of a Yuzhan Vong frigate limiting them to air thrusters, it was nearly impossible. After several minutes of trying, Jaina finally aligned the comm pip inside the targeting reticle and matched the shadow's rotation to the nebula chaser's progress across the face of the orange sun. How's that? R2-D2 scrolled a message down the heads up. No, I don't think I can, Jaina snapped. If you're getting anything at all, put it on. Half a dozen fuzzy two-dimensional vids appeared inside the canopy, neatly arrayed in a row across the plex alloy. Half the displays showed Yuzhan Vong warriors being Yuzhan Vong warriors, smashing droids, throwing electronics down disintegration tubes, beating helpless refugees. One screen showed some sort of eight-legged reptile. Maybe it was a reptile, pinned beneath a bulkhead door, its head badly acid-burned, and one eye burst from sudden decompression. Another display showed an empty escape pod bay, but it was the last screen that caught Jaina's interest. It showed the Nebula Chaser's bridge, where Captain Pollux and his entire flight crew stood surrounded by Yuzhan Vong warriors. Even had Jaina known Pollux personally, and the vid display been better than it was, she would not have recognized him. His face had been reduced to a misshapen lump. A Yuzhan Vong with no nose cut the captain's ear off his head. I asked the last time, where did you pick up the Jedi? Somehow, Pollux found the strength to laugh. What Jedi? The Yuzhan Vong chuckled. You are a funny man, Captain. He folded the dismembered ear into the captain's palm then turned to his subordinates. Kill the crew. Heart sinking, Jaina turned to Mara. Can we do anything? Mara kept her attention fixed on her Navic computer. Not for the crew. But look at this. She keyed a command, and a golden trajectory line appeared inside the canopy. It ran from the nebula chaser more or less across the shadow's bow 
then curved sharply toward the planet. An escape pod? Gina glanced back to the Skyliner and found the Yuzhan Vong frigate still sitting idle off the chaser's docking bay deck. They endangered thousands of refugees, then snuck away in an escape pod? Jedi did that? That's how it looks, doesn't it? Mara began to plot an interception course. Let's pick them up before they do any more damage. Chapter 2 A mere kilometer beyond the transperisteel wall, the antenna-strewn horizon plunged away into a bottomless abyss of tumbling asteroids and drifting stars. Tiny blue halos winked into existence and slowly swelled into the backlit rectangles of enormous cargo barges, returning with loads of durasteel from outlying fabrication plants. Crew transports laced the darkness with long tails of ions, racing from task to task on more than a hundred orbiting dry docks, and enormous welding droids traced ship skeletons in brilliant spark storms. On the way in, Han Solo had counted nearly five hundred warships under construction in the old Bilbringi shipyards. They were mostly escorts, corvettes, and other small stuff that could be finished in a hurry, but there were also two Imperial-class star destroyers. While these huge ships probably would not be ready before the Yuzhan Vong captured the facility, the hulls were nearly closed and the drive units already mounted. Clearly, young General Moon was a Sulliston with a plan just the sort of careful desk pilot who always impressed Coruscant command, and seldom failed to exhaust Han's limited supply of patience. Wishing he could use one of those Jedi calming techniques his son Jason was always talking about, Han forced an insincere smile and turned toward the center of the room. Leia sat on a small couch with the general, her face glowing with the same stunning brown-eyed intensity that had caught Han's eye so long ago though he would never understand how she had kept that fervor burning so brightly through thirty years of service to the galaxy. It had become a mooring for him, the one constant that never seemed to change through so many decades of struggle, loss, and death. Now, when occasionally her legs, healed from her near-fatal ordeal on Duro but still sometimes weak, tired and stumbled, the pain of almost losing her made his heart stop and he swore he would never, ever, shut her out again. Hundred thousand lives are at stake, General, she was saying. The Vray are a gentle species. Without an escort, the evacuation convoy will be defenseless against the Yuzhan Vong. And how many lives will the New Republic lose if Bill Bringy falls before the fleet is completed? Moon asked. His heavy, Sulliston jowls rippled gently as he spoke, but his feelings remained otherwise hidden behind his flat mask of a face. Whole worlds will perish, and that will mean millions. She's only asking for twenty ships, Han said. The general turned his black eyes on Han. She is asking for five cruisers and fifteen corvettes, a quarter of Gilbringi's defense, and the Yuzhan Vong are already probing our outer security posts. We're letting you keep the Dauntless, Han spoke in his most reasonable tone, and the other ships will be back in a week standard. Two tops. I am sorry. No. Moon shook his head and started to rise. A buzz sounded from the secure comm station on the general's desk. C-3PO, who had been standing behind the couch, raised his head and inquired, Would you like me to take that for you, General? Moon nodded. Unless it's urgent priority, I'll reply in a few minutes. Thanks, 3PO, Han said. Any interruption would only reduce their chances of getting the escort. He dropped into a seat opposite Moon. You seem to be forgetting who you're talking to, General. Leia's brown eyes flashed in alarm. Han, it wasn't so long ago she could have demanded the ships, Han continued. If anyone deserves, I know what the princess deserves. Moon reluctantly returned to his seat. I studied the history vids at the academy. History vids? Han growled. So they activated you when? About last year. 
He glanced through the transparasteel dome at the bustling dry docks. You must have had some test scores to get a command like this. An indignant shudder ran through the Sullustan's jowls, but before he could reply, C-3PO spoke again. Excuse me for interrupting, but there is a Yuzhan Vong emissary asking to see Princess Leia. What? Han and Leia asked together. Tell him no, Han said. And Leia asked, How did he find me? C-3PO spouted a millisecond of digital squeal into the comm station. The reply came a moment later. The Yuzhan Vong emissary refuses to reveal that information to the picket officer. But he does swear in the name of Yun Yamka to do you no harm. He wishes to discuss the fate of some refugees. No, Han said. Leia flashed him a scowl, then said to C-3PO, Tell him I'll send instructions shortly. Have you gone space-sick? Han knew he would never win this argument, but he had to try. Having already lost his best friend to the Yuzhan Vong, he was determined not to lose his wife. Or maybe you've forgotten Elon in the boathouse attempt. Or how close you came to losing your legs last year on Duro. I haven't forgotten, Leia said evenly. She turned to their host. But I'm sure General Moon wants to hear how the Yuzhan Vong knew I was here, almost as much as I do. The Sullustan nodded. Indeed. You can't let a Yuzhan Vong into Bilbringy, Han said, realizing that Moon was his best hope of preventing Leia from taking such a risk. The ship counts alone. Will be of use to our enemies only if they are accurate. The Sullustan did not even look in Han's direction. His jowls lifted into a sort of stiff grin, and he said to Leia, We have been waiting for just such an opportunity. Then it is my pleasure to give it to you. Leia turned to C-3PO. You may relay to the Yuzhan Vong that we will grant him safe passage. As long as he presents himself unarmed and unmasked, Han added glumly. Leia's Nogri bodyguards, waiting in the corridor outside Moon's office, would like this even less than he did, but they stood no chance at all of changing her mind. And if there's any funny business, he has already promised honorable conduct, C-3PO replied. Though if you ask me, a Yuzhan Vong's promise is worth precisely as much as a Jawa's. General Moon stepped over to his desk and opened a comm channel to his security chief. Commence Operation Rest Break. This is not a drill. Han and the two bodyguards spent the next two hours converting one of the base's old Imperial interrogation chambers into an interview room he considered safe enough for his wife. The main safety feature was the transparasteel panel through which the discussion would be held. But there were also the biosensor arrays to monitor the Yuzhan Vong's body state, the negative air pressure to confine any poisons he might release to the original room, and a void button that would open the chamber to the near vacuum outside. General Moon's preparations were just as thorough and twice as fast. He had barely given the order before the orbiting dry docks began to fall dark and still, making the shipyard look more and more abandoned. By the time the picket ship appeared above the planetoid, only three dilapidated dry docks remained in operation. Skeleton crews scurrying about their work, as though rushing to put the final touches on half a dozen inconsequential corvettes. The vast majority of the dry docks were not even visible, and the few that could be seen contained only half-built craft that appeared to have been abandoned in the haste of an over-early evacuation. Whether or not the general deserved his command at such a young age, Han had to admire his cleverness. Based on what could be seen from the surface, the Yuzhan Vong would be in no hurry to attack the Bilbringi shipyards. C-3PO announced the emissary's arrival. Then a dozen guards entered the interrogation chamber with their charge. The Yuzhan Vong had been afforded few diplomatic courtesies. Something that looked like an artificial eye had been confiscated and now rested in a security officer's hand. 
and in place of his own clothes he wore a thin fleet watch cloak with the hood up. In his hands he carried a sponge-like creature that resembled the villips Eugen Vong used to communicate over long distances, though this one was larger and more gelatinous. The shipyard science officers had screened the creature for every known form of Eugen Vong attack and confirmed it to be an organic communication device. But Leia's Nogri bodyguards, Adarak and Miwa, insisted on performing their own inspection, sniffing, prodding, and squeezing the thing until Han thought it would burst. He put his hand over the void button anyway, until someone could tell him how an overgrown protozoan could send messages across the galaxy as efficiently as the holonet. He wasn't taking anyone's word for anything. Once everyone was satisfied, the escorts pushed the emissary into the room's single chair, then left and locked the door. Leia stepped to the transperistyl. I am Leia Organa Solo. Yes, we have met before, on the planet Romamool. The emissary's voice was throaty and arrogant, and it instantly caused Leia's face to go white. He set his creature on the table and peeled back his hood, revealing a smashed Yuzhan Vong face with one empty eye socket. And at Duro, we even worked together for a time. Kriar? Leia's hand dropped instinctively to her lightsaber, the one Luke had made for her years ago. Savong La had destroyed her other lightsaber on Duro. Nom Anor. You have an excellent memory. The Yuzhan Vong glared at Leia coldly. How is your son, Jason? And Mara, is she still in remission? As you know, I have a special interest in your sister-in-law's condition. Han felt the void button tickle his palm and realized he was dangerously close to pressing it. Keep talking, fella. During the fall of Duro, Nom Anor had attempted to kill Mara and Jaina, tried to orchestrate the deaths of Leia and Jason, and before that he had infected Mara with a deadly disease that had required more than two years to overcome. There's nothing I'd enjoy more than vacking you. Nom Anor's smile remained snide. Before you hear what I came to say. Besides, I do not think Leia Organa Solo the type to break a promise of safe passage. My promise, not Hans, Leia said. And his self-control isn't what it used to be. How did you know I was here? With the ray evacuating, where else would you look for a convoy escort? Nom Anor gestured at the creature on the desk. If I may. The Vray have been evacuating for weeks, Leia said, continuing to press for an answer. Han doubted Nom Anor would tell them if there was a spy inside Bill Bringy. But what was left unsaid would prove just as useful to General Moon. We've only been here a few hours. We are, of course, watching Bill Bringy and that is really all I am going to say on the matter. Without asking permission this time, Nomanor coaxed his creature awake with a brief stroke. Savon La wishes you to see this. The creature melted into a flat disk, then began to glow with yellow bioluminescence. The light coalesced into a long starship with a blocky stern and the distinctive hammerhead bridge of one of the Corellian Engineering Corporation's large civilian cruisers. Judging by the lack of efflux from the ion drives and the open doors of its docking bay deck, the ship was standing dead in space. The Starliner, Nebula Chaser. No, Monor said. The image is current. Han's heart leapt into his throat. The Nebula Chaser was the ship Mara and Jaina had gone to meet. The mission was supposed to be simple, a quick rendezvous in a safe sector and then home. But something had clearly gone wrong. He put on his best sabak face and forced himself not to look in his wife's direction. Very impressive, Leia said. Though she had to be just as worried as Han, her voice remained dry and mocking. You've learned to transmit holograms. 
I'll look forward to your holodramas on the net. The Yuzhan Vong have made living light for centuries, Numanor snapped. I am showing you this ship because the War Master thought you might wish to trade. Here it comes, Han thought. He moved his hand away from the void button, not trusting himself to resist if Nomanor announced the Yuzhan Vong had his daughter. Savong La fought wrong, Leia said. Her voice was a little too cold, the only hint of the ice ball that had to be filling in her stomach. I'd rather trade with a hut. The huts do not have what you want. Numanor stabbed a claw-like finger into the hologram. There are ten thousand refugees aboard, and their peril is your doing. I doubt that. If this is what Savong La wished me to see, our business is done. Leia turned her back on Numanor and stepped away from the transperistyl. It was all Han could do not to remind her that their daughter's life might be at stake, but he held his tongue knowing she was only trying to undermine their opponent's confidence. She made it as far as the door before Nome Anor called. You can save them. He rose to peer over the living light. Just tell me where to find the Jedi base. Leia glanced at Han, clearly wondering whether Nome Anor meant they could save the refugees or Jaina and Mara, then said, There is no Jedi base. Numanor sighed theatrically. Princess Leia, you discredit me again in the eyes of Savong La. He let his chin slump. I advised him you would never sacrifice so many to save so few. But he believes you are willing to sacrifice more, much more, to protect the Jedi. As Numanor spoke, a salvo of plasma balls streaked into the hologram and erupted against the shieldless starliner, opening flash-melted holes in the durasteel hull. Dark clouds of speck-sized flotsam and atmospheric vapor began to jet into space, and another salvo of plasma boiled into view. Many of the balls entered through the same holes as the previous fusillade and tore through the ship's interior bulkheads. The clouds darkened as more flotsam poured into the cold vacuum. Then the image shifted, magnifying the breach area and revealing the specks to be the tumbling, pressure-ruptured bodies of the ship's passengers. Truly, the wisdom of Savong La is as boundless as the galaxy itself. Nom Anor rolled his one good eye, as though sharing a joke, then gestured at the Starliner. They are dying because there were Jedi aboard. If the Jedi do not want more to die, they will surrender within one of your standard weeks. More? Han knew it was exactly the question Nomanor wanted him to ask. But he could not restrain himself. He had to know what had become of Jaina. How many more? Your scouts will confirm that our fleets have surrounded the world of Talfalio. For the next week, all refugee ships are being held in orbit. If the Jedi surrender, the convoy will be allowed to leave. If the Jedi do not, it will be destroyed. Nom Anor glanced down at Han's hand, which was hovering over the void button, and added, As they will if I fail to return. You expect the Jedi to surrender? Han asked. He was too relieved by Nomanor's failure to mention Jaina or Mara to feel any real outrage at the deaths of ten thousand strangers. Maybe he should have felt guilty about that. He didn't know, but all that mattered at the moment was that Jaina and Mara were safe. Won't happen, fella. I might as well get things started. Han locked gazes with Nomanor and lowered his hand toward the void button, grinning crookedly and taking his time to give Leia a chance to stop him. The Yuzhan Vong met his gaze with a sneer and did not look away, even when Han's palm touched the button. He paused there, waiting for Leia to stop him, but she said nothing. 
On glanced over and saw her glaring at the emissary, her brown eyes burning with raw rage. What are you waiting for? she demanded. Really? Leia nodded. Do it. The edge in her voice unsettled Han, and it occurred to him that no Manor might have failed to mention Jaina or Mara for another reason. A reason Leia had already thought of. It was entirely possible the pair had been aboard when the Nebula Chaser was destroyed, and the Yuzhan Vong simply did not realize who they had killed. Han pushed the void button, and a seal hissed open along the edge of the ceiling panel. Num Anor's one eye grew wide. Are you mad? He jumped to his feet. You'll kill millions. Leia reached over and depressed the void button again, stopping the ceiling panel where it was. Not us. You. The air continued to hiss out of the chamber, causing the image of the nebula chaser to flicker out of existence as the villop creature curled in on itself. Numanor glanced at the ceiling, then back to Leia, his gruesome face slack with surprise. She waited until he pressed his fingers to his ears, then hit the void button again and closed the panel. When Num Anor took his hands away from his ears, Leia said, Go back to your war master, and tell him how you were treated. Tell him the Jedi accept no responsibility for the lives he threatens, and that any emissary issuing a similar threat will not be returned. Num Anor nodded, if not meekly, then at least not haughtily. I will tell him, but that will change nothing. He went to the door and waited until it opened, then added, The War Master believes this will work, and he has not been wrong yet. Luke Skywalker knew that a few days in the back to tank would heal the physical damage, but there was an anguish in Alima that would never fade. He could feel it even now while she floated in a restless healing trance, and the torment would only grow worse when she awakened to the news of the Nebula Chaser's fate. There would be more feelings of guilt, more anger, more fear of the... thing that had killed her sister. Already perilously close to the dark side in her leadership of the new Plimpto resistance, now she would find it an irresistible alternative to accepting whatever responsibility she bore for her sister's death, for new Plimpto's destruction, and for the Starliner's fate. It was not a question of whether Alima Rar would turn to the dark side, but how soon and for how long. The infirmary door whispered open behind Luke, and he turned to find Silgal's liquid eyes studying him from the threshold. I am sorry to interrupt, Luke, but your brother-in-law is demanding to speak to you. He seems to think we're keeping something from him. Luke smiled. Good old Han. It's nice to have him back to normal. Silgal's huge mouth parted in a calamarian grin. Yes, isn't it? Luke followed her into a round corridor and started toward the conference vault. Like much of the new base, the tunnel had been laser-cut from solid rock, but it had been sealed against vacuum leaks with a white plastifoam that made it appear much softer and brighter than the typical cave-worn. The foam was also an excellent insulator, trapping equipment generated heat so efficiently that most species elected to wear their vacuum emergency suits still necessary far too often, with all closures open. Engineering was trying to correct the problem, but most inhabitants already referred to their sleeping quarters as sweat lodges. Luke entered the conference vault and found his nephews, Jason and Anakin, waiting with Danny Kui, Tahiri Vela, and a group of other Jedi. A small hologram of Han and Leia hovered above the hollow projector in the center of the conference table. Han was grilling his sons about exactly why their sister was not in the room. Leia was looking a little embarrassed. Luke joined the others at the table and, much to the gratitude of his two nephews, took their place in the hollow's sensor arc. Han, 
Gina is in the signal center with R2, trying to enhance a transmission they received from the Nebula Chaser. She'll be here as soon as she can, but she can't drop what she's doing. Han frowned, but appeared to accept this. You heard about the threat? Luke nodded. A few minutes ago. Then what took you so long? I was with Alima Rar, he said. She wasn't strapped in when the pot ejected and got beat up. She couldn't say much on the way back except Voxen, so I was hoping to get a subconscious impression of what happened to her sister. Han narrowed his eyes. Subconscious impression? Through the Force, Han, Luke said, beginning to lose patience with his brother-in-law. Though Han was largely back to himself, his grief over Chewbacca's death continued to manifest itself in peculiar ways. The latest was a nervous streak that had both Leia and his children ready to walk asteroids. Jaina is fine. So is Mara. The attempted at subtlety was lost on Han. So how come Mara isn't there? Mara can't exactly drop what she's doing either. Luke answered, she's feeding Ben. You'll have to excuse us for being a little nervous. Leia flashed an annoyed look at her husband, then continued. That was quite a demonstration, Numanor put on. Ten thousand people dead. And I doubt he would have stopped if I had told him where to find Eclipse. What are we going to do about Talfalio? First, remember that by allowing the Yuzhan Vong to make the responsibility ours, we would only be playing into their hands, Luke said. We must always remember that they're the murderers here, not us. That is true as far as it goes, Master Skywalker, Silgal said, addressing Luke more formally now that they were in a larger group. But I am not comfortable closing my eyes to the death of so many. Whether the responsibility is ours or not, we must do something if we can prevent it. And we're not entirely innocent in this either. Jaina entered the vault, leading R2-D2 and several Jedi. News of Savong La's threat was spreading fast and base personnel were pouring into the conference vault. There were Jedi on the Nebula Chaser, and those Jedi were leading the resistance on New Plimto. The Rar sisters put the whole Starliner at risk by boarding it, as we did by rendezvousing with it. And you know the Yuzhan Vong wouldn't have taken them for sacrifices how? Danny Kui asked, always quick to pinpoint the flaw in any argument. A small-framed woman with green eyes and curly blonde hair, Danny had been one of the first Yuzhan Vong prisoners, and the first to witness their breaking tortures. We can't presume to know how these killers think, she went on. It will cause mistakes, bad ones. As Danny spoke, she stepped aside to let Jaina join Luke in the holocom's sensor arc. Hi, Dad, Mom, Jaina said. Sorry to keep you waiting. We weren't waiting that long, Leia said. The tension drained from Han's face, and he added, Yeah, no problem. The calm lasted about a second before Anakin Solo, his brown hair as unruly as ever, stepped forward to kick the discussion into hyperdrive. Look, it doesn't really matter whether we're responsible or not. There are hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of lives at risk. We've got to do something, that's all. What would you have us do, Anakin? Luke asked. Tahiri answered for him. Break their blockade, of course. Blonde and willowy, Tahiri resembled in many respects a fifteen-year-old version of Danny Kui, even down to having been a Yuzhan Vong prisoner until Anakin rescued her from a shaper laboratory. We make them pay so they don't try it again. It's the only way we turn this back on them. And that may be exactly what the Yuzhan Vong expect us to do, Danny said. If they see the Jedi as warriors like themselves, they would expect an honorable response. Han nodded in the hologram. They're calling the Jedi out. You'd be fools to go, especially when they're waiting for you. So we let a world die. Jason's quiet voice was a stark contrast to the rising tension in the room. He turned toward Tahiri and Anakin. But waving our lightsabers around will only get more people killed, too. Anakin scowled, as he so often did when talking with his older brother these days. 
Maybe you can just stand aside and watch. Jason raised a hand. Let me finish, Anakin. I'm saying that neither choice is good. He glanced at the others in the room. If we fight, the Yuzhan Vong kill more people. If we don't fight, they kill them anyway. We can't permit either. The Jedi are supposed to be the defenders of life in this galaxy. What are you saying, Jason? Han demanded. That the Jedi have to surrender? He closed his eyes and winced. Tell me that's not what you're saying. Nobody is going to surrender, Han, Luke said. He was sympathetic to Han's concern. Of all the young Jedi knights who had come to Eclipse, Jason was the most philosophical, often struggling with the paradoxical idea that it was sometimes necessary to destroy in order to preserve. Luke knew his nephew's concerns to be the result of a disturbing vision on the planet Duro, in which Jason had seen the galaxy tipping toward darkness and been unable to stop it. Fearful of tipping the balance even farther, the young Jedi had temporarily abandoned the Force altogether, though he had resumed its use when events necessitated it in order to save his mother's life. Jason remained uncertain enough about his vision that at times his uneasiness still moved him close to inaction, a situation as perilous in its own way as the one that would soon be leading Alima into danger. We're not surrendering. Luke repeated, and we won't let the Yuzhan Vong lure us into battle unprepared. He turned to Danny and Silgal. Does the Eclipse program have anything to offer yet? Danny shook her head. Nothing. We can tell from the hollows when there's a Yamask coordinating the battle, but it's been impossible to identify posting patterns or determine how it communicates. We just have to get closer. Luke looked to Silgal. And the Villips? I fear my group has made even less progress, she said. The Yuzhan Vong obviously stopped using the Villips we have captured, which leaves us only with dissection. So far, we haven't the faintest idea how they work. Luke nodded to both scientists. It's too early to expect progress, but it will come. He turned to the others, now numbering nearly fifty, including Mara, their infant son Ben and more than a dozen non-Jedi support volunteers. Our path is not yet clear, but I am confident in this much. It would be folly to let the Yuzhan Vong draw us out before we are ready. I hope you can be patient, and trust in the Force to steer blame for the Nebula Chaser's destruction onto the proper shoulders. As the group murmured its consent and began to break up, Mara came to his side. Well said, Luke. Cradling Ben in one arm, she rose to her toes and kissed him on the cheek. But I'd feel better if the Force weren't blind to Yuzhan Vong's shoulders. Chapter 3 One of a thousand pagan blasphemies excluded from the redemption of Obroa Sky. The Museum of Applied Phototonics rose above the surrounding bug yards in a glittering massif of transparent steel towers and crystal plast galleries. Though no Manor had spent too much time among the infidels to find the site offensive, he knew better than to let his comfort with the place show. He paused at the threshold to cast a yearning glance out over the droning black plain, then put on a sneer of disgust and followed his escorts into the lobby where a hundred verpine captives stood watching their Yuzhan Vong guards with unfathomable insectoid eyes. After a brief conversation with the subaltern of the detachment, Numanor's escorts led him through a maze of corridors profanely lit by wandering balls of pure light. They found Savong La in a chamber surrounded by what looked like a hundred kilometers of snarled, translucent threads, a fully tattooed warrior with fringed lips and bone-implanted armor, the War Master was holding a small holopad in his hand, gazing at its projector disc with a look most others would reserve for cowards and slaves. Now, he said into the instrument. Sawang La had barely spoken before an instantaneous flash lit the whole thread tangle, then leapt through the empty air into the holopad. A millisecond later, 
the full-sized image of an infidel X-wing appeared over his hand, obscuring the Warmaster's upper body and much of the room. The Starfighter turned slowly toward the door and opened fire. Only Nomanor did not duck for cover. Do you know what I'd do with this, were I the infidels? Savongla asked, speaking from inside the hologram. Destroy it, I am certain, Nomanor answered. Such lifeless things are an abomination to the gods. I cannot tell you how it disgusted me to abide them while I prepared the way for our invasion. We all do what is necessary, Executor, and you have already been commended for enduring the enemy's filth. Savong Lai's tone was irritated and perhaps a little distracted. We cannot defeat what we do not understand. For instance, our coral skipper pilots could easily be misled by an image such as this. Were I the enemy, the galaxy would be littered with these devices. The galaxy is littered with them, Nomanor answered, bristling. They're not really much to admire, Great One. They are as limited in their capacities as are our enemies. The X-Wing vanished. Then Savong La dropped the hollow pad to the floor and crushed it beneath the armored Vuasa claw that he now stood upon in place of the foot taken by Jason Solo. The enemy has proven challenging enough to thwart you several times. The War Master's voice was full of loathing. A true believer in the supremacy of the Yuzhan Vong gods, he disavowed the influence of chance and viewed any failure as a sign of the instrument's spiritual decadence. I trust that was not the case this time. The Chi Lab worked beautifully. Nomanor tipped his head to one side then covered his nostrils and blew air into his sinuses. Though he lacked the faith to truly enjoy the pain of the neural grub's detachment, he feigned a smile of satisfaction as the thing tore its dendrites from his optic chiasma and exited through his nasal cavity. He let it drop into his palm, then presented it to Savong La. I had a good view on the way in. I am certain the Chi Lab's memories will prove useful in planning your attack. No doubt. Savong La slipped the grub into the pocket of the sharp-clawed cape, clinging to his shoulders. I will view them later. Your meeting with Leia Solo went well? Very well. It would have been unthinkable to answer anything else. I have no doubt that the Jedi will respond to our challenge. You are more confident than I would be in your place? A wispy voice said, low and behind him, The Jedi will smell our trap and be wary. Nomanor turned and saw Motley Featherball hopping past the guards on thin, reverse-jointed legs. Her willowy ears and corkscrew antennae bestowed on her a vaguely moth-like aspect, though Nomanor considered her a pest more on the magnitude of a rodank. Vergier, he fumed. I was not aware you knew the ways of the Jedi. Virgir knows them better than I, Savong La said. She was the one who said the Jedi would let you live. I believed they would kill you outright. You were perhaps closer to the truth than your pet. Nomanor refused to call Virgir an aide, for the peculiar little creature was no more than the familiar of an agent who had perished during an ill-fated attempt to disease the Jedi. She had become an advisor to Savong La, after a brief captivity in the hands of New Republic Intelligence, where she managed to learn as much about the enemy in a few weeks as had Nomanor in all his years as an agent provocateur. Questions had been raised about her loyalties, but once the reliability of her information had been established, she had quickly become Nomanor's greatest rival. Leia Solo and her consort did attempt to kill me, as you expected. Nomanor continued, but I was able to play on her human emotions to save my life. So now you can control the emotions of the Jedi, Virgir marked. Then perhaps you should make them surrender. One can lure a Tana into the spatter pit with a smile and soft words. Nomanor spread his hands and turned to Savong La. Even I cannot persuade it to lay its neck in the cleaving yoke. 
The War Master rewarded him with a curt nod. I am more interested in what Leia Solo said than why you are still alive. How did she respond when the gift of anguish destroyed the infidels? She wanted to kill me. But she did not, the War Master observed. What did she do instead? I convinced her she would also be killing millions of refugees. Even Nomano realized he was clinging to the claim a little too closely, perhaps because of the shame he had already suffered at Leia's hands on Duro. She yielded. Not yielded. She refused to accept blame. Verger stated her rebuttal as fact, not supposition. She hopped over to Savong La. She's been a diplomat all her life. For her to fall into such a trap would be akin to you flying into an ambush. Savong La considered her argument for only an instant. It may appear so, but something else is happening. He looked over Vergier's feathery back at Nomanor. She let you live for a reason. What is it? The answer, of course, was because she had given her word, but Nomanor knew better than to say so. Such an answer would contradict the opinion the War Master had expressed earlier. And while a Yuzhan Vong subordinate could insinuate, thwart, even subvert and still hope to live, he could never contradict. Sometimes Nomanor wondered if the infidel's way was not better, and he supposed the fact that he did not immediately cower in fear of the god's retribution was in itself a sign that he had spent too long away from his people. Leaving aside for the moment the question of why he had been forced to endure the painful introduction of the Chi Lab if the War Master had not expected him to return, Nomanor shrugged. Before she released me, she gave me a warning. She said to tell you that the Jedi accept no responsibility for the hostages, and that any emissary you send with a similar threat will not be returned. If Savong La noticed the slight contradiction of Nomanor's contention that he had been the one controlling Leia, he showed no sign. He simply looked to Vergier. Right again, my servant. She smiled up at him. Have I not said the Jedi will prove worthy foes? You have indeed, the War Master said. But the refugees will be their undoing yet. They will become the wedge that drives the New Republic away from the Jedi. Chapter 4 The one good thing to come of Savong La's threat was that General Moon decided now would be a bad time to appear indifferent to the fate of refugees, and a particularly good time to boost his career by rescuing a group of evacuees. Not only did he send ten vessels to escort the Vray to safety, he insisted on leading the operation himself, freeing Leia and Han to return directly to Eclipse. One of the many bad things to come of the threat was that, when they arrived, Luke was waiting with a mission and a request to borrow C-3PO. The Solos barely had a chance to say hello to Anakin and the twins before they were on their way again, this time to Nova Station, in what had once been the Corita system. Surrounded as it was by the still-cooling ejecta of the explosion that had turned its sun into a supernova, Space outside Nova Station was the reddest space Leia had ever seen. Wispy curtains of crimson gas swept slowly past the turning station, obscuring the distant stars and calling to mind the flash-boiled blood of billions of perished Caridans. Sitting there with Han in the wryly named Big Boom Cantina, sipping an eye blaster and trying to ignore Bobolo Baker's All Bith Band, Leia could not help feeling a little sickened by the knowledge that this had been an artificial cataclysm, one wrought by her own species' boundless thirst for vengeance and destruction. An electronic attention bell chimed three times, temporarily drowning out Bobolo's flighty melody. Then a male voice said something garbled over the public address system. Along with every other being in the cantina, Leia and Han turned their heads toward a hologram projector hanging over the Albith band. The name Asteroid Dancer appeared, with a line beneath designating the vessel a YT-1500 freighter. 
A few moments later, the word confirmed was added, and a hologram depicting the craft's distinctive cockpit arrangement appeared. Han grunted in frustration and reached for the pitcher of eye blasters sitting in front of him. They should have been here by now. He filled his glass, took a sip, and tried not to make a sour face and returned the drink to the table. Booster's not coming. He has to, Leia said, glad to see the distaste in Han's expression. For a long time after Chewbacca's death, he would drink anything, the fouler the better. The healing of his taste buds was yet one more sign of the healing inside. Even the errant venture needs to resupply. Could we have missed them? Han gave her one of his patented dumb question looks, then waved at the hollow display. How do we miss a Star Destroyer? We don't, Leia agreed. Not here. Built to replace Corrida as a waystop on the Perlemian trade route, Nova Station floated just inside the supernova's expanding gas shell, moving along behind the edge at the same three kilometers per second. As a result, any starship wishing to dock with the station had to leave hyperspace and enter the cloud at sublight speed, then use its sensors to obtain a final location. This gave station security and anyone else with a decent sensor package a chance to identify the ship long before it arrived, making the station an ideal haunt for smugglers, criminals, and anyone else with reason to appreciate a head start. Han looked across the table. What do you think, Red? He was referring to Leia's neon-colored hair, now almost down to her collar after being shaved off during a decon alert on Duro last year. Along with a blast-back pilot's jacket and stretch-tight flight suit, she could still pull off. The temporary dye job was part of her smuggler's mall disguise. Time to go? Leia smiled and shook her head. How about something to eat? She reached over to thumb the service pad, but stopped when she noticed Han being eyed from the next table. The watcher was a small mountain of a weequay, with a broad nose and a deeply creased face, almost as gruesome as a Yuzhan Vong's. I think you're about to be recognized. Me? Han turned to gaze out the viewport and see if he could spy the watcher in its reflection. It's not my face that's been flashing over the net for the last twenty years. Long resentful of the loss of anonymity that came with being a hero of the rebellion, Han had limited his disguise to a brush-bottle mustache and a pair of cheek pads. Along with a two-day growth of beard, the costume had worked so far, probably because people did not expect to see the husband of a former chief of state in a place like the Big Boom. Clearly, their luck was changing. The big Weequay picked up his drink and stood, flight duster flapping open to reveal the hilt of a big vibra-blade on his hip. Knowing that her Nogri bodyguard would be growing nervous, Leia glanced quickly in Miwal's direction. Gaunt, wiry, and no more than a meter and a half tall, Miwal was nevertheless such an intimidating sight with her leathery skin and wild eyes that even the Big Boom's clientele gave her wide berth. Leia signaled the Nogri to wait with a double eye flick, then pretended not to notice as the stranger started toward Han. Wait a minute, Han said, more to himself than Leia. I know this guy. Leia casually lowered a hand beneath the table and loosened the blaster on her hip. The mere fact that her husband knew someone was no guarantee that the party in question did not have murder in mind. The big Weequay stopped beside their table and, after casting an appraising glance at Leia, turned to Han. Thought it was you, he said. I'd recognize that smell anywhere. Yeah? Han narrowed his eyes at the Weequay, clearly trying to recall where he had seen him before. I get that a lot. Didn't see our ship come in on the board, Meek. The Weequay's smile was almost a sneer. Clearly, he enjoyed watching Han struggle to remember him. You still with the sunlight? You might say that. 
Han flashed a conspiratorial smile, then took a long drink of his eye blaster to buy himself some time. Sunlight Franchise was one of a dozen false transponder codes the Falcon used regularly. They had docked with Nova Station under the name Longshot, and Han had more aliases than even he could track. Finally, he returned the glass to the table and refilled it from the pitcher. Only you'd have to try a different name. The weak way laughed. I thought as much. That captain of yours was a tricky one. He pulled up a chair and sat down, then glanced around the room. Haven't seen any rin around, though. That hardness only a wife can see came to Han's eyes, and Leia knew he had finally placed their uninvited guest. Droma doesn't run things anymore, Han said. Droma and Han had fallen in together for a time after the capture of Ord Mantell, then spent half a year tracking down Droma's lost Rin clanmates and bringing them together in a Duros refugee camp. Though Droma and his people had since vanished into space, they had given Han a focus when Leia could not and would therefore always have a warm place in her heart. He and I parted ways nearly a year ago. Really? The weak way turned to Leia again, half leering and half appraising. This your new captain? Han looked hurt. I'm captain. She's the mate. You might say that. Leia glared across the table at her husband. On a good day. The weak way laughed heartily then surprised Leia by reaching under the table to lay a meaty hand on her knee. The next time you have a bad day, come over and see me on the sweet surprise. I'm the mate there, but you can have any post you want. That's enough, Plan. She's not looking. Han's voice was serious now. What are you doing off Fullerton, anyway? I thought you were the security chief. The small amount of humor Leia saw in the situation vanished. Follaton was the home of a group of traitorous smugglers who were not above aiding the Yuzhan Vong when the price was high enough. Change of jobs? Like I said, I'm first mate on the sweet surprise now. He removed his hand from Leia's thigh. Reason I came over, we're short of help this run. Pays good. Han waited just long enough for Leia to shake her head, then raise his hand to silence her. How good. Captain? Leia interrupted. Whether it was through the Force or because of all their years together, the role he wanted her to play came to her almost instinctively. What about that load we're waiting for? Han did not look at her. It's late. But we've already been paid for the job. Leia was playing the role, but she was also truly irritated at being dismissed. And you know how he is about runners who don't keep their contracts. I'd hate to see you frozen in carbonite or something. Han winced, then took another long drink of his eye blaster. There's a clause, he said. If the load's more than a day late, we pick it up later. Let's hear him out. Can't say much until you're in, Plan said. We don't need much. Han said, as long as it's not that refugee scam. The last thing I want is a New Republic fleet breathing down my neck. Plan shook his head. No more of that. This time they get where they're going. A sweet deal for them and us. You won't believe it. Leia slumped back and folded her arms across her ribs, doing her best imitation of an angry maul. It wasn't hard. How long would it take? Han asked. We have to hop out and pick up the rest of our cargo, Plan said. Then it's a two-day run. No more. Han looked across the table. What do you think, Red? Realizing he was still probing for information, Leia said, What about the long shot, Meek? Are we hitchhiking back? We'll drop you, Plan said. We'll be coming back by. How much? Han asked. Five thousand, Plan answered. Each? Leia asked. Plan frowned. 
For both. And that covers the docking fees for leaving the long shot here. Han looked to Leia. Well? Leia rolled her eyes and reached for her eye blaster. We'll think about it, Han said. Plan started to make a higher offer, then looked at Leia and changed his mind. Don't think too long. We're pulling out in an hour. He took his drink and left, weaving his way through the crowd toward another pair of likely-looking prospects. Leia watched as he sat down and began his pitch. Then she glanced up with everyone else when the electronic attention bell chimed. This time, the name Light Racer appeared above the Bith's heads. So where's he going? she asked. With that schedule, three possibilities, Han replied. Kuat, Borlias, or Coruscant? Coruscant, Leia surmised. Kuat and Borlias are turning away refugees. If he expects to get where he's going, it's Coruscant. Plan found his two crew members and stood, waving to Han and Leia as he shouldered his way toward the exit with a pair of flop-eared Osan. Han raised his glass to the big weak way and took a long drink, then waited until they were gone and thumped the service pad on the table. Where are you going? Leia put the emphasis on you. To gargle. I can't stand eye blasters, Han replied. And then we're going to Coruscant. Leia remained seated. I can't. You know how worried my brother is about his students. The young students of Luke's Jedi Academy were currently aboard the errant venture with Booster Terek, jumping around the galaxy at random to prevent the Yuzhan Vong from tracking them down. Unfortunately, in the two days since Alima Rar had awakened on Eclipse and described the attack on her sister, two more Jedi had fallen to Voxen. One on the supposedly secure world of Kuat. Concerned that the Venture might stumble across one of the Jedi killers during a supply stop, Luke had asked Han and Leia to pass Booster the coordinates of the new Jedi base at Eclipse and suggest that he resupply only from there. Booster, being Booster, he was now three days overdue for his regularly scheduled rendezvous, and even Leia had to admit it seemed unlikely he meant to keep it. Let's wait one more day, she suggested. The long shot is fast. If Booster doesn't show, we can still reach Coruscant ahead of plan. Well, I'm not leaving here without you, Han sighed. But Rogue Squadron is rotating through Coruscant right now, and Wedge owes me a favor. At least let me talk to him and make sure the sweet surprise receives a warm welcome. Wedge Antilles owes you a favor? Everybody owes me a favor. Han said. Booster failed to show, of course, and Wedge, General Antilles, was reluctant to order the boarding of a properly registered starship without evidence of suspicion, in this case the presence of the complaining witness. Knowing this to be no more than an essential concession to the anti-Jedi sentiments on the Advisory Council, Leia reluctantly kept her promise to Han and informed Luke it was impossible to wait for the errant venture any longer. They left Nova Station and jumped into hyperspace at the Perlemian trade route. Han guessed they would be fast enough to beat the sweet surprise to Coruscant. Han's calculations were a little off. They emerged from hyperspace to the news that Rogue Squadron was already on its way to intercept the surprise. Wedge asked Han to meet him at Orbital Control to file a report, and Han surprised no one by promising to be there after he saw what happened with the surprise. Coruscant's usual aura of flickering starship light was now squeezed into a stack of luminous halos. To guard against the possibility of a Yuzhan Vong surprise attack, the military had surrounded the planet with a shell of orbiting space mines, leaving open only a few dozen narrow travel bands and slowing the normal traffic storm to a crawl. Han took the Falcon over the top of a travel band and came down within a few hundred meters of the Sweet Surprise's blocky stern, drawing an ear-popping comm squeal from the thousand-meter cargo hauler he had cut off. He reached for the comm unit to return the affront, and Leia practically had to throw herself out of the Wookiee-sized co-pilot seat to stop him. Easy, flyboy. 
This is no place to start a screech fight. When Han removed his hand, she opened a private frequency to the freighter. Sorry to cut in, freight. There's about to be a military delay ahead. Suggest you veer port. Delay? An icy Duros voice responded. What do you call this? The huge freighter began to slide across the traffic band, prompting such a squall of random comm squeals that Leia had to turn down the volume. Who needs the military? Han asked. Let the Yuzhan Vong into this traffic storm and see how long they last. The storm grew worse as four tiny X-wings streaked into view, then pivoted on their noses and fell in behind the sweet surprise. Leia scanned comm channels until she heard Gavin Darklighter's familiar voice. And stand for inspection, sweet surprise. What for? Plan's voice replied. We aren't violating any trade laws. We haven't even entered customs control. Be advised, this is a New Republic military inspection. In a more reassuring voice, Gavin added, No need to worry, it's just random. Random? Plan sounded doubtful. I'll talk to my captain. Remind him we're not interested in customs regulations, Gavin said, but we are armed. The discussion between Plan and his captain must have been a lively one, because the sweet surprise continued forward until the traffic band narrowed to a mere three hundred meters. The space mines became a tangible presence, more because of the vast swaths of darkness they occupied than because of the tiny shapes Leia occasionally saw silhouetted against Coruscant's scintillating surface. Gavin again warned the ship that his X-wings were armed and authorized to fire, and Plan replied that the surprise was carrying a thousand innocent refugees. They're not going to stop, Leia said. Monitoring the exchange from its network of orbital weapon platforms, the Planetary Defense Force was slowly coming to the same conclusion. Over the Falcon's military comm unit, Leia listened to a series of increasingly senior officers query first Gavin Darklighter, then Wedge Antilles about what was happening. Finally, the groggy voice of General Raikin, who had been called out of retirement to command the PDF, demanded an explanation from Han. Han told him who Plan was, the Weequay's refugee selling history, and what had transpired aboard Nova Station. So basically, you're telling me you've got a bad feeling about these guys. Han winced. That's about it, General. There was a crackle as the General switched comm channels, then his voice came over the unsecured channel being used between Rogue Squadron and the Surprise. Colonel Darklighter, you know who this is? General Raikin, yes, sir. Good. As commander of Coruscant's Planetary Defense Force, I am ordering you not to allow the sweet surprise inside the mine shell. Do you understand? Leia looked at Han. No more than three kilometers ahead of the Falcon, traffic was already passing under the minefield. By the time Gavin responded, both Rogue Squadron and the surprise would be between the mines. Uh, sir, we're already entering the safe lane— you have your orders, Colonel Darklighter. Raikin, out. That was all it took. Save for the Falcon and the X-Wings, every ship within ten kilometers of the Sweet Surprise began to veer away. What about it, Sweet Surprise? Gavin asked. Come to a halt and prepare for boarding. The proper response would have been to fire a burst of braking rockets from the bow thrusters. Instead, the Surprise nosed sharply up. We don't want any trouble, Plan said. Negative surprise. The voice belonged to Colonel Tico Selchu, Gavin Darklighter's immediate superior, and a veteran rogue squadron pilot himself. You can't pull a flip over here. You're too long for the safe lane. You let us worry about that, Plan's reply came. As he spoke, all three hundred meters of the sweet surprise shot straight up in front of the Falcon then began to arc back overhead. Colonel, Gavin called. Orders? Shields! Tico's reply came. Good idea, Han muttered, reaching for the controls. Leia's hand was already bringing the glide switches up. Full power? You Jedi always reading minds. 
Leia locked the glides at maximum, then opened an intercom channel to the main hold and crew quarters. Strap in back there. We're about to have some fun. The Nogri, of course, said nothing. A pair of mine rockets flared to life. The sweet surprise's belly laser flashed in response, and both mines erupted before they traveled a hundred meters. Wormheads! Han nosed the falcon down. On the military channel, Gavin called frantically, Mine control, deactivate! The ten closest mines fired their rockets and streaked toward the sweet surprise in a funnel-shaped web of orange. The freighter's belly laser lashed out again, destroying three more mines. Another ten ignited. You'd think they'd learn, Leia said, struggling to cinch her crash webbing. It was still Wookiee-sized, and she almost said something about replacing it, then realized how that would sound to Han, and grabbed hold in a cross-chest grip. We should have filed the report first. The first wave of mines blossomed into white fire against the Sweet Surprise's shields. So did most of the second. But three devices passed through the shields, their vibrapoint heads penetrating the ship's durasteel walls. One erupted on the bridge, shattering the transparasteel viewing panels, spraying X-wing-sized shards down through the safe lane. A second warhead vaporized the ion drives and sent the crippled freighter tumbling down behind the Falcon. Leia did not see where the third detonated. She was distracted by several orange halos expanding above their own cockpit. Han, I know, he said. With the sweet surprise falling away, the Falcon had become the largest target mass. Just hold on. I think... The halos went dark, and a half-dozen black silhouettes bounced harmlessly off the Falcon's shields. Han finished... They'll deactivate. He rolled the falcon down after the surprise. Leia sank into her oversized chair, then grunted as she snapped back up into her loose shoulder restraints. Han glanced over. This could get tricky. Dial up the inertial compensator. Tighten your crash webbing. It's as tight as it goes, Leia said. I'll just hold on. If Han heard, he was too busy to answer. They were diving through the next band of traffic. Rogue's X-Wings were spiraling after the tumbling sweet surprise. Startled at starships were looping in all directions, their deflector shields rubbing, forks of blue lightning dancing between their hulls. Han swerved away from a space yacht, bounced the Falcon off a particle shield, slipped between two gallifrey transports, then shot out the bottom of the traffic band. Pilots below began to respond to Rogue Squadron's emergency warnings, and a series of gaps opened ahead of the sweet surprise. Leia reached out with the Force to see how many survivors there were. She felt a wave of fear that convinced her plan had not been lying about his hostages, and also a feral stirring, a strange sense of hungry agitation unlike anything she had ever experienced. Han, in a minute... Below, a trio of X-Wings were struggling to align themselves with the Sweet Surprise's center of gravity. Leia glimpsed the freighter's belly and saw where the third mine had struck. A plume of cargo and vapor streamed from the hole. The three X-Wings finally arranged themselves and advanced at berthing speed, their laser cannons blasting a docking breach in the ship's hull. The maneuver was desperate but effective. Standard military protocol for entering out-of-control craft. Inside, the last pilot would seal the breach with his shields. The other two would close their vac suits and do what could be done. The feral stirring faded, just like the stirring aboard the nebula chaser that Jaina and Mara had described. Leia opened a scrambled channel to Rogue Squadron. Colonels Selchu and Darklighter, this is Leia Solo. Your men will find more than smugglers on board. There may be a voxen. Han looked over wide-eyed, but she ignored him and waited. Copy, Gavin said. Voxen? Yuzhan Vong monsters. Jedi killers, Leia explained. Stay away from anything that looks like an eight-legged reptile. Far away. These things spit acid and screech blast waves. Maybe they do worse. 
I'll keep that in mind. Darklighter out. Leia looked to Han. He went in himself? First one, Han confirmed. Han and Leia spent a nervous quarter hour following the surprise into an unstable orbit around Coruscant. Gavin was not only Jaina's commanding officer in Rogue Squadron, he was also a good friend of Han and Leia and the cousin of Biggs Darklighter, who had died helping Luke destroy the first Death Star at the Battle of Yavin. Both Solos were afraid of losing him to an accident or one of the Voxen, but trying to grab the freighter with the Falcon's tractor beam would only drag them out of control. They could do nothing but sit by while someone else performed the heroics. Leia could tell by Han's white knuckles that he found their helplessness even more frustrating than she did. As they waited, the freighter tumbled through the last traffic band and swung into an erratic polar orbit. The PDF agreed to deactivate the appropriate sectors of the mine shell as the sweet surprise passed through, but the ship's trajectory would decay in forty-two minutes. With Orbital Control's rescue tractors busy cleaning up collisions the freighter had caused trying to escape, there would be no choice except to destroy the surprise before it crashed into Coruscant. The refugees would have to be evacuated via civilian rescue or perish with the ship. Gavin reached the backup controls in engineering and began to fire the surprise's attitude thrusters. Orbital Control called for evacuation help and received a reply from a bulk cruiser with room for a thousand passengers. The cruiser, a sleek fast hauler named Steady Lady, appeared behind the Falcon and began to maneuver its five hundred meter body into position over the topside rescue hatch. Han dropped behind the sweet surprise's stern, clearly galled at having to sit back and wait for others. Leia reached out with the force again. The passengers were near the top of the freighter, moving toward the center in a large mass. She did not sense the Voxen, but that meant nothing. Jaina and Mara had not felt Numerar's killer after the initial stirring. By the time the steady lady began to descend toward the escape hatch, the sweet surprise was above Coruscant's south pole. The Navi computer showed thirty-three minutes to orbital decay. Barely time, Leia hoped to transfer a thousand frightened passengers. Gavin Darklighter's voice came over the comm. Leia, how'd you say to kill these things? Things? Leia echoed. Four, Gavin confirmed. Han groaned. About a meter high, four long, Gavin continued, not attacking but between us and the airlock. Han opened a separate channel to the steady lady. Hold still a minute, lady. Not waiting for a reply, he eased the falcon up under the larger ship's belly and started forward. We've got to take care of a small problem. Leia did not hear what the lady's pilot shrieked back. She was busy on the other channel. Gavin, sit tight. We'll clear them for you. Clear them? The reply came. How? Leia looked to Han. Han shrugged. We'll think of something, he mouthed. Leia shot her husband to scowl, but said, We have a plan. The falcon slid over the sweet surprise's mangled stern and shot down the narrowing cleft between the big freighters, orange tongues of rocket fire licking all around as the steady lady fired her braking thrusters. A loud clunk sounded from the roof, and the long-range displays went to static. Hun barely looked up. He had lost the sensor dish so many times he now carried a spare. It could be plugged into the new breakaway sockets in minutes. Leia released her crash webbing, grabbed her lightsaber, and turned to go. Hold on, Han said. He was struggling to keep the Falcon from becoming a Durasteel sandwich. Where are you? The docking hatch. Too dangerous. Han actually looked away from the viewport. You're staying here. If you like... Leia had to remind herself that Han's protectiveness was a good thing, a stage in the healing process. You can lure the Voxen out with the Force, and I can scrape off the cannon mounts. She gestured ahead. The gap between the Lady and Sweet Surprise could not have been much wider than the Falcon itself. Han cringed. Use the emergency hatch in the aft freight lift, he said. When you draw them out, stay on this side of the airlock. Whatever you say, dear. 
Leia was already halfway down the access tunnel. She collected the Nogri from the crew deck and went aft. Adarak removed the floor of the freight lift. Miwal prepared the emergency docking hatch, and Leia used the intercom to guide Han into place. The space was narrow, and they had to tip the Falcon up against the steady lady to slip the cofferdam over the Sweet Surprise's escape hatch. Leia could feel the voxen below. Four killers thirsty for her blood. Hatterack equalized the pressures. A clunk echoed up through the hull. No need to draw them out. They were coming. Leia spun toward the inner hatch, thumbed her lightsaber active. Let's go! A wave of excitement rippled through the force. A heavy body slammed into the still-sealed hatch on the Falcon's end of the cofferdam. Adarak and Miwal stopped and reached for their blasters. Come on, Leia ordered. She reached the hatch, hit the slap pad, heard the seal break, and exhaled in relief. Had the Voxen triggered the emergency hatch first, a decompression safety would have prevented hers from opening. Leia led Adarak and Miwal into the access corridor, then sealed the hold and waited. The emergency hatch did not open. Leia? Han called over the intercom. How's it going? It's not. They haven't opened the emergency hatch. Not a problem. The hatch slid open to reveal a passage full of scaly black legs and wary yellow eyes. One creature extended its neck to peer into the empty hold, then withdrew and remained inside the airlock. Well, Han called, they smell a trap. Han was silent for a moment, then said, Our side is airtight. I could pull away now. Leia stood on her toes and tried to see how many Voxen were in the cofferdam, but her angle was hopeless. No good, I need to draw them out. Draw them out how? The disapproval in Han's voice could not be missed. I'm coming back there. Stay put. Leia palmed the hatch open and stepped through. Someone has to fly. Han yelled something over the intercom. But the Voxen were suddenly boiling out of the cofferdam, scales rattling and claws squealing. Leia brought her lightsaber around and stood fast. Stood fast for about two seconds, until the third set of yellow eyes came over the rim and looked in her direction. She decided the fourth Voxen could not be far behind and used the force to spring back through the hatchway. Adarak and Miwal poured blaster fire through the door, and the lead Voxen only three meters away, exploded into a cloud of acid vapor. Its blood reeked like smoke and ammonia. Leia's eyes flooded with tears. She started to call the Nogri back. Bad mistake. Her lungs erupted in acid agony. The second Voxen leapt over the first, screeching. An invisible wall slammed into Leia, and her ears rang with pain. Adarak and Miwal collapsed in front of her. Leia pressed herself to the wall and reached out with the force, depressed the slap pad. The Voxen opened its mouth again, this time burping out a brown stream. The mucus splatted against the closing hatch, but a few drops shot past and splashed the unconscious Nogri. Counting them lucky, Leia hit the lock, then cursed as the crush safety prevented the door from sealing. A round reptilian foot protruded from under the hatch, gouging at the floor. She brought her lightsaber down. The blade droned, cutting through something hard as durasteel. A yowl came from the hold, and the voxen stuck its muzzle under the door. Lay hit the crush safety override, then hoping one of the ship's three droid brains would not, for a change, challenge the veracity of the command, she hit it again. The door hesitated an instant, then crunched shut on the voxen's muzzle. Another yowl, more muffled. A caustic odor, worse than before. Six inches of scaly snout in a pool of purplish blood. Leia grew queasy, lightheaded. Her lungs burned down to her knees. She glanced up. The other two Voxen were a meter away, staring at her through the hatch viewport. They opened their mouths, and a sound like a meteor strike rang through the durasteel. She stumbled back. Fell. Leia, what's happening back there? Han shouted. Answer me. We've got... The rest was lost to coughing. Leia? 
You don't sound so. No time. Leia staggered up, vision darkening, head spinning. Han just... It was hard to tell. She might have made it as far as go. Chapter 5 Mara looked away as the hologram shifted, zooming in on the flash-frozen bodies tumbling out of the nebula chaser's breached hull. At the time, she and Jaina had been too busy recovering the escape pod to notice the Yuzhan Vong attack, but she had seen the hologram too many times to want to view it again. In the privacy of her apartment on Eclipse, she had made R2-D2 play it repeatedly, trying to see some way she could have saved the refugees. After a hundred times, she had given up, convinced she could have done nothing differently, and little comforted by the knowledge. Nomanor's smug voice, captured by the surveillance equipment in the Bilbringi interrogation chamber, sounded from R2-D2's speakers. Mara focused on the others in the dank chamber, a hangar storeroom on the free-drifting supply base Sala Station, one of a thousand anonymous rendezvous points where Jedi could meet and be gone before the Peace Brigade learned of their presence. A flash of hatred showed in Kip Duron's cold eyes. Then he clenched his still boyish jaw and pushed his anger down into the dark pit where he stowed such emotions. The reaction of Saba Sebatine was more difficult to read, perhaps because Mara did not know what signaled anger in the scaly face of a Barabel. With huge dark eyes, Heavy brow folds and a thin-lipped muzzle, Saba's reptilian features betrayed nothing. Luke allowed the hologram to play itself out. By the time R2-D2's projector shut down, Kip's outrage was a tangible thing in the Force, filling the room with a crackling energy that seemed in danger of blasting the doors off their quiet meeting place. Saba's feelings, if she had any, remained secret. Mara might have been able to probe them by reaching out with the Force, but knew how a Barabel would react to such an intrusion. Kip Duron surprised no one by speaking before Luke. That wasn't my fault. He pointed at R2-D2, as though the droid had been the one threatening the refugee fleet. I'm not responsible for what the Yuzhan Vong do. Who said you were? Luke responded mildly. But you were running supplies to the new Plimto resistance. Kip nodded reluctantly. I won't apologize. If there were Jedi doing the same thing on every Kip, no one's asking you to apologize. Luke passed a data card to the younger Jedi. We only came to give you our data on the Voxen and discuss how the Jedi should react to the Yuzhan Vong threat. Ignore it. Kip pocketed the data card and turned to go. Thanks for the warning. Kip, we're talking about a million people, Mara said. The Jedi can't just ignore them. Kip paused at the door but did not turn around. What else can we do? We'd be fools to attack. They'd be waiting to wipe us out. If we surrender... Forget it, I won't surrender. Neither will I, Luke said. But now is not the time to keep harassing them. Our enemies in the Senate will use this. I don't care about the Senate, Kip replied, and the dozen are not harassing the enemy, Master Skywalker. We're killing them. More Jedi should be doing the same. Mara was not sure whether the flash of irritation she felt was her own or her husband's. Luke was not all that fond of being called master in the first place, and he particularly loathed it when it was used in a spirit of scorn. Kip palmed a touchpad on the wall. The storeroom door slid open, much to the surprise of the eleven flight-suited pilots trying to eavesdrop on the other side. Well? Kip stood at the door, glaring. Are we leaving or not? The pilots scattered across the hangar running for the brand-new XJ-3 X-Wings, the latest and most lethal version of the venerable Starfighter, scattered at the landing bay entrance. Before Kip could follow, Mara stepped to the door and caught him by the arm. Kip, 
No one's saying you're wrong, but it's time for the Jedi to act in concert, she said. The Yuzhan Vong are smart. If we keep going our own ways, they'll kill us one by one. Kip nodded. I know that better than anyone. He had already lost an apprentice, Miko Reglia, to the enemy. He looked past Mara to Luke. When the rest of you are ready to fight, I'll be there. And when you are ready to join the rest of us, Luke replied, you know how to reach me. Once Kip passed out of earshot, Saba Sebatine came to stand in the door and spoke in a raspy voice. That one is trouble. Mara turned. So you do speak basic. She glanced at C-3PO. I was beginning to think we would have to ask 3PO to translate. Forgive this one. Saba broke into a fit of amused sissing, then struggled to add, Jedi Elisa taught her the wisdom of waiting. Elisa was a native of Coruscant, born soon after Palpatine's death, and untainted by the poisons that had corrupted so many who came before her. Now a grown woman, she was one of Luke's most resourceful and trusted Jedi Knights, often living for years at a time in the wildest parts of galaxy, in service to the Jedi cause. She had discovered Saba while on a long-term spying mission to Barab One, but the circumstances of her cover had prevented her from sending the Barabel to Yavin Four to train with other Jedi students. Instead, she had taken Saba as her own apprentice teaching her what she could of the Force before being chased off the planet by a hunting pack, trying to import the human-hating doctrine of Nola Tarkona's Ryloth-based Diversity Alliance. When her sissing fit finally passed, Saba rasped something in her own language that C-3PO dutifully translated as, She also taught this one the wisdom of listening quietly. Yes, Elissa has proven herself an expert in that regard many times over. Luke laughed, joining the pair at the door. I should have known that any Jedi of hers would be full of surprises. This one is glad her silence did not offend you, Saba said. The taste of Kip Duron was not pleasing to her. How does one like him earn a new squadron of X-Wings? There are some in the military who admire his courage, misplaced as it is, Luke said. He caught Mara's eye and directed it to the motley assortment of Y-wings, headhunters, and howl runners, resting in a neat line beside Saba's plasma-scored blast boat. Having fought her way in from the outer rim only recently, Saba was not as well known as Kip Duran, or as well equipped, but her habit of keeping a low profile had attracted an entire squadron of like-minded Jedi pilots. The reputation of your squadron is also admired by those in a position to know. Mara said. I'm sure the same officers who supply Kip would happily lose a shipment in your direction. Saba's slit pupils widened almost into diamonds. The Wild Knights would never dishonor the Jedi by taking such a shipment. Mara was taken aback by the disapproval in Saba's voice, but Luke only smiled and laid a hand, his real one, on her scaly shoulder. C-3PO had warned them that such intimacies with the Barabel had been known to result in the loss of the hand, but somehow Luke's familiarity drew only an accepting curl of Saba's thick tail. In your hands, such a gift would do the Jedi no dishonor, Luke said. But I'm glad to know you're concerned. Have you given any thought to Sabong La's threat against the refugees? And how we will be hurt if the Senate believes us insensitive to so many deaths? Saba looked away. The path is not clear. She opened her mouth as though to continue, but rippled her scales and simply stopped. Luke and Mara waited for her to continue, then shared a moment of bewilderment and reached out around them with the Force. Mara felt nothing unusual, and she could tell by Luke's puzzled reaction that he did not either. Saba? Luke asked. The bear bell turned back to Luke. 
You did not feel that. No, Mara said. She could sense that Saba wasn't easy with her, especially after she had suggested something the Barabel considered less than honorable. But she also knew that standing quietly by would do nothing to allay that uneasiness. And neither did Luke. Strange. Saba looked around for a moment, then flipped her tail in the reptilian equivalent of a shrug. Master Skywalker, this one knows the Senate disapproves of us, and others like us. But when are cowards not threatened by the brave? She glanced across the hangar to her pilots, who all stood patiently beside their battle-scarred craft. The Jedi are few, and the Yuzhan Vong many. Yet look at the forces they direct against us. Boxen, blockades, whole hunting fleets. We are doing something they fear, and the Force tells this one she must continue. Mara started to suggest that they would be more effective if they all worked together, but sensed a sudden acceptance in Luke and remained quiet. The Barabell are hunters, Luke said to Saba, and hunters work best in small packs. Saba rewarded him with a crooked grin. Truly, Master Skywalker is as wise as Jedi Elissa claims. Perhaps he would honor this one with a great favor? Luke did not hesitate. Of course. She turned to Mara. And you? This will be a burden on you as well, and you have the new hatchling in your nest. Mara thought of Ben, and instantly felt him aboard the shadow with Jaina and Danny, sleeping contentedly in the arms of one of the two young women. Mara would never do anything to jeopardize her baby's well-being, but she sensed the inherent trust Luke felt for this Jedi they had never met and Mara's trust in him was such that there could be no doubt of her answer. Please, we Jedi must do what we can for each other, Mara said, and we have plenty of help on Eclipse. Good. You may have need of it, Saba said, not smiling. She turned to C-3PO and rasped something in her own language. Oh, my! The droid's photoreceptors lit an alarm. Truly? Saba snarled something back. It's only an expression, C-3PO said, scurrying toward Saba's blast boat. I wasn't calling you a liar. Luke and Mara exchanged curious glances, and Mara realized they also had a favor to ask of Saba. She was about to suggest this, but Luke, as usual, knew what she was thinking almost before she did. Saba, perhaps the Wild Knights would also do us a great service, Luke asked. It would mean carrying a fair amount of equipment into battle. And a scientist, Mara added. It could mean the war, especially if you know where to find a Yamisk war coordinator. Mara was not sure Saba heard them. The barrel bell was looking somewhere beyond their shoulders, brow folds creased deeper than ever. Master Skywalker, do you know where Elissa is? Mara felt the growing apprehension that accompanied Luke's answer. She's still monitoring the situation on Corellia for us. Saba's gaze returned to Luke. Do you think she could be in danger? And now Mara had a sinking feeling. As much as Luke cared for all of the Academy's former students— it had been impossible to spend enough time with each one to develop the kind of bond that would connect them closely through the Force. But Elissa had spent years training Saba one-on-one, -on -one, in a very stressful environment. It was not surprising that their bond would be an especially close one, and strong enough to inform Saba of her master's danger. It's always impossible to say what Thracken Solo and his ilk will do next. Mara said. But we didn't expect Elissa's mission to be dangerous. The Corellians don't even know she's there. Perhaps they have found out, Saba said. Or perhaps 
It is something else. But Elisa is frightened. Frightened? Luke asked. He looked at Mara. That doesn't sound like Elisa. Saba shook her head. No, it does not. We will investigate once we have loaded your scientist and the equipment. There will be no trouble finding a Yamask. They come to us. Thank you, Luke said. I'll have Danny start the transfer. Luke activated his comlink and informed Danny, who sounded happy, perhaps ecstatic was a better word, to be flying with Saba Sabatine instead of Kip Duran. The shadow's cargo ramp descended. Then Danny and the pilots from Saba's squadron began to transfer equipment. In the meantime, C-3PO returned with three burly barabels. Though a little larger than Saba, all three had the purple-green scales of young adults. There were also lightsabers hanging from their belts. If you please, Master Skywalker, we were on our way to Yavin 4 when the war blocked us. Saba said, Please take these young Jedi knights and show them the true path to becoming a Jedi. There remains too much of the hunter in this one to teach them well. Luke and Mara exchanged startled looks. Then Mara asked, Are these your children, Saba? They are hatchmates, but only the male is of me. Saba said, The females share a mother. One also shares a father with my own son. But, of course, it is impossible to say which. The affiliations were horribly lost on the two humans, but Mara suspected they would figure it out in time. We'll care for them as though they were our own. Saba's eyes widened. They are old enough to find their own food. Just give them a territory. Any sub-basement or scrub lot will do. Now it was Mara's turn to be shocked. This is going to be interesting. The slight smile that came to Luke's lips suggested he had perceived the sense of her thoughts. Then Saba let out a chain of long hisses. Mara mistook the sound for the Barabel's sissing laughter, until Saba cried out in grief and dropped into a fighting crouch. Her needle-like teeth folded down into view, and she let out a long, mournful growl. Mara and Luke stepped away in unison, their hands instinctively dropping toward their lightsabers. C-3PO rasped at her and Barabel. She snarled something in reply, then dropped to all fours and crouched low. The other Barabels reacted to their master's distress, also dropping to all fours and adding their own raspy voices to the rumble, and they all began to scratch at the durasteel floor. Mara and Luke exchanged startled glances. Then the forest grew heavy with anger and disbelief. Mara knelt beside Saba and, ignoring C-3PO's admonition not to touch a strange barabel, laid a hand on the Jedi's back. Saba, what's wrong? The barabel's head turned slowly toward Mara, her reptilian pupils narrowed to slits, her fangs wet with saliva. Elissa, she rasped. Something caught her. Something? Luke asked. Saba beat her tail against the ground, prompting C-3PO to explain unnecessarily that tail-banging was a typical reptilian expression of rage. This one doesn't know, the Barabel said. But she is gone. Elissa is no more. Mara and Luke glanced across her back, each knowing without speaking what the other was thinking. Voxen Chapter 6 With a hologram of the strategic situation lighting the overhead darkness and dozens of tactical displays hovering in the pit below, the New Republic Defense Force Fleet Command Room looked more like a galaxarium than a council chamber. The overhead display depicted the barest outlines of the galaxy, a broad ribbon of crimson marking the Yuzhan Vong invasion route. In just two years, the aliens had cut a swath from the Tingle Arm almost to Bothan space, 
with three distinct salients punching through the inner rim at Fondor and Duro. A third offshoot, the one threatening Bilbringi, had not quite reached the inner rim, but Leia knew it soon would. The invaders were destroying ships faster than the New Republic could build them, and even Bilbringi did not warrant a major defense. She wondered how much importance Nermak, the New Republic Military Oversight Committee, would place on the lives of the Talfalian refugees. She wondered how much they could afford to. Less than happy to find herself once again negotiating Coruscant's twisted corridors of power, Leia leaned on her son's arm and advanced along the mezzanine. Though it had been more than a day since she was knocked unconscious by the Voxen's noxious blood, she still felt the need of support when she moved, and considered herself lucky. The Nogri, who had taken the brunt of the attacks, remained in back to tanks with severe ear and lung damage. This is encouraging, Jason said. He had come to stay with her while Han returned to Eclipse with the Voxen bodies. If they'll let us in here, our reputation in the Senate can't be all that bad. Don't read too much into this, Leia said. There is a reason behind the reason Borsk Felia does anything. Listen with your eyes, Jason. See with your ears. As they advanced, Leia barely glanced at the tactical displays below the mezzanine. There was a less elaborate situation room on Eclipse, kept up to date by a secret feed from a friendly command officer, so she knew the holograms would show several dozen fleets orbiting on station, as well as an alarming number of pitched space battles. The situation had been much the same for nearly a year, with the Yuzhan Vong steadily widening their swath of occupied territory while their main advance remained stalled in the Corellian sector. Leia and Jason passed a hologram depicting the frantic work at the Bilbringi shipyards. Then a large lift rose into view from behind a minor engagement near Vortex. Borsk Felia himself was on the lift, his feral Botham features twisted into a snarl of greeting creamy fur rippling with what Leia had long ago learned to recognize as his species' way of cringing. Princess Leia, you honor us. You could not find room on the agenda for a former chief of state to address the Senate in body? Leia demanded. With the war going badly, Felia's support was slipping, and she stood to win more allies than she lost by treating him sharply. Surely the war isn't going that poorly. Thalia's insincere smile remained frozen on his face. It's nice to see you recovered so soon from your fray with the Jedi killers. He opened the gate himself, a sure sign of how tenuous his power had become. We can certainly put you on the agenda if you wish, but Nurmok will consider your request more carefully in closed session. Please, come aboard. Leia released Jason's arm and led the way onto the lift. They descended directly onto the committee's conferencing balcony, and Leia went straight to the speaker's rostrum. Several tiers of senators were seated in a semicircle at the opposite end. Thank you for coming, Felia said, joining her. And welcome to your Jedi companion as well. Jason is here as my bodyguard, Leia said, both explaining her son's presence and sidestepping any question of why the Jedi had not sent a higher-ranking member. This has nothing to do with the Jedi. It's entirely a Selkor matter. Of course, Felia said agreeably. We have studied your report. This is certainly worthy of Nurmok's attention. Wary of the Bothan's unexpected support, Leia asked, And? And, unfortunately, this does concern the Jedi. A honeyed female voice said, are they not the reason the Yuzhan Vong are holding Talfalian hostages at all? Leia turned to see a slender woman, with long jet-black hair rising from her seat. A sultry young senator from the shipbuilding world of Kuat, Vicky Shesh had parlayed her world's importance to the war effort into a position on the advisory council and several coveted bottom-tier seats on the Senate's most powerful oversight committees. She had also proven an adept deal-maker, who traded loyalties with a facility that awed Bothans, and who did not hesitate to use her position for personal gain. 
less than a year ago. As the administrating senator of the Senate Select Committee for Refugees, Selkor, Shash had not hesitated to strike a deal for her personal gain, by diverting vital supplies from the refugee camps on Duro. Leia had been unable to marshal sufficient proof to have the woman removed from the Senate, but she had created enough of a stink to have her rotated off the committee. How the unscrupulous senator had managed to win an influential and highly secret posting on Nurmak was a mystery. But the Kuwati's opening salvo made clear that Leia had made a powerful enemy for both herself and the Jedi. Drawing on the Force for strength and patience, Leia met the senator's gaze evenly. The Yuzhan Vong have threatened to destroy the convoy unless the Jedi surrender. Yes. Were the Jedi to do so, I have no doubt the Yuzhan Vong's next demand would be the surrender of Kuat drive yards. It has never been the New Republic's policy to yield to coercion, Thalia said, deftly cutting off the argument before it started. The question is, what can we do without surrendering? I submit there is nothing we can do. Shesh looked to Thalia. If we can see the Corellian sector? The Bothan used a remote to send the command, and the hollow rotated to display the appropriate sector. The Corellian system was surrounded by a shell of New Republic frigates, the ones on the Duro side glowing slightly brighter to show they were lightly engaged against a wall of enemy probe ships facing them. Talfalio was encircled by a swarm of Yuzhan Vong Corvette analog patrol craft with a single cruiser centrally positioned to provide support. But it was the Jumus system that was most alarming. Just a short hyperspace jump from either Corellia or Talfalio, it was now home to much of the fleet that had captured Duro. As you can see, the Yuzhan Vong are hoping we'll try to break their blockade. Shesh pointed to the all-too-small cluster of capital ships orbiting Corellia. The moment we move, they'll sweep in and grab the prize. Not if we come the back way, Jason said. He pointed above their heads, tracing a route along the edge of the deep core into the back of the sector. If we sneak three Star Destroyers along here, we can wipe out their blockade and be gone with the convoy before they can react. Now that would teach them to take hostages. Farm Gia a gray-bearded senator from Tapani Sector said, Where can we find the Star Destroyers? Yes, where do we find three expendable Star Destroyers? Shesh echoed, quick to turn Gia's support on its head. Or do you suggest sacrificing yet another world to Jedi ineptitude? A pair of senators began to speak at the same time realized they were on opposite sides of the issues, and immediately tried to talk over each other. Thalia called for order, only to be shouted down by senators from the anti-Jedi coalition, who were in turn shouted down by Gia's supporters. Soon all the senators on the balcony were bellowing at once. Jason looked over at Leia and shook his head in dismay. More accustomed to the rancorous nature of Republican politics, Leia occupied herself with counting heads and quickly realized the committee was split almost down the center. She borrowed Jason's lightsaber. She had left her own behind, hoping to emphasize that she was appearing on Selkor's behalf and not as a Jedi. Then turned to Felia. If I may. She nearly had to shout to make herself heard. The Bothan nodded and stepped back. By all means. Leia ignited the blade, its brilliance and distinctive snap hiss bringing the tumult to an instant silence. Suppressing a smile at this reminder of the continuing power of the Jedi, she thumbed the blade off. Please forgive the theatrics. Leia returned the weapon to her son. In appearing before you, it was not my intention to cause such discord in Nurmok. That's the last thing the Republic needs. Perhaps the committee should simply vote on Jason's suggestion and be done with it. Vote now? Shesha's eyes narrowed. 
so you and your son can use your Jedi mind tricks? Leia forced a tolerant smile. Those tricks work only on the weak of will, which I can assure you no one on this committee is. The joke drew a tension-draining laugh from both camps, and Gia mocked. Unless you're afraid of losing, Senator Shesh. It would not be I who lose, Senator Gia. It would be the New Republic, Shesh said. But let us vote by all means. Thalia went to his dais and authorized the vote, and the balcony's droid brain announced the results almost before the last senator had keyed his voting pad. As Leia had expected, the resolution passed with a bare two-vote majority, not enough to authorize the action without the full Senate's approval, but enough for failure to use his authority under the Military Secrets Act to bypass the security risk of a full Senate vote and declare the necessary majority. Given the deference he had shown Leia earlier, she expected him to do just that. Uneasy at finding herself in debt to a Botham, she turned to Felia. Will you declare the majority, Chief Felia? This is your chance to save a million lives. Felia's fur rippled again, betraying just how weak his position as Chief of State had become. A chance to save a million? Or lose billions? What? Leia was astonished at the ire in her own voice. Perhaps it was because of her fatigue, or perhaps because of her surprise at having miscalculated so badly. But she found herself struggling to hold back a string of invectives on the tip of her tongue. Chief Thalia, the plan is a sound one. Thalia raised a placating hand. And I haven't said no. But you must know what the loss of three Star Destroyers would mean to us. We could lose another dozen planets. He stroked the creamy tufts on his cheek, then spoke in a deliberately thoughtful voice. I will ask the military for a study. A study? Jason burst out. The convoy will be drifting slag by the time they finish. I'm sure General Bell Iblis will expedite matters, Philia said evenly. In the meantime, we'll stall. Stall. In her weakened state, Leia did not trust herself to keep a civil tone. She knew Garm Bel Iblis, who, like Wedge Antilles, had been reactivated at the outbreak of the war, would move as quickly as possible, but even he could push the plotting command bureaucracy along only so fast, and there was no guarantee that he would reach the conclusion she hoped for. How can you stall the Yuzhan Vong? Thalia flashed a snarl she was sure he meant as reassuring. We'll ask Savongla for an envoy to discuss the matter. An envoy? Gia shouted the question. It will look like we're asking for terms. Thalia's ears pricked mischievously forward. Precisely, Senator. And it will buy time. The Bothan was quick to look back to Leia. But rest assured, Princess... Whatever General Bell Iblis's conclusion, we shall tell the envoy only this, that Yuzhan Vong threats merely strengthen the ties between the New Republic and her Jedi. Gia actually grinned. A point that will be underscored when we rescue the hostages. Or even if we must let them die, Shesh added. She nodded her approval. I believe we have a consensus— Chief Thalia. The consensus only angered Leia more, for she had worked with Borsk Thalia long enough to know that his plans served only himself. Whatever he intended to say to the Yuzhan Vong, she felt sure that he would not allow the Jedi to stand in the way of making an accommodation that would save his own position. What you have, Senators, she said icily, is a consensus of fools. Mother? Leia felt Jason reach out to her through the Force, laving her with soothing emotions, and she realized how young he really was. The New Republic Senate was far from the unblemished body he imagined, and the good-faith compromises described in C-3PO's civics lessons were all too rare. The Senate was a power-grubbing club of people 
who too often saw their duty in terms of their own interests, who measured their success by how long they held office, and it made Leia ashamed to think she had played such a prominent role in its founding. She spun on her heel and would have stepped into the lift's gate, perhaps even flipped over it, if not for a gentle telekinetic tug from her son. To cover for herself, she reached for the gate and said, I have wasted all the time I care to with Nermak. Borsk Felia stepped in front of her. You really have no reason to be upset, Princess. General Bel Iblis's integrity is beyond question. It is not Garm's integrity I question, Chief. Leia used the force to open the gate behind Felia, then brushed him aside and stepped onto the lift. Jason came to her side, one hand ready to catch her at the first sign of weakness. When they reached the mezzanine and started for the exit, he asked, Was that wise? We have enough enemies in the Senate. Jason, I'm done with the Senate. Again. As Leia spoke, an unexpected calmness came to her. She began to feel stronger and less weary, more at harmony with herself, and she knew her words had been more than the usual frustration with politicians. She had lost control with failure, not because she was weak and tired, though she was, but because she no longer belonged in the halls of power, no longer believed in the process that placed selfish bureaucrats in positions of power over those they were sworn to serve. The force was guiding her, telling her the new republic had changed, the galaxy had changed. Most of all, she had changed. She had stepped onto a new path, and it was time that she realized it and stopped trying to follow the old one. Leia took Jason's arm and, in a more peaceful voice, said, I'll never appear before them or their committees again. Jason remained silent, but his distress and concern were as thick in the force as the air over a Dagobah swamp. Leia wrapped an arm around his waist and, surprised as always at how far her nineteen-year-old son now towered above her, pulled him close. Jason, sometimes it can be dangerous to assume the best about people, she said quietly. Borsk is our worst enemy in the Senate, and he just proved it. He did? They left the committee room and started down the familiar corridor. Think, Leia said. The reason behind the reason. Why would Borsk want to talk to a Yuzhan Vong envoy? What can he bargain with? Jason walked a few silent steps, then stopped when the answer finally struck him. Us. Chapter 7 Blood still streaming from a network of hastily inflicted slashes, Nomanor presented himself to the sentry outside Sabong La's private warren, aboard the Sunalak. I have been summoned. Nomanor struggled to mask his excitement, for the Warmaster rarely called subordinates to his private refuge, and never during the sleep cycle. I was told not to concern myself with appearance. The sentry nodded curtly and pressed a palm to the receptor pores in the door valve. The portal took a moment to recognize the warrior's scent, then puckered open to reveal a small contemplation chamber lit softly by a bioluminescent wall lichen. Savong La sat on the far side of the room, absorbed in conversation with the Master Villip. Numanor stomped a foot politely, then waited for permission to enter. Virgir came out from behind a table and waved him over. He wants you to see this. Irritated to find his rifle there, Nom Anor rounded the table to look over the War Master's shoulder. The villa had assumed the visage of a human female with high cheeks and sharp features. Nom Anor's annoyance immediately vanished, for he knew the woman well. He had been the one who turned her to the Yuzhan Vong cause. See, you have put the Vornskers I sent to good use, Vicky Shash was saying. Four Jedi have died already. Your Voxen are proving most effective. Voxen? How do you know their names? 
Shesha's eyes widened slightly, though subtly enough that the War Master might not have noticed her surprise. That's what the Jedi call them. I don't know how they came by the name. They're becoming very tight-lipped about the matter. Are they? Savongla turned thoughtful. Interesting. Rajir astonished Nomanor by touching the War Master's arm. Your agent is here. Savongla did not strike her or chastise her in any manner. He merely told Shesh to wait and turned to his agent, as Virgir had so dismissively called Nomanor, and studied the bloodstains seeping through his web-silk tunic. My summons interrupted your devotions. His tone was apologetic and sincere. Perhaps something can be done about that. Savongla surprised Nomanor yet again by rising and fetching, himself, a thorn seat from the far corner. He put it in front of Shesha's villip and motioned his guest to sit. The lack of a blood crust suggested the chair's last feeding had been less than sating, but it would have been an insult to hesitate. Nomanor sat down and, as the hungry thorns sank into his back and buttocks, consoled himself with the thought that the War Master believed he enjoyed such indulgences. I am honored. Savong La was already returning to the villa. Vicky, I have an old friend of yours here. Really? Shesh replied. She would not have seen Nom Anor enter the room. Her villa would be of the type linked directly to the War Master and able to relay only his image and words. Who's there? I am certain you recall Pedrick Cuff. Savongla said, using the alias by which Shesh knew no Manor. The smile that came to the villip's lips was less than sincere, for Vicky had seized the first opportunity to bypass no Manor and offer her services directly to the War Master. What a delight! Vicky, repeat what happened today. Savongla gave no Manor no chance to reply to her greeting. Pedrick Cuff needs to hear all. Vicky obediently recounted what had happened in the committee room earlier, emphasizing Jason's plan to ambush the Talfalio blockade. She lingered a little too long on how cleverly she had manipulated Borsk failure into asking for a military study, buying the Yuzhan Vong time to prepare a counter-ambush. You may have as much as two weeks, Shesh finished. I will keep you informed. You did well, Savongla said, though no Manor knew they already had a fleet lying in wait for just such a purpose. But tell Pedrick Cuff about the envoy, Vicky. If she understood that Savongla was slighting her by consistently speaking only half her name, Vicky Shesh showed no sign. There was some concern about the time required for a study but I persuaded Borsk to ask for an envoy. Her villip smiled. He has no real interest in talking to you, but I convinced him the request might save the refugees long enough for the military to complete its study. Very clever, Savongla said. You buy us time, but make them think they are the ones who stall. You are truly gifted, Vicky. On the day of our victory, your reward will be beyond imagining. Is there anything you need now? Only the usual funds, she replied. You will have them and more, the War Master promised, through the customary channels. Savongla broke the connection by stroking the villip, then turned to Nomanor as the creature reverted into an inert blob. That one angers me, he growled. She takes me for a fool. Humans often cast themselves in the best light, Nomanor said, unsure whether the War Master's displeasure extended to him as Shesh's recruiter. They seem unable to see the shadows they also cast. A pity for you, then, Nomanor, Savangla said. Nomanor sat forward stifling a cry as the chair's thorns tore free of his back. Me, War Master? 
Savong La nodded. Tell me, do you believe what she says about the boffin? That he has no interest in talking to us? No more than I believe she persuaded him to ask for an envoy. No Manor said, Borsk Felia wants to talk, and Vicky Shesh fears he has something to make us listen. She hopes to protect her own position. Our thinking is the same on this, no Manor, the Warmaster said. All the more reason I must command you to return to the infidels. Him? Virgir asked. Numanor glared fire at the feathery pet. Who else? Perhaps you were thinking of yourself. Virgir lowered her arms. My objection praises you, Numanor. You have caused the New Republic too much damage. Borskferia could not talk to you if he wanted to. The Senate would vote him out of office. Truly? Savongwa smiled slyly then turned to Numanor and gestured at the thorn chair. Take that with you, my servant. Consider it a gift. Chapter 8 The door opened to an unfamiliar soughing sound, and Silgal's skin went dry. The Voxen were dead. The Millennium Falcon had pulled away from the sweet surprise, with its emergency hatch still open, and the aft hold exposed to cold space. It was true the creatures had sealed themselves into scale cocoons and survived the resulting decompression. They had even endured the vacuum, for a time, by dropping into deep hibernation. But the cold had killed them, eventually. Han had kept the hold in a sealed vacuum and near absolute zero the entire trip and by the time they arrived on Eclipse, the Voxen were frozen solid. She had probed their molecular structures with the Force and found every cell in their bodies burst. She had confirmed her findings via ultrasonic probe and thermal scan, then performed a dozen different bioscans on their space-frozen carcasses to search out any lingering sign of life. Just to be certain, she had done it all again, and only after confirming her results had she cut their claws out of the falcon's durasteel deck. They had to be dead. Still, Silgal was not taking chances. Not with creatures that spat flesh-eating acid and stunned their prey with sonic blasts. Creatures whose blood became a neurotoxin in most kinds of air, whose toe pads harbored a hundred deadly retroviruses. She was too fatigued to analyze the situation, too prone to mistakes lately to gamble with the lives of everyone on Eclipse. Silgal backed quietly out the door, then slipped the comm link from her pocket and raised it to her lips. A plaintive Wookiee groan rolled out of the room, and she grew aware of a strange heaviness in the force. With a start, she realized the sound she had heard was crying. Human crying. Silgal peered through the door and saw a line of young Jedi standing on the other side of the room, looking through a transperisteel observation panel into the frozen tissue locker. At one end of the group stood Anakin, tall, lanky, and broad-shouldered in the way of human males as they crossed from adolescence into adulthood, recognizable even from behind by his sandy-brown, tousled mane. Beside him, as always, stood Tahiri, small and svelte with short-cropped blonde hair feet customarily bare, her E.V. footwear in one hand and Anakin's arm in the other. The Wookiee groan had come from the opposite end of the line, where russet-furred Lobaka stood with Jaina Solo's slender form wrapped into his hairy arm. Next to them stood Zek and Tenel Ka. Zek, a wiry young man with shaggy black hair hanging over his collar. Tenel Ka, a tall and willowy beauty with rust-colored hair and an arm amputated just above the elbow. And, more or less in the center, was the one Silgal had heard crying, blond-haired Raynar Thule, standing alone with his fists pressed against the transperisteel, his shoulders rising and falling as he sobbed. Silgal remained outside, trying to decide whether collecting yet another tissue sample justified the intrusion. The young Jedi Knights were a close-knit group, 
having spent many of their formative years studying at Luke's Jedi Academy on Yavin 4. Together they had fought off Imperial kidnappers, dark Jedi, ruthless crime organizations, and more hazards than the Moon Calamari healer could name. Whatever was grieving them, it did not seem right to trespass on their gathering now. She started to back away, but her presence had not gone unnoticed. Tenel Ka turned and fixed a pair of red-rimmed eyes on her. "'Do not mind us,' she said. "'We are not here to disturb your work.' Feeling the companion's anguish through the force, but unsure of what to do about it, Silgal entered the room and went to the closet where she kept the cryosuit she would need to collect her samples. "'Someone else has died,' she asked, fearing the truth even as she surmised it. "'Lusa,' Anakin said, voice cracking. Lusa was one of their close friends from the Academy on Yavin 4, a nature-loving Chironian female. Anakin gestured vaguely toward the frozen carcasses in the tissue locker. A pack of voxen ran her down. We just heard over the subspace, Tahiri added. She was at home, just running through a meadow. She was supposed to be safe, Gina added finally pulling her face out of Lobaka's fur. Chiron is long way from the Yuzhan Vong. Silgal felt a stab of guilt. I am sorry to be so slow. I have learned much about these creatures, but nothing of use. Raynar mumbled a suggestion that she work harder. Out of respect for his grief, Silgal pretended not to hear, and began to fumble into her cryosuit. Lobaka was not so generous, groaning softly and admonishing the young Jedi for his rudeness. Raynar started to say something in reply, but his throat failed him and he turned back toward the tissue locker. Jaina stepped away from Lobaka and patted Raynar's arm, then turned to Silgal. Forgive Raynar, Silgal. He and Glusa were very close. Though Jaina's eyes were puffy from crying, Silgal could feel that the red came from anger. No one is angry at you. Jedi are dying, and the Senate blames us for losing the war. Sometimes I think we should just go off into the unknown regions and leave the New Republic to the Yuzhan Vong. I understand, Silgal said. Grief, especially young grief, had to have an outlet, or it would eat away the vessel. But what will we do when the Yuzhan Vong come for us there? Jaina's eyes hardened, but she nodded. I know, and I suppose there's no guarantee that Chiss would welcome us. Then I suppose we must find a way to defend this part of the galaxy. Silgal nearly fell as she thrust her leg into the cryosuit. If we can. Don't these creatures have a weakness? Tahiri asked. The Sand People say everyone has a weakness. Everyone except them. The Voxen have no weakness I have found, Silgal answered. As we suspected, they are part of this galaxy and part of the Yuzhan Vongs. But I have not gone far beyond that. There is so much that makes no sense. You are tired. Tenel Ka came over and held one of the suit's bulky arms. I will help you. Maybe she should rest. Anakin turned around, revealing eyes as red as Tenel Ka's. It's hard to think straight when you can't even stand. Silgal smiled at his concern. You're right, of course, but I cannot bring myself to sleep while others are dying. She pushed her arm through the second sleeve. I may as well work. Is there anything we can do? Tenel Ka asked. We have sentry duty in an hour, but you can watch, Silgal said. You can tell me how I keep contaminating these samples. Contaminating them? Tahiri asked. What do you mean? Their genetic codes always map the same, Silgal said. It's not the equipment. I have checked, so I must be contaminating the samples when I collect them. Tenel Ka exchanged glances with her friends then laid a hand on Silgal's arm to stop her from closing the suit. 
How many times have you tried? For, Silgal said. And they always map the same? Jaina asked. Exactly the same? Silgal nodded, struggling to see what the young Jedi were driving at. Even when Tekli gathers the samples. Tekli was her apprentice, a young Chadra Fawn no older than Jaina. We are making a systematic error somewhere. And what if you are not? Tenelka asked. A wave of weariness came over Silgal, and she shook her head. We are. No two genetic sequences are identical. There are always differences. Not always, Jaina said. Silgal frowned, then felt her skin brighten to a pale green. Clones? she gasped. They're cloning the Voxen. Why would they do that? Tenelka asked. Would it not make more sense to breed them? Perhaps. Silgal was suddenly wide awake, her thoughts flying at light speed. Unless they have only one. Anakin's eyes lit with excitement. Or perhaps it was determination. That would be a weakness, definitely. But these rocks and all came from the same shipment, Tenelka observed. Can we be sure that a pack from another shipment would not come from a different master? Silgal thought for a moment, going over all the different kinds of tests, both scientific and through the Force. She could run. She kept coming to the same conclusion. There is no way to be sure, she said, not from one set of samples. Then we need more samples. Anakin was already half out the door before he seemed to realize that Tahiri was the only one following. He scowled back at the others. We need them now. Chapter 9 The signal was scratchy, but clear enough to recognize a familiar name as the Corellian newscaster's sober voice filled Anakin's cockpit. Kuwati Senator Vicky Shesh said the New Republic will receive the envoy with cautious optimism. Anakin opened a channel to the rest of his small task force. Are you guys getting this? They were sitting on an asteroid on the outskirts of the Fraz system, powered down and quietly keeping tabs on inbound traffic. With Kip Duran supplying from here, it seemed a good place to look for the Voxen Silgal needed. The Yuzhan Vong are sending an envoy after all. Neg that calm clutter, little brother, Jaina ordered. Anakin was in command of the mission, but being a veteran rogue squadron pilot, Jaina was in charge of tactical aspects. As Luke had put it before allowing them to leave Eclipse, Anakin decided what to do. Jaina decided how. Stay passive. Let's not spray rays on idle chatter. Never know who might be listening. Anakin clicked an acknowledgment. Then Vicky Shesh's cloying voice replaced that of the newscaster. I'm the last to condone bargaining with murderers, but I do think we have something to talk about, she said. If we can make our foes understand that the New Republic has no control over the Jedi, perhaps the Yuzhan Vong will apply pressure where it belongs. Would making the Yuzhan Vong understand include helping them find the Jedi's secret base? The newscaster asked. Isn't that why they took hostages in the first place? I've been a friend of the Jedi since I joined the Senate. But in this case, Luke Skywalker is thinking only of his followers. The rash acts of the Jedi have endangered the citizens of an entire world, and now he refuses to take responsibility. How do you like that? Zek said, ignoring Jaina's request for calm silence. While he and Jaina had been close when they were younger, they had drifted apart since she volunteered for Rogue Squadron, and now he sometimes seemed to place a premium on annoying her. The Yuzhan Vong threaten a billion lives. We get blamed. Bounty Hunter, what did I say? Excuse me, Kimilka said. Along with Lobaka, Raynar, and Yulaha Kor, who in addition to being a talented musician was also a force-gifted tactical analyst, Tenelka was manning their sensor platform, 
a converted blast boat named the Big Eye. We have a contact entering the system. The transponder identifies them as the freighter Speed Queen. Tenelkoff fed the coordinates directly to the X-Wing astromech droids, then added, A second craft has exited hyperspace. It is on a convergence course to the first. Enemy interdictor? Jaina asked. A favorite tactic of the Yuzhan Vong interdiction forces was to lurk outside their assigned system, then catch inbound traffic with a quick hyperspace hop. Tenel Ka took only a moment to confirm Jaina's deduction. It does not register on the sensors, and there is no ion efflux. It masses out at corvette size. Little brother, Jaina said, give me a sec. Being the group's most powerful in the force, Anakin reached out, stretching his awareness to just shy of the population concentration around Fraz. He felt no Voxen aboard the corvette, nor even the Yuzhan Vong flying it. This latter was no surprise. Though the living crystal he had stolen from the enemy base on Yavin 4 enabled him to sense Yuzhan Vong, in a different, much hazier way than Jedi sensed most other beings, his perceptions at such distances were too weak to discern anything less than a massive concentration. He was somewhat surprised to detect a more ordinary presence on a frozen moon near the edge of the system, something that was startled to feel his touch. Negative Voxen, he reported. Something on that moon in Orbit 12, but I can't tell what. Not Yuzhan Vong, though. Nor did we three feel anything hungry. The rasping voice of one of Saba Sebatine's Barabel apprentices agreed. Anakin had been reluctant to bring the newcomers along, until Luke pointedly reminded him that they had survived more than fifty space battles flying ancient Y-wings for the Wild Knights. On the way out, they had also proven adept pilots in the new XJ-3, with variable stutter lasers, decoy-enhanced proton torpedoes, and grab-proof shields, the newest and most sophisticated X-wing yet. But... The presence in Orbit 12 was human. Unsure of whether the Barabel was trying to show him up or be helpful, Anakin assumed the latter. Thanks for the backup, uh, one. There was a rhythmic hissing that suggested chuckling. Tale two, little brother. Anakin felt the heat rise to his cheeks. Sorry. Tale one was the male. Tsar Sabatine. Two and three were Bella and Krossoff Hara. Not sisters, they insisted, but hatchmates. Whatever that meant, their sense of humor gave Anakin the shudders. They had been the ones to suggest the tail code names, which they seemed to find hilarious for some reason no one understood. Raynar saved Anakin the embarrassment of a more protracted silence. Where are we sitting here? Let's do something. We can't interfere, merchantman, Anakin said. He was as eager as Raynar to avenge Luce's death, but Luke had ordered them to focus solely on the mission. With Vicky Shesh and her allies already suggesting the Jedi should surrender for the greater good, the slightest incident could turn the rest of the Senate against them. And the Speed Queen is better off without us. If the Yuzhan Vongsi is coming, they'll blast and run. This way, they might let it off with a search. Fact, Kennelcaw confirmed. They have used their Dovin basils to bring the Speed Queen to a halt, and a small launch is separating from their hull. A trio of blips, one marked in New Republic Red and two in Yuzhan Vong Blue, appeared on Anakin's tactical display. He had his astromech droid, Fiverr, Call up the technical data and saw no reason to disagree with Tenel Ka. Even the Yuzhan Vong did not destroy every vessel they found. If the ship was not carrying war materiel or Jedi, they often released it in the hope of picking it up outbound, filled with refugees. A raspy barabel voice, Anakin thought it was Krossoff, said, Little brother, we feel someone does not obey the orders of Uncle Master. An instant later, a swarm of blips appeared on Anakin's sensor display. He called, Big Eye? A flight of X-wings, Tenelka reported. 
12 XJ3s. Likelihood 99 point. Ulaha paused, then said, Well, that is Kip's dozen, undoubtedly. Big Eye, open a secure subspace channel, Anakin said, and download the coordinates for a micro jump. Little brother, Jaina warned, remember what? Just in case. Anakin's subspace comm light came on, and he activated his microphone. X-Wing Flight, you know who this is. He reached out with the Force to identify himself and felt a presence almost as strong as his own in return. Request you break off, he said. You'll cause some real trouble for us. For all of us. Trouble, yes, the familiar voice of Kip Duran replied. But not for us. On Anakin's tactical display, the Yuzhan Vong boarding shuttle dissolved into static and vanished. Simply vanished, no sign of attack from the X-Wings. No propellant trails, no energy flashes, nothing. Big guy? Anakin asked. Is something wrong with... The corvette lashed out with plasma cannons and magma missiles, and Anakin's display filled with streaks of red energy. Nothing wrong with Big Eye's sensor package. Kip had destroyed the shuttle. How? The Force? It didn't seem possible. Only the most powerful Jedi could use it that way. Only Dark Jedi would. Killing with the Force directly opened a Jedi to corruption, made him hungry for power. At least, that was what Luke said. Anakin knew his uncle and Mara had been disappointed by their latest meeting with Kip. Perhaps this was the reason. The dozen began to juke and jink, lacing the tactical display with flashes of laser fire. Enemy plasma balls flared against their shields or streaked off and vanished. Then the corvette's blip was engulfed in static. Anakin thought maybe a proton torpedo, but his display had not shown any propellant trails. When the static faded, the corvette remained. Its fire faded to a mere dribble. The XJ-3 X-wings swarmed, blasting it with laser bolts and finishing it with proton torpedoes. This time propellant trails glowed brilliant blue on Anakin's display. Kip's voice came over the subspace. See? No trouble. The Speed Queen fired its sublight drives and lumbered off. Though Anakin knew rogue attacks would ultimately prove harmful to both the Jedi and the New Republic, Luce's death was still too fresh for him to feel anything but glad. Nice shooting, he said. He was about to ask after the two strange detonations when Tenel Ka's voice came over their squadron comm channel. New contacts, she reported. Two, no, three vessels. They appear somewhat larger. Fiverr whistled in alarm as he displayed the blips on Anakin's sensor screen. The three were arrayed in a perfect stacked triangle, a ship above, on, and below the dozen's tactical plane each vessel situated so that its firing lane passed safely between the other two. Anakin was about to ask for a tactical readout when a data line appeared beneath each ship, identifying all three as assault frigates, slow and clumsy, but heavily armed and well protected. Ambush! Anakin cried. Fact, Temelka said. Launching coral skippers now. Clouds of faint blips swarmed from the frigates off battleside. Most moved to take up positions around the killing zone, but a half-dozen turned to pursue the fleeing Speed Queen. The dozen broke formation, but the bigger ships had already loosed a salvo of corkscrewing lava missiles. A pair of Kip's X-wings flared briefly and vanished. Anakin was already lifting off the asteroid. Hold on, little brother, Jaina said. Despite her words, her X-wing was rising along with everyone else's. We're not exactly following orders here. Are we exactly disobeying them? Anakin demanded. He truly did not know what his uncle would want. Whether Kip had turned to the dark side or not, Luke would not want him killed. Or, worse, captured. We can't let them have another of us. Not after Lusa. This is different, Tenelka said. The argument could be made that Kip has brought this on himself. Maybe, Anakin said. He took a moment to collect himself. 
People had been accusing him of being reckless since Yavin 4, and the last thing he needed was to give them more ammunition. On the other hand, he had made up his mind. Is that an argument you want to make? he asked. Tenelka was quiet for a moment. Then the blast boat rose. No, fine. We're going in. Jaina, tell us how. As the squadron formed around the big eye, Jaina said, Our hop brings us out behind the low frigate. No fancy stuff, and don't get carried away. Just blast an escape hole and head for home. Tails, you fly cover. No offense, but we haven't worked together. No offense taken, Sticks, a barabel said. Worried that she might not respond as automatically to a different call sign, Jaina had asked the squadron to use her rogue squadron nickname. We are honored to cover your backs, if Tail One may offer a suggestion. Tell Ka began the countdown, and Jaina said, Seven seconds, one. Their missile crews will be facing away when you arrive, if you send the blast boat on the first pass. Risky, but it could work in a hurry, Jaina said. Odds, minstrel? The probability of success is eighty-two percent, with a margin of error. Babaka rumbled his commitment to the Barabel plan, then Tenelka said, Two, one, mark. Anakin pushed the throttle and toggled the hyperdrive. The stars stretched into lines. Two seconds later, Fiverr chirped to announce their arrival half a system away. To prevent the return to real space from disorienting him, Anakin kept his eyes squeezed shut. He reached out with the force and felt his squadron in formation behind him. Kip and the dozen were a short distance to the left, swirling about in the killing zone, trying to avoid plasma balls and magma missiles. Now that he was close enough, he could also feel the Yuzhan Vong over at the battle, an indistinct quaver just powerful enough to divert his attention at a crucial moment. He was tempted to remove his lightsaber's lambent focusing crystal. A starfighter battle was no place to get distracted. The X-Wing banked sharply right as Fiverr, acting in tandem with the other astromech droids, lined up on target. Now past any danger of becoming disoriented, Anakin opened his eyes and saw the battle ahead, a tiny web of flashing color. "'Everybody ready to play?' Jaina asked. Anakin keyed his microphone to answer affirmative and counted the right number of clicks as others did likewise. Through the force, he sensed a strange resignation in his sister, not at all similar to his own adrenaline-charged excitement. She seemed more weary than tense, almost detached. Maybe that was how an ace pilot survived so many blinding, fast starfighter battles. Or maybe it was the price of coming back alive, the all-too-organic result of stress overload. Perhaps Senate politics weren't the only reason Jaina's leave from Rogue Squadron was indefinite. Perhaps the flight surgeons had suggested to Gavin that she needed a long rest. Fiverr, open a private channel to Jaina. Before the droid could obey, Jaina said, We're whole and hot. Green to go, Jedi, and good shooting. Her X-wing leapt ahead, racing into a light-laced panorama now so large it spilled across the entire front panel of Anakin's canopy. Putting aside any thought of suggesting she stay behind, he toggled his weapons live and selected laser cannons. The target swelled into view, first a blocky silhouette hiding the stars, then a megalithic darkness spewing plasma and magma into the maelstrom beyond. Jaina nosed down to meet the only coral skipper in position to intercept the Jedi, and soon had it juking and jinking to avoid her laser fire. The enemy pilot poured the power of his Dovin basil into shielding his craft instead of maneuvering it. Not smart. Jaina dodged past the few plasma balls he lobbed in her direction and raked the skip with low-power stutter blasts. When the first hit scored, she immediately quadded her weapons and unloaded. Now that's shooting, Zek said. Neg that com clutter, bounty hunter, Jaina ordered. Zek keyed his microphone. With nothing between him and the frigate, Anakin switched to proton torpedoes and laid his targeting reticle on the ship's bow. 
Tisar had guessed right about the missile crews. The plasma nodules and rock spitters on their side of the vessel remained quiet. Fiverr, what's happened with those skips chasing the Speed Queen? Fiverr shifted the tactical display's scale. The missing coral skippers were swarming the Queen. Not good, Anakin groaned. Really not good. Uncle Luke will like that about as much as rancor fighting. Fiverr displayed a readout, noting how long it would take the skips to return. They were out of the fight, but they might try to cut off the Jedi retreat. Keep an eye on them. Fiverr whistled an acknowledgment, then Anakin's targeting reticle lit as he entered torpedo range. The frigate filled the front of the canopy now, an asteroid-like rock that was all Anakin could see. Little Brother Green, he reported. Bounty Hunter Green, Zek said. Back and forth, you first. A dozen white circles, three proton torpedoes and their decoy flares, streaked past and spread along the frigate's flank. The Yuzhan Vong shielding crews activated their gravity-focusing Dovin basils, projecting a string of miniature black holes that swallowed everything coming at them. Zek switched two laser cannons and sprayed the frigate with stutter blasts. Over the last two years, space combat between the New Republic and the Yuzhan Vong had evolved into a game of bait and switch, each side trying to bluff the other into squandering its limited reserve of power on unneeded defenses and ineffectual attacks. The XJ-3 updates had been designed to win that game. Anakin fired his first torpedo salvo, then switched weapons and sprayed laser fire. The shield crews were slower to grab his attacks, and the proximity fuses detonated within meters of the ship. Melt circles pocked the hull. Out of one small crack shot a geyser of atmosphere. Anakin hit the fissure with a pair of laser bursts, and a plume of bodies and equipment tumbled out. Zek added a quadded burst and triggered a flurry of internal explosions, and then they were too close and had to pull up. Anakin felt a pair of Yuzhan Vong eyes on him. The lambent wasn't always a distraction, and jinked right. A magma missile spiraled past from somewhere beyond the frigate, and he felt his alarm mirrored back to him through the force. He checked the heads-up display, and saw Zek sliding in behind him as another rock missile corkscrewed past. Thanks for the warning, Zek calmed. A pair of skips shot up from behind the frigate and hurled past, volcano cannons spitting plasma balls in the blast boat's direction. Anakin started to loop around. Get em. Neg that, boys. Jaina's X-wing came swinging up behind the skips, her nose already leveling off to fire. Take the pair going under. She flashed past, a single proton torpedo streaking after the rear skip. No need to check the tactical display. With Jaina on their tail, the two Yuzhan Vong were already dead. Anakin and Zek nosed down over the frigate, weaving through a storm of magma missiles and circling under the vessel's belly before the surprised gunnery crews could target them. Three hundred meters ahead, two skips were angling up under the big eye, trading fire with the blast boat's big laser cannons. Anakin felt Zek find him through the force. He quadded his cannons and positioned his targeting reticle. Lead flyer ready. They depressed their triggers together. Their weapons flashed together. The skips disintegrated. Together. Very nice shooting, Tamilka said. Now please get clear. Anakin pushed his throttle forward. There should have been another coral skipper, but it was nowhere on his display. Where's that last skip, he said. Got it, Gina replied. On the way under. Fiverr let out a whistle. Yeah, four of them, Anakin said. And she's not even excited. The blast boat lit the darkness with flashing color. Anakin used his rearview vid screen to watch the enemy shielding crews catch the entire first salvo. They missed four missiles from the next salvo, though, and one entered the breach Anakin and Zek had opened earlier. The blast blew a hole through the far hull. The third salvo broke the vessel in two, and the ship tumbled away in separate pieces, its truncated halves bleeding bodies and vapor. Anakin looped his X-wing back toward the battle, and found another frigate angling to cut off the dozen. 
the Big Eye launched all torpedoes and, no match for the larger ship's firepower, fled. Jaina led Anakin and Zek after the volleys, but Kip's voice came over their comm channel. You've done enough, Styx. We've got it from here. Sure. Jaina's reply was sarcastic, perhaps because the blast boat's torpedoes were arcing into a gravitic singularity. They'll just let you past. Well, not let. A brilliant flash lit the frigate's bow incinerating the bridge and leaving the vessel dead in space. The dozen's eight survivors launched a torpedo volley at the crippled ship, then streaked out of the killing zone with a comfortable lead on the pursuing coral skippers. Kip! Anakin gasped. How did you— The Force! The answer was curt, and even without the Force, Anakin would have sensed Kip's anger at losing so many pilots. The two groups joined formations in cold silence and remained silent. Kip had yielded to his anger before, and all Jedi knew the danger of that. But Anakin was beginning to wonder. On Yavin 4, a bitter Yuzhan Vong outcast had betrayed his people to help Anakin rescue Tahiri. And from him, Anakin had learned that there was a dark side even without the Force, that strength of will counted for as much as purity of heart now more than ever, it seemed to him that the Force was one tool among many, to be used for a greater good. And if Kip Duran had discovered some way to use the Force to destroy enemy ships, it seemed to Anakin that Eclipse should investigate it, that a strong Jedi with a focused will and pure heart might be able to use it without turning to the dark side. Kip allowed the silence to hang on the comm channels until they were clear of the enemy, then asked, and again, do those explosions remind you of anything? Their spectrographic signature was that of a proton torpedo, Temelka said helpfully, but there was no propellant trail. And what does that tell you? Kip asked smugly. Think about it. Size matters not and all that. Telekinesis? Anakin gasped. You're using the Force to throw torpedoes? I'm not as fast as a propellant charge, yet. But the Yuzhan Vong have a hard time seeing proton torpedoes without a big, bright propellant glow to give them away. Anakin was almost disappointed. He had been hoping for a secret weapon, something the force-blind Yuzhan Vong could never counter. Instead, it was just one more move in the game, one more trick the enemy would soon learn to defeat. If Kip expected someone to congratulate him on his cleverness, he was disappointed. Tenel Ka remarked that it would save the New Republic a few propellant cylinders, if nothing else. Then an urgent warble drew Anakin's attention to his tactical display. Fiverr shifted scales, showing the Speed Queen's derelict hulk dead in space. The six coral skippers that had destroyed it were rushing to cut off his group's escape path. We are not done yet, I fear. Tenelka said. The six skip pilots were hopelessly outnumbered, and would no doubt die, but they would also buy the rest of the task force time to catch the X-Wings from behind. Anakin hissed a curse, then cursed again as three X-Wings appeared ahead of the skips, rushing to meet them. Please continue on course, little brother, a barabelle rasped. This will not take long. There are only six. The three X-Wings merged into one blip and continued toward the enemy, forcing the Yuzhan Vong to choose between being torn apart piecemeal and abandoning their screen. Not surprisingly, they closed ranks, spraying a flurry of stripes and corkscrew lines at the barabels. Outside the canopy, Anakin could barely see the battle ahead, mere pinpoints of light flashing in the distant darkness. He looked back to the tactical display and saw the corkscrew lines winking out as they approached the X-Wings. "'They can't do that!' Zek gasped. "'If you think they are shooting missiles out of space, then they can,' Tenelka said. "'Optical magnification shows a seventy-two percent correlation between their laser flashes and the disappearance of the missiles.' Anakin was not as impressed by their shooting as by their flying. "'To merge into one blip,' They had to be on top of each other, 
no more than a meter apart, at a velocity that might well be ten percent of light. Aside from demoralizing the enemy, he could think of no battle use for such a display of precision. But he was impressed. At last, one magma missile got through to the X-wings. Anakin's eyes remained glued to the tactical display, awaiting the horrible flash that would mean the end of one, or, as close as they were, all three barabels. It never came. The missile reappeared on the other side of the blip in a different trajectory. Someone had used the force to redirect its flight. I need some Jedi in my squadron, Kip said. I need some Barabel Jedi. Anakin looked up again. The battle was brighter now, more like a flickering phosphly. But there was no question of reaching it in time to help the Barabels. The Yuzhan Vong gave up on the magma missiles and concentrated on plasma balls. To Anakin's amazement, the Barabels wasted no effort trying to dodge. They took the attacks head-on, one after the other, and continued straight on long after their shields should have fallen. "'How can they do that?' Zek asked. "'Are they reinforcing each other's shields?' "'Not enough overlap.' Jaina's voice was full of admiration, the first sign of emotion she had displayed during the battle. "'They must be leapfrogging, taking turns out front while the others re-energize. "'Fact,' Tenelcaw confirmed, "'there are fluctuating ion pulses consistent with variations in drive output.' Now I'm really impressed, Anakin said. A Yuzhan Vong blip vanished. The X-Wings swung toward another skip. It disappeared, too. Anakin was not surprised by this tactic, but he was awed by its precision. The hatchmates were concentrating their fire, simply overwhelming their targets with the sheer volume of laser blasts. A third skip blinked out. The survivors closed on the X-Wing's flanks, trying to swing around behind them. The Barabel's blip quivered and slowed. Anakin knew the Yuzhan Vong were using Dovin basils to pull at the X-Wing's shields. He wanted to open a channel and yell at them to toggle their grab safety, which would release the shields and bring them back up a millisecond later. He did not dare interfere with their concentration. The Barabels surprised him again, this time shutting down their sublight drives completely. With the skips pulling on their shields, the distance closed in a heartbeat. Then there were three X-Wings again, each nose-to-nose -nose with a coral skipper. The tactical display burst into an indecipherable tangle of propellant trails, then dissolved into static as the rapid-fire proton bursts overloaded the blast boat's sensors. Anakin glanced through his canopy and saw a Nova-like burst of light. When he looked back to his display, there was nothing but static. Fiverr? The droid tweedled and set to work filtering the overload. Tails? Jaina called. Are you there? They did not reply. But Tenelka said, Our sensors are coming back online. There appear to be three X-wings. Tails, are you there? Jaina repeated. One, two, three... She was answered by a long outburst of sissing, what passed for laughter among the Barabel. We are here, Sticks. One of the hatchmates rasped. One, two, three. Chapter 10 Nearly a hundred senatorial balconies sat empty in support of the Ithorian boycott. The Wookiees were hurling pieces of their conferencing console at the Speaker's dais, where a hologram of the Thyphiran senator offered a nine-point plan to open peace negotiations with the Yuzhan Vong. The entire consular staff of Talfalio wandered the walkway shouting, actually shouting, their demand that the Jedi surrender to save the hostages. Balmoro was channel-blasting an offer of free orbital turbolaser platforms to any world that sent a fleet to its defense and security droids were whirring back and forth through the air, searching in vain for a Dathomiri assassin, rumored to be hiding in the chamber. It was not how Borsk Felia would have liked to meet Savong La's envoy. He would have preferred to receive him in the state reception hall and, 
over a decanter of fine Andorian port, quietly work out an acceptable script for their public confrontation. But the emissary had balked at the invitation, suggesting instead that the chief of state greet him as he debarked his ship, a deferential gesture that would have further split the Senate and undermined Borsk's already sagging support. So, unable to reach a compromise, here they were, meeting for the first time in the grand convocation chamber of the New Republic Senate, the whole galaxy watching, and neither one with a clue as to what the other would do or say. It was, as the phrase went, a great moment in history, when empires rose or fell on the words of politicians, and posterity's favor was won or lost in a second. Chief of State Felia felt like he was going to throw up. The Yuzhan Vong, looking faintly Jedi-like in a hooded cape over scarlet Von Doon crab armor, made Borsk wait while he descended three hundred meters of stairs at the pace of a Dagobah swamp sloth. The envoy brought no bodyguards, giving the impression that he needed no protection but his living armor and the long amphistaff in his hands. He paid no attention to the hisses and jeers many senators cast his way, and even less to the fools who stepped forward to suggest private meetings. The only time he looked away was when the Togorians hurled a volley of calf mugs at him, and even then it was only to cast a shadowed glare upon the security droids who intercepted the fusillade. Borsk suddenly wished he had instructed the sergeant-at-arms to disarm the Yuzhan Vong. He had thought facing an armed warrior would make him look brave on the hollow net, but now he was not so sure. Though the security droids would blast the envoy senseless at the first sign of an attack, Borsk knew himself well enough to realize even holocams would not ease his anxiety. When the Yuzhan Vong finally reached the chamber floor, he stopped on one side of the speaker's rostrum and waited. As their negotiators had agreed, Borsk left the chief of state's consul and came down to stand across from him. He was followed by two members of the advisory council. Vicky Shesh of Kuat, and Fior Rodan of Kamenor. No one exchanged pleasantries or greetings. I am Borsk Felia. I have invited you here to discuss the Talfalian hostages. What is there to discuss? The envoy reached up and pulled his hood back, revealing the usual wreck of a Yuzhan Vong face. My words to Leia Solo were clear enough. The uproar in the chamber faded to an electric drone, as consular aides scoured databanks for face map fits and voice print matches. Borsk needed no such help. Though he had not stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with many invaders, none actually, he had watched the hologram of Leia's Bill Bringy meeting a hundred times. Nomanor's gnarled visage was almost as familiar to him as his own even with a new false eye fitted in what had been an empty socket on the hollow. Leia Solo is no longer a representative of this government, Borsk said. Though his fur was standing on end, his tone was dismissive. If you have something to say to the New Republic, you must say it to me. The envoy glared out of his one good eye, clearly surprised by Borsk's impudence. You do not know of our terms? An indignant murmur built in the chamber as the consular aides began to inform their masters of the envoy's identity, and Borsk knew he had to work quickly. Nom Anor's role in both the romamul Osarian conflict and the fall of Duro were well documented, and selecting him as an envoy was an open insult. I know you have threatened to kill millions of New Republic citizens, Borsk said. I summoned you here to provide an explanation. The murmur in the chamber rose to a near din, and the Wookiees whooped in approval. Borsk did nothing to quell the noise, which the Talfalians correctly interpreted as encouragement, and attempted to rebut by urging their allies to shout down the Wookiees. This drew a deafening counter-roar from the Jedi supporters, and it occurred to Borsk that he might have found the way to shore up his support. He locked gazes with Nomanor, and allowed the uproar to continue until Vicky Shesh finally returned to the advisory council's dais and used the gallery address to plead for quiet. 
Orsk was not as troubled by the betrayal of his patronage as by how quickly her efforts were rewarded. When the uproar had died, Nomanor turned from Borsk and looked directly into the galleries. What a pity the courage of your Jedi does not match that of your bureaucrats. The chorus of jeers was not nearly so loud as Borsk would have liked, and for a moment he worried he was making a mistake. While many of the systems supporting the Jedi were almost fanatical in their loyalties, they tended to be already conquered or separated from the rest of the New Republic by the invasion route. On the other hand, the worlds that favored appeasing the Yuzhan Vong were mostly rich core systems, with resources vital to the war effort and political power bases critical to Borsk's continued tenure as chief of state. The Yuzhan Vong knew all that, which was why they had sent a notorious spy to represent them in the first place. They were trying to divide the Senate between those they could intimidate and those they could not, and Borsk had been in politics long enough to know what happened to those who were easily intimidated. He waited while Nomanor's gaze circled the gallery, passing over those who taunted him with a confident sneer, lingering on the ones who remained quiet until they grew uncomfortable and looked away. Borsk had to admire the envoy's technique. It was classic intimidation politics, rendered all the more effective by the fact that the Yuzhan Vong had proven time and again they would not hesitate to carry through even the most unthinkable threat. Fortunately for the New Republic, in the humble opinion of its chief of state at least, they were playing this game against a master. When Nome Anor's gaze finally returned to the speaker's rostrum, Borsk stepped to within a hand's breadth of the Yuzhan Vong's chest, purposely contrasting his stubby figure against his counterpart's more massive build. He craned his neck back and stared at the underside of the other's crooked chin. The Yuzhan Vong must be worried about our Jedi indeed, to think a handful worth so many lives. Borsk spoke so softly that the sound droid had to float nearly between them to pick up his words, and, as he had planned, Nomanor was forced to step back to glare down at him. Your lives mean nothing to us. Indeed. Borsk glanced into the high galleries, searching out the peace-loving senator from Thyphira. I thought as much. A silence fell over the chamber, and the Bothan knew he was succeeding when he heard the rustle of a thousand senatorial backsides shifting in their seats. He was holding his audience rapt. This was not what they had expected, and they barely dared breathe for fear of missing what would happen next. Then Vicky Shesh stepped over beside them, and Borsk could almost hear the excitement drain from the room. What the Chief of State means to say, Ambassador, is that the Yuzhan Vong may not understand the New Republic's relationship with the Jedi. We lack control. No. Borsk shot Shesh a look that would have melted Durasteel. That is not what the Chief of State means to say. Shesh paled but refused to retreat. I beg your pardon. The senator from Kuat is welcome to express her opinion in the proper forums, but she may not presume to speak for the chief of state. Borsk glared at her until she retreated. Then he turned back to Nomanor. What the chief of state means to say is that the Yuzhan Vong are cowards and murderers. If they had the courage of the least of their slaves, they would stop hiding behind helpless refugees and go do battle with the Jedi. We are not hiding. Nomanor shot back. It is the Jedi. Really? Borsk answered in a sarcastic tone. Then I suggest you look in the Corellian sector. There were recently quite a few at Fra's, from what I understand. Much of the chamber erupted into laughter for the irresponsible Jedi ambush at Fra's had dominated the Hollownet over the last few days. It was too early to tell whether Borsk's comment would change the slant of the coverage, but it was sure to keep the incident, and the Chief of State, in the news vids for days to come. Nomanor's meandering eyes swiveled down toward Borsk, and the Bothan's stomach went sour. He had read reports on the false eye confiscated at Bilbringi, 
and knew the unpleasant death that awaited anyone unfortunate enough to have its poison emptied in his face. But he refused to back down. He could feel the support of the Jedi lovers swelling behind him, and he knew that to show fear now was to throw away all he had just won. Then, in a flash of inspiration, Borsk knew what to say, exactly how to crystallize his support. And you might try looking in Bothan's space. I have it on good authority that the Jedi are well loved there. This drew an even bigger laugh than the Fra's suggestion, for Borsk and the Jedi had not been on good terms since, well, ever. It was a weak point in his rapidly developing plan, and one he hoped to fix by openly pledging his home system's support to the Jedi. He glanced up at the Bothan gallery and saw Max Cezala, the Bothan senator, staring daggers at him. Borsk flattened his ears in warning, and Cezala obediently rose and began to suggest planets where the Yuzhan Vong might start searching. None of the worlds were inhabited, but it was enough to bring the senators of a hundred other systems to their feet with similar suggestions. Umanor's eyes narrowed. Borsk thought he had finally pushed too far. But the Yuzhan Vong stepped back. I will relay your suggestions. He turned toward the stairs and glanced into the galleries. All of them. Fine. But you will do so by Vilip, Borsk said. Nomanor looked over his shoulder. What? You may relay your suggestions by Vilip. Borsk did not want to miss this chance to mock the infamous spy. I summoned you here to explain the taking of a million hostages. You aren't leaving until you do. Nomanor's reply was lost to a tumult of Wookiee roaring. The cheers felt good to Borsk. He would never again be able to set foot inside Bothan space, but the cheers felt good. Chapter 11 The villip averted at last, assuming the likeness of the war-master's disfigured visage. Rugged and bold-featured, with pensive eyes and a fringed mouth, it had once been a face Vicky Shash might have found alluring. Now, laced with devotional scars and rearranged by ritual breakings, the best she could call it was interesting. So how come her stomach fluttered whenever she saw it? Why should she be annoyed? that he had taken so long to respond to her villip. It had to be his power. She was drawn to powerful men. Well, males. She was not proud of this weakness. It was considered something of a perversion back on Kuat, where women of her station normally purchased Telbun servants to serve as their mates. But there it was, her secret shame. For a while, a very brief while, she had even been rather taken with three little Borsk. Vicky, you have something to report? Salongla asked. Yes. She liked how he always called her by her first name. It bespoke a certain intimacy he did not share with most others. It was a surprising session. Nomanor says successful. Then he saw something I did not, she replied. Nomanor misread the situation from the start. His arrogance forced Borsk to throw his support to the Jedi. Truly, the Warmaster did not seem all that surprised. And he assured me he would do so well. I have been all day salvaging the situation. You have? Savong Law sounded surprised, no doubt because he was not accustomed to underlings showing such initiative. What have you done? The Senate split roughly along core boundaries, she explained. Those inside the core, and coincidentally in your invasion path, favored turning against the Jedi. The others support them. That was expected, Sabong La said impatiently. Seeing that the significance was lost on the War Master, Vicky tried a confident tone. The Core Worlds have most of the resources still available to the New Republic, and those who control the purse strings control the government. Yes? I've spent all morning talking to Core Senators. 
We don't have the votes to win a no-confidence call, but I'm convinced that were Borsk to meet an untimely end, the next chief of state would be less favorably disposed toward the Jedi. Sabong La's brow rose. You are thinking of murder? Vicky was surprised to feel a shudder run down her spine. Murder was such an ugly way to put it, but how like the Yuzhan Vong to say it in the ghastliest way possible. No Manor was close enough today. He could do it. No Manor? Savong La echoed. Are you not the one who will be elected chief of state when Borsk dies? Not if, Vicky noted. When? She smiled confidently. That's my plan? Yes. The war master scowled. Then you do it, Vicky. Her smile vanished. Me? Thoughts swirled through her mind, trying to sort through the possible purposes behind his words. Was he testing her courage? Joking? Perhaps he simply did not understand the ramifications of his suggestion. Yes, that had to be it. I don't think politics work the same way in the New Republic as among the Yuzhan Vong. Were I to murder Borsk, I'd be disgraced and sent to a rehabilitation facility, not elected chief of state. Only if you were caught. Vicky paused. Sabong La could certainly smuggle her some means of killing Borsk secretly, but knowing the Yuzhan Vong, and the war master in particular, she felt sure the method would involve some horrible mutilation to her own body, and still require her to look in the Bothan's eye as she murdered him. Though she had never killed anyone face to face before, she believed she could do it, considering the prize. But what of the investigation that followed? As fierce as the Yuzhan Vong were as warriors, they knew nothing of the New Republic's investigative technology, technology that would be brought fully to bear to identify Borsk's assassin. Vicky shook her head. It wouldn't work. You're refusing me? I am. Her insides went cold. She already regretted proposing the assassination in the first place, but she knew better than to show fear now. The war master would see hesitation as a sign of weakness, and pounce on it like the predator he was. And she had worked too hard, done too many things that repulsed even her, to throw it all away recklessly. I won't do either of us any good on a prison planet. Sabong La's tone grew dangerously even. I have ways to force your cooperation. I'm sure Belindi Kalenda would be very interested to learn of our association. I'm sure she would. But then you would lose that steady little flow of memories from the Nurmok situation room. To illustrate her point, she tipped her head to one side and ground her teeth together then winced as the chi lab detached itself and slithered down her nasal passage. And I'm sure New Republic intelligence would also be very interested in these. The neural grub dropped out of her nostril exactly on cue, and a small smile of respect crept across Sabong La's face. As you wish, Vicky Shesh, he said. But no manor cannot be trusted with a task this important. A vermin hunter named Bjork Umi will contact you soon. Yes? Give him a time and a place, Sabong La said, and you will become chief of state. Our chief of state. Chapter 12 The YVH-1 is a top-notch war droid with flawless search-and-identify engineering the heavy weapons punch of a four-seater blast car, and, with the optional laminanium-layered armor, the durability to survive even the most hazardous postings. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the ultimate answer to the invasion of the New Republic, Tendrondo Arms, Yuzhan Vong Hunter One. The hulking war droid sprang into view a skull-headed blur of black and gray camouflage, bouncing across the floor in a dizzying array of evasive flips and mid-air twists. 
It crashed through a ferrocrete wall that had apparently been erected for just that purpose, dived over a hovering land speeder, and finished by positioning itself precisely at the entrance of the proving facility. It pivoted exactly ninety degrees left, and clanked to attention in front of the spectator hover sled, then snapped its blaster cannon arm against its chest in salute. With a death's head face and red photoreceptors gleaming in socket mountings as deep as a blaster burn, the droid bore a faint but nightmarish resemblance to the enemy it had been built to destroy. Its wedge-shaped torso, the massive proportions of its system-packed limbs, even the way its armor overlapped at the joints reminded Leia of a Yuzhan Vong warrior trapped in a droid's shell. She wondered if Lando's designers had intended the similarity, perhaps to cause judgment lapses by goading their foes into a rage, or if the insult had just been lucky coincidence. In an ultra-deep, ultra-male version of Lando Calrissian's voice, the droid said, YVH-11A reporting all systems functional. Ready to proceed in demonstration mode. Leia rolled her eyes at Lando's characteristic vanity, then looked at Han, who had returned to Coruscant immediately after dropping the Voxen at Eclipse. I don't see why I have to be here. Think of it as a favor. Han nodded toward the front of the hover sled, where Borsk Felia stood flanked by two generals, Garm Bel Iblis and Wedge Antilles. Borsk wouldn't meet with Lando unless you came. And why is the Chief of State meeting with an arms supplier in the first place? Leia demanded. You know what this is. Han shrugged. They're good droids. As if anyone here were qualified to judge that. Leia was silent for a moment, then said, He's trying to draw me back in. Look, all Lando's trying to do is sell a few droids and... Help win the war, Han said. I was talking about Borsk. I know, Han answered. But what's wrong with using him for a change? It's politics. I'm done with that. She fell silent as Lando explained he would be demonstrating the YVH's capabilities in the most challenging combat environment of all, the urban battleground. YVH-11A turned and began to stalk down the simulation maze of a fairly modern glass-steel city. The hover sled followed a dozen meters above, where the occupants would have a clear view of the action. Adarak and Miwal were still in back to tanks, recovering from their acid burns, or Leia knew they would have insisted on being even farther from the action. Demonstrations of war droids were notorious for going tragically astray. The first test came when a pair of what looked like Yuzhan Vong quietly stepped into an alley around the corner from 11A. They were armed with amphistaffs and bandoliers of thudbugs. There's nothing to be concerned about, Lando said. They're actually training droids, built off the same frame as the YVH, but programmed with Yuzhan Vong battle tactics and equipped with emitter packages that mimic enemy heart rates, heat signatures, and odor characteristics. Yuzhan droids, the ultimate abomination, Bel Iblis said, grinning. I admire a man who has confidence in his own product. I have confidence in everything I manufacture, Lando said, returning the general's smile. But why do you find that so admirable, in this case? No particular reason, Bel Iblis shrugged. I was just thinking of what the enemy will do when they hear you've begun manufacturing them. Lando's smile grew queasy. The Yuzhan droids made it only three steps down the alley before 11A sprang around the corner to meet them, the servo motors of his repulsor-enhanced legs hissing slightly as they propelled his enormous mass. One Yuzhan droid made the mistake of raising his amphistaff and was immediately struck down by a green blaster bolt. The other was smarter making a headlong dive and reaching for his bandolier of thudbugs. He actually had a hand on it before 11A's blaster bolt knocked him senseless. For the purposes of this demonstration, 11A's blaster cannon is powered down to a non-lethal setting modulated specifically to paralyze the Yuzhan droid circuitry. 
Lando explained. In true combat, 1-1-A would automatically select the energy level needed to annihilate any target up to the size of a coral skipper. We'll see his destructive capabilities in the second part of the demonstration. YVH-11A paused while a remote sensor scan confirmed that he downed his targets. Then he continued along the main avenue. For the next hour, Leia and the others watched the war droid work his way through a broad assortment of combat problems, locating concealed Yuzhan droids through solid durasteel, tracking multiple escapees and, most impressive to Leia, capturing a trio of Uglith-masked infiltrators without harming anyone in a crowd of bystanders. The finale came when 11A was ordered into a simulated ambush, simulated because 11A's sensors alerted him to it well in advance, and Lando ordered him in anyway. Of the half a dozen Yuzhan droids trapped in the cul-de-sac with him, four hit him with thud bugs. Only one managed a second strike before being blasted unconscious. By the time 11A's sensors confirmed that he had downed all six targets, the bug pits in his laminanium armor were already filling themselves. Self-healing metals, General Bell Iblis observed. Nice. Just one of the YVH's many design innovations. Lando's smile was one of genuine pride, more sincere than Leia had seen in decades. Of course, it's impossible to simulate a full-scale battle here. The Yuzhan Vong would have heavier weapons that we just can't use in a demonstration, but... This should provide some idea of the YVH's capabilities. It's totally immune to biological agents, hermetically seals itself in the presence of corrosive chemicals, and the laminanium armor can take a coral skipper plasma ball in the chest without breaching. How long to repair that? Wedge asked. Less than a standard day, but it will need to recharge its power pack and replace its laminanium ingot. Lando signaled to 11A, who drew an appreciative murmur from the generals by riding the repulsor lifts concealed in his feet onto the deck of the hover sled. If we can proceed to the firing range, 11A will demonstrate his destructive capability. Felia nodded to the pilot droid, and they started across the mock city toward a distant blast tunnel. The YVH's primary weapon is the variable output blaster cannon in his right arm. Lando said. But his left arm can be fitted with a wide variety of weapons, including a 50-missile seeker battery, sonic rifles, heavy lasers. As Lando ticked off the options, failure motioned for him to continue for the generals, then joined Leia and Han in the back. Impressive. He addressed himself to both Leia and Han, as though he were only making casual conversation. I can see an army of these droids defending the New Republic. What would it take? A million? Three million would be better, Han answered, immediately slipping into bargaining mode on his friend's behalf. There are a lot of Yuzhan Vong, and these things are bound to make them mad. That's worth something. Three million? Failure considered the number, then looked to Leia. That's a lot of laminanium. It would require a great deal of support to push through. Leia had a hollow feeling in her stomach. She had known this moment was coming, since watching the hologram of failure dressing Gnome Honor down in front of the full Senate. And, for a change, she was almost eager to give the Bothan what he wanted. After the destruction of the Speed Queen in the battle at Fraz, the Jedi were taking more of a battering in the Senate than ever. The Chief of State's support would do much to alleviate that, but her feeling as she left the Nurmok Situation Room that day had been unmistakable. The Force was guiding her away from politics, and she had no doubt that the Boffin hoped to bring her back into the Senate as his ally, a move that would both add to his support and give the Jedi an audible voice. It was a sacrifice she could no longer make. The feeling had been too clear. I'm sure you'll find all the support you need, if you truly believe it's the right thing. The fur around Felia's collar ruffled uncertainly. What do my beliefs matter? We're talking about the Senate. The Senate you made, Leia said, 
you and those like you. I'm no part of that. Philia's ears flattened, and Leia heard her husband mutter something under his breath. They had talked this over before coming. Han was sympathetic to her determination to have no more to do with the Senate. But in typical Han Solo fashion, he thought she simply ought to fake it. To his way of thinking, all she had to do was smile a few times and make a couple of public appearances with Failure. Then the Jedi would be off the hook, Lando would have enough credits to buy an entire sector, and the New Republic would have the finest droid army in a dozen galaxies. Han just could not understand that to play Failure's game would be to countenance the Bothan's way of doing things to become a part of the rot that had made the New Republic such a soft target for the Yuzhan Vong in the first place. After a long pause, Felia cast a meaningful glance at the lightsaber hanging from Leia's belt. Come now, Princess. You know how this works. I cannot support the Jedi unless the Jedi support me. Do the right thing, and you will have their support, Leia said. Lando and the generals had given up all pretense of discussing the YVH's merits and were now openly eavesdropping. I am no longer in the business of making behind-the-scenes deals. What a pity, when there is such a need for them to hold the New Republic together. Lando's eyes widened at Failure's acid tone, and he shot Han a look of appeal. Han could only shrug. Sorry, pal. I promised she'd come, not what she'd say. The hover sled slowed, and began to descend toward the blast tunnel, where several Tendrondo technicians were unloading two huge crates of YVH munitions. Lando rallied with one of his slickest smiles. No problem, Han. This baby sells itself. He jerked a thumb toward a squad of big human bodyguards rushing to secure the hover sled's landing pad. When the Chief of State sees what 11A's depleted beradium pellets do to Yorick Coral, he'll want a dozen to replace those jokers. From behind them came 11A's ultra-masculine voice. Remain calm. Seek shelter immediately. The hover sled shuddered beneath the war droid's heavy steps. This is a military emergency. Seek shelter immediately. It was the same warning the droid had given in the search-and-identify demonstration, just before disabling three Yuzhan droid infiltrators as they tried to slip through a crowd of Tendrondo pedestrians. Leia cocked a querying brow at Lando. He shook his head, then moved to intercept the war droid. 1-1-A, the demonstration is over, he said. Affirmative, demonstration completed, the droid replied. Please seek shelter. There are Yuzhan Vong ahead. YVH-11A brushed Lando aside and jerked the pilot droid away from the control column, then jacked into the socket himself. The sled was so close to the landing area that Leia had to step to the safety rail to look down on the bodyguards. They were arraying themselves on all sides of the pad, facing outward as was proper. Once the sled descended, it would take only an instant to spin around and catch the group in a deadly crossfire. The war droid turned the hover sled away from the landing area. Calrissian, General Bel Iblis barked. Enough is enough! Leia reached out with the force, felt nothing from the guards. No, Garm, she said. They're impostors. YVH-11A laid his arm on the rail and loosed a flurry of blaster bolts. A pair of Yuzhan Vong detached the sleeves of their blast armor and turned their shoulders toward the hover sled, and something black and winged shot out of the first warrior's sleeve. YVH-11A continued to bank away. The thing, whatever it was, smashed into the hover sled and nearly flipped it. Four black pincers came through the durasteel floor, ripping a hole, and a beetle-like insect about the size of Leia's arm started to come through. Han, Beliblis, and Wedge vaporized it with blaster fire. Another jolt. The hover sled turned on edge and angled down into the simulated city. Impact imminent, 11A warned. Brace! 
Even cushioned by repulsor lift engines, the crash was a mad and confusing thing. Leia ricocheted off Durasteel and dropped face first onto Ferrocrete, bodies thudding all around. The hover sled fell against a wall above her, remaining there leaning. Han called out. She reached for him through the force and felt more worry than pain. I'm fine, she said. Everyone? Thalia answered first. Thankfully, I am unhurt. Sound and strong, Bill Iblis reported. Same here, Wedge said. Only Lando did not answer. Leia picked herself up and found him crouched behind the overturned sled, watching 11A spray blaster bolts down a one-block street. The wumpf-wumpf of the droid's blaster cannon sounded somehow all too gentle. Lando? Leia pulled the lightsaber from her belt. The handle felt familiar enough, but the weapon still seemed a thing in her hand, not at all the extension of herself she knew it should have been. Tell 11A to let loose with the heavy stuff. Can't. There's a power governor on his weapon systems. Lando sounded almost sick. With two generals and the chief of state here, we didn't want a chance of programming glitch. Power governor? This from both Han and Thalia. You think I'm not disappointed? Lando retorted. An opportunity like this? Thudbugs began to ping the bottom of the hover sled. What was he supposed to do in the blast tunnel? Han asked. Put on a light show? It only takes a second to change a programming card, Lando said. It's with the munitions. Leia peered around the platform edge. YVH-11A stood in a storm of thudbugs, pouring blaster fire at the assassins and accomplishing nothing against their stolen blast armor. Finally, he gave an electronic bellow and stomped down the street. A pair of Yuzhan Vong pressed themselves into a doorway and opened their breastplates, each drawing a long, eel-like creature from beneath his armor and throwing it at 11A. The things turned rigid and streaked at the droid, their heads pulsing with white energy, their tails shooting threads of flame. YVH-11A fired twice on the run. The eels exploded. He fired twice more, and both attackers dropped. Then the droid was crashing into the others. Two more fell to his flailing arms, but the rest slipped past, and Han, Lando, and the generals took out another pair with blaster pistols. Wedge stopped firing long enough to shove Han and Leia toward Thalia. Take him. We'll hold here. Han started to object, but Thalia was already fleeing, shouting into his comlink for someone to answer. Judging by the panic in his voice, no one was. Leia grabbed Han and started after the Bothan. Like it or not, Thalia was chief of state. Behind them, another assassin fell. Then Wedge took a thud bug in the shoulder and tumbled into the others. And the last trio of Yuzhan Vong charged under the hover sled and raced past, 11A stomping into view behind them, still scorching their armor with ineffective blaster fire. The droid's laminanium armor was pitted to the underskeleton, and his circuits were showing. But he kept coming, kept firing even with his allies in front of him. Precision targeting. Seeing the advantage of the situation, Leia ignited her lightsaber. Time to make a stand. Too dangerous. The near panic in Han's voice surprised Leia. You go. He shoved her after Felia, nearly losing a hand as he reached past her lightsaber, then dropped the nearest Yuzhan Vong with an impressive under-the-arm shot. Bad timing. A blaster bolt, one of 11A's non-lethal green bolts, caught him in the chest and hurled him into Leia. He dropped, not dead, she could tell, but out, really, really out. She caught her balance and stumbled around to meet the last two Yuzhan Vong, one slashing at her head, the other slipping past after failure. Leia dropped to a crouch and tumbled backward, using the force to carry her along. A flying somersault would have been better, but she was no dueling master. She rolled to her feet and spun, catching Borsk's would-be assassin across the back. Her ruby blade cleaved him nearly in two, and the smell was sickening. Leia continued her spin and found the last Yuzhan Vong where she expected, whipping his amphistaff at her legs, also as expected. 
she blocked low. He dropped his weapon and reached for his utility pouch. Something struck at Leia's knee. She caught it on her blade, saw the amphistaff had reverted to snake form, and flung the thing away. The Yuzhan Vong's hand was in his utility pouch. Leia summoned the Force and kicked with everything she had. The blow caught the assassin square and sent him stumbling back all of two steps. The warrior sneered and withdrew his hand from the utility pouch. Vowing for the thousandth time to spend more time practicing her Jedi skills, Leia hurled her lightsaber at his arm. Still sneering, he pivoted to let it pass, and suddenly found himself folded into one Monet's laminanium arms. The droid crushed the stolen blast armor like an eggshell, squeezing black gore out onto the ground. Blaster's ineffectual, he said, stunned and confused. Alternate tactics required. Chapter 13 With the milky splendor of the galactic core pouring down through its transparasteel ceiling, the crater room on Eclipse was one of the few that still had light. An attempt to feed more power to the central cooling system had blown a primary switching bank, shutting down all non-vital systems and compelling the Jedi to hold their assembly in one of the Eclipse program's labs. Several empty villip tanks, even Silgal could not make the things grow, had been moved aside to create a gathering area. Han and Lando stood a little off to the side with Leia's Nogri bodyguards. After the close call on Coruscant, the Nogri had emerged from their back to tanks a day early, and now refused to let Leia out of their sight. Leia was near the front with Mara, Silgal, and the older Jedi, while Jason and Jaina stood with Tenel Ka, Loi, Raynar, Zek, and the more thoughtful of the younger Jedi Knights. Anakin, with his pretty friend Tahiri at his side, was surrounded by his growing gaggle of companions, now including the three Barabel hatchmates, Yulaha Kor, a red-haired woman named Errol Besa, and the Twi'lek dancer, Alima Rar. Han was only slightly less pleased than Tahiri to see how closely Alima pressed into his son's space. Though the Twi'lek was about the same age as Anakin, he could tell by how she used her eyes and touch that she was much older in at least one sense, and now was not a particularly good time for Anakin to learn those lessons. Though Luke had called the gathering to report a breakthrough in Silgal's research, they had just received word that Anakin's friend Lyric had fallen to the Voxen. Almost as alarming, Corrin Horn had been seen with his wife, Mirax, fleeing a pack of the creatures while resupplying on Corellia. No one had been able to contact them since. Silgal was the first to break the silence. I asked Master Skywalker to call this meeting because I wanted to give you some hopeful news. Instead, I must again apologize for my tardiness in solving the problem. The Moon Calamari turned her bulbous eyes toward the floor. Forgive me. Don't think like that. Though Anakin's eyes were wet with barely restrained tears, his tone was warm. No one could do better. Without you, we wouldn't even know these things were part Vornsker. Anakin's words made Han proud. He knew from his own experience how difficult it was not to lash out after the loss of someone close, and his son's reassurances would help ease Silgal's overactive conscience. That's right, Ganner Rysot agreed. The big man's scarred cheek lent a dangerous air to an otherwise rakishly handsome face. Everyone knows how hard you've been working, just by how hard we've been working. This drew a chorus of agreement, for Silgal was keeping many of the Jedi busy, trying to identify the location of the original Voxen, the Queen, as they now called her. Ganner had retraced the Sweet Surprise's route to and from Nova Station. Streen had searched the log for suspicious gaps, and Cheklev was still keeping a dozen scientists busy, analyzing pieces of the destroyed ship. Meanwhile, Anakin and his group rushed from planet to planet, retrieving Voxen corpses for Silgal, who plotted dispersal patterns and correlated data. The result of all that effort had been to confirm that all Voxen were indeed clones of a single creature, but also, and more importantly, 
to establish that their cells deteriorated at an accelerated rate. Silgal estimated that the creatures could survive no more than a few months after release, and Han knew she had been searching for a way to use the Force to make them age even more rapidly. With any luck, she had called today's meeting to announce her success. Luke allowed everyone a chance to express their support, then raised a hand to quiet the gathering. We have no complaints about Silgal's progress, but there is reason for concern. If Corrin and Mirax are missing, Booster Terek may take it on himself to go into the war zone after them. Not with Tion and Cam aboard, Han said. He and Glea had finally caught up to Booster between trips to Coruscant. They know where to find us. They won't let him try anything stupid without swinging by here to drop the students off. You're sure? Luke asked. That ship is carrying the next generation of Jedi Knights. Two of whom are his own grandchildren, Leia said. Booster wouldn't risk Valen and Gisela, even for Mirax. Luke considered this, then nodded. Good. I've been friends with Corn long enough to know he can take care of himself. But we'll all breathe easier if we don't have to worry about the Academy students. He fell silent for a moment, then said, Let's turn our attention to preventing the Voxen from taking any more of us. Silgal has some interesting news. Luke stepped over to Mara and smiled at the infant sleeping in her arms. The sight filled Han with a sense of calm, and he wondered if that was what it felt like to touch the Force. For a moment, the galaxy did not seem to be coming apart after all. The glue that held it together remained, and, Yuzhan Vong or not, it would still be there tomorrow. Silgal blinked twice and choked on her emotion and found her voice. My friends, I discovered something very interesting in the last voxen retrieved by Yulaha and Errol. She tipped her head toward the pair, both standing with the flock of young females that always seemed to gather around Anakin these days. In its stomach was a full-grown Isalamiri, and in the Isalamiri stomach were several Obio leaves. So these things eat Isalamiri? Raynar asked. During Han's visits to Yavin 4, he had noticed that questions seemed to boil out of the boy the way words bubbled out of young Tahiri, two more things that had survived the invasion of the Yuzhan Vong. Is that what you're telling us? No, Silgal is telling us where to find the queen, Jason said. You ran a metal study on the leaves? Silgal smiled. A perfect match. The leaves came from Mirker. Lando let out a low whistle, and Han drew a disapproving glance from Leia by expressing his emotions in a less eloquent fashion. Mirker was famous among smugglers for the high metal content of its trees, a trait that rendered orbital sensor readings unreliable and made the place perfect for secret bases. It was also the world of origination for both Vornskers and Isolamiri, the former being nasty four-legged predators that hunted the Force in their prey, the latter being docile reptiles that pushed the Force away from them in small areas. Under the best of conditions, it was hardly an ideal place to go voxen hunting, and the task was bound to be complicated by the fact that it lay about four hundred light-years behind Yuzhan Vong lines. Okay, Raynar said. So what's the good news? It's a start. Mara passed Ben to Luke, then looked to Silgal. You're sure the Queen is there? The Isolamiri couldn't have come from another place? It was Jason who answered. Not with those leaves in its stomach. If the leaves had come from somewhere else, the metal content would be far less. The Isolamiri ate on Mirker shortly before its death, Silgal agreed, and was eaten itself a short time later. I saw no sign of freezing or other preservation in the leaves. The room fell eerily silent. The question before the group was as obvious as it was pressing, and the Jedi were well enough attuned to each other to realize their next task was making a plan. Let us dismiss any thought of a massive attack out of hand, Yulaha Kor said. Even if we could assemble a large enough fleet, 
and we cannot. Our probability of success is below single digits. And the mere attempt would telegraph our intentions, Luke said. We must think of a better way. A commando force, Zek said. We sneak a small strike team in the back way. Not unless you are better at it than Wraith Squadron, uninterrupted. Before leaving Coruscant, he had stopped by the New Republic Defense Force Med Center to check on Wedge, and found the general in a garrulous mood. They've been trying to penetrate the frontier between Corellia and Vortex for six months. The Yuzhan Vong have Dovin basal interdictors everywhere. The wraiths were pulled out of every hyperspace lane they tried, and the stretch between the Perlemian trade route and the Hidian Way was especially bad. They were jumped this side of the frontier. Now we know why, Luke surmised. The Yuzhan Vong suspect we will discover this secret, and they're prepared for us to take action. I think they're counting on it, Tahiri said. Despite her age, at just over fifteen, she was the youngest Jedi present. Her comment commanded attention. Having survived a Yuzhan Vong shaper's attempt to turn her into a Jedi hunting slave, she understood the Yuzhan Vong better than anyone present. They have a saying. Let the enemy fight. I don't think they're trying to be fair. You are very right, Tahiri, Alima said. The praise drew only an icy glare in response, but the Twi'lek pretended not to notice. She addressed herself to Luke and the senior Jedi. On New Plimto, the Yuzhan Vong always tried to anticipate our response and build a trap around it. You can be sure they're looking for us now. Then we have to fool them. Anakin said, speaking in his typical tone of teenage certainty. He turned to the younger Jedi gathered around him. The Yuzhan Vong want us to surrender, right? So we do. And let them ferry us across the frontier. Go on, Luke said, deftly drawing attention back to the Assembly's more mature side. We're listening. Anakin disengaged himself from Tahiri and stepped toward his uncle. It'll buy time for Talfalio, too. That would be a plus, Luke said. How do we do this? You don't, Anakin said. We do. An felt Lando's hand on his arm even before he realized he was starting forward. Lando had been there when Leia finally laid into Han for nearly getting her killed at the droid demonstration. In no uncertain terms, she had told him that while she was glad to have him back, she would not tolerate overprotectiveness in a husband any more than she would in a Nogri bodyguard, who was certainly much better at it. The next time Han smothered her or one of their children with his deranged need to control, she had warned, he would find himself flying the Falcon alone. Han vowed to hear his younger son out, then stepped back and quietly thanked Lando for the reminder. Anakin looked back to his group. We'll have a traitor turn us over to the Yuzhan Vong on the pretext of buying time for the Talfalian hostages. We'll set up a transfer for somewhere near Obroa Sky. Let them cross the frontier, then take over the ship and fly to Mirkur. He turned to his older sister. I know Wedge, General Antilles, has let you fly a couple of captured Yuzhan Vong vessels. Can you teach Zack? Jaina studied him suspiciously. Why would I need to? You're not doing something that crazy without me. A look of distress came to Anakin's face. But you're only on temporary leave. The rogues could call you back any time. Sure they could. Jaina rolled her eyes. Then her face grew hard in the same way Leia's did when she would abide no argument. If you go, I go. Me too, Tahiri said. Anakin frowned. You? You're too, if you say young, I'll kick you where you really don't want to be kicked. Tahiri interrupted. Nobody here knows the Yuzhan Vong from the inside like I do. Can anyone else, except you maybe, be sure they'd know a shaper laboratory? Can anyone else understand the language? Good point, Jaina said. We'll need her help to run the ship. Anakin frowned at his sister. Can you fly a Yuzhan Vong ship or not? If Wedge just had you put on the cognition hood or something, I've flown. And so has Tahiri, unless you've forgotten, Jaina said. 
She was referring to Anakin's narrow escape in the Yogg-Dul system a few months before, when, along with Corrin Horn and Tahiri, he escaped an almost certain death by capturing the Yuzhan Vong scouting ship. Most of the piloting stuff is symbolic, but who knows about the rest? There's more to this than flying. And what happens when they start hailing us? Tahiri asked. You'll need to know what they're saying, and how to answer. She glanced around the room expectantly. When no one responded, Han bit his tongue and waited for his brother-in-law to shoot down the plan. Luke was very patient. Han counted the seconds, determined to heed his wife's warning, yet just as determined to keep his family safe. All of it. Han made it to five seconds before his brother-in-law's silence grew unbearable. What are you waiting for, Luke? Han shook off Lando's hand and stepped into the Jedi Circle. Tell him why this isn't going to work. Anakin's blue eyes darkened to angry amethyst. Why don't you tell me, Dad? All right, I will. He spun toward his son. It won't work because... Han was so angry he found it difficult to think of a reason. Because you can't be certain you'll escape. Actually, I think I can. At least, reasonably certain. Despite the indignation in his eyes, Anakin's voice remained calm. I went behind Yuzhan Vong lines to rescue Tahiri, and I have this. He touched his lambent, modulated lightsaber. But most of all, I know how they think. We know how they think, Tahiri corrected. You know how they think? Han stormed. They aren't going to be thinking fud bugs at you. Leia took his arm. Han, he shook her off, and I'll give you another reason. You can't do it because it's crazy. He shook a finger in his son's face and was vaguely surprised to realize he was shaking it at the height of his own nose. Because you're not going, that's why. Han. Leia pulled him away. This isn't your decision. Han turned to scowl. It sure isn't Anakin's. When he turned back to Anakin, he was surprised to find his son glaring at him, more hurt than angry, yet unyielding and completely sure of himself. It was so teenage, so classically rebellious. But there was also a stoniness that even Han could not miss, a hardness born of battles already lost and won, tempered by the anguish of fallen comrades and missing friends. At seventeen, Anakin was as much a man as Han had been at thirty had probably seen as much combat and spilled more blood than Han had in the rebellion. And he was still so young. Han, the decision is Luke's, Leia said. Not Anakin's, not yours. She interposed herself between father and son, then gently turned Han away, leaving him to wonder where he had been when his son, when all his children, had grown into adults. The answer, of course, was lost. Lost in wallowing in his grief as the object of that grief would never have wanted. But the old Han Solo was back now, and the old Han Solo was not about to let the Yuzhan Vong or anyone else take his family from him. He turned to Luke. This isn't a mission, it's a sacrifice. You can't send him in there. Not Anakin, not any of them. Luke studied the floor for a moment, then turned to Anakin. It feels right, Anakin, but I'll lead the strike team. You stay here. Anakin's face fell, and with it Han's heart, but that did not stop him from feeling relieved. Luke had done this sort of thing before. Han had been there helping, and, despite the queasy look on Mara's face, he knew Luke would come back especially if Han went along to keep him out of trouble. He looked over to Mara to reassure her, and saw that no reassurance was needed. Mara's jaw was set and her eyes were hard, but there was a calmness in her expression that Han found difficult to understand. A knowledge of the danger and all it might cost her, and yet a stoic acceptance of fact. Somebody had to kill the Voxen, and if it had to be Luke, then it had to be. Anakin studied his uncle for a moment, then managed a curt nod and stepped back into his group. 
he refused to meet his father's eye. For a time Han thought Anakin would leave the chamber, but his son had grown into a man in so many more ways than he realized. Seeming to sense how his reaction would dictate that of his large circle of friends, Anakin remained with the group, ready to offer Luke his full support. After a tense moment of silence, Tenel Ka stepped forward. Her usual Dathomir warrior's dress, now covered by the ubiquitous vacuum emergency suit, still necessary everywhere on Eclipse. Master Skywalker, forgive me for speaking so candidly, but have you lost your mind? The young woman's customary bluntness filled the room with uneasy chuckles. Even Luke smiled. I don't think so. Why? Because you must know that Anakin's plan would never work for you, she said. It depends on the Yuzhan Vong taking us for granted, and that would never happen with any Jedi Master. Even if they did not kill you on the spot, they would take every precaution to render you helpless. She has a point, Ganner said. The leader has to be someone they won't be too worried about, and someone they'll believe could be duped by a traitor. He flashed a white smile beneath his mustache. Someone like me. Even Han could sense the reluctance of the other Jedi. When no one volunteered to join the handsome Jedi Knight, Jason said, Maybe none of us should be going. This drew a frown from both of his siblings, and Anakin said, Jason, this is no time to stand around debating good and evil. Either we kill those things, or those things kill the Jedi. And if we destroy the Queen, the Yuzhan Vong will retaliate against New Republic citizens even more severely, Jason replied. Do we want that on our heads? Jason, the blood is not on our hands, Alima said, Leku trembling angrily. It is on theirs. A convenient position. But will it save more lives than it costs? Yulaha asked. As Jedi, that must be our only concern. And they were off, voices rising and gestures growing sharp as they argued the same point they had been contesting since the destruction of the Nebula Chaser. Alima spoke most forcefully against Jason, no doubt because she could not bear the burden of New Plimpto's destruction and her sister's death. Yulaha and Jason led the argument for Jedi responsibility. They were supported by a surprisingly large number, including Streen, Silgal, and, most astonishingly, the Barabel Hatchmates. In the end, the debate grew so heated that C-3PO had to be summoned to take a crying Ben to his nursery, and Luke was forced to call repeatedly for quiet. Finally, he used the Force to project his voice directly into the mind of everyone present, and a silence as tense as it was embarrassed fell over the room. Luke glanced over the Jedi calmly, then spoke in barely a whisper. It comes down to a simple question. How do we fight a brutal, evil enemy without growing brutal and evil ourselves? This is so. Tenelka confirmed. Luke looked at her for a moment, then shook his head wearily. I wish I had the answer, but the Force has refused to guide me in this, as it has all of you, I think. He waited a moment, and when no one denied this, continued. What has grown clear to me is that the time has come for us to choose one path. I assume there is no one among us who believes we should actually surrender to the Yuzhan Vong. Though Jason alarmed Han by briefly looking as though he might disagree, he remained as silent as the rest of the Jedi. Luke nodded, as I thought. So, do we destroy the Voxen and risk more retaliation? Or do we accept our losses in the hope that, doing so, will save the New Republic many more lives than it costs us. What are you asking for? Ganner demanded. A vote? Your opinion. Luke clarified. Whatever I decide, I want to know that everyone has been heard. Ganner considered this for a moment, then nodded. All right. I say we go after the Queen. Accept our losses. The first barabel, Tisar Sebatine, rasped. His female hatchmates echoed his sentiment, and Luke started around the circle. 
Though Han felt in his heart that they should go after the queen, he could not help giving a silent cheer every time someone supported accepting their losses. Kennel Ka had been right about a Jedi Master not being able to lead the strike team, which meant that Anakin, and no doubt Jaina too, would be trusting their lives to a plan almost as foolhardy as trying to break Leia out of the Death Star's detention center. If the Jedi opted for accepting their losses, at least he and Leia would be close by in the Falcon to keep an eye on their children, until a pack of Voxen caught them. Sooner or later, somebody was going to have to destroy that queen. Han just did not see why it had to be his children. By the time the question came around to Leia's end of the circle, opinion was divided almost evenly, with a slight edge toward destroying the Voxen. Lando leaned close to Han. You can breathe easy, old buddy. Leia and Mara will want to go after the Queen, but Silgal and Streen are against it. Though Han knew no gambler in the galaxy could read faces as well as Lando Calrissian, he did not feel as relieved as he might have. The way Leia looked at him made clear enough how she felt about Anakin's injured pride. But there was more to it than her anger. Han was being selfish, and she knew it. And she knew what his selfishness might cost the Jedi in the end. Han? Caught by surprise, Han looked from Leia to her brother. Yeah? Your opinion? Mine? You're part of this, Luke said. You have a say. Han glanced back to Leia, and, seeing the silent plea in her eyes, wondered how she could be so strong. Okay, give me a minute. He closed his eyes and, wishing someone could teach him one of those Jedi relaxation techniques, tried to calm himself with a few deep breaths. It didn't help. Not really. He knew why his son wanted to lead this mission, why Anakin had fought in every major Jedi battle since the invasion began, why he had charged off alone to rescue Tahiri. Chewbacca. No matter how much Anakin claimed otherwise, it all came down to Chewbacca. Dad, Anakin said, just do what you think's right. I didn't need to hear that. I really didn't. Han opened his eyes and found his son standing in front of him. He started to take the boy by his shoulders, but realized how ridiculous he would look, spreading his arms so wide and clasped a forearm instead. You don't have to do this, you know. I know. The hurt in Anakin's face was instantly replaced by an alarming brashness. But I'm going to. With the uneasy feeling that he had seen the same cocky look in the mirror thirty years before, Han turned and found Leia staring at him open-mouthed. He shrugged and gave her a lopsided grin. Kids, what can you do? I take it you favor destroying the Queen, Luke said. He finished the polling, which came out exactly as Landau had predicted, except that with Han behind the mission, Luke decided to go after the Voxen Queen. I expect everyone present to support this decision, he said. We'll do what we can to protect the innocent. But we will be sending a strike team to Mirker. Jason turned to his brother. Then let me be the first to volunteer. You? No one looked more surprised than Anakin. But you're against it. That doesn't matter, Jason said. Nobody is as good with animals as I am. If you have to track down the queen or something, you're going to need me. When he's right, he's right, little brother, Jaina said, stepping to her twin's side. And I believe we've already agreed that I'm coming. Like I had a choice. Anakin smiled, then turned to the other young Jedi around him. Anyone who wants to volunteer, see me later, after we've put together some kind of plan. Han felt like his knees would buckle. All three of them were going, all of his children on the same crazy mission. And he wouldn't be there to protect them. Couldn't even consider going along because he wasn't a Jedi. Leia looked no happier than he. Her face was pale, her lip trembling and still she somehow found the strength to hold her head up and look proud. 
There is one condition, she said, turning to Lando. I want you to deliver them. For the first time in a very long while, Lando looked surprised. Me? You're the only one who can make this work, Leia said. I know I wasn't much help with Borsk, but if you'll do this... Lando raised his hands. We're way past favors here, he said. I'll help any way I can. Chapter 14 The hulking war droid rotated two hundred degrees on his waist coupling and pointed the business end of his blaster arm at Raynar Thule. Plan point fourteen, Private. I'm not a private. Raynar was dressed as usual in the colors of his family's merchant house. In this case, scarlet breeches, purple waist sash, and a golden tunic that matched the color of his bristly blonde hair. We're not in the military. Point fourteen, one one a insisted. Raynar rolled his eyes. The crew bursts into the dining area and gets the drop on the Jedi, he said. Point fifteen, the Jedi yield their weapons. Lightsabers, one one a corrected, and I did not ask for point fifteen, soldier. I'm not a soldier, Raynar said wearily. Anakin and the sixteen members of his strike team were sitting on the lush, conform couches on the observation deck of Lando Calrissian's private space yacht. Rehearsing the plan Anakin had worked out with Luke, Lando, his father, mother, and about half the Jedi on Eclipse. There were a thousand little details, but basically, the scheme called for the Lady Lux crew to surprise the Jedi when the Yuzhan Vong boarded. As the invaders took their prisoners away, a pair of YVH war droids would slip out of the disposal lock with an equipment pod and attach to the bottom of the enemy boarding shuttle. When the shuttle returned to its mothership, the droids would ride along, concealed from view by the shuttle itself. To make certain the droids went undetected, the strike team would stage a diversion. Point 32, sir. Recalling that the droid considered him the group officer, Anakin looked up to find 1-1-A's blaster arm leveled at his face. As usual, staring down the black tunnel of death brought his thoughts into sharp focus. I used the force to tear open the weapons locker and pass out blasters, Anakin said. The blasters will be stored with power packs disengaged. This part troubles me, Tenel Ka said. Surely the Yuzhan Vong will find it too convenient. Consider the alternative, Lando said, stepping onto the observation deck with them. My crew is all volunteer, but they won't die just to make things look good. Which only proves her point, Ganner said. As the oldest Jedi Knight aboard, he would serve as a decoy commander so that Anakin would remain free, or as free as possible, to quietly lead the group. The Yuzhan Vong aren't stupid. No, they're not, which is why I can sell this, Lando said. Disengaging power packs is a common safety procedure, one that anyone about to betray a shipload of Jedi would certainly take. This came up in the planning meeting, Anakin said. Dad thought it was a good idea. Ganner shrugged, then, much to Anakin's relief, nodded. Serving as a decoy leader had been Ganner's own suggestion, and Anakin's biggest worry so far was that the older man would have trouble separating the two roles. I have a question, Raynar said. Why am I not surprised? Jaina muttered. Lando smiled. Ask away. You need to be confident in this plan. You Jean Vong ships are alive, right? he asked. So how come this one isn't going to feel the droids attaching? That would be like a shenbit feeling something on its shell. Bellahara rasped. Armor serves no purpose if one feels pain when it is struck. These are hulls, not armor, Raynar objected. And if the ships were alive... They're not alive like that, Jaina said. They have brains, but the brains only control certain functions, like computers do aboard our ships. And they don't have feeling in their hulls. At least none of the ships I've been on did. They couldn't, Jason said. Feeling requires nerve endings, and nerve endings close enough to feel the exterior of the hull would freeze solid. Imagine standing on Hoth, barefoot. 
This seemed to convince Raynar. He winced and nodded to Lando. Thanks. Now I'm confident. YVH-11A swiveled toward Lobaka. Point thirty-three, Private. Lobaka groaned something long and low that Anakin recognized as a crude offer involving a memory wipe. The Wookiee's translation droid, MTD, flitted down in front of him. Are you sure you want to say that to a war droid, Master Lobaka? When Lobaka answered with a growl, MTD zipped around behind Techley and emitted a burst of static that caused 11A's photoreceptors to light. Lando interposed himself between Lobaka and the war droid. That's all for now, 11A. Stand down. He shot Lobaka a weary look, then turned to the others. We've transferred the extra two YVHs and your equipment pod, and Tendra is down on the bridge plotting our route with the crew. We're ready, Tahiri said confidently. 11A has seen to that. Lando's expression grew even more stern. 11A is a droid. He can make you drill in practice, but he can't prepare you. Not for something like this. I'm not sure I understand, Yulaha Kor ventured. Our rehearsals have been flawless. Certainly, we must be ready to improvise. Every good ensemble is. But current projections give us a... 72% chance of success. Anakin did not want to ask about the margin of error. There were still so many unknowns that he suspected the swing could place their chances either above 100% or below 50. Lando sat across from the Bith and stared into her glassy eyes his own gaze harder and colder than Anakin had ever seen. What I'm talking about can't be measured. He glanced at the others. Things are going to go wrong. No matter how many times we rehearse, no matter how well we plan, this isn't going to happen the way we expect. You'll need to react fast. No different from any battle, Ganner said. This isn't a battle, Rysode. Get that into your head. Lando glared at Ganner until Ganner looked away, then continued to glare some more. You're not going as warriors. You're going as spies. You'll have to do things that don't sit well inside. You can't balk. You can't even hesitate. We won't. It was Alima Rar who said this, and Anakin knew by the look in her eyes that she, at least, understood exactly what Lando was telling them. I won't. Lando studied the Twi'lek only a moment before nodding. You've been there, I know. He turned to the others and said, Watch Alima. She'll do what's necessary, and so should you. What are you saying? Jason asked. That any means justify the ends? He means we have only two concerns, Alima said, the silkiness of her voice belying the steel of her words. The first is to complete our mission. The second is to return alive. That way lies the dark side, Jason insisted. If we have no concern for the methods we use to win our goals, we are no better than the Emperor. Or the Yuzhan Vong. Perhaps so, Alima agreed. But if the path before us is dark, we dare not shy away. Not for our own sakes, but for the sake of those who will fall if we fail. And for Numa and Lusa, and Elissa and everyone else the Voxen have taken already, Raynar added. Alima rewarded his support with a vaguely promising smile. Of course, for their sakes most of all. No. Vengeance leads to the dark side, Zek said. I won't be a part of something like that. Everyone started to talk at once. Alima and Raynar arguing that destroying the Voxen and defeating the Yuzhan Vong would justify any action. Zek telling them they didn't know what they were talking about. Jason insisting it was wrong to put the ends before the means. Though the others seemed to fall somewhere between the two poles, they spoke just as loudly, drawing even Errol Besa and Joven Drark, an imperturbable Rodian, into the argument on opposite sides. Only the Barabels, squatting in the corner with the reptilian pupils narrowed to vertical slits, seemed in possession of themselves. Anakin sighed deep inside, 
then noticed Lando watching him, and realized just how wise his mother had been in choosing the arms merchant to ferry them to the enemy. As sincere as Lando's warning about not hesitating might be, there was a hidden agenda behind his words. Knowing the strike team was going to have this argument eventually, he had intentionally provoked it, while they could take time to work things through. And now he was waiting for Anakin to solve the problem. Quiet! Anakin waited a moment, then tried again, and when that failed, shouted, Shut up! That's an order! His rudeness and the force he used to augment his voice finally got through to the others. Before the argument could resume, he continued, Nobody is turning to the dark side on this mission. He glared at Raynar and Alima. Is that clear? I didn't mean to suggest we should, Alima began quietly. Only that we can't shy. Is that clear? Anakin demanded again. Alima's leku curled at the tips, but she pushed her lip out and said, Of course, Anakin. Anakin felt more than glimpsed the strange smirk that came to Tahiri's face. While she was not fond of any of the strike team's female Jedi, she seemed to truly dislike Alima. Deciding to puzzle over the matter later, he turned to Raynar and cocked his brow. Raynar nodded. Fine. Who'd want to anyway? Anakin accepted this and turned to Zack and Jason. But Lando's right. We may have to do some things we don't feel good about and do them quickly. If you can't live with that, maybe you should catch a ride home on the freighter. What kind of things? Jason asked. If we talk about our limits now, Jason, Anakin hissed. Can you do this? Instead of answering, Jason looked around for support. He found it, of course, especially from Zek and Tenel Ka, but Anakin began to think even his brother's special talent for handling animals might not be worth the discord he would bring to the team. He looked to Lando for guidance, but found only the expressionless face of a seasoned gambler. Anakin would have to solve this problem on his own. Where they were going, there would be no advice from old heroes of the Rebellion. Anakin took a deep breath, using a Jedi relaxation technique to clear his mind so he could concentrate. Throughout the Yuzhan Vong invasion, he and Jason had been drifting apart, until they had reached a point where they had barely been able to speak to each other without an undercurrent of resentment and blame. Those wounds were only now beginning to heal. The last thing Anakin wanted to do was remove his brother from the team and open them again. But he had to think of the mission, and of the others who would be on it. Anakin turned to his brother. Jason, maybe. Anakin, I've had a brainstorm. Though Jaina's tone was enthusiastic, Anakin could feel his sister's agitation through the Force. Nearly as troubled by the schism as the brothers themselves, she had spoken to them both about trying to bridge it. You know how we've been worried about the breaking? Yeah? Anakin answered cautiously. Everyone on Eclipse knew how much value the Yuzhan Vong placed on trying to break the will of Jedi prisoners. His biggest concern was that their captors would start it aboard the transfer vessel and that someone in the group would not be able to endure it long enough to cross the frontier. What's that have to do with what we're talking about? You remember how we used that telepathic force union during that first Yuzhan Vong attack at Dubrillion? Jaina asked. The three siblings had reached out to each other through the force to share perceptions. What if Jason could help us all do that? We could use the link to bolster each other mentally and emotionally. This is a good plan, Tenelka said. Every interrogator knows that mental isolation is key to breaking a victim's resistance. Anakin saw the potential, just as he saw how desperately his sister was trying to prevent the gulf between him and Jason from widening any farther. Cautiously he asked, How can we do that? Jaina's expression grew confident. I've been talking to Tisar and his hatchmates about the Wild Knight's combat tactics. She glanced in the Barabelle's direction. 
I think we could adapt a couple to our situation. Yes, this one thinks we could, Tisar said. Perhaps we could even use the bond to create a big meld fight. Anakin raised his brow. Meld fight was what the Barabels had called their incredible display of cohesion during the confused battle at Fra's. An interesting possibility. But we'd need Jason, Jaina pressed. He's the only one with enough empathic power to bind us all together. Or to drive us apart, Anakin thought. But as he studied the expectant faces watching him, he realized much of the damage had been done already. Sending Jason back now would not only disappoint his sister, it would alienate Zek, Tenel Ka, and many of the others who shared his concerns about the dark side. It would also widen the gulf between the two brothers, and Anakin wanted that about as much as he wanted another Yuzhan Vong slave seed implanted in his head. Jason, you have to do what I say when I say it. Anakin caught his brother's gaze and held it. If something feels wrong, it's on my head, not yours. If you can't live with that, I'm sorry, but you can't come. Having sensed how close Anakin had been to sending him home before, Jason knew better than to hesitate. He nodded and said, I trust your judgment, Anakin. I really do. Chapter 15 The data readouts went wild. Then Danny was slammed back into her G-seat as one ton put them into a tight turn. A stocky, brub reptoid from gravity-heavy barrows, one ton kept the inertial compensators dialed down to ninety-two percent because he liked to know when the blast boat shuddered. If someone in the crew got sick or blacked out for a few seconds, that was better than stressing the ancient hull welds. Danny fought to keep the purple out of her vision and strained to watch her display. The readouts continued to dance. It didn't mean she had solved her riddle. Saba Sebatin had not even said there was a Yamisk present. But it meant something. The gunners vaporized the skips with a volley of stutter fire from the blast boat's big laser cannons. Then Danny's skin prickled with sudden apprehension. Still, she resisted the temptation to look away from her instruments. The readouts were rising and falling in intermittent surges that looked suspiciously contrived, and Danny would not let herself be distracted. Her fingers began to fly over her control panels, defining sensor sweeps and activating recorders. Saba, could there be a Yamask out there? She still did not look away from her instruments. Please tell me there's a Yamask out there. Oh, yes, there is a Yamask. No doubt. Saba's tone was distracted, and she did not seem to catch the significance of Danny's question. Speaking into the blast boat's comm unit, she ordered, Wild Nights, prepare for return to the Jolly Man. Break left on this one's mark. Danny braced herself. The Jolly Man was not the cramped blast boat in which she was riding, but a fast freighter standing some distance off in a pocket of space dust. It served the squadron as a mobile base, and to carry the vigilances and howl runners, which had no hyperdrives, into and out of battle. Three, two, mark. Danny strained to keep her head turned toward her data screens as one ton whipped the blast boat around. Several more readouts jumped to life, hovered there an instant, then dropped back to close zero. When the data bars she had been watching answered with a flurry of oscillations, Danny ruled out coincidence. She was seeing a comm code, not some random graviton eddy. Saba must have felt her excitement through the force, for the bear bell rasped, You have found something, Danny Quee. I think so. The blast boat's hull thrummed as the gunners opened up. Gravitic modulation. That's how the Yamask communicates. Ah. For the Barabel, it was almost a cry of excitement. Crimson flashes filled the ship interior as plasma balls started to burst against the shields. If this one may make a suggestion, you should open a comm feed so your data will not be lost. Danny tore her eyes away from her data screens. Sith sabers. 
curving through space to intercept them, was what at first looked like an entire ring of asteroids, but which the plasma-burping nodules on the closest monoliths quickly identified as an enemy fleet. She could not believe even the Wild Knights warranted such an effort. Then she realized they did not. For the past few days, the squadron had been working a choke point not far from the gem-mining world of Arcania, ambushing Yuzhan Vong corvettes as they felt their way out of the war zone. Everyone had assumed these patrols were merely scouting New Republic positions, but now it seemed obvious that they had been clearing an invasion route. Danny did not need a galactic holograph to know that capturing Arcania would put the Yuzhan Vong close to both the Perlemian trade route and the Hidian Way and in position to threaten much of the colony's region. She opened the data feed to the Jolly Man, then added an urgent alert for the subspace emergency band. The leading elements of the fleet fired a volley of magma missiles, forcing one ton to put the blast boat into a stomach-churning series of loops and rolls. Saba ordered him to turn up the inertial compensator so she could stay conscious. The enemy fleet was now so close it looked like one huge spray of Yorick coral. One of the large lumps opened its nose and vomited grutchens, half-meter insects resembling turf hoppers. The blast boat's gunners switched targets, laying a barrage of laser fire in the creature's path. Those things could eat through a titanium hull in seconds. Saba spoke into the comm unit. There is our target, the cruiser at the bottom of the formation. Do you see it? The one on the end... Griff Lidge, pilot of one of the squadron's old T-65 X-wings, calmed. No, that they will expect, Saba said. Three ships in. He is ahead of himself. Got it, Griff replied. A flurry of comm clicks confirmed everyone else did, too, and Danny sensed the squadron's fear changing to resolve. Saba said, Glow ball in five, four. Ezal was. An Arcona gunner with a nasty salt habit stopped firing and drew inward. Though his compound eyes were incapable of distinguishing shapes, their sensitivity to movement made him the best gunner in the squadron. As Saba continued her countdown, those golden eyes grew glassy and distant, like they did during a salt binge, and the veins on his anvil-shaped head popped in concentration. Mark, Saba said. A white sphere of illumination engulfed the blast boat. Danny thought, shield overload, but one ton straightened out and they accelerated. When no plasma balls came boiling through the hull, she looked outside and found the squadron camouflaged in a sun-bright orb. What's this? Danny gasped. You have seen ghost suns? Saba asked. Perhelions? Of course, Danny said. Sometimes from two suns at once. It is like that, Saba explained. Ezal Waz calls it his glowball. He is using the force to collect light. Danny eyed Ezal with newfound respect. What's it do? What does it do? Saba sissed at this. It hides us. Is that not enough? Though the sphere had to be a kilometer across, the wild knights were clustered close to the blast boat, a dozen ghostly shapes pooling defenses. Drift's X-wing hung just meters away. Its ion engines were pouring blue efflux into the glowball, feeding the intensity of the general radiance. Plasma balls and magma missiles continued to pour blindly into the glowball, but most missed by a wide margin, and those that came close were defeated by the wild knights' combined defenses. Does the Jolly Man have enough data yet? Saba asked. Danny checked her instruments. The readouts were dancing like crazy. This is good stuff, she said. The longer we stay, the better. Saba's diamond-shaped pupils narrowed. But do they have enough? Danny did a quick statistical calculation in her head, then nodded. We could use a higher significance level, but... We must train you to fly an A-wing, Danny Quee. The Wild Knights could use someone as crazy as you. Saba turned and calmed. Short hoppers, break for the Jolly Man. We'll see you at home. Shielded by the still-expanding glowball, the squadron's two howl-runners and three vigilances 
broke for the fast freighter. Passive sensors, no lasers, Saba ordered. She turned to Danny and pointed at Ezal, who was slumped in a trance at the upper cannon turret. Change places. The glow ball requires his concentration. Danny eyed the big Arcona, trying to imagine how she was going to move someone more than twice her size without breaking his concentration. Uh, I don't think I can lift him, she said. Maybe you could. This one could. But she told you to. Saba glared out of one dark eye. You are Jedi, Danny Kui. Size matters not. Danny swallowed. She had been studying the Force for almost two years now, but no one seemed able to explain the theory behind it. Even Luke always spoke of feeling and doing, never how or why. And it was still the last solution that came to mind. An impatient tongue began to flicker between Saba's pebbly lips. Danny let out a long, relaxing breath, then pictured the tall Arcona slipping out of his seat and coming to a rest in the one opposite her, then reached out with the Force and made it so. To her relief, Ezal settled into the chair as though he had moved himself, and the glow ball remained intact. Danny started to climb into the turret as ordered, but Saba caught her by the shoulder and pulled her back down. Do you never train Danny Kui? She climbed into the turret. This one will save us herself. Watch. Learn. Danny did not understand until a moment later when a volley of magma missiles came streaking in and her heart leapt into her throat. She felt the Y-wing weapon operators reach out and start nudging, and then there was no time for questions. A crimson spiral loomed large. Saba pushed, and it shot past meters above her turret. Someone else redirected a Gretchen, and Danny spent the next eternity watching the Barabelle use the force to push, lift, and turn Yuzhan Vong missiles. Finally, Saba asked, What does your machine say now, Danny Kui? Has the Yamask seen through our ruse? Danny stepped over to look at her display. The gravity arrow readouts were dancing. Same as before, she reported. The Yamask seems to be giving orders. Everyone else is quiet. What that means, I have no idea. Saba bared her needle teeth and sissed in satisfaction. It means it thinks it has us. She dropped out of the turret and motioned Danny back into the gunner's seat. Ready all weapons. Back out and drop the block on this one's mark. Three, two. Danny barely climbed into the turret before Mark. The cargo door thumped open, expelling a two-ton square of durasteel and the blast boat decelerated and slammed her into the transparasteel dome. And she grabbed for the cannon triggers and pushed herself into the firing seat. Outside, the sun-like sphere of the glow ball was shrinking away, with a comet's tail of magma missiles, plasma balls, and gretchens trailing behind. An uproarious rasp erupted from the blast boat's main deck, where Saba stood over the instrument panel, scaly shoulders shaking as the data readouts danced. Oh. That got them, she sissed. That got them good. A plasma ball erupted against the shields, and Drift's voice came over the comm speaker. Danny, the hostiles are behind us. Sorry. She spun the turret around to see the Wild Knight's fighters looping up to meet a dozen coral skippers. Pointing more than aiming, she squeezed the triggers and felt the twin laser cannons come to life. Long streaks of crimson stained the starlit darkness, forcing the skips to roll and twist as they descended on the squadron. The blast boat jerked forward. Then one ton announced, The cruiser wants to pull our shields. Squadron, form on the blast boat on this one's mark, Saba said. Five. The blast boat slipped backward, and one ton reported, Shields gone. To one mark. Saba finished. The blast boat accelerated. Danny's laser cannons went wild, catching a coral skipper by sheer chance and reducing it to pebbles. The X-wings and Y-wings looped back to encircle the blast boat, masking the larger ship behind their own shields. 
Keep firing, Danny, Drift urged. You've got our backs. Danny swung the cannons toward the largest lump in the sky, a Corvette analog angling down to cut them off, and squeezed the triggers. Her crimson bolts shot straight into its nose and vanished into a black hole. She strafed the hull at full power, back and forth, back and forth. The shielding crews continued to catch her attacks, but the Corvette fell behind as its Dovin basils diverted to protecting the ship. Danny fired a few more seconds, until the battle drew too close to the enemy cruiser and the Corvette and Coral Skippers broke off. She swung her cannons forward, a mere two hundred meters distant. The glow ball was as large as a Class Three comet, and space beyond was filled by the Yuzhan Vong cruiser, a lumpy silhouette as big as some moons, spewing plasma and magma into the glow ball. The golden sphere flattened and began to shrink as the enemy shielding crews drew it toward one of their singularities. Ready missiles and torpedoes. Spread pattern, Saba ordered. Hold. Hold. The glow ball distorted into an undulating flower pattern and shrank to the size of Danny's thumbnail. Fire all, Saba commanded. Cancel glow ball. The glow ball blinked out of existence. Then Ezol thumped to the deck, exhausted. The Yuzhan Vong cruiser fell ominously dark as the weapons crews struggled to retrain their weapons. The Wild Knights launched a second, then third volley of concussion missiles and proton torpedoes, and suddenly the darkness ahead was all spiraling ion trails and looping plasma trails. Dark and blast tinting. Saba used the force to lift Ezol back into his seat, then swung around and strapped him in. Prepare for concussion impact. Concussion impact, Danny cried, grabbing her seat restraints. You're ramming it? Ramming it? Saba erupted into a fit of sissing, and even one ton rumbled with laughter. Danny Kui, you are so crazy. Then Danny remembered the block. The block the Yuzhan Vong could not have seen when they grabbed the glow ball. The two tons of durasteel accelerated to no small percentage of light speed. The energy on impact would be equal to mass multiplied by velocity squared, divided by... Danny was still doing the calculations when space turned white. Chapter 16 The Kufi fell and the sanctum filled with the strange odor of alien blood and an endless undulating wail. Savong La waited until the priests began their real work, then stepped away from the spatter pit so he could focus his thoughts on the bungled sneak attack. You do not wish to know Yun Yamka's will? Rajir asked, one eye still fixed on the howling slave. The slayer's will is no mystery. How to accomplish it? That is another matter. He waved his hand toward the priests and their sacrifice. They serve in their way, I in mine. Virgir's beak-like mouth cracked open in what Savong La had come to recognize as a mocking smile. You doubt the accuracy of Vekta's seers? Only the gods are infallible. Savong La glanced into the pit and smiled at what was happening there. The priests are faithful servants, but until they can tell me how the Jedi work their magic, I must do my own work. You make too much of these Jedi. Virgir looked back to the spatter pit, and fixed her eye on the shrieking sacrifice. The Athorian's T-shaped head curled in her direction. His gaze lingering on hers as his eyes grew glassy and distant. His screams subsided much sooner than they should have, and he slipped into that strange tranquility that sometimes came over slaves, even in their most anguished moments. A priest stepped in front of the Athorian and tried unsuccessfully to draw him back into his pain. A pity for the invasion. Virgir's tone was that of a thwarted child, the priests are sure to take a dim view of that. Savong La glanced down to find her feathers hanging flat in disappointment. Sometimes 
she seemed more a Yuzhan Vong to him than his own warriors. It was a Jedi squadron that intercepted the invasion of Arcania, he said, returning to her earlier remark, and it was only two Jedi who forced us to sacrifice New Plimpto. Then destroy the Talthalian convoys, Rajir said. That will draw them out. Savong La raised his brow. And sacrifice no monor? It would not be such a sacrifice. Savong La smiled faintly. You have high ambitions for such an unassuming creature. Vekta stepped over to their side of the spatter pit and looked up. A stoop-shouldered female with an aged and wrinkled face. She did not bow to Savong La or cross her blood-streaked arms in salute. During a ritual, the priestess was beholden to Lord Shimra himself, and would die, gladly, before offering deference to any other. The slave's silence will not please the slayer. You should not go through with the attack. Savong La looked away from her. The decision is mine. Lord Shimra has made that clear, she agreed. I was given to believe Lord Shimra also made clear you should consider the will of the gods in all things. Savong La continued to look away. But the decision is mine. Victor did not disagree. Good. Savong La looked back to the priestess. You will ask Yun Yumka to punish the commanders who allowed the Jedi squadron to escape. I will order their replacements to make a half-hearted assault on the planet and withdraw. If you tease Yunyamka, he will want lives, Vekta warned. Many lives. Of course. Though Savong La felt certain the god of war would understand the value of a good feint, it was better to be safe about these things. He shall have eight thousand. Twenty thousand would be better, Victor retorted. Twenty, then. Savong La turned and left the sanctum, already adjusting his plans to accommodate the ritual. The extra sacrifices would require a full escort instead of a single ship, putting an unnecessary strain on his already overextended logistics train. Virgir waddled up to his side. Why take that from Vekta? Even with reinforcements, the New Republic can't hold Arcania. Capture it, and make a fool of her. Savongla whirled on Virgir. You question my judgment? He raised his foot as though to kick her. You think you know better than I how to win battles? Virgir gave his leg a contemptuous glance, then bristled her feathers, and moved a step closer. If you have a better idea, all you need do is say so. It was all Savong La could do not to burst out laughing. Around you? I think not. Supreme commanders and high prefects trembled at his slightest frown. Yet Virgir... This ugly little bird dismissed his fury as though it were nothing. You, I must watch. It will amuse me, if nothing else. Chapter 17 Lando let his sweaty palm brush against his pant leg, then transferred the data pad to the somewhat drier hand and displayed the screen to the subaltern of the Yuzhan Vong boarding party. The picture showed seventeen young Jedi knights crowded around the Lady Lux dining table. Though their bowls were filled with green thacatillo, Lando had ordered his chef to serve only the finest fare on this journey. None of the Jedi were eating. Most were not even holding their spoons. They seem agitated, the subaltern said. A brutish warrior with a fringe of spindly black hair, he stared at the data pad from arm's length, as though keeping his distance would prevent the instrument from defiling him. 
You are sure they do not know we are here? They're Jedi, Lando answered, feigning irritation at a foolish question. They can certainly sense my crew's apprehension. But I won't claim to know what's in their minds. All I can say is the viewports have been closed the entire trip. After a moment, the subaltern nodded to himself and turned to an unarmed, but heavily armored, superior waiting outside the Lady Luck's airlock. Edag lightsabers. Duminyakt. Yeneg Doajidai. The superior stepped out of the red-ribbed transfer tunnel. A little smaller than his subordinates, this one had sculpted his face into a gridwork of raised scars. Like the subaltern of the boarding party, he wore two small villops on his shoulders instead of the usual one. He stopped across from Lando and looked expectant. This is Fitzgibbon Lane, holder of the Star Dream, the subaltern said, supplying the false names Lando was traveling under. He is the one who sent the message. Lando stared at the subaltern and waited for him to introduce his leader. When the warrior grew uncomfortable and looked down, Lando shifted his gaze to the superior and continued to wait. As nervous as he was about this particular swindle, he knew better than to open negotiations on anything less than equal footing. After a moment, the superior said, I am Duman Yacht, commander of the exquisite death. You have some Jedi for me? For your war master, Lando corrected. Taking the commander's presence as a sign of eagerness, he turned the data pad toward the Yuzhan Vong and dangled the bait. I have seventeen, in fact. The subaltern scowled and reached out to knock the profane instrument aside, but the commander raised a hand. No, this I must see for myself. Duman Yacht peered into the vid screen where Anakin and a few others were half-heartedly spooning Thakatillo into their mouths. The strike team had not been warned about the boarding, in part because Lando wanted their reactions to appear genuine, in part because the Yuzhan Vong had come so quickly. The Lady Luck had been drifting along beside an outbound comet, waiting for the nav computer to plot the final leg of their journey, when the boarding shuttle came swinging out of the tail. It had headed straight for the docking portal a worm-like transfer tunnel already extending, to make contact. There was barely time to alert Tendra before the bridge alarm announced contact at the airlock. Lando authorized equalization and rushed back to find the subaltern already opening the exterior hatch. A check on his data pad revealed a corvette-sized coral ship swinging over the comet to cover the shuttle's approach, and Lando realized the vessel was lying in wait when he entered the system. He had almost felt foolish until he realized what the clever maneuver told him about the eagerness of the Yuzhan Vong commander. Satisfied? Lando asked. I'd ask them to levitate, but that might give us away. That won't be necessary. We have already confirmed their nature. Really? Lando did not like the sound of that, but knew better than to ask for details. If you want them, let the Talfalian hostages go. If I want them, I will take them, Dumanyakt said. Lando raised his data pad and depressed the function key. We both know what seventeen Jedi can do with warning. Don't make me release this button. The commander stepped closer. You think that would matter to me? Of course not. Lando sneered with more confidence than he felt. Even a space boulder like the Exquisite Death would destroy this barge in about three seconds. And what a pity that would be. No sacrifices for you, Nyamka, and no more Jedi deliveries for your war master. More Jedi deliveries? The blue beneath Dumanyak's eyes grew brighter. You can bring more? Only if Talfalio is spared. I'm not doing this because I like you, Lando said. If you knew to intercept me here, then you know who I am. You know I can deliver. 
Du Mignacht lowered his chin in a vague nod. I heard your message, yes. In the message, sent to what the wraiths had identified as a Yuzhan Vong listening post, Lando had claimed to be a Talfalian native, active in the Great River Jedi Rescue Organization. He had given just enough details of past operations to sound like a low-level pilot, then rambled on for a few minutes about how the Jedi were betraying him by allowing Talfalio's destruction. He had finished by naming a time and place and promising that anyone meeting him would be well rewarded. Duman's eyes remained fixed on the data pad, where the Jedi were beginning to discuss something in low tones. You must know I cannot make promises on the War Master's behalf. Then go ask for authority and meet me at the rendezvous, Lando said. The next step had to be the Yuzhan Vongs. The Mark had to think he was the one pushing things. I'm not turning them over until I have his promise. The Yuzhan Vong considered this a moment, then said, You won't make it that far. He tapped the vid display with a blackened fingernail. Your Jedi are nervous. Let me take them now, and we will see what happens. The War Master is certain to be interested. I can promise you that. I don't know, Lando said, setting the hook. I don't see how you can handle so many Jedi aboard that little rock. How we handle the slaves will not be your concern, Duminyacht said. It will be when they escape and hunt me down, Lando said. They will not escape. You may be assured of that. Sure I can, Lando scoffed. Now that he had his mark pushing him, he could afford to take a few risks, and he wanted to know why Duman Yacht had been so quick to confirm he was carrying Jedi. Maybe I should just go to the rendezvous point. That is not one of your choices. Duminyacht's voice remained mild. You may turn them over to me and know that they will reach the War Master, who may or may not be sufficiently impressed by your token of faith, to spare Talfalio's refugees. Or you may release that button and be assured that when we die, a million of your people will die with us. Lando looked down and stroked his lip not feigning his thoughtfulness at all. Duminyacht's confidence in his ability to control the Jedi concerned him, but he had pushed his quest for information as far as he dared. He could release the function key on his data pad and sound the abort alarm. He would almost certainly die, but they had planned for just such an emergency. The transfer deck's inner hatch would seal automatically. Then the detonite charges concealed in the exterior hatch of the airlock would explode into the boarding shuttle. Duminyacht and the boarding party would be sucked out into space, and the Lady Luck would shoot around the comet and be in hyperspace before the exquisite death realized what was happening. But the mission would be lost, more Jedi doomed. And why? Because Lando had an uneasy feeling about something, Duminyacht said? He shook his head in resignation. If you put it like that, Lando said. It was not his place to abort the mission, not with so much writing on it, not even with the children of his best friend at risk. But I'm no fool. I know how this works. Good, Duminyak said. Then you also know that the lives of your fellows will rest on your shoulders. I'll give you a villop so you can contact me when the next delivery is ready. Lando's only response was a sigh of disgust. No need for rude noises. Dubignac grabbed the back of Lando's neck in what may have been a gesture of domination or friendship, or both. This will work out well for both of us. The Yuzhan Vong waved his subaltern and the boarding party forward but Lando quickly blocked their way. No, I've got this all planned out, he said. My ship, my way, or you might as well call the volcano cannons down. The subaltern glowered, but looked to his commander for orders. As he wishes, Duminyacht smirked. 
his ship, his way. Jason had sensed only the single stirring in the force, but everyone else had felt it too, and now it was gone. He lifted another spoonful of green thacatillo to his mouth, but hardly tasted the zest of the dissolving curds. Even without Alima's abrupt paleness and fluttering laku, he would have recognized the burst of hungry agitation. Silgal theorized that the initial disturbance came from the voxen reaching out to find its prey, but Jason wondered if it might be something simpler. To him, it felt more like raw animal excitement. It was a feeling surprisingly close to that held by a number of Jason's fellow Jedi. The members of the strike team had opened their emotions to each other the instant they sensed the voxen, and he could feel the eagerness of Ganner, Zek, the Barabels, Erobesa, even Raynar, to destroy the creature. Others, Tahiri, Lobaka, Tekli, Yulaha, were surprised at how fast things were happening. Alima Rar was terrified, more of herself than the creature. Tenelka was grimly determined. Anakin absorbed in concerns about everyone else, Joven Drark eager to begin the game. To Rodians, everything was a game. Continuing on page 164. Only Jaina, whose feelings Jason could always sense through their bond as twins, seemed calm. Whatever came, warning or no warning, voxen or not, they would handle it. Or not. They had cast their fate to the Force, and now they had no choice but to trust where it carried them. It was a strange sort of composure born of battle and death and suffering, the grim serenity of the soldier, who was both maker and victim of the all-devouring cataclysm. Jason put another spoonful of Thakatillo in his mouth. Beyond the dining area, he could feel the crew's fear, Lando's apprehension about something unknown to him. Tendra's guilt as she approached the cabin door. He pressed his tongue to the roof of his mouth and crushed the curds, then savored the tangy explosion of their melting. The galley door hissed open. Yarsrud, the ship's Hodin chef, stepped into the dining cabin with his human assistant, both holding blasters behind their backs. It was the signal to follow the primary plan. Jason extended himself to the other Jedi going beyond the simple emotional connection the Barabels had taught them to a much deeper level, melding with the others until it seemed to him that he was them and they were all him. As the meld coordinator, he was to a certain extent trusting the others with his body. They had discovered that at times he might become so consumed by the sensations and feelings of others that he forgot to keep track of himself. Lando's tall wife entered the dining room from the main cabin, a nasty G-9 power blaster cradled in her arms. Zek and Joven instantly pushed away from the table and reached for their lightsabers. Tendra loosed a flurry of blue stun bolts, blasting both Jedi and red-haired Arrow into the wall. All as planned. Lobaka and Kossoff tried to rise and were dropped by stun shots from Yarsrut and his assistant, also as planned. Feeling the impact of each bolt through the team's battle meld, Jason groaned and would have tumbled from his chair had Tenel Ka not steadied him. That was not part of the plan. Tendra flipped her power blaster to full automatic, lethal. Anyone else moves, or even looks my way, you all die. She glanced at Ganner, supporting the role he was to play as the decoy leader. That clear? As transparasteel, Ganner kept his eyes fixed on the center of the table. Do as she says. Good. Tendra motioned two crew members behind her into the room. Now sit very still, and no one gets hurt. The two crew members started around the table, unclipping the strike team's lightsabers and tossing them down the food disposal chute, along with Lobaka's protesting translation droid, MTD. Jason experienced a moment of panic from Anakin and realized they had just run into their first problem. The disposal chutes still led to the flush lock instead of their weapons pod. 
They had intended to make the changeover after the evening meal. Jason reached out to Jaina and moved some of her serenity toward Anakin. Nothing to be done about it. Follow the Force. Tendra, what's all this about? Ganner asked. This wasn't in the script, but Ganner knew what was needed. Jason could feel it. Ganner always knew. Haven't we been good guests? The best, Tendra replied. Fitzgibbon just doesn't like cowards. Jason did not even feel Yarsroot's assistant remove his lightsaber. He only saw it go down the chute with the others. Cowards? Ganner asked. What are you? Talfalio. Tendra said simply. A native of nearby Sicoria, she did not need to work to make herself sound angry. Now shut that fly hanger of yours and stand up. There's someone who wants to see you. All of you. Back to the script. Jason felt himself stand and turned toward the door, Tennel Ka close behind. She would be his watcher, her one arm strong enough to carry them both. Tendra stepped aside and motioned the strike team through the door. Down the corridor, past the guest cabins, and up three stairs under the transfer deck. Things would be crowded. Airlock, escape pods, who knows how many Yuzhan Vong. Would the Voxen be there? Probably not. Nobody could feel it yet. Olima began to tremble, frightened not of the Yuzhan Vong. She had killed dozens with her own hands, eluded hundreds more. But of herself. She had not expected to encounter a Voxen on the transit ship. Could she face one again, knowing what the first had done to her sister? Jason fettered the feelings of Raynar who was comforting himself with the knowledge that the Twi'lek had done this stuff many times before. She had denied the Yuzhan Vong new Plimpto. She would get them through this. Alima's Leku stopped shaking, and Jason followed the unconscious Jedi, who were being levitated by five of their fellows, past Lando's suite toward the guest cabins. A door slid open behind Tenel Ka, and something blunt caught her between the shoulder blades. Jason dropped to his knees and started to black out, then realized it was Tenel Ka's body he was feeling, and reached out to the others, calling upon their strength to keep them both conscious. When his vision cleared, Yuzhan Vong filled the corridor. At the head of the line, Ganner lunged for Lando. You double-crossing! The blunt edge of an amphistaff caught the big Jedi across the back of the head dropping him into a dark pit before Jason could call on the others to keep him conscious. Not in the script, but probably for the best. Point 30. The Crew Departs Tendra and Yarsroot retreated into the ship, leaving the strike team in the hands of the Yuzhan Vong. There were only six guards on the transfer deck with Lando. The rest were down in the access corridor behind Anakin, flanking the long line of Jedi. Tisar Sabatine, who was second in line, hesitated at the transfer deck and stared down at Ganner's unconscious form. A Yuzhan Vong warrior, a large one with a spindly fringe of black hair, grabbed the Baravel and shoved him into the boarding suite. Forward, all of you! Anakin suppressed a smirk and stepped over Ganner's unconscious form. Tisar had played his role perfectly, forcing the Yuzhan Vong to order the strike team to do exactly what the strike team wanted to. Anakin followed the Barabel to the far end of the deck and took his place across from the weapons locker. Tahiri and the other Jedi crowded after him, packing themselves just tightly enough to make room for the whole team, and not much else. So far, events were proceeding more or less as planned. True, their lightsabers had been dropped into the flush lock, but Tendra and Yarzrut had taken extra precautions during the turnover to give the war droids time to retrieve the weapons. Anakin could feel the strike team's confidence growing with every success. The empathic sharing strengthened everyone's resolve and bound them to a common purpose, just as the Barabels had said it would. And Jason was keeping him in touch with the group. Anakin sensed Alima Rar's resolve harden and shared Tenelka's surprise when she was struck from behind. 
and now he perceived Loey's mind stirring. No sooner had Anakin begun to worry about how a groggy Wookiee would impact their plans than he sensed Jason reaching out to calm their waking friend. This was going to work great. Once the crew was safely out of sight, Lando turned to a scar-faced Yuzhan Vong and gestured at a fiber-plast crate in front of the Lady Lux escape pod. Perhaps the commander of the exquisite death would allow me to present him with a small gift. It was a subtle variation on point thirty-one, but a useful one. No one had expected the commander of the transit ship to supervise the transfer personally. This officer was an eager one. When the enemy commander did not object, Lando removed several pairs of stun cuffs from the crate. Anakin expelled a long, calming breath, using a Jedi relaxation technique to let a spike of anxiety flow out with it. Lando held the cuffs in front of the commander. A little something to keep the prisoners in line, Dumanyakt. Dumanyakt regarded the cuffs with a sneer. What are those profanities? Wrist restraints. Lando opened a metal sleeve and displayed it proudly. You see, I've thought of everything. Duman knocked the stun cuffs aside. We have our own bindings. He glared at Ganner's unconscious form which one of the strike team had levitated and placed in the center of the transfer deck with the other unconscious Jedi Knights. Bindings that teach, as well as restrain. Point 32. The enemy acknowledges the offer. Anakin turned his palm toward the weapons locker and reached out with the force, buckling the door panel inward. Lando and the Yuzhan Vong spun toward the screel of crumpling durosteel. Yulaha closed the pressure hatch at her end of the transfer deck, sealing the rest of the enemy boarding party out in the access corridor. Anakin twisted the door free and slammed it into Dumanyak's head. One Yuzhan Vong warrior stepped over to defend his stunned commander, and the others, finding the space too cramped for amphistaffs, reached for their kufis. The strike team counterattacked in a flurry of kicks and blows, taking full advantage of the battle meld to keep the enemy too busy dodging and blocking to actually draw a weapon. With the force, Anakin jerked the blaster pistols from their locker mounts and hurled them across the transfer deck into the grasps of ten waiting Jedi. From the other side of the sealed hatch came muffled shouts and metallic thuds as the rest of the boarding party tried to break into the transfer deck. Then Tisar half-turned, whipping his thick reptilian tail into the ankles of Duman Yacht and his defender and sweeping both Yuzhan Vong off their feet. He leveled his blaster at the commander's head. Call off your scarheads, the barabelle rasped. Duminyak's eyes flared with anger, and his guard, now lying behind Tisar, reached for his kufi. Anakin started to shout a warning, but Jason had already felt his alarm and relayed it through the battle meld. The barabelle pivoted and brought his heel down, a long spike folding out to pin the warrior's hand to the durasteel floor. The tumult on the other side of the hatch suddenly fell silent, and Anakin guessed the situation on the transfer deck had been relayed to the officers of the exquisite death. He leveled his blaster pistol at Dumanyak's wounded protector and began to count. The war droids would need at least a thirty-second distraction to slip out of the Lady Lux disposal lock with the equipment pod and attached to the enemy shuttle. Anakin would have liked to give them a safety margin of twice that, but sixty seconds seemed like an eternity. Tisar took his time pulling his heel spike out of the guard's hand, then pressed his blaster to Dumanyak's face. Tell your warriors to drop their weapons, the barabelle rasped. Dumanyak surprised Anakin and everyone else by responding with an admiring smirk. Impressive. The reputation of the Jedi is well deserved. Tisar's only response was a hiss. If not for the battle melt, Anakin would have thought the Barabel confused, but he sensed through Jason that Tisar was only stalling for time. Two seconds later, Tisar snarled, This one wants surrender, not compliments. 
Then you are to be disappointed, Duman replied. You must know that before allowing seventeen Jedi to escape, I'll destroy this ship and everyone aboard it, myself included. Wait a second, Lando objected. He stepped forward, and Anakin's count reached eight. There's no call for silence. If you know anything about the Yuzhan Vong, then you know we have no fear of death. Duman looked back to Tisar. You have five breaths. Finally, something they had not planned for. Desperate to thwart the deadline, Anakin stepped over and kicked the villops off the commander's shoulder, crushed them beneath his foot. That will not save you, the commander said. I have a personal villop on the bridge of my ship, relaying every word I say. He looked back to Tisar. Three breaths. Though Anakin's count had barely passed ten seconds, he knew better than to challenge the commander's word. Having proclaimed his willingness to die, it was now a matter of honor to follow through. He watched Dumanyak's chest rise and fall two more times. Lando must have been watching as well. After the second breath, he snorted loudly, Nobody's going to slag my ship. He started across the transfer deck to the inner hatch. Not when there's no reason for it. Olima Rar blocked his way and pointed her blaster at his face, then pulled the trigger as he moved to step past. There was a loud pop of a tripping safety breaker, then she cried out and dropped the smoking pistol. Lando kicked the weapon aside. You see? I've thought of everything. He snatched Raynar's blaster out of his hand popped a retaining clip, reversed the power pack, adjusted the discharge setting, and dropped Tsar with a stun bolt. Reversed power packs. Standard safety precaution, at least when you're turning traitor on a company of Jedi. Anakin and several others popped their retaining clips, but even Jedi were not that quick. Dumanyak's protector caught Anakin in a leg scissors and whipped him to the floor. And Anakin found himself struggling to continue his count beneath a rain of blows. The rest of the Yuzhan Vong were also attacking, foregoing their kufis to lash out at the blasters in the hands of their foes. Even Dumanyak joined the fray, leaping up to hurl Tahiri into an escape pod hatch. Blaster and power pack flew in two directions, and she wisely let herself slump to the deck. The commander turned to Lando, pointed to the inner hatch. Open it. Lando stepped forward, his hand reaching for the override. By Anakin's count, they were at twenty-five seconds. The two war droids would be searching the bottom of the shuttle for a place to anchor. Jason sensed Anakin's worry, and Yulaha stepped forward to block the path, a long-fingered bith hand flicking forward as she opened herself to the Force. Jason screamed first. Anakin experienced an instant of hot pain and thought his brother had been wounded. But then he heard Yulaha's whistle and saw the bith stumbling forward, the handle of a kufi protruding from her back. Shock shot through the strike team like a stun bolt. No one had seen the attack coming, and the sudden pain dazed them badly. Anakin took two hard blows and felt the others reeling too, and then bodies began to fall. Across the deck, Yulaha lay face down, too pained to scream, her fingernails raking the durasteel floor. Lando stood above her, dark eyes dazed with horror, but too much the gambler to show anything more. His knee flexed, as though he might kneel down to pull out the kufi. Then he caught himself and stepped over the anguished Jedi and opened the inner hatch. Another fist crashed down on Anakin, this time summoning misty shadows of unconsciousness. He forgot his count, but it had to be thirty, or as close as they were going to get. The floor began to reverberate with heavy footfalls, the rest of the boarding party rushing onto the transfer deck. Anakin reached out with the force and hurled a discarded blaster pistol into his attacker's head, and was rewarded with another blow. Then the tip of a kufi touched his throat. Done, Jedi, the warrior hissed. Understand. Anakin did not even dare to nod. Dumanyakt barked an order. 
A pair of Yuzhan Vong lifted Yulaha off the floor and passed her into the airlock, the Kufi still protruding from her back. A familiar hollowness came to Anakin then, the same hollowness he had felt on Cernpadal, when he had been forced to raise the falcon's nose and leave Chewie behind. And a cold fear rose inside him. They had barely made contact, and he had already gotten someone injured. Maybe this mission was too much for them. Maybe everyone was going to get killed, just like Chewbacca. Loi, Tahiri, even Jason and Jaina. Maybe it would be his fault. Jason reached out to him, gently laving him with the emotions of the others. There was fear, anger, guilt. Anakin could not tell who was feeling what, except for Alima Rar. Alima seemed to be relieved. No one had actually died yet, and she had made it this far without breaking down in terror. Things were going pretty well, it seemed to her. Duminyak's voice sounded from somewhere beyond Anakin's feet. I must admit, Fitzgibbon Lane, that I now understand why you destroyed their lightsabers. Had they gotten to those? Well, let us say I am happy they were disintegrated. A pair of Yuzhan Vong jerked Anakin to his feet, and he saw the commander standing with Lando as the boarding party lined the Jedi up for transfer. Anakin fixed his stare on Lando, wondering if there was not some way for the silky-tongued gambler to keep you laha aboard the Lady Luck. Lando caught Anakin staring at him and allowed his gaze to linger a moment, then turned back to Duman Yacht. It's all in the planning, but next time I want some warning. If we catch them during a sleep cycle... You will have your villip, the Yuzhan Vong interrupted. That is all I can promise. Anakin's guards pushed him into the airlock. He stumbled on the threshold, but kept his gaze turned over his shoulder. He knew there was no safe way for Lando to retrieve Yulaha, but Lando Calrissian had a way of doing the impossible. Lando had spent his youth outwitting Imperial agents and swindling the deadliest criminals in the galaxy, and he had been rescuing the Solo children and their parents for longer than Anakin had been alive. Surely, Lando Calrissian could outwit one ambitious Yuzhan Vong. Lando met Anakin's gaze again. A haunted and fearful look came to his eyes. Then Duminyak said something that required a laugh, and Lando had to turn his back. Chapter 18 Instead of taking the Sanabuffed Corridor to the Errant Ventures parade deck, where two dozen eager Academy students stood waiting to display their force skills, Luke and his companions followed a freshly preened booster Terek into a lift tube and ascended directly to the bridge. The Star Destroyer could orbit Eclipse only so long before it risked exposing the base's location. So the last thing anyone in the group wanted was to spend time watching the holonet. Unfortunately, they had just received word that Numanor was about to address the Senate regarding the Talfalian hostages and that Borsk Felia himself had asked both Wedge Antilles and Garm Bel Iblis to attend. There could be no doubt that something major was about to happen, and that it would be of great importance to the Jedi. Booster led them along the back of the bridge into the ship's comm center, where an old Imperial hollow projector sat at the far end of a conference table littered with data pads, science projects, and flimsiplast dye paintings. In addition to Luke and Booster, there were Corrin and Mirax Horn, Han and Leia, R2-D2 and C-3PO, and, fussing discontentedly in Mara's arms, Ben. Tion and Cam Solisar were on the parade deck with their students, explaining that Master Skywalker was looking forward to seeing them very much and would be along soon. Luke had not yet heard how Corrin and Mirax had escaped from the Voxen on Corellia. Their story had been interrupted by news of Nomanor's address, but they claimed it was nothing too exciting, save that they would need to find some way of quietly reimbursing Corellian transport services for a badly corroded hover taxi. Ben grew more disgruntled as the group gathered around the transceiver pad. He was normally the most imperturbable of babies, 
but there were times when he simply could not be consoled. Now, as R2-D2 tuned the ancient transceiver to the Senate hollow band, Ben broke into a fit of wailing. Luke felt Mara reaching out through the force to calm him. When that did not help, he did so himself. Ben only cried harder. Mara sighed heavily and turned to take the baby into the next room. Leia intercepted her. Let me. I really don't need to see this. Mara nodded and passed Ben over. The infant calmed almost instantly. Luke and Mara exchanged surprised glances, both feeling a little distressed that they had not been able to comfort their son themselves, but knowing there was more to it than that. I was thinking about Anakin, Leia said, her eyes fixed on Ben's face. I was watching Mara and wishing there had been more time for me to hold him when he was this age. Luke smiled and turned back to the hollow pad, where the cam was zooming in on a figure in the Grand Convocation Chamber. To Vicky Shesh's eye, Lomanor looked too certain of himself. Though Felia had denied him the privilege of appearing in warrior's garb, the executor carried himself tall and haughtily, all but deaf to the taunts of the jeering senators, his one eye fixed on the high counselor's dais. He wore a shimmering robe of living glistaweb, nearly as proof against blaster bolts as Von Doon crab armor, but far more innocuous, at least to those who did not know the secret of its charge-neutralizing fibers. Numanor stepped to the center of the speaker's platform and waited for silence. It would be a long wait, Vicky knew. After Felia's public declarations of support for the Jedi, the Jedi lovers were content to wait for the Bothan's signal before they stopped heckling. Never one to miss a chance to bully an enemy, Felia did not give Numanor a chance to correct his mistake. He leaned forward, peering down from behind his chief of state's console, and spoke into the microphone. You asked for this audience. Felia's amplified voice reverberated through the chamber, quieting the hecklers. Have you come to explain the Talfalian hostages? Numanor's now empty eye socket twitched. Hardly. You understand the situation. I have come to inform you the War Master has extended the deadline for the Jedi surrender. The chamber burst into an astonished rustle. Vicky was as shocked as everyone else, for the War Master was not the type to yield to Felia's empty threats. Perhaps Nomanor was playing some game of his own. Now that Felia had thrown his support behind the Jedi, perhaps the Executor believed he could strike a deal with the appeasers. Such a plan would have to be stopped, and quickly, or it might be Nomanor instead of her who replaced Felia when Savong La's killers finally attacked. She did not understand what was taking the assassins so long. Most of the opportunities she had listed for them were already past, and so far she had not heard of even a suspicious loiterer near the chief of state. Not waiting for the commotion to fade, Vicky activated her own microphone. How do you explain this sudden attack of conscience, Mr. Ambassador? Numanor's expression remained far too smug. The War Master has come to realize it may be difficult for the New Republic to comply with his orders on short notice. He paused and turned away from the High Counselor's dais to look directly into the galleries. Last night, a concerned citizen turned over seventeen young Jedi. The Convocation Chamber burst into such an uproar that it was impossible to hear the rest of Nomanor's statement. Vicky fell back in her chair as stunned as the others in the room, and began to wonder how such a thing could happen. No bounty hunter in the galaxy could just fly out and collect seventeen Jedi. She doubted that even a company of bounty hunters could do it. To restore order, Felia was forced to darken the chamber, and even then he had to wait several minutes before he could make himself heard enough to order the sergeant-at-arms to have the security droids remove any senator who continued to yell. When light was finally restored, the Bothan's ears were flattened, and a long ridge of hair was standing along the back of his neck. 
I don't believe you, he said. Vicky was inclined to agree, as was most of the Senate. A rising murmur threatened to crest into another uproar, until the security droids brought the noise under control by issuing stern warnings about decibel levels. Nomanor sneered. I have a list. He made a show of consulting a sheet of what looked like the shed skin of a snake, then said, The leader is Gana Rysode. His assistants seem to be Tisar Sebatine and a Wookiee named Lobaka. A plaintive howl echoed down from the Wookiee gallery, and a security droid was slapped out of the air by a hairy claw. The Bith Jedi Yulaha Kor was wounded resisting capture, and I certainly recognize the Solo name. Solo? Wedge Antilles gasped. Along with Garmbel Iblis, he was standing behind Felia's seat for some reason Vicky did not yet understand. You have a solo. The chamber fell so quiet that the next question, from General Bell Iblis, would have carried to the top gallery even without being picked up by Felia's microphone. Which one, Anakin or the twins? The smug look vanished from Nomanor's face. Twins? He quickly forced a sneer, but to Vicky the expression looked more sick than snide. We have the three young ones. The two generals glanced at each other with fallen faces, and Felia's ears drooped, but only Vicky seemed to perceive Nomanor's subtle shift of attitude. She did not know what significance twins had to the Yuzhan Vong, but it seemed clear enough to her that there was one and that, with a little help from her, Nom Anor would look like a fool to Savong La for not realizing it. Vicky leaned forward and glared at the Yuzhan Vong as though challenging his claim. Jason and Jaina are twins, Mr. Ambassador. She leaned back, then added with a disdainful smirk, It's common knowledge. They're twins, just like their mother and Luke Skywalker. Umanor's good eye narrowed, and he glared at her in open anger. It does not matter what they are. He forced himself to look back to Felia. What I came here to say, what the Master wishes me to say, is that he is not unreasonable. He will spare the Talfalian hostages, as long as the New Republic continues to turn over its Jedi. Felia rose from his seat. Never— Nomanor ignored him and turned to the gallery. A like number every. His microphone suddenly went dead, preventing his last three words from reaching the Senate gallery. Vicky keyed her own microphone. A like number every ten standard days. You have the right to know whether the Chief of State wants you to or not. Her words instantly had an inflammatory effect causing such a heated exchange that the security droids actually began to chase a handful of senators toward the exits with sting bolts. Thalia pressed a button on his console and rose, his voice now reverberating from both the chamber's public address system and the individual conferencing consoles. What the Chief of State wants you to know, whether Counselor Shesh wishes it or not, is how the Yuzhan Vong conduct their diplomacy. Mif Kumis, the Senate Sergeant-at-Arms, appeared at the edge of the chamber floor, his big calabop wings fluttering madly as he struggled to keep pace with the three big defense droids used to deal with serious matters in the Senate. Felia glanced in Vicky's direction just long enough to bear his fangs, and she suddenly knew the Chief of State remained alive not because of Savong La's tardiness in ordering the kill, but because the assassins had failed. Blood running cold. She calmly stood and turned to leave the High Counselor's dais. Thalia touched his control board, and his voice sounded from her conferencing console. Going somewhere, Counselor? Vicky lifted her chin and met his violet eyes as steadily as she was able. I have a personal need. He smiled wickedly. Stay. This won't take long, and I'm sure you will find it most— 
enlightening. Faced with prospect of being publicly stunned into submission by Kumis's protection droids, or maintaining at least a plausible pretense of her innocence, she returned to her seat and tried to pretend she did not feel the thoughtful gazes of the two generals boring into her. I will trust you to make this fast. Of course, a quick kill is safest. Felia touched a key, once again feeding his microphone into the public address system, then turned back to Numanor. Recently, a squad of Yuzhan Vong infiltrators made an attempt on my life. A half-doubtful murmur filled the chamber, and Vicky's stomach grew so qualmish. She feared her personal need would soon become legitimate. Felia raised his hands. There are certainly some who will view this as a cynical ploy to garner political advantage. But I assure you that is not the case. He glared down at Numanor, who had finally noticed the droids and Kalabop approaching behind him. My only desire is to make certain the appeasers in this body understand who they are dealing with. To that end, I have brought two men to substantiate this attack. A pair of generals whose honesty is beyond reproach, and who, as many of you know, bear me no particular good faith. He motioned the generals forward, and Wedge Antilles leaned to the microphone. It was a well-planned attack. General Bel Iblis was next. Unfortunately, we were engaged in classified work, and the details must remain secret. But it happened, as Chief Failure says. There can be no doubt. The doubtful murmur quickly assumed a tone of outrage, and Vicky's stomach growled so loudly that her microphone picked up the sound. Failure turned to her expectantly. Senator Shash? he asked. Do you have anything to say? Vicky glared vibra-blades at him. She checked the protection droids and found them hovering beside Numanor, less than five meters away. Only the certain knowledge that they would stun her before she could shoot kept her from palming her stealth blaster. What should I say, Borsk? I'm sorry? Felia smiled triumphantly. An apology is hardly necessary, Senator Shesh. You were only trying to save Kuat. He glanced in Numanor's direction. As long as you see your mistake now. My mistake? Vicky gasped, beginning to comprehend that her secret remained secret. Perhaps her contact had been killed in the attack, or perhaps Yuzhan Vong infiltrators were trained to withstand even modern interrogation techniques. It hardly mattered. Thalia thought he had defeated her challenge, her political challenge. Now he wanted to draw her back into the fold and consolidate his support, and he still had no idea what game they were really playing. No idea at all. Vicky smiled and inclined her head. I do see my mistake. She turned to glare at Nomanor. You just can't trust the Yuzhan Vaughn. Oh, my, C-3PO said to no one in particular. Did you notice the interest Nomano showed when he discovered that Jaina and Jason were twins? Neither Luke nor anyone else answered the droid, for their attention remained riveted on the holopad, where Borsk Felia was gleefully informing Nomano of his arrest. It troubled Luke that the Yuzhan Vong did not bother protesting his innocence. He merely glared at the Bothan, as though they both knew the truth. Of course, it's impossible to know the significance of twins to the Yuzhan Vong, C-3PO babbled on. But in approximately 98.7% of the cultures in our own galaxy, they represent the dualistic nature of the universe good and evil, light and dark, male and female. When the twins are in harmony, there is balance to the universe. In the hologram, Myth Kumis fluttered forward with a pair of stun cuffs, his three protection droids arrayed in a triangle around the Yuzhan Vong. To Luke's great surprise, the Yuzhan Vong extended his arms and brought his wrists together, then grabbed his own little finger and tore it off. A string of black vapor sprayed out of the base, billowing up around Nomanor and Myth Kumis in cloud of inky miasma. 
The event seemed to lie outside the parameters of the protection droid's programming, for they did not open fire until the Yuzhan Vong thrust the stump of his finger into the Kalabop's startled face. Luke saw the first bolts strike Nomanor's shimmering robe and blink out without causing him harm. Then both figures vanished inside the expanding cloud of darkness. Paying no attention at all to what was happening in the hologram, C-3PO continued. But whatever the significance of twins to our enemies, I fear it will only make Jason and Janus' captors all the more vigilant. Nomanor's reaction suggests... C-3PO! Leia barked, returning to the room with Ben still quiet in her arms. Yes, Mr. Slayer? Silence yourself before I decide you need a memory wipe. A memory wipe? C-3PO echoed. Why in the world would I need a memory wipe? R2-D2 tweedled a suggestion. Well, I didn't mean to alarm Mr. Slayer. C-3PO objected. I only thought. Han reached behind the droid's head and tripped the primary circuit breaker. Thank you, Luke said, though he knew Han had silenced the droid for Leia and himself. The scene in the hologram was confused, dark, and rapidly growing more so. Nomanor's cloud quickly filled the holocam's view, and the protector droids stopped firing as they lost contact with their target. The operator pulled back a wider view of the chamber, but the black fumes continued to expand, and even that view was obscured within a few seconds. The audio was filled with panicked screams and the sound of coughing and the thunder of running feet. There was a moment of static as the chamber's ventilation and fire suppression systems activated. Then the image began to clear rapidly. As the stairs and galleries grew visible again, they saw prone bodies lying everywhere. On the stairs, slumped over conferencing consoles, sprawled on communications ramps. Sith spawn, Korn gasped. He wiped out the entire Senate. Knocked out? Luke corrected. He was still trying to puzzle out Nomanor's strange reaction to Felia's accusation. Luke knew for himself that the attempt on the chief's life had occurred, since both Han and Leia had been at the proving trials when the assassins struck. Yet the Yuzhan Vong had reacted as though it were political fiction. This wasn't about destroying the Senate. That kind of outrage would draw the New Republic together, and so far the Yuzhan Vong have been trying to split it apart. It grew apparent that Luke was correct as the image zoomed back to the chamber floor. Even there, where the cloud had been thickest, the bodies were beginning to stir, hoarse throats to rasp for air. Kumus's wings began to flutter again, while Felia and the other counselors dragged themselves up and punched at their consoles, barking orders that made sense only to their confused minds. The three protection droids lay inert on the floor, the last swaddled in the still shimmering robe Nomanor had been wearing. Of the Yuzhan Vong himself, there was no sign. Got away clean, Han observed. Probably had one of those masker things around his waist. Maybe palace security will pick him up. Leia turned to Korn, who, as an ex-member of Corellian security, had more experience in such matters than anyone else. What do you think? Instead of answering... Korn only looked at her and Han with an expression of infinite sadness. He spread his arms and came around the table, Mirax following close behind. Han? Leia? I'm so sorry. Hold on there, fella. Han backed away, one hand raised to ward off the embrace of the former Corsac officer who, a few decades earlier, might have been hunting him down instead of offering him comfort. There's something you ought to know. Corrin stopped, looking equal parts hurt and confused. Luke chuckled. Corrin, there's a reason I'm asking the Jedi to gather. He glanced in Booster's direction and said, But this has to stay secret. Very secret. Booster spread his palms and looked around the cabin. Who am I going to tell? Luke explained what Anakin and the strike team were doing, and how Eclipse was trying to put together a group of Jedi to defend the Talfalian hostages. Do you remember what you told Jason after the fall of Ithor? 
that if there ever came a time when folks looked forward to the return of the man who killed Ithor, Master, I was a little, uh, disappointed then, Corin said. I didn't mean to sound bitter. And you didn't, Luke assured him. But Corin, the time has come. The invasion is out of hand, and the Jedi need someone of your experience to help us prepare to teach our young pilots how to fight as a unit and survive. Corrin considered this for a moment, then cast a querying look in Mirax's direction. What else are we going to do? She hooked a thumb at her father. Hang around with this old grouch? Booster scowled and started to retort, then threw up his hands. I'm sworn to secrecy. He eyed Luke. I suppose you'll be needing a Star Destroyer for this fleet of yours. Not yet. Where could we hide you? As tempting as the offer was, Luke still wanted the Academy students kept out of harm's way. Admiral Crefe has converted that old smuggler's hole at Reese into a rear base. He'd welcome an extra Star Destroyer there, and you'll be close enough to Eclipse to come running when things start to look bad. Booster fixed Luke with a sour glare. I know what you're doing, young fellow. Luke smiled. Good. I was starting to think you were slipping. Chapter 19 The assault on Arcania began quietly enough. A few sensor alarms chimed in warning. Then the silky voice of a female tactical controller reported the coordinates of the invasion fleet. A circle of darkness smaller than a thumbnail appeared at the indicated place and blocked the light of the distant stars. The dark area expanded quickly, to the size of a human hand, then a head. The stars reappeared, winking in and out of sight as thousands of Yorick coral ships passed in front of them. A flurry of light points sprayed out from the fleet, then swelled into the blue-white dots of plasma balls. They passed harmlessly through the mine shell. The droid brains were programmed to ignore weapons, then flared out of existence against the planetary shields. A volley of magma missiles followed. A storm of low-power stutter lasers flashed out from Arcania's new Balmoran arms defense platforms to intercept and destroy the missiles on the far side of the mine shells. When the fire inadvertently struck and detonated one mine, the shell instantly realigned itself for optimum coverage. Finally, what looked like an entire asteroid belt burst into the blue light of Arcania's sun. Dozens of large, clearing ships went straight for the mines and opened their pointed noses, spewing rocky decoys into the shell. The rest of the fleet swirled out to surround the planet, spewing magma missiles and grutchens at the orbital defense platforms. The Takcon's silky voice came over the blast boat's comm channel. Guard ships take cover behind your platforms. Turbo lasers will commence fire in three seconds. The battered blast boat slid into the sensor shadow of the Wild Knight's assigned platform, and Danny's readouts went to zero. She slammed her palm against the console. How can I correlate anything from here? You will have your chance, Danny Quee. Their platform opened up with its variable pulse turbo lasers, filling the darkness outside with sheets of colored light. Saba, sitting in her command chair near the front, half turned so she could fix her reptilian eye on Danny. Use the way to calm yourself. It is dangerous to enter a fight angry. I'm not angry. You feel angry to me, one ton rumbled from the pilot's seat, and that'll get someone killed. Calm down or close up. You were angry when Mara came to tell us about Anakin's plan, Saba said. Perhaps you wished to go along? You're smarter than that, Danny retorted, or this bunch of Gretchen traps wouldn't have lasted this long. The last place I want to be is another Yuzhan Vong holding cell. No anger there, one ton observed sarcastically. She is upset with Master Skywalker. He's all sat in the topside turret, his long tongue flicking the pale salt crust clinging to his upper lip. She thinks he should have asked her. Danny glared up at the Arcona. 
stay out of my mind. It is in your face, not your mind. Danny was not certain she believed him. Isol could be a little sly when he was holding back on the salt, but there was no denying the irritation she felt at the suggestion. He shouldn't have let Anakin talk him into it, Danny said. Those kids have no idea what they're getting into. The Voxen must be exterminated, Saba said. Master Skywalker has surely considered the risks. Master Skywalker has not seen a breaking, Danny shot back. He has no idea. The strike team will commandeer the ship before the breaking, Saba said. Sure they will, Danny said. Saba's scaly tail slapped the floor. What would you have us do? Go after them? The sudden apprehension in the Force reminded Danny of what she was saying. Saba's face was so stoic and fearsome-looking that it was easy to forget she had emotions, too, and it had completely slipped Danny's mind that Saba's apprentices and son were with the strike team. Knowing the Barabelle did not really understand the concept of an apology and would probably have found it disingenuous if she did, Danny did not even try. She simply gave a small nod. If we could find them, Saba, that's exactly what I'd do, Danny said. I'd go after them. Saba studied her with a black eye for a moment. Then the Tak Khan's voice came over the Khan channel. Guard ships forward. Remember your areas and stay close to your platforms. Let us do our own jobs first. Saba gestured at Danny's instrument panel, knowing how the Yamisks communicate does us no good until we understand their language. Did you not say that? Without awaiting a reply, the Barabelle turned away and ordered the squadron forward. Though Danny's anger was gone, the force was now filled with grimness and apprehension. And not only Saba's. Though the exchange in the blast boat had not been transmitted over the comm channels, the rest of the Wild Knights could sense their leader's anxiety. Danny instantly felt ashamed of her anger and regretted her thoughtless words even more than before. In a squadron that relied on empathy to bind it together, runaway emotions could get someone killed. Danny focused her attention on her instruments and promised herself that she would coax every bit of data possible out of the battle. It was the only apology Saba Sebatin would understand. They emerged from behind the platform shields, not into the maelstrom of whirling fighter craft that Danny expected, but into a meshwork of streaking missiles and flashing laser bolts. Having penetrated the mine shell, the Yuzhan Vong capital ships were laying off, firing salvos of plasma balls and magma missiles at the orbiting defense platforms. One platform, an older KDY system designed for the turbolaser exchanges of the Rebellion era, was jetting a long plume of borum coolant into space. Otherwise, the enemy barrages were proving remarkably inefficient. On the other hand, the motley assemblage defending Arcania, the planet's military, volunteer squadrons like Saba's and a small New Republic task force rushed in to attempt a delaying action, were doing remarkably well. The slow but powerful KDY platforms were breaking up concentrations of enemy ships, preventing the invaders from mounting any sort of planetward thrust. The smaller but newer Balmoran arms platforms used their long-range stutter lasers to destroy incoming missile volleys and pepper the big Yuzhan Vong capital ships with showers of random intensity attacks. Whenever a low-power laser struck Yorick Coral, a sensor detected the strike and automatically fired a pair of devastating blasts from the platform's charge-storing turbolasers. The system was as deadly as it was efficient, and there were already scores of lumpy derelicts spinning off into space. What Danny did not see was a swarm of coral skippers rushing to disable the platforms. She checked her instruments and found all readouts hovering down near the bottom. What do they wait for? One ton grumbled. I see the skips on my sensor screen. Clouds of them. Perhaps they fear the battle platforms. Saba said. No, Danny said, suddenly feeling relieved. They never intended to come in. This is a feint. A feint? 
Saba turned to look at Danny. You cannot know that. Can't I? Danny gestured at her instrument panel, where all of the data bars continued to hover near the bottom. If the attack had truly stalled, don't you think the Yamask would be going wild? Saba left her chair and peered over Danny's shoulder for a long time, then finally said, This makes no sense. They would conquer at half the strength. But not without cost, Danny said. Perhaps their resources are not as limitless as we think. Saba considered this for a moment, then turned to one ton. Calculate a course for eclipse. What about the Yuzhan Vong? One ton asked. They're not going to let us. The Yuzhan Vong are going to withdraw, Saba said. They are saving their fleet for something else. Something we must warn Master Skywalker about. Chapter 20 The door valve drew open, and Nomanor stepped into the sweltering dazzle of the glory room. The War Master, tethered into his cognition throne thirty meters away, could hardly be seen for all the blaze bugs warming the chamber with their crimson abdomens. Some of the creatures moved slowly through the air, and a few winked out or blinked on, but most hovered in space, each representing the known location of a capital starship or significant concentration of smaller craft. The scene was confusing to the eye alone, but a careful listener could identify a blaze bug's affiliation by the sound of its wings. Low thrum for Yuzhan Vong vessels, sharp drone for the New Republic, steady buzz for Imperial Remnant, and shrill whine for other infidels. With the hum of the invading corps enveloped on all sides by the high-pitched whirring of infidel forces, the situation sounded precarious at best. Had not a sour odor filled Nomanor's nostrils as he moved through the enemy blaze bugs near the entrance of the room, he might have worried. As it was, the reek of disorganization and poor battle preparedness assured a swift Yuzhan Vong victory, and the executor's success in dividing the New Republic Senate was undoubtedly responsible for the strongest part of that smell. Certainly, that was why the War Master had left orders for him to report the instant of his return. Or so Nomanor hoped. The alternative was too horrible to contemplate. He passed through the infidel areas into the Yuzhan Vong invasion column, where the sour reek of confusion was replaced by the clyris like odor of organization and purpose. Instead of swirling about in confusion when he passed through, as had the blaze bugs in the New Republic section of the room, the bugs here simply fluttered aside, then returned to their places once he was gone. As Nomanor drew near the center of the chamber, the War Master's cognition throne grew more distinct. A little smaller than an infidel land speeder, the chair lumbered about on six squat legs, flashing a constant series of instructions to the blaze bugs via the soft glow tips at the ends of its hundred antennae. The War Master himself sat atop the throne in a neural cusp, his head swaddled in worm like sensory feeds his hands thrust into control sacks on the armrests alongside his body. Though no Manor had never himself mounted a cognition throne, he knew a skilled rider could join the creatures so completely that he experienced the totality of the strategic situation at once. Each blaze bug's coated wing beats identified not only the class and name of the vessel represented, but also the ship's condition and estimated combat effectiveness. The subtle undertones of odor suggested the morale of the captain and crew, estimates based on a complicated formula of known experience, effectiveness in previous battles, and the general tactical situation. Though Nome would never have said so aloud, he suspected the estimates tended to rate Yuzhan Vong ships unduly high and infidel ships outrageously low. The usual crowd of apprentices, subalterns, and readers parted to let Nomanor pass, but only the apprentices and subalterns crossed their arms over their breasts. An amalgam of diviners and military analysts, the readers were responsible for gathering information on enemy capabilities and translating their knowledge into the blazebug's swarm. Each was also a priest of one of the many different gods to whom the Yuzhan Vong paid homage and as such technically subordinate to the Sunalak's priestess. 
Vekta, rather than the War Master, a fact they took every opportunity to emphasize. Nomanor knew the arrangement to be a constant fang in Savongla's heel, but at least to those who believed in such things. The precaution was necessary to avoid placing any of the other gods in symbolic servitude to Yunyamka, the slayer. Trying not to read anything into the lack of envy in the eyes of those around him, Nomanor stopped before the cognition throne and pounded his own chest in salute. I come straight from the docking chamber, my master. Savong La peered down from the throne, little more than eyes and mouth visible through his cocoon of sensory feeds. As ordered. Good. Nomanor's mouth went dry. No words of welcome, no hint of praise. I am sorry that it took me this long to rejoin the fleet. My journey was delayed by the difficulties of leaving Coruscant. Not an easy thing to do with all of planetary defense hunting you, I am sure, Berger's thin voice said. She pushed through the crowd and peered up from between two readers. You are to be congratulated on your escape. It was most ingenious. Yes, planning is everything. No monarch had difficulty keeping the rage out of his voice, for he was convinced that Vergier lay behind the attempt on Felia's life. He had considered the matter from every angle, and she had more to gain from it than anyone. I'm only sorry it was necessary to disappoint you. Why would I be disappointed in your escape? Regier spread her arms. Your value to our cause is well known to all. As accustomed as no monor was to the gamesmanship of politics, the subtle mockery of this half-pagan creature was too much. Not only had she interfered with his mission and nearly gotten him imprisoned, now she was ridiculing him before his master and peers. There is no need to play the shy bunish, Regier. Numanor had to struggle to keep his voice icy, and even then his fury was tangible enough to draw a quiet murmur. You are to be applauded on your ingenuity. I had not thought a mere pet capable of so much cunning. Or daring. Had Vergier been a Yuzhan Vong, Numanor's words would have been enough to draw a blood challenge. As it was, the little creature only pricked her antennae. Do you accuse me of what happened in the Senate? A bold attempt to remove a rival, Nomanor confirmed. Whether or not the assassination succeeds, I am blamed by the infidels and the war master both. He shifted his attention to Savong La. The fact of my return stands as proof both of my worth to the great doctrine and of my faith in the war master's ability to see beyond such primitive ruses. Virgir's beakish mouth opened as though she might hiss. Then she caught herself and seemed to calm. Do not blame me for your failures on Coruscant. It only makes you look more the— Enough! Though the War Master spoke quietly, the mere sound of his voice was enough to silence Virgir and save her life. Had she uttered the fateful fool, Nomanor would have been not only within his rights, but expected to kill her on the spot. The assassination of Borsk Felia, or the attempt, holds little interest for me. The shadow of a smile came to Savong La's lips. He manipulated something in an arm sack, and the throne's legs folded, lowering the war master to a more comfortable speaking level. Before you arrived, Nomanor, we were discussing General Bell Iblis's pathetic scheme to undermine the morale of our warriors with this nonsense about Jedi twins. How did he think of such an idea? Nomanor knew what Savong La wanted to hear, but he was not foolish enough to lie in the War Master's presence, not with Vergier waiting to pounce on his every word. I have no knowledge of how Bel Iblis prepares his plans. Then guess, Savong La said. I command it. Nomanor's throat grew scratchy. The blaze bugs, temporarily released from their station by the idleness of the throne, began to descend on the group. The touch of their hot abdomens stung more than the stab of their proboscises. 
but such was the price of service. No one did more than shoo the ravenous creatures away from their eyes, and the readers did not do that much. My master, humans are not like you, Jean Vong. Twins are not an infrequent occurrence, Numanor said. In all of Yuzhan Vong history, there had been only a few twin births, and these only when the gods wished it so. In each instance, one had murdered the other in childhood, then matured to lead the empire through a time of grave crisis. Lord Shimre himself had murdered his twin brother before growing up to have the dream that foretold the finding of this new galaxy. Their birth suggests no special favor of the gods. Then you are saying the Solo children are twins? The reader who asked this was Kolyabu of the Undying Flame, a half-and-half, half, whose burn-melded body had been carefully shaped to appear male from one profile and female from the other. As an apostle of the Undying Flame, Kolyabu worshipped the twins Yunshin and Yunka, brother and sister gods of love and hate and all things opposite. You admit that Jason and Jaina Soto are twin Jedi brother and sister. Nomanor tried to wet his throat, but found his swallow as dry as bone dust. I admit nothing, reader. He looked toward Savongla and decided it was probably well that the War Master's face remained hidden behind a glowing mask of blaze bugs. Our spy, Vicky Shesh claims the two Solos are twins, and that their mother and uncle are also twins. Perhaps she is the one we should ask about Bel Iblis's plan. Savong La avoided the half-and-half's gaze by glaring at Nomanor. Vicky is either a traitor to her own people, or an infidel double agent. I have no faith in her. In this matter, we can trust only the opinion of a Yuzhan Vong, Berger agreed. Unlike the others, she was not limbed in scintillating blaze bug light, perhaps because she kept ruffling her feathers to keep the hungry creatures at bay. And Nomanor was on Coruscant. Surely he took time to investigate a matter of such importance before fleeing? Nom would have liked to claim there had been no time, but. He knew better than to think he could defeat Verjir's trap so easily. Deciding his only hope lay in the unexpected, he took a deep breath, then looked the war master in the eye and told the truth. There were many records to support Shesh's claim, my master, and I doubt they were planted. Even in obscure sources, I found nothing to contradict her. When the blazebugs began to leave the war master's angry face and take wing, Nomanor decided his only hope of redemption lay in a risky strategy. Clearly, fortune was smiling on us when the one named Jason escaped you at Duro. The cognition throne trembled and hopped forward, no doubt in response to the clenched fists inside its arm sacks. Tell me how. The War Master's voice was low and harsh for he did not enjoy being reminded of how Jason had used the Jedi sorcery a year earlier to rob him of a foot and prevent the sacrifice of Leo Organa Solo. Nomanor took a deep breath, then turned to Kolyabu. How would Yun Shin and Yun Ka view the sacrifice of only one twin? The half and half considered this for a moment, then said, The twins do not demand sacrifices, but the balance is all. That is not what the executor asked, Savongla said, glowering at the priest. Answer clearly, or I will ask for a reader who does. Kolyabu's ice axe paled. He, or she, Nomanor had never checked to see which, answered to Vekta, but such a request from the war master would not be ignored. Offended is not the word, War Master. The great dance would grow unstable. Savongla considered this and nodded. I thought as much. If I may make a suggestion, Nomanor said, determined to exploit his gains. Perhaps 
Lord Chimra would look favorably on a sacrifice of twin Jedi. You could have them fight each other, as Lord Chimra fought his brother. Just as the gods have ordained that twins must do since the beginning of Yuzhan Vong history. Savong La sat back in the cognition throne, considering. It would make a great gift to Yun Yuzhan, would it not? There was no reader to answer, for only Lord Chimri himself communed with Yun Yuzhan, the cosmic lord. They will never fight each other, Rajir said, always eager to undermine Nomanor. They are as close as a pilot and his coral skipper, these two. Nomanor was spared the necessity of countering her argument by the war master himself. We will have to break them first, that is all, Savangla said. And Nomanor should arrange to net cast the combat for the New Republic, I think. As you wish, great war master. Nomanor allowed himself a quick smirk in Vergier's direction, then said, Nothing could dishearten the Jedi more. I am sure. Chapter 21 A nasal bith voice keened in anguish somewhere in the middle of the exquisite death's frigid hold, and Jaina knew Yulaha was in the jaws of the Voxen again. Like the rest of the strike team, Jaina sat facing a wall of red Yorick coral, bent uncomfortably forward with her elbows between her knees, her ankles and wrists fastened to the floor by gummy masses of blorash jelly. She was barely clothed and filthy, and in too much pain to care, though she did wish it were not so cold. She was shivering, and shivering made everything hurt more. Yulaha screamed again, and Alima Rar, sitting next to Jaina in much the same condition, mumbled something through swollen lips. Jaina, who was having trouble collecting her thoughts after the voxen screeched in her face, recalled something about teamwork and opened her emotions to her companions. Immediately she felt Jason weaving them into a single entity, calling upon their mutual confidence and fellowship to lend strength to their suffering comrade. Though everyone except Ganner, who was being held somewhere else in the mistaken belief that he was the group's leader, had faced the breaking at least once. Duman Yacht kept returning to Yulaha, allowing the Bith just enough time to drop into a Jedi healing trance before awakening her to begin again. Poor Yulaha had been to the center of the hold so many times that the others were attempting to prolong their own sessions to buy time for the Bith to recover. Jaina recalled dimly that she had managed only one answer before an angry Duman Yacht pushed her at the creature's face, drawing the compressed wave screech that had blasted her into unconsciousness. When Yulaha's cries grew quiet, Duman Yacht said, Growing accustomed to the drool, are we, big head? His favorite torture was to place Yulaha's wound beneath the Voxen's acid-slavering jaws. We shall have to try something new. Yulaha screamed. Jaina struggled to look over her shoulder, but could turn only far enough to see Anakin, Jason, and several others straining to do the same. For her, that was the worst part of the breaking, the listening to friends scream without knowing what was happening to them. She felt Jason drawing upon her concern to reinforce the bith. Yulaha's scream grew a little less visceral, and Duman Yacht sensed the change. He always sensed the change. You don't have to tell me where to find the Jedi base, Liu Vong said. Just admit there is one. Yulaha's scream returned to its anguished pitch, and this time Jason seemed unable to relieve the Bith's distress. Jaina looked to her other side, where Errol Besa sat stiff-bodied and wide-eyed, the victim of a neural tail shock, a Voxen attack form they had not known about, until Duman Yacht suggested that Errol experience it. After a moment, Jaina finally caught the other woman's eye and raised her brow. Errol frowned in puzzlement, then seemed to understand and shook her head. The daughter of a fanatic space racer, Errol had been conceived and born on a long cross-galaxy run, then spent most of her childhood speeding up and down the mapped arms of the galaxy, 
Somewhere along the way, she had developed the ability to tell by the texture of the Force where she was in the galaxy at any given moment. It was her job to alert Anakin once they were safely behind Yuzhan Vong lines, where they would be far less likely to run into space mines and curious picket ships. Unfortunately, it was taking longer to cross the war zone than anyone expected. Perhaps, Jaina suspected, because Duman Yacht hoped to make a name for himself by returning to his masters with the location of the Jedi base. What harm is there in admitting it? Dumanyak asked. The Yuzhan Vong already know of its existence. Just admit what we already know, and you can rest. You can go into your healing sleep. There is no base. No, don't lie. Dumanyak's voice remained as eerily calm as always. Give me your hand. I want to tell you about the neuropoison. An involuntary whistle of terror escaped Yulaha's nasal cavities, but she said nothing. Jaina imagined the commander holding the Bith's hand over the sensory bristles along the Voxen's back, for Silgal had detected a powerful neurotoxin coating the spines. There would be an antidote in the equipment pod, but it was as untested as the rest of the inoculations and anti-venoms she and Techley had administered before the strike team's departure. Your skin is so thin, and the tiniest puncture would inject the poison, Dumanyak said. Our shapers claim the effect is not the same on all species. Some fall into convulsions and sink into an endless sleep of pain. Others weaken over many hours, slowly growing so feeble they can no longer breathe or swallow. Some drown in their own saliva. In the silence that followed, Yulaha's pain and fear grew heavy in the Force. Jaina opened herself to both sensations, hoping to ease her comrade's burden by taking some upon herself. But she was too frightened to be of much help. Bith had only one lung, and the Kufi attack aboard the Lady Luck had pierced Yulaha's. If she had to fight a neurotoxin as well, Jaina wanted her to admit the existence of Eclipse. She couldn't help it. She just did not want to see Yulaha die. No sooner had she given thought to this emotion than she felt a flood of similar feelings from the others. Jaina knew that persuading Yulaha to admit the planet's existence was only the first step of the breaking. But what harm was there, really? The strike team would be seizing the ship soon, and at least Yulaha would still be alive. She felt a flash of alarm from Alima and a certain bewilderment from the Barabels but there was no doubting the general feeling of the group. They agreed. Big Head, you must think carefully before you answer, Dumanyak said. This may be your last chance. Is there a Jedi base? Tell him, Jaina wanted to scream. You know the answer, Yulaha gasped. I am sorry, Big Head. That is not good enough. Say it. Yes, Yulaha cried. The group let out an emotional sigh of relief, but now Alima seemed worried and the Barabels sad. Yes, what? Duman demanded. Yes, there is a Jedi base, Jaina said, yelling into the wall. She admitted it. Now let her rest. Jaina, be quiet. Alima hissed. He's trying to break. The admonishment was interrupted by a hollow crack, and Jaina looked over to see a Yuzhan Vong warrior holding the butt of an amphistaff over the Twi'lek's unconscious form. There was a surge of anger from the other Jedi, but Jaina felt only guilt. It had been her outburst that prompted Alima to speak without permission. Dumin Yacht said something in his own language and the guard tossed a small button-shaped beetle on the floor beside each of Jaina's wrists and ankles. The blorash jelly released its adhesive hold on her flesh and slid away to encase the struggling insects. The guard jerked Jaina to her feet and spun her toward the center of the room, where the commander stood holding Yulaha's hand over the Voxen's sensory bristles. 
The Bith's normally pale skin had gone translucent with blood loss, and she was so weak that a Yuzhan Vong warrior had to hold her up. The rest of the strike team sat along the edge of the small hold, partially clothed, filthy, and facing the walls. Only Ganner, whose presence they sometimes sensed forward and sometimes not at all, was absent. Duman Yacht studied Jaina, then asked, You think I do not keep my word? Jaina fixed her eye on Yulaha's hand. That remains to be seen. The commander seemed confused by her challenging tone, then recovered and smirked. Very well. You are the one in control here. He said something to the guard holding Yulaha, who returned the injured Jedi to her place next to Tekli, laying the bith on her back instead of the uncomfortable sitting position in which everyone else was bound. The bith may rest and heal. Duminyak smiled at Jaina. And you will determine how long. Jaina began to feel sick and frightened, but forced herself to raise her head and step forward without being summoned. Warm feelings of encouragement and confidence flooded into her as the others reached out to prepare her for the breaking. She felt fairly confident that Duman Yacht would not let the Voxen kill her. He had already bragged to her about the place he had been promised at the Great Sacrifice. So she saw every reason to think that with her companion supporting her, she could buy Yulaha enough time to enter a healing trance and stabilize her wounded lung. But Jaina's confidence was not enough to keep her from trembling as she approached. Only the strength flowing to her through the Force had prevented her from wailing like an infant the first time Duman Yacht tried to break her, and this time would be worse, much worse. The commander could not allow her to challenge him and succeed, and there were so many ways he could hurt her without killing her, so many things to remove or disfigure or break. A fresh surge of confidence buoyed Jaina up as Jason relayed Anakin's resolve to keep her healthy, Zek's admiration of her bravery, Yulaha's weary gratitude, Tekle's calm assurance that all of their injuries could be repaired. She stopped before Duman Yacht and looked up into his face. I hope you don't expect me to thank you. He soured her stomach by clasping the back of her neck. No need. He guided her to the Voxen's head. Though the creature's malicious hunger rippled through the force with a carnal urgency, the thing seemed very much the master of its instincts, quivering with excitement, yet keeping its yellow eyes fixed on its master to await his command. Duman Yacht paused a meter from its jaws, turning Jaina to watch the beads of sour-smelling drool as they dripped from the boxen's fangs and landed, smoking, on the floor. Jaina swallowed. Her back was covered with thumb-sized circles where the drops had fallen the time before. She started to kneel. Dumanyak's hand tightened, holding her up. That is not what I was thinking. He guided her past the Voxen to the wall where her brothers sat affixed to the floor. Choose. What? Jaina felt the shock of his demand not only in the hollowness of her own stomach, but in the stunned outrage coming to her through the Force. Choose what? You are the one in control, Jaina Solo. Who will be next? He kicked first Anakin in the kidneys, then Jason. Your brother, or your twin? They're both my brothers. In Jaina's shock it registered only vaguely that Duman Yacht now realized her relationship to Jason. And I choose neither. I choose me. Duman Yacht shook his head. That is not your choice. You must choose Anakin or Jason. Again he kicked them drawing involuntary groans from both. Choose one, or I will be forced to return Yulaha to the breaking. The War Master knows of her wound, so no one will think anything of it, should she happen to die. You are the Master now, Jaina Solo. Jaina felt a surge of anger, and would have whirled on Duman Yacht to attack, 
at a flash of alarm from her brothers not brought her up short. Each wanted to be the one chosen. She would have felt that much from her brothers even without the group's emotional bond. And her tie to Jason went farther yet. She could sense that, for him, it was more than a matter of being noble, that he had good reason to believe himself the best choice. Jaina suspected those reasons included the fact that Anakin would need a clear head when the time came to escape. It had to be soon, she hoped. But she could not be certain. Even the bond between the twins was not strong enough to share complete thoughts. Your choice? Dumanyacht demanded. You can't ask that, Jaina said. She told herself that as facilitator of the battle meld, Jason was just as important as Anakin, but the truth was that she could not bring herself to harm either one. Though Anakin was a war hero and leader to everyone else, he would always be a little brother to her, someone to look after, protect, keep out of trouble. And Jason had always been her best friend, the person who understood her when she did not understand herself, the presence that enveloped her like a second skin. How could she send either of them? She looked away from Duman Yacht. I can't choose. No. His hand tightened on the back of her neck, and he started to pull her away. A pity for the Bith, then. Anakin craned his head around. Jaina, you can choose. The weight of the Force was behind his words, not as much to compel her as to make clear that this was an order. You can choose me. Jaina's connection to the others diminished as Jason withdrew into himself. He looked toward their younger brother. Anakin, be quiet, Jason. Anakin continued to stare at Jaina. Choose. Duminyacht looked at her expectantly. The Bith will probably die anyway, you know. Gina closed her eyes. Anakin, she said. Take Anakin. Duman Yacht nodded to the guard standing behind her brothers, then said something to another standing beside one of the gelatinous membranes that covered the whole doorways. The warrior tickled the membrane until it drew aside then disappeared into the next room with a thin smile of anticipation. Instead of returning Jaina to her place on the wall, Duman Yacht forced her to stand beside him as Anakin was secured to the floor face down. The commander summoned his pet forward and began to give orders, and for the next quarter hour Jaina was forced to watch. Bolstered by the support of the strike team, Anakin never cried out. Eventually even Duman Yacht clucked his tongue in admiration. "'He takes pain well, your brother,' the commander said. "'Perhaps we try something new, yes?' He barked a command, and the voxen held a foot over Anakin's back. The sharp claws were coated in green slime, the medium, Jaina knew, for the retroviruses that flourished in the thing's toe-pads. Is that fear in your eyes, Jaina Solo? Duman asked. Then there is no need to tell you about the fevers. You know what will become of your brother if he is scratched. You wouldn't disappoint your priests. As Jaina spoke, she reached out to the others, sharing with them the uncertainty her brave words concealed. The vaccine Silgal had given them was untested. It might destroy all the diseases or only some and she was not happy about experimenting with her brother's life. Not when they have promised you a place at our sacrifices. True, but think of my place, if I could tell them in which region the Jedi base is located, Duman Yacht said. I would be only a few tears behind the Warmaster, close enough so that you could see the gratitude in my eyes. An overwhelming sense of defiance came to Jaina. Anakin's feelings on the matter, no doubt, as relayed by Jason. You'll just have to watch from the back, Jaina retorted. Duminyacht's hand tightened on her neck. You believe I won't do this? He whistled sharply, and the voxen raked its claw down Anakin's back. 
Jaina felt a shock through the force, but somehow her brother still did not scream. You overestimate your brother's value, Dumignac said. The priests will be happy as long as I return with you and Jason. You two are the twins. He said the word twins as though it were some sort of state secret. There was something there Jaina did not understand, but it hardly mattered. One way or the other, she and Jason were going to disappoint both Dumanyak and the priests. The guard who had been sent out earlier reappeared at the hold door. Dumanyak had a pair of guards lay a lump of blorash jelly over the boxin's two rear feet, trapping the creature in place. They moved Anakin well beyond the Voxen's reach and secured him to the floor by a single foot. This was something new, and Jaina did not like the look of it. What are you preparing, a stare-down? Dumignac cracked a smile. In a manner of speaking, yes. He nodded to the door guard, who stood aside and stretched the membrane back to admit what looked like a small tree, about the size of a grown wookie. The plant had a small but thick crown of foliage. In the center of its trunk was a single knothole with a glassy black orb, which it turned in the commander's direction. Dumignac pointed at the center of the hold, and the tree clumped forward on three gnarled root burls. As the thing approached, the voxen's forked tongue flickered out to test the air. The sensory bristles rose on its back. Then it strained to curl its long body around and look behind it. The tree was about seven meters away when the voxen went wild, hissing madly and gouging furrows into the floor as it tried to tear itself free. The creature seemed to have lost all its intelligence, acting more like a mindless beast than the shrewd predator the Jedi had learned to fear. The tree continued to advance and two meters later Jaina lost all contact with her companions. She reached out with the Force and felt nothing. Then, as the tree drew nearer and the rest of the strike team struggled to see what was cutting them off from the Force, Jaina glimpsed a lizard-like shape clinging to the back of the tree, no doubt trying to hide itself from the voracious predator clambering to get it. Anissa Lemiri, Jaina said loudly. She was a little puzzled, for Isola Miri usually created a much larger bubble of force absence. What are you going to do with that? An interesting question. Dumignac nodded to the guard, who had brought the walking tree into the room. Show her. The guard stepped forward and took the Isola Miri from its perch. The creature's hook-shaped claws tore small chunks of bark out of the trunk, drawing a pained leaf rustle from the tree. With a crooked ridge of vertebrae running down its gaunt back and red sores flecking its smooth hide, the Isolomiri itself looked half dead. The voxen was mad to get at it, lunging and flicking its tongue at the wary guard as he laid the thing on Anakin's shoulders. The Isolomiri slid down behind Anakin's back and held on. The voxen lunged at its restraints, threatening to pull its rear legs out of socket. The Shapers cannot understand why, but Isolomiri drive Voxen mad, Dumignac said. The Voxen lose their natural cunning. In experiments similar to this, I have seen them tear off their own legs to get the Isolomiri. Your point? You know my point, Dumignac said. Sooner or later, the Voxen will stop trying to eat its problem and kill it. Jaina could not take her eyes off her brother. Now so coated in blood, he looked almost clothed. In the equipment pod, there was a way to make the Isolomiri leave the hold, of course, but Anakin and Ganner were the only ones who could activate the war droids and get at it. If they both died, the droids would automatically activate to search for strike team survivors, hardly the way Jaina wanted to deal with the problem of the Isolomiri. In what region will we find the Jedi base? Dumignac asked. Take all the time you wish to answer. I am in no hurry. Jaina tore her gaze from Anakin. Now she understood. In dragging Nulaha before the Voxen all those times, Dumignac had not been trying to break the Bith. He had been trying to break the rest of the strike team. And Jaina had shown the first crack. 
Her body did not seem large enough to hold the disappointment she felt in herself. Nando had warned them, and she clearly had not listened. Without looking at her tormentor, she asked, You'll release Anakin if I answer? If that is what you wish, Duminyak answered. You are the one controlling things. The core, Gina answered. Technically, it was true, though the only way to reach it was via a short hyperlane, shaving the edge of the deep core. That should come as no surprise. Duminyak nodded. It confirms what the readers have surmised. He nodded, and Anakin's guard tore the Isolmiri free, then tossed it to the boxen. Never deny a killer her reward. I'll keep that in mind, Jaina said. As the Voxen gulped down its treat, her contact with the Force returned, and she felt a surge of support from her companions. What about my brother? Of course. Just tell me who is next. Jaina's heart fell. She had expected something like this, and knew there was only one response. Me. Not possible. It's my only answer. Then Anakin will stay. Perhaps he will die. You said you would release him, Jaina said. I thought Yuzhan Vong were honorable. The blue beneath the commander's eyes grew darker, but he turned to Anakin's guard and nodded. Return him to his place and bring the bith. Jaina sensed a torrent of conflicting emotions from the rest of the strike team. Some seemed frightened for Yulaha. Others supportive of her defiance. But Jason brought one feeling to the fore. Anakin's calmness and determination. He had a plan. Jaina had no idea what, but just knowing that much gave her the strength to remain silent. Three meters from the wall, Anakin pulled out of his guard's grasp and, yelling for Yulaha to wake, sprang to her side. He dropped to his knees and whispered frantically into her ear. Yulaha's lidless eyes continued to stare vacantly at the ceiling, but a groggy hint of disappointment in the Force suggested she was more alert than she appeared. Anakin managed another half a dozen words before a guard's amphistaff slammed him in the head. He sank into a place of quiet darkness, and even the strike team's apprehension could not summon him back. The guard secured him in place with Blorash jelly, then released Yulaha and, still holding his amphistaff in one hand, dragged the bith to the center of the hold. The Voxen tried to face them, but found its rear feet still secured, and settled for watching out of one eye. The creature seemed in control of itself again, but its hunger burned through the force as hot as a blaster bolt. Too weak to stand on her own, Yulaha was trembling visibly and seemed unwilling to lift her gaze from the floor. Lando had said they would need to do things that sat poorly with their consciences, but Jaina could not believe he had meant standing by while the Yuzhan Vong killed someone on their team. The choice is yours, Jaina. Duminyak twisted his scarified face into the semblance of a smirk. A name or a life? Jaina reached out to Errol Besa through the Force, praying for some sign that they had crossed the war zone that they could finally call the war droids to blast them out of this mess. No such reassurance came. Jaina lowered her head. There was only one way to correct her mistake, only one way to defeat the breaking. But she could not bring herself to let Yulaha die, to actually speak the words that would kill her. Jaina did not look up. This is the last name. If you wish it so. Duminyak's mocking tone provoked a sense of deep humiliation. Jaina had been broken. Everyone knew. Yulaha's feeble voice came to her, and with it a sense of shame not unlike her own. You mustn't, Jaina. Don't let them use me. She was silenced by a sharp smack. The name, Jaina, Duminyak demanded. Who is next? Jaina finally raised her gaze and saw Yulaha struggling to recover her feet. The guard was practically dangling the bith by her arm, holding her hand over the sensory bristles along the voxen's spine. Yulaha turned toward Jason, gasped. Give me strength. Quiet. The warrior jerked Yulaha to her feet. The force surged with encouragement, support, and something else. 
something electric and raw, like the zap of a stun bolt. Suddenly, Yulaha gathered her legs beneath her. The strange energy continued to flow through the force, and she grew stronger by the moment, pushing her hand down, down onto the sensory bristles. It was all the guard could do to keep the bith from impaling her own palm. Jenny felt sick. Could this have been Anakin's plan? The anger spilling out of Jason made clear what he thought, but Jaina could not believe Anakin would order anyone to take her own life, not when he still felt Chewbacca's death so acutely. Yulaha proved too weak to push her hand down all the way. She appeared to give up, then snatched her captor's kufi from its sheath and flicked the blade across the Yuzhan Vong's throat. A cascade of blood poured out. With impossible speed for one so wounded, Yulaha jerked him around and caught the voxen's striking tail on his back. The barb snapped against the warrior's Vondun crab armor. Duminyak roared a command that sent half a dozen warriors dashing in. The voxen opened its mouth to screech, and Jaina thought it was over for Yulaha. Then Jason let the battle meld drop, and she felt him reaching out, attuning himself to the voxen's emotions, infusing it with the idea that Yulaha's attack was only a diversion, that the real danger lay with the Yuzhan Vong rushing in from the flank. It was a desperate gamble, one that could ruin the mission if Duman Yacht came to understand how the Jedi were playing him. Jaina expected nothing else from a solo. The Voxen swung its head around and burped a bubble of green mucilage over the closest guard. The Yuzhan Vong stumbled half a dozen steps more, groaning, screaming, dissolving. Yulaha used the distraction to slip forward and drive the kufi down between the Voxen's eyes. The creature shuddered to the floor and began to convulse, and even that ceased when the bith twisted the blade. Purple blood oozed around the wound, turning to brown fume as it contacted the air. Yulaha staggered back with a hand clasped over her face. She made a second step, then collapsed. The surviving guards stopped outside the brown cloud. Duminyacht barked something harsh, and one warrior tossed a ball of blorash onto the kufi knife, sealing the wound. Another covered his mouth and nose and dashed in to recover Yulaha. She allowed the guard to drag her clear of the toxin cloud, then gathered her legs beneath her and rose. Wide Yuzhan Vong eyes and gaping Yuzhan Vong mouths betrayed their surprise at seeing such a mangled body rise, and even Duman Yacht gasped. A familiar sissing sound from the far side of the hold, where all three barabels were sniggering hysterically, their heads twisted around backward, and their reptilian eyes glazed with exhaustion. Gina allowed herself a smirk, then returned her gaze to Duman Yacht. Perhaps you have another voxen to amuse us? The Yuzhan Vong glared down and, much to her surprise, smiled. That would be foolish, don't you think? I see why the War Master is so determined to destroy you Jedi. He motioned a pair of guards over, then thrust her into their arms. Know that we are done playing, Jaina Solo. If you try anything now, the consequences will be fatal. Perhaps... Jaina smiled back at him. But not for us. The comment drew feelings of alarm from many on the strike team, but Jaina knew by the sudden darkness under Duman Yacht's eyes that she had said exactly the right thing. He turned away, already calling for the Star Reader to plot a faster course to the rendezvous. Chapter 22 It would have been simpler to take a tray down to the mess hall and order breakfast from one of Eclipse's military food processors, but Mara was grilling dust crepes and mossage, a Tatooine favorite, over the single therm pad assigned to the Skywalker living quarters. Hardly a chef under the best of circumstances, she had somehow browned the dust crepes and puffed the mossage, but she refused to admit defeat. Fetching breakfast would have meant opening the door to the rest of the base, and after a rare full night in her husband's company, a night through which Ben had slept blissfully, Mara wanted Luke to herself for just a few minutes more. R2-D2 whistled from the other side of the work counter, then ran an urgent message across the sitting-room vid-screen. "'There's no reason to alert emergency control,' she said. "'This isn't a fire.' 
R2-D2 tweedled an objection. This isn't cooking, it's... heating. Mara growled. Any suggestion otherwise will earn you a memory wipe. Clear? R2-D2 trilled scornfully, then fell silent. Mara looked down to see the nausage in her makeshift skillet collapsing into black crumbs. Luke picked that moment to emerge from the refresher, pulling a fresh tunic over his wet hair. Smells good. He popped a morsel of blackened nausage into his mouth, somehow avoiding a sour face and nodding in approval. Just like we used to make back home. Really? Mara asked doubtfully. And I always thought the reason you left tattooing was to join the rebellion and save the galaxy. Luke maintained a deadpan expression. No, it was the food. Definitely the food. He took a rubbery dust crepe and began to chew, rolling his eyes as though he were enjoying a bowl of green thacatillo. Disarmed as always by Luke's humble good nature, Mara laughed and leaned across the counter to kiss him. To everyone else on Eclipse, he might be the enigmatic Jedi Master and the last best hope for an imperiled galaxy. But to her, he was the gentle husband who always knew what to say, the unassuming moisture farmer who had seen value in her when she could not find it herself. Even knowing of all the things she had done in Palpatine's service, all the lies told and the lives taken, he had accepted her first as a peer, then a friend, and finally, after it had dawned on Mara that the Force was steering them toward a very different relationship than the one envisioned by Emperor Palpatine, a lover and a spouse. She pulled away from her husband's lips and smiled. For last night. Luke glanced across the room to where Ben was sleeping in his crib, watched over by an updated version of the same TDL nanny droid that had tended Anakin and the twins when they were young and did not need to say what he was thinking. Mara took his hand and started toward the sleeping chamber. They had almost reached the door when R2-D2 whistled for their attention. Mara did not even turn around. Not now, R2. R2-D2 whistled again, then sent a live feed of the hangar to the sitting room vid screen. Mara glimpsed the Shadow and Falcon sitting with a dozen other large vessels on the far side of the cavernous bay, where several support technicians were jockeying blast boats to make room for an arriving ship. The central area was packed with seventy new XJ-3 X-wings that Admiral Crefe had quietly rotated out of his fleet onto Eclipse, while Saba Sebatine's motley assortment of starfighters and Kip Duran's battle-scarred X-wings sat untended and inaccessible on the close side of the hangar. The picture zoomed in on the area between the new X-Wings and the older starfighters. Corrin Horn stood surrounded by pilots from Kip's Dozen, the Wild Knights and the Shockers. This last squadron was Eclipse's own, made up equally of untested Jedi and space-blooded non-Jedi veterans. The three leaders, Kip Duran, Saba Sabatine, and the non-Jedi Rigard Mattel, were all talking at once while an impatient-looking Corrin Horn stood looking into the ceiling holocam. Luke sighed, then asked Mara, Do you mind? I'll mind more if we don't win this war, she said. Corrin might seem rigid and moralistic, but he's not the sort who calls for help unless he needs it. R2, give us some sound. Kip Duron's impatient voice came over the speaker. Don't see what we're waiting for. Maybe Danny will figure out how to jam the Yamisks, and maybe she won't, but in the meantime, the Yuzhan Vong have Anakin and the others. Like most pilots who had not promised to remain at Eclipse, Kip had not yet been informed that the strike team's capture was a ruse. While we train, they move deeper into Yuzhan Vong territory. We'll go after them when Master Skywalker says we go after them, Corrin replied. Until then, we sit tight and wait for orders. Orders? Kip scoffed. This isn't the military, Corrin. Jedi don't wait for orders while the enemy carries their friends off for sacrifice. Perhaps not. But they don't rush into battle ill-prepared, Rigard said. A former TIE pilot with a battle-scarred face nearly as gruesome as a Yuzhan Vong's, Rigard hated war with a passion, yet somehow found himself fighting on one side or the other, and sometimes both. 
in every major galactic conflict since the Rebellion. We're waiting for more to fall in place than Danny's research on gravitic modulation. We don't want to lock in our cards until everything's ready. It is locking in the cards that worries this one. Saba Sabatin addressed this to the holocamp, making clear that she was speaking directly to Luke. She is thinking that when someone sticks an arm out too far, she is liable to lose a hand. Blasters, Luke hissed, echoing a curse Mara had not heard since Jaina and Jason were at the Jedi Academy. Kip again. Better get down there. Mara said, reaching across the work counter for her comlink. I'll let Corrin know we are coming. Mara and Luke dressed and, leaving instructions with the nanny droid to calm them when Ben woke, left for the hangar bay. They had to bundle themselves in thermal cloaks, for the base's cooling system was working too well now. The corridors were in constant danger of icing over. As they twined their way through the passages, Mara sensed the disharmony welling up inside Luke, though their bond was not quite deep enough for her to read his thoughts all the time. She knew he was once again struggling with the difficulties of leadership and family. In a time when the Jedi needed him most, he was worried that Mara's recovery, as mysterious as the disease itself, would not hold. In a time when he needed to be at her side learning to be a good father— he was struggling to hold the fractious Jedi together and find the wisest course along which to guide them. They rounded a corner and started down the passage toward the big emergency airlock outside the hangar bay, and Mara took his hand. Skywalker, sometimes I think I should just kick you in the head. Not looking all that surprised, Luke glanced over at her. Really? Mara waved a hand at the hangar ahead. Everything you're doing with the Jedi, it is for us. She palmed the airlock's control pad and its hatch, irised open. Ben is strong in the Force. I know you felt it, too. Luke nodded. I have. So the Jedi must win this war, Mara said. If we don't, where will Ben be safe? Luke stopped and Mara felt the disharmony in him melting away. He motioned her into the airlock. I hadn't thought of it quite like that. Of course not. You're too selfless. She opened the door to the hangar. But I'm not. Now, are you going to set Kip and Saba straight, or am I? She felt Luke's smile in the back of her head. I'd better do it myself. It wouldn't be fair to let you loose on them. Fair? Mara echoed. What makes you think I care about fair? They stepped out of the airlock and walked down a clear path to the gathering of pilots. Danny Kui had also joined the group, no doubt summoned the instant Saba learned Luke was coming. Convinced the strike team could never withstand the breaking, she had been pressing Luke to send a backup mission almost since the Wild Knight's return from Arcania. Luke had yet to rule out the possibility, in part because he feared Saba would take her squadron and attempt the mission herself, but also because he worried Danny was right. Corrin stepped aside, yielding his place at the head of the gathering to Luke. Luke allowed a note of irritation to creep into his voice and focused only on Corrin. Corrin, what's happening here? Why aren't you analyzing the morning exercise? Corrin's eyes betrayed surprise at Luke's stern tone, but he stiffened his bearing. Master Skywalker, our exercise came to an early end when the Lady Luck entered the system. It should be arriving shortly. Luke heard Han and Leia approaching, and, with a dart of his eyes, sent Mara to intercept them. The sense of purpose he felt from her confirmed that she understood what she needed to do. As Mara departed, Luke continued to look at Corrin. I don't understand. His voice remained even but firm. If Lando was in trouble, what are you doing here? Saba Sabatine stepped forward. It is not Jedi Horn's fault, Master Skywalker. This one left. Luke raised his brow and waited. This one wanted to hear how it went. How what went? Kip demanded 
completely ignorant of the part Lando had played in Anakin's capture. Somebody had better tell me what's going on around here before I take the dozen and leave. Luke stepped toward Kip. How can we tell you anything when you are always so ready to leave us? Kip frowned, then glanced over his shoulder at his pilots. Are you saying you can't trust us? It isn't a matter of trust, Luke replied. He let the statement hang and continued to study Kip as Han and Leia came up behind him. Neither spoke, and they both fixed silent gazes on Kip. Finally, Kip looked from Luke to Saba. Saba knows what this is all about, he complained, and she isn't promising to stay. Saba has a right to know. Her son is with Anakin, Luke said. So are her apprentices. Kip considered this for a moment, then turned to Saba. We don't have to take this, you know. We can go after them ourselves. Han shook his head. No, kid, you can't. He pointed at the blast doors. You can take the dozen and leave if you like. But you can't go after Anakin and the twins. Not if friendship means anything to you. A look of stunned confusion came over Kip. Those are your kids, Han. You should want us to go after them. I want them back alive, Han said. And that's not going to happen if you go after them. Depending on what Lando Calrissian has to report, Saba corrected. If he has learned through his villip that the breaking worked. There won't be a backup mission, Luke said. He saw Han stiffen and felt Leia's dismay through the Force, but Mara had prepared them well enough that they betrayed no other sign of concern. The strike team must succeed or fail on its own. Even if we could reach them, we'll be too busy with other things. Strike team? Kip looked to Han for enlightenment. What other things? Sorry, Kip. You'll have to ask Luke. Ever the gambler, Han sweetened the pot. There's too much at risk for me to talk out of turn. Kip looked back to Luke. Have you figured out what that feint at Arcania was about? Are we finally going to take the war to the Yuzhan Vong? Luke fought to keep a deadpan face. I don't know that we are going to do anything. As he spoke, the Lady Luck appeared outside the hangar door and hovered on the other side of the magnetic containment field while the technicians moved the last vessel, Tendra Ricent Calrissian's gentleman caller, out of the way. If you want to be part of this, I need your promise. Kip looked wary. What kind of promise? An oath of allegiance. What kind do you think? Han asked, his tone almost angry. You promise to obey Luke and do what he says as long as he'll have you. If you won't do that, pack your bags and get out now. Han paused, and his tone grew a little more gentle. It's time you started acting like a Jedi Knight. Kip's eyes flared at the admonition. Luke thought for a moment Han had overplayed his hand, but, as usual, the Corellian knew how far to press a bet. Kip's gaze slowly softened and something fatherly in Han seemed to get through to him. He turned to his pilots. What do you think? Do we throw in with the Jedi and pretend like we're in a real space navy? You know what we want, an insectoid verpine pilot buzzed, one whose name Luke was ashamed to realize he did not know. As long as we fight you, Jean Vong. Kip looked to the rest of his squadron. When they voiced similar sentiments, he turned and nodded to Han. Okay, we promise. Not me, kid. Han quietly pointed to Luke. He's the boss around here. Kip's face reddened, but he swallowed his pride and turned to Luke. You have our oath, Master Skywalker. We'll stay as long as you'll have us. And follow orders? This from Corn Horn. Kip made a sour face. If we have to, you do. Luke saw the Lady Luck drifting into the docking bay and turned to Saba Sebatine. 
How about the Wild Knights? Of course, if the Jedi truly intend to carry the war to the invaders, Saba said. So you have determined the War Master's purpose in fainting at Arcadia? We're still working on that, Luke said. But we are going to carry the war to the Yuzhan Vong. I would never have risked your son and apprentices if we weren't. Chapter 23 A groggy, wookie groan reverberated through the frigid hold of the exquisite death. Cautiously, Anakin craned his neck around. Obaka and many others remained hidden behind a small grove of Isolamiri laden trees the Yuzhan Vong had marched into the hold. But he could see Jaina and Errol opposite him, and Joven and the Barabels on the wall adjacent. Still secured to the floor with their hands between their knees, they were all fidgeting, trying to relieve the strain on their back and legs. The Barabels seemed especially uncomfortable, with their thick tails stretched behind them and secured at the tip with blorash jelly. Anakin glanced over at Zek and his brother and raised his brow. Zek nodded eagerly, but Jason closed his eyes and looked away. Unable to imagine what was troubling his moody brother, and not sure he cared, Anakin lowered his chin toward his left armpit. Activate escape, he whispered. There was a hot tingle as the subcutaneous implant relayed the message. Then a heavy foot scuffed the floor behind him. Anakin ducked and caught the expected strike on his much bruised shoulder. Quiet, Jedi, the guard said. Another word, and I'll fill your mouth with blorash jelly. Uncertain how long the war droids would need, or even whether they were still attached to the ship, Anakin fixed his gaze on the floor. The guard hovered another thirty seconds, then shuffled off. Many minutes later, a series of distant thuds sounded forward in the ship. From the next hold back came a much louder whumph. Then the muffled roar of explosive decompression and the clatter and shriek of equipment and creatures tumbling into the void. In the back of the Jedi's hold, the door membranes bowed dangerously outward, but held long enough to turn opaque and stiffen into durasteel-like panels. The subaltern barked something in Yuzhan Vong. When no response came from his shoulder villip, he sent two guards forward to investigate, assigned eight more to watch the Jedi prisoners and took the last two to the rear of the hold. Anakin knew that by now, 2-1-S would be standing guard as 2-4-S sealed the breach, using emergency patching foam to mate the open equipment pod to the death's exterior hull. He watched the guards carefully, alert for any hint of an order coming through their shoulder villips. The subaltern pressed his face close to the door, as though to breathe on it. But then a cannon bolt came blasting through the opaque membrane and sprayed black gore everywhere. Anakin's ears popped as the hold pressures equalized, and the subaltern's two escorts were reduced to so much smoking flesh by a series of strobe-like weapon flashes. The rest of the Yuzhan Vong reached for thud bugs and amphistaffs. Some turned to assault the strike team and fell to a flurry of screaming green bolts as 2-1-S crashed into the hold. A coat of icy rime was forming on his space-cold armor, and his photoreceptors were fogging over. Anakin feared the droid would be forced to stand idle while his surface temperature stabilized. Instead, 2-1-S activated a thermal defogger and cut down two more enemies as they dived for cover. He raised his other arm and began knocking Isolamiri from their trees with an optional electro-ray discharger. Anakin's guard yelled something about Jedi and spun to attack Anakin, and was cut in half by a torrent of rapid-fire blaster bolts. The stream swept down the wall, chopping through an Isolamiri tree to dismember a Yuzhan Vong whirling on Jason. As 2-1-S did all this, he was advancing into the hold, taking thud bugs in the chest and scorching two warriors near Jaina with electro-rays. It could not have escaped anyone's notice that the droid was protecting the three solos, a programming adjustment Lando had neglected to mention but the others had no cause to complain. YVH-24S entered the hold on the heels of 2-1S, one arm firing a blaster cannon, the other mini-rockets. He shot through the elbows of a Yuzhan Vong attempting to behead Joven Drark, 
then chased another, away from Techley, with the self-guiding mini-rocket. Only Tisar had to defend himself, ripping his tail free of the Blorash jelly and, leaving the tip behind, sweeping his attacker off his feet. The Yuzhan Vong landed hard, but leveled his amphistaff at Tisar's midsection, only to have his arms pinned to the floor by Bella's tail, also tipless. Krossoff finished the fight by smashing her tail, tipless as well, across his windpipe. Surprise! Tisar rasped. This launched the three barabels into a bewildering fit of laughter. Tisar used the raw end of his tipless tail to flip open the dead Yuzhan Vong's waist pouch and began flicking beetles at the blur-ash jelly binding nearby Jedi to the floor. Anakin looked across the hold to 2-1-S. Secure the doors, he ordered. A beetle landed beside Anakin's ankle, then several more between him and Jason, and soon they were free. He assigned one group to retrieve weapons and equipment from the pod, another to dispose of the Isla Lemiri, and the rest of the Jedi to evaluate the group's medical condition and tend to Yulaha. Only then did he join 2-1-S at the forward door, where the droid was peering through the translucent membrane down a long access corridor. Report. Sir, we are fifteen seconds ahead of schedule. 2-4-S was able to penetrate the hull with ten coma gas canisters. Effectiveness assessment currently unavailable. Three Voxen were detected in the stern hold and attacked with Class C thermal detonators. Post-blast sensor sweep detected no sign of surviving life forms. And the vessel itself? Anakin asked. Tekli appeared beside him, her pudgy Chadrafan snout twitching incessantly as she reached up to spray a pain-numbing antiseptic over his raw back. He nodded his thanks, but kept his attention fixed on 2-1-S. Were you able to do any internal mapping? Sir, we are aboard a Corvette analog picket boat, length 122 meters, estimated crew 98, 2-1-S said. Ultrasonic soundings suggest a two-level design with back-to-back -back decks sharing a common floor, four main access corridors, three aft holds, forward-facing bridge in the bow, and a substantial network of non-diagrammed ducts. Anakin groaned inwardly. The ducts would make it easy for the enemy to move around undetected. The barabels came up behind him loaded with weapons, equipment, and bulky jumpsuits. One one a fished these out of the flush lock, Tisar said, passing Anakin's lightsaber to him. As Anakin took it, the lambent crystal inside opened him to the presence of the Yuzhan Vong, an indistinct fury somewhere forward in the ship. Bella pointed to a gob of frozen gunk on the handle. Want that meat? Uh, not really. Anakin knocked the garbage off the handle and clipped the weapon to the equipment harness Tisar was holding out to him. The Barabels exchanged expressionless reptilian glances, then Krossoff retrieved the gunk and divided it into three even pieces. Anakin rolled his eyes and selected a blaster pistol and half a dozen stun grenades from the small arsenal Tisar was carrying, then called the rest of the group over while Tahiri, who had insisted on taking the duty over from Tekli, plastered his back with back to bandages. Bella passed jumpsuits to those who were not yet dressed, and within moments everyone on the strike team was garbed in a simple brown uniform that made the Jedi Knights seem both efficient and intimidating. The jumpsuits were also light armor, for they were lined with the same alternating layers of molly tex and quantum fiber that made the YVH droid's laminanium armor so impenetrable. In a pinch, they could even serve as vac suits. They had been designed to work with the emergency suits, worn back on Eclipse, but attached independently to the appendage pieces and could be made airtight in their own right. Anakin divided the strike team into two squads, assault and support, and outlined his plan. After allowing everyone a few moments to meditate and rejuvenate their anguished bodies through the Force, they opened their emotions to each other. As Jason weaved the battle meld, Anakin sensed a certain reservation in his brother, some misgiving that sent unsettling ripples through the entire strike team. 
He immediately regretted not sending Jason back with Lando, but swallowed his irritation and focused on the task at hand. The team would sense his resentment through their emotional bond, and such distractions were the last thing they needed now. Anakin fitted a breath mask over his nose and mouth, then affixed the attachable hood to his jumpsuit to protect his head. When the others did the same, he was so awed by the effect that he instantly felt better. Astral, he exclaimed. Let's go do this. YVH-21S opened his elbow and fired a pair of flash grenades down the corridor, then stepped through the tattered door membrane. Thudbugs began to plink at his laminanium armor. He silenced the source with a flurry of blaster bolts, and the Jedi followed him forward. The interior of the ship looked oddly cavern-like and murky, with hazy circles of bioluminescent lichen clinging to the walls and clouds of coma gas swirling through the air and door valves sagging open every two meters. Anakin advanced with lightsaber in hand and blaster holstered. Behind him came T. Sarsebatine, a big B-100 power blaster cradled in both arms, then Alima Rar and the rest of the assault squad. Jason was in the middle with Tenel Ka, followed by an indignant Tahiri. She wanted to be in front with Anakin. And Bella and Krasov Hara. Last came 2-4-S, who was tasked with covering Lobaka, while the Wookiee used a laser drill to insert flechette mines into the system ducts. Jaina remained behind with Yulaha and the support squad, covering the other corridors with powerful blaster mini-cannons. As Anakin and the others moved toward the bridge, it grew apparent that the coma gas had done its job well. Unconscious Yuzhan Vong lay sprawled across sagging door valves, curled up in sleeping nests, slumped over duty stations in shielding nodules and weapon turrets. Several had fallen to the floor in front of Nuliths the Yuzhan Vong equivalent of breath masks, and one crew member had even managed to lay the thing on his face before falling prey to the neural effects of the coma gas. The strike team was attacked only once, when Anakin sensed a sudden flare of enemy anxiety behind a half-open door valve. By the time he turned to warn the others, a Newlith-masked warrior was flinging a pair of thud bugs into Bella's shoulder. The projectiles smashed harmlessly against her jumpsuit's armored lining, and she barely flinched before jerking her attacker from his hiding place and skewering him on her sister's waiting lightsaber. As they drew near the bow, the assault team lost contact with the force, no doubt because Issa Lemiri were near. Anakin lost his sense of the Yuzhan Vong as well, a hint that the lambent crystal was somehow connected to the force. It was good to know, he supposed but he really didn't care as long as it worked when the Force returned. Ten meters ahead, the corridor ended in a vertical bulkhead, where an unconscious Yuzhan Vong warrior hung as though pinned to the wall. The strange sight confused no one. Like all good starship designers, the enemy made the most of shipboard space, utilizing their Dovin basils to orient gravity in the most convenient direction. The bulkhead looked like a wall from the assault squad's current perspective, but it would become a floor as soon as they crossed the open area and placed a foot on it. A gentle wump shook the corridor behind them, and 2-1-S said, 2-4-S reports mine detonation in the main elimination duct. Ultrasonic sounding suggests the triggering agent was a voxen, injured but not crippled. Voxen? Anakin demanded from beneath his breath mask. I thought 2-4-S disintegrated them. There was a point zero eight chance of a single survival, 2-1-S pointed out. 2-4-S calculates the odds of a double survival. Don't tell me, Anakin said, raising a hand. I really don't want to know. He used his comlink to warn Jaina about the Voxen and sent 2-4-S back to watch ducts for her, then asked 2-1-S for a see-through sensor sweep. Eleven conscious warriors waiting on the deck below, in a cabin adjacent to the bulkhead ahead, the droid reported. Tactical analysis suggests the likelihood of an ambush. You don't say, Anakin said. What about Ganner? Implant triangulation fixes Ganner rysoed at five meters starboard and moving forward. 
Passive acoustics suggest the company of several guards. Vital readings satisfactory. Heart rate and respiration indicate deep sleep. Come aghast but moving, Anakin surmised. They must be cutting their way from one cabin to another, or Jaina's squad would see them. And they have Isla Miri. Alima Rar laid a hand on Anakin's arm and spoke so quietly that he had to lean his ear toward her breath mask. The Yuzhan Vong believe we are soft. They will try to use him against us. Against us? Anakin found himself staring almost hypnotically into Alima's pale Twi'lek eyes. As bait? When she nodded, Anakin disengaged himself and ignited his lightsaber. Being careful not to penetrate all the way through, he plunged the blade into the floor and began to cut a circle. He had no real plan yet except to avoid the ambush, but walking into a trap was not going to save Ganner either. The Yorick coral was easier to cut than durasteel, but it popped and cracked loudly as it melted, and Anakin worried that the enemy would not be as surprised as he hoped. Jason stepped to Anakin's side. What are you doing? The disappointment was evident on his face, and Anakin knew others could see it too. We should be going after Ganner. No, we must destroy the ambush party first, Alima said. This is better. Better how? Jason asked. Anakin can't keep sacrificing others to make his plans work. That way lies the dark side. Sacrificing others? Anakin did not look away from his work. What are you talking about? Yulaha and now Ganner, Jason said. You told Yulaha to attack the Voxen, and now you're abandoning Ganner. The accusations hit Anakin almost physically. His lightsaber slipped and cut a deep furrow across the floor, and he found himself glaring at his brother, sick with anger and hurt. How can you think that, he demanded. Yulaha disobeyed orders. I wanted her to tell Duman Yacht the name of the base. I did not say to attack. Jason's cheeks flushed, then his jaw dropped and he stood speechless for a long time. Finally he stammered, Anakin, I... I'm sorry. When Yulaha attacked, I thought... I just assumed... I know what you assumed, Anakin said. Though his brother's regret was evident on his crimson face, no apology could erase the doubt he had expressed about Anakin's character, nor the fact that he had been so quick to believe the worst, just as their father had when Chewbacca died. Anakin plunged his lightsaber back into the floor and continued to cut. Get away from me, you're holding things up. Jason started to reply, but Tenel Kaw caught him by the arm and pulled him away. This cannot be resolved now, Jason. You must wait until later. With Alima's help, Anakin cut the circle to within a few millimeters of the other side, then activated his comlink to warn Jaina about what they were doing. She and 2-4-S were busy keeping the wounded Voxen trapped in the system's ducts. But she paused long enough to warn Zek and Raynar not to fire when figures started appearing in their corridor. Bella and Kossoff kicked the circle out, then lay on their bellies and vanished, one after the other, into the floor. The muffled zing of their repeated blasters immediately came back through the hole. Alima went next, diving headfirst. Then Anakin, lightsaber in one hand, concussion grenade in the other. On the other side, he slowed and landed feet first on what felt like the ceiling. The whine of blaster fire and drone splat of striking thud bugs drove Anakin against the wall. Mind struggling to reorient, he thumbed the arming switch of his grenade. A trio of would-be ambushers lay at the end of the corridor, Bundoon crab armor stitched with holes from the Barabel sisters' repeating blasters. The thud bugs came from the open door of the ambushers' cabin, and also from the bulkhead itself, where a pair of bridge guards wearing nuleths were attacking through a jagged melt hole. He saw no sign of Ganner, but had not expected to. Anakin nodded across the corridor to Alima. She armed her own grenade, then they tossed the weapons into the ambush cabin. There were two bright flashes and a gut-deep jolt, and a tongue of flame shot into the corridor, reeking of scorched flesh. 
Waving the others to follow, Anakin charged forward behind the fiery curtain. A line of thudbugs crackled along the wall. Then one took him in the chest and slammed him down on his back. Bella and Kossoff pounded past, pouring blaster fire into the bulkhead, and Alima came next, pausing to pull him to his feet. It hurt to breathe, and he might have a cracked rib, but his jumpsuit's armored liner had spared him any blood or deep pain. He activated his comlink. Two on S, secure the bulkhead. The droid appeared at the end of the corridor and dropped onto the bulkhead, now standing perpendicular to Anakin. The bridge guards swarmed him with thud bugs and magma pebbles, burning thumb-sized pits into his armor. He counterattacked with sensor-targeted blaster bolts and electro-rays, and the enemy fire withered. A sporadic stream of thud bugs began to assail 2-1-S from the deck where they had first located Ganner. The droid ignored this nuisance and dropped to his knees beside the melt holes, then fired into the bridge itself. Anakin sent Alima and the Barabel sisters to support the droid, then returned to the hole in the floor and dropped back through to the other side. Tisar and Lobaka were in the forward cabin, already outlining a new doorway with elastic detonite. As Anakin approached, the pair pressed themselves flat against the wall and ignited the charge with the tip of Loe's lightsaber. There was a sharp crack and the clatter of spraying shrapnel. Then smoke filled the air, and the new door remained closed. Tisar stepped away from the wall and sprang into the Yorick Coral feet first. The slab flew into the adjacent cabin, slammed into something large, and drew a startled Yuzhan Vong curse. Tisar silenced the voice with the staccato roar of his power blaster, then Lobaka charged in behind him. Anakin ignited his own lightsaber and— heard the all-too-familiar burp of a voxen expelling acid. Anakin's thoughts leapt to Lobaka. He could not bear the thought of telling Chewbacca's family that another member had died with him. Then the brown mucus came shooting out of the makeshift door and splashed against the far wall. From inside came a wookie growl and the shrill sizzle of a lightsaber straining to cut, then a ghostly squeal of pain that quickly modulated into the opening burst of a screech attack. Tisar's power blaster roared again. The screech choked to an end. Anakin stepped through the doorway and found himself looking into a large wardroom, where a blaster-scorched voxen was scurrying toward a lopsided hole in the rear wall. The thing was missing at least a tail and two rear legs, but remained quick enough to dodge a blaster bolt. Scattered across the floor were nearly a dozen coma-gassed Yuzhan Vong but two more stood behind the claw-scarred remnants of an Isla Miri tree, their faces half-hidden behind Nulith's amphistaffs held ready. Tisar disposed of the sickly-looking Isla Miri with a quick shot from his power blaster, and the Yuzhan Vong warriors rushed to do battle. Tisar brought his power blaster around and burned a hole through the chest armor of the first one, hurling him back against the wall. Anakin intercepted the second, freeing Lobaka to make one last stab at the vanishing boxen. The Yuzhan Vong tried to pin Anakin against the wall, changing his amphistaff into a whip form and flicking the fanged head at the Jedi's eyes. It was a tired tactic, almost disrespectful. Anakin feigned to stumble and dropped into a crouch, catching the attack on his lightsaber's fiery blade. The serpent recoiled. Anakin posted his free hand, whipped his feet around, and trapped the Yuzhan Vong's knees, scissored his legs. The warrior yelled and hit the floor like a bag of rocks. The amphistaff struck again. Anakin blocked, flicked the thing away, brought his own blade down across the enemy's throat. As the head rolled away, he spun toward the rear wall and was relieved to find Lobaka holding yet another voxen leg. The Wookiee's disappointed growls left no doubt that the creature had escaped, but Anakin was happy enough to see him standing. He gathered his own feet beneath him and saw, as he had feared, no sign of Ganner in the room. Anakin noticed a chill along his spine and realized that his sense of the Yuzhan Vong had returned. Then he felt Jason's touch brush his mind. There was also another sensation, the familiar hunger of the Voxen, wounded and angry, lurking somewhere in the duck. They would hunt it down later, after the vessel was secure. Waving his lightsaber out the door to avoid being blasted by a mini-cannon, 
Anakin motioned Tisar and Lobaka after him and stepped into the corridor. Jaina's voice came over the comlink. What's that I feel? It can't be a voxen. Two for S and I killed it. I'm looking at its body right now. Just keep an eye on those ducts, Anakin said, resisting the urge to calm 2-1-S about the odds of all three escaping the thermal detonator. There's another one. He turned toward the bulkhead and found 2-1-S kneeling over the shredded door valve, firing an intimidating but relatively harmless stream of non-lethal bolts into the bridge. There was no return fire but the droid's armor was pocked and smoking from head to foot, with several fist-deep craters where the Yuzhan Vong had managed to concentrate their attacks. Anakin dropped down beside the droid and the rest of the assault squad. There was a definite Yuzhan Vong presence on the bridge, but the feeling was too murky for him to tell how many or what condition. YVH-21S turned toward him. Bulkhead secure but the enemy is holding one captive, Jedi Rysode, on the bridge. His photoreceptors were shattered and smeared with thud-bug juice. Currently two minutes, eleven seconds ahead of schedule. You expected something else? Anakin had intended to sound cocky like his father, but the effect was ruined when a pang from his bruised ribs made him squeak out the last two words. He glanced onto the bridge, then said, You don't look so good, Tuanes. We'll finish without you. Affirmative, the droid answered. Sensor systems unstable. Rather than risk a security trap by entering through the bridge's battered entrance valve, Anakin dropped to his belly beside the melt holes and peered through. On the other side lay more than a dozen Yuzhan Vong, most deep in a coma gas sleep. Some had nuliths fastened over their faces, no doubt placed there by well-meaning comrades who had not realized that an antidote agent would be required to awaken their comrades. A handful of warriors lay in the awkward positions of their death throes, their wounds still smoking from the heat of the fatal blaster strike. The cognition hood used to steer the vessel dangled a few centimeters above the comatose pilot's blank face, while the neural interface gloves employed in regulating the ship's systems lay draped over several different control consoles, usually with the hands of a dozing Yuzhan Vong crew member still wearing them. Anakin was disappointed to find the command chair empty and no one lying within three meters of it. Dumanyak had escaped the coma gas. It doesn't look like there's much happening, Anakin said, speaking to Lobaka, Tisar, and the rest of the assault squad. But be careful. We don't want to get careless and blast Ganner by mistake. You're sure? Tahiri asked, drawing a laugh from the others. Anakin allowed himself a chuckle, but said, at least for now. He ignited his lightsaber and dived through the melt hole head first then felt an attack coming, and brought his blade around to block. The thud bug sizzled out of existence with a sharp hiss, and Anakin spun in the direction of the assault, stepping forward to protect those who would be following him. Very impressive, Jedi. Anakin looked toward the voice and found Duman Yacht, wearing a newlith and standing behind an instrument console, Gana Rysode's limp form held in front with a kufi to the throat. There you are. Anakin peered around the bridge. All alone, it seems. Lay down your weapons, the commander said cautiously, and your leader will live to meet our war master. Anakin thumbed off his lightsaber. Then, as Lobaka and Tisar stepped onto the bridge, drew his blaster pistol. You really don't know Ganner, do you? Anakin asked. What makes you think he's that important? You came after him, did you not? Duminyak retreated a few steps, bringing Ganner around to shield him from all three Jedi. We have studied you, Jedi. When it comes to the death of your fellows, you are soft. Not that soft. Anakin leveled his blaster pistol at the commander's head, and Tisar did the same with his power blaster. But I'll offer you a deal. If you surrender, we'll put you off in the shuttle with the rest of your crew. Dumanyakt's eyes hardened. And Dishonored Dumanyakt? He ran the kufi lightly along Ganner's throat, 
drawing a two-centimeter-long trickle of blood. Yuzhan Vong do not surrender. Really? Anakin reached out with the Force and used it to push the Kufi away from Ganner's neck. Eyes growing wide, Duman yocked, struggled for a moment to bring the blade back to his captive's throat, then snarled something in his own language and let it fly from his grasp. When the other hand twitched and started to rise, his head vanished in a convergence of blaster fire. By this one's broken tail, Tisar slung his power blaster over his shoulder and stepped forward to pluck Ganner out of the mess. They don't surrender. Chapter 24 No Manor could not believe even Vergier would dare suggest that the Warmaster waste his time playing an infidel game, much less survive the affront. Yet there she sat across from Savong La, studying a shaper's version of a Dejeric board, complete with animate monsters and a mat of living terrain. The Warmaster was down to a pair of monarchs and a single miniature Mantellian savrip, while his feathery pet still boasted a kintan strider and three chlor slugs. Though Nomanor had never really enjoyed the game, he had frequently been forced to play holographic versions during his time in the galaxy, often enough to recognize a master when he saw one. And Vergier was, undoubtedly, a master. If New Republic strategists were the only ones who practiced this game, it would not be worth the learning, Vergier was saying. But there are suggestions that the Jarek was once a favorite study of Jedi Knights. That explained how she had enticed the War Master into such a blasphemy, Nomanor realized. Savong La would do anything that might help him defeat the Jedi. The strategies are more subtle than they appear, Nomanor, Savong La said, not looking away from the game mat, and surprising Nomanor, who had thought the War Master too absorbed to notice the scrutiny. And a warrior must know the mind of his enemy. The game is popular throughout the galaxy, Nomanor replied. I have played a few times myself. Indeed? Savong La tore his gaze from the board. Then perhaps you have some insight as to the route Jason and his sister will be taking home. Home? Nomanor was confused. The exquisite death was more than a day overdue. But such delays were not unusual for picket ships, which operated just inside enemy territory and had to be very careful choosing their routes. I did not know they had escaped. You didn't? Savong La looked back to the Dejeric game, then nudged his savrip forward between two of Vergier's claw slugs. Interesting. By now I would have thought that obvious to any Dejeric player. An angry heat filled Nomanor's ice axe. The Supreme Commander's last report claimed that this Duman Yacht has things well in hand. Has there been a communication I'm unaware of? Not yet. Savongla smiled as Vergier sent her strider up to upend his savrip. Then he slipped his little monarch through the vacated space to slay her strider from behind. Taking advantage of the surprise-kill second move, the Warmaster threatened a claw slug, then smiled across the table at Vergier. But the Jedi mind is growing clearer to me. They will keep a low profile, then strike when their captor has grown complacent. Vergier returned the smirk with one of her own. They will strike, but not where we think. Instead of moving a second claw slug to defend the first, she sent it slinking two squares toward Savong La's side of the mat. The Dejeric vids call that the Kin Tan Strider Death Gambit. It defeats with promises. She now had her three claw slugs arranged in a right angle, with each of his monarchs trapped between two of her monsters. No matter which he attacked first, both of the others would be in a position to counter-strike from behind take a surprise move, and trap his remaining monster in an inescapable vice. The War Master took all this in with a glance, his ice axe growing dangerously dark as he realized how cleanly Vergier had defeated him. I see what you mean. 
He cleared the game mat with a swipe of his hand, then stood and looked through an exterior viewing lens at the swarm of black-faceted vessels hanging in the starlight beside the Sunalok. So they have tricked us. To what purpose? The Jedi do not think so differently from you. Regeer scanned through the holographic images of the tiny monsters and selected one, then projected it on the game mat. They will strike hardest at what they fear most. Savong La turned away from the viewing lens and, finding the rancor alone on the mat, nodded. I suppose it would be wise to assume the worst. He turned to Nomanor. You will take the Kastar and start for Banu Ras. At once. Nomanor nodded, needing no explanation. Currently orbiting the planet Mirkur, Banu Ras was the largest of the world ships to enter the galaxy so far. With a dying brain that could no longer control its spin, the shapers there now used Dovin basils to give it gravity. Banu Ras was also three-quarters abandoned, a perfect tome for the Voxen cloning program that was proving so effective against the Jedi. And the Jedi? Do what is necessary, but the Solo Twins have been promised to Lord Shimra. Those you must bring back alive. As you command. The feeling that filled Nomanor's heart was closer to triumph than joy. While the Warmaster had proven surprisingly tolerant of events on Coruscant, neither had he chastened Vergeer for interfering with his mission. Nomanor crossed his fists over his breast and backed toward the door, already planning how he would convert this assignment into a sector prefecture. Warmaster, I believe this to be a mistake. Vergeer spoke quietly so that Nomanor would be forced to admit that he was eavesdropping if he wished to challenge her words. Given that your reputation with Lord Shimra is at stake, would it not be wiser to send someone with a more certain touch? Nomanor held his tongue, just barely, and continued to back toward the door, ears straining for the War Master's reply. If you are referring to events on Coruscant, I know what happened, Savongla said. Nomanor is not to blame. He did well to return to us at all. More to Nomanor's astonishment than his anger, Virgir continued to press. We must also consider the debacle with Elan and the Peace Brigade, and his failures against Mara Jade Skywalker. Nomanor has faced Jedi many times and done poorly. The door valve opened behind Nomanor but he remained where he was, not so certain of his position that he could bring himself to depart. Savong La turned to face him. You understand what is at risk, no manor? Virgir's words are rooted in rivalry, but there is substance to what she says. If you are not confident of success, say so now, and let us find a better solution together. There is no cause for concern, War Master. Nomanor understood perfectly well what was at risk, his prefecture and perhaps his life. Now that I know you see through Virgir's intrigues, I have no doubts at all. Savong La's face darkened. And you did before? My master. I did not mean to say I doubted you, only my own understanding of your methods. Savong La motioned him back into the chamber. And what exactly did you not understand? The War Master's tone was sharp. And do not insult me again by lying. Nomanor took a deep breath and returned to the Dejeric mat. My Master, the sentience of this galaxy also play another game called Sabak, where the chip cards change identities before their eyes. He cast a pointed glance at his rifle. Regeer was the infidel's prisoner for many weeks, and she has yet to provide a satisfactory explanation of her escape. The readers were satisfied, Virgir replied, as were all of Yun Harla's priests. They have not met Han Solo. Nomanor kept his eyes fixed on Savong La. He is not the type to let an enemy escape. He did not let me do anything, Virgir replied. There is more to me than you know. 
And they were in the middle of a battle caused by the ineptitude of your hirelings, Savonla added. More importantly, Virgir learned more during her captivity than how to play de Jeric. Her insights have saved thousands of vessels, and we have destroyed three New Republic fleets when she guessed correctly about their intentions. A small price for your favor. The retort was out of Nomanor's mouth almost before he realized it was in his mind. I certainly don't mean that Virgir is a traitor. Of course not, Savangla said. Only that I lack the judgment to tell if she were. Nomanor closed his eyes. I would never disparage. You just did, Savangla said. But that is not what concerns me. The war master fell silent and remained so, until Nomanor dared to open his eyes. What concerns me is that you are foolish enough to think I do not see through you. Savonla studied Nomanor for a long time, then said, This assignment is more important than any other I have given you. I think it would be wise for you to take an advisor along. Having disparaged the War Master's judgment once that day, Nomanor knew better than to do so again. If the War Master thinks it wise, the War Master does. Savongla turned to Virgir and, in a voice as stern as he had been using with Nomanor, said, You will accompany Nomanor. Virgir's feathers bristled. As his advisor? she gasped. One does not advise close lugs. This will never work. It had better. Savongla gave them both a hard smile. I have had enough of this jealousy between you two. From this moment on, you succeed or fail together. Chapter 25 What was I to think when Yulaha attacked? Jason asked. Despite his frustration, he kept his voice low to avoid disturbing Yulaha or any of the others lying in healing trances in the Yuzhan Vong nest bunks. It looked as though Anakin had ordered her to, and I'm not the only one who thought so. Fact, Tenelka agreed. She sat hunched into a nest bunk beside him, her shoulder touching his in a manner that was a little more than comfortable. Their lightsabers lay close at hand. With the Voxen still at large in the ship's duct system, they were taking no chances. But you are his brother. What seems a mistake in others is judgmental from you. And your objections to Lando's advice do not help matters. Gamblers and spies can afford to dispense with morality, Jason replied. Jedi cannot. It's too easy for our power to lead us down a dark path, and we're not the only ones who suffer when that happens. This is so, Tenelka said. But, Jason, do you remember my first lightsaber? How could I forget? Jason asked, wondering where this was going. Tenelka had made the mistake of building her first lightsaber in a hurry, and a flawed crystal had caused it to fail during a sparring match with Jason. His blade had sliced off her left arm, his first painful lesson in the burden of wielding great power. For a long time I felt responsible for that accident. I still do, at least partly. But I don't see what that has to do with Anakin and me. The accident was no one's fault but mine. Tenelka tapped her chest with her one hand to emphasize the point. What I believed to be confidence in my fighting abilities was arrogance, and that is why I built a faulty lightsaber. Arrogance, Jason repeated. Try as he might, he could not quite see how his mistake resembled Tenel Ka's. And? Do you believe you are the only Jedi among us who understands the danger of the Dark Sun? Of course not. Most of us have had trouble with the Shadow Academy, and Zek even turned— Jason let the sentence trail off, finally comprehending Tenel Ka's point. Anakin knew the danger of the Dark Side as well as any of them. To believe him capable of ordering Yulaha's mad attack was to doubt more than his judgment. It was to doubt his very character. Jason shook his head in guilty regret. That was a mistake. A bad one. 
Fact. Kennel Cobb bumped him with her shoulder. But there is no need to sulk. I will always be fond of you. Jason's stomach grew hollow. You think he's that angry? Temelkar rolled her eyes, then took a canister of bacta lotion and slipped off the nest bunk to check on their insensate fellows. It was a joke, Jason. Ah. Jason grabbed his lightsaber and followed close behind. Aha! You have a lot to learn about jokes. She glanced at him over her shoulder. Actually, I thought it quite good. She came to Yulaha, who was breathing fitfully even in her healing trance, and lifted the Bith's blanket. Trust him to forgive, Jason, and things will return to normal. She rubbed a fresh coat of lotion over Yulaha's wounds. It wasn't nearly as effective as immersion in a tank, but it was better than almost anything else they could do for her. On the deck below, a Yuzhan Vong targeting brain lay open on a wardroom table, its nutrient bath filling the chamber with the stink of rotten seaweed. Nestled in a nut-like shell no larger than a human fist, the organ was a tangle of axons and dendrons webbing together a gelatinous muddle of neuron clusters. Though Jaina found the structure of the biotic computer hopelessly bewildering, Lobaka was engrossed in dissecting the thing, using a small set of steel tools to snip here and move there, grunting in satisfaction as the fibers reattached themselves in new locations. Finally, he fused a short thread of axon between two lengths of dendron, then chortled in delight as an eye stalk hanging from the front of the casing rose and focused on Jaina. Lobaka growled a request, which MTD, recently retrieved from the equipment pod, translated as, Master Lobaka asks, if you would be kind enough to circumnavigate the table. Though Jaina understood Wookie well enough to know Lobaka had phrased the request somewhat less eloquently, she did as asked. The eye followed her progress, using a control stem on the back of the shell to spin the brain around as she circled. Louis, get some help, Jaina laughed. That's just Sith. Lobaka growled a chuckle then steadied the shell with a big hand and slipped a pair of needle-nosed fiber snips inside. Turning away from the targeting brain, Jaina found Zek waiting with a photon trap from their equipment pod's sensor system. There weren't any extra detector films in the droid kit, he said. Maybe we can take a sheet from this and trim one down. It's worth a try. Jaina led the way across the wardroom to where 21S stood silently regrowing his laminanium armor and running internal diagnostics. Since awakening from their healing trances, Jaina, Zek, and Lobaka had been working nonstop to help the war droid repair himself, but 21S still looked like he had grabbed the wrong end of a turbo laser. They had replaced his recessed photoreceptors with extras from the repair kit Lando had included in the equipment pod, but several thud bugs had penetrated deep inside the skull casing smashing circuit boards and detection mediums beyond all hope of repair. Fortunately, having spent much of his life as an equipment forager in Coruscant's dangerous undercity, Zek had a force-enhanced talent for finding things. So far, he had scavenged substitutes for the infrared and ultrasonic sensors, and now possibly the gamma analyzers as well. Jaina took the thin sheet of detector film from the photon trap and held it up for 2-1-S. What about this for your gamma system? YVH-21S ran his photoreceptors over the sheet, then crackled. Affirmative. His voice was a static-filled ghost of Lando's, but that was the least of their worries. Double the thickness. Another success for Zek, Jaina said. She turned and found herself looking directly into his green two-tone eyes a sentiment much deeper than friendship evident in the way he held her gaze. Jane waited a moment for him to look away, and, when he did not, passed the detector film back to him. Hold this while I get the cutter. Though hardly blind to the disappointment that clouded Zek's face, Jane was careful to maintain a neutral expression as she reached for the laser cutter. 
Her reaction was not because she lacked feelings for Zek. In fact, a few years ago, she had found it difficult to keep her thoughts off him. But over time her feelings had changed from infatuation to something closer to what she felt for her brothers. It was love, certainly, but nothing physical. Nothing like the spark that had passed through her on the Tafanda Bay, when Jag Fell had ignored Borsk Felia's entire cabinet to introduce himself to her. That had made her stomach flutter. But she was being silly. She had no idea where Jag Fell was probably not even in the known galaxy, and even less whether they were ever likely to meet again. If she insisted on waiting for a jolt like that again, she would be Mara's age before she ever— Jaina? Zek fluttered the detector film in her face. Are you going to cut or not? Of course, but we need measurements. Jaina turned away to hide her blush. Where did I put that hydro spanner? Only a few meters away, crawling on his belly through the black muck in the exquisite death's central elimination duct, Tisar Sabatin heard the hiss of a large creature drawing deep breath. He immediately raised his makeshift Durasteel shield, and used the force to push it down the low conduit. There was a muffled burp, and a loud sizzling as the acid struck, then a dull clang as the shield slammed into the voxen. Sissing with laughter— Tisar used the force to shove Voxen and shield down the duct. When the creature snarled and tried to push its snout through the holes its acid had eaten in the Durasteel, the Barabel brought up his blaster pistol and loosed a single bolt. The creature's nose exploded in a spray of black blood, filling the conduit with toxic fumes. Tisar sissed into his breath mask and fired again. The Voxen roared and, knocking the makeshift shield from its snout, vanished up the duct. Tisar pictured the beast and reached out to his hatchmates with an impression of movement in his mind, and of the creature growing larger. A moment later, Bella replied with an image of the creature's body glow. Like most Barabels, she could see into the infrared spectrum, and often tracked her prey by the heat of its body. She sent a sensation of impending danger, and Tisar knew he had to get clear. He retreated two meters and squeezed himself into a side feed. He counted three slow reptilian heartbeats before a series of wump thumps reverberated through the Yorick coral. The duct lit with the flashing brilliance of his hatchmate's mini-cannons, arranged at right angles to each other at the next intersection, and he had to close his eyes. The voxen's shrill screech sliced through the dank air like a lightsaber, then dropped in tone and began to undulate. Had they missed? Tisar wondered. How could they? The irritation his hatchmates shot his way convinced him they had not. His earplugs detected a sudden redshift in the voxen's squeal and closed tight, sealing his ears against the disorienting impact of a compression wave. He experienced a deep, hard vibration in the pit of his stomach, but shared in the exhilaration of his hatchmates as they continued to pour bolts at their prey. By his cold blood, how he loved hunting with his hatchmates. Finally, the mini-cannons fell silent and his earplugs opened again. He flicked his tongue into the breath mask and smelled filter-scrubbed ozone and scorched uric coral, and an antiseptic coppery odor he recognized as detoxified voxen blood. He sent a question sense the sister's way, and received back only an impression of uncertainty. Though Tisar could not exactly feel his hatchmate's actions through the force— he had lived with them side by side all his life, and intuitively knew they would be activating a glow stick to supplement their infrared vision. An image of smoking scales came to his mind, then of a voxen's blaster-scorched leg. Then Anakin's voice came over a comlink. Tisar, what's going on back there? The sound of clicking claws sounded from around the corner, and Tisar thought, uh-oh. He worked a hand under his chest up toward the comlink clipped to his collar, at the same time worming his way backward down the duct. It was slow going, for the side feed was little larger than Tisar himself, and he was crawling against the lay of his scales. Even through his thick jumpsuit, the rough walls kept catching the tips and bringing his progress to a painful halt. The voxen's head appeared at the corner, a red heat silhouette barely two meters in front of him. 
Tisar? Anakin demanded. What's going on back there? Tisar fired at the Voxen and saw his bolt ricochet off. He should have scales like that. The creature pulled its head out of sight, but pink heat wisps of breath continued to curl past the corner. Tisar finally reached his comlink. You told us to watch the Voxen. And? And to call for help if... The pink wisps vanished ahead, and Tisar heard a sharp intake of air. Ah, uh, keep talking. He ripped his comlink off and tossed it down the duct. Anakin's distant voice continued to demand an explanation, but Tisar squirmed away as fast as he could. A mangled snout pushed around the corner and buried the squawking instrument beneath a weak stream of acid. Tisar stopped moving and, using the force to project his voice down the duct, screamed as loud as he could. He sensed approval from Kossoff and, through her, perceived Anakin's panic. He had to be on the comlink, screaming for Tisar to answer. Bella found this funny. Tisar could feel her sissing. He knew without looking that she would be creeping down the main duct behind the Voxen, lightsaber in hand. Kossoff was following along behind a big T-21 repeating blaster, pointed over her sister's shoulder. The Voxen hauled itself around the corner, its claws digging into the York coral walls and pulling it forward. Tisar could not see its wounds in infrared, but the creature was definitely moving slowly and in great weariness. It paused at the small pit, its acid had burned into the floor, then, not finding the expected body, raised its head and peered down the duct. Tisar resumed his retreat, firing blaster bolts into the creature's head. Many ricocheted off, but many burned through the armored scales and failed to kill it. Wasting no time with another of its screeches, the Voxen pursued him down the duct, stubby legs pulling it forward faster than the Barabel could retreat. For the first time, Tisar's scales rippled with fear. The beast learned from its mistakes. Big trouble, he thought. He sensed the alarm in his hatchmates and heard them begin to splash and rattle in the main duct as they tried to draw the Voxen's attention. Too clever for such antics, the creature pulled to within a meter of Tisar and let out a burp, but either its acid was depleted or the efflux tube had been burned shut. Nothing came out. Tisar fired point-blank and smelled scorched flesh. The Voxen lurched ahead, its mouth closing around the barrel of the Merson blaster. Tisar squeezed the trigger, then snarled in pain as the safety circuit sensed a clog in the emitter nozzle and shut down the actuating module. Releasing the weapon into the Voxen's mouth, he squirmed away, pressing his back against the duct roof in what he felt fairly certain would be a futile attempt to free his lightsaber. Bella's white blade hissed to life somewhere behind the Voxen, but the creature filled the duct so completely that only a few stray rays of light showed past. The beast lunged. Tisar barely saved his breath mask by jerking away, then lashed out and felt his finger talons sink into the thing's wounded snout. The Voxen continued to drag itself forward, its jaws snapping at the hand clawing on its muzzle. Tisar shoved its head against the wall. Tisar exuded triumph to his hatchmates. A heavy foot came forward to catch his elbow its disease-tipped claws dimpling his jumpsuit's molly-tex lining and nearly pushing through. To his sense of triumph, he added urgency. The drone of Bella's blade grew louder, then vanished beneath the sharp crack of exploding detonite. An unexpected weight settled on Tisar's back, and suddenly the duct was filled with the soft green light of the bioluminescent wall lichen that illuminated the interior of the exquisite death. Tisar glimpsed the tangled mass of broken fang and scorched flesh that was the Voxen's mutilated snout, then felt himself rising through the top of the duct as someone levitated him into the cabin above. The blaster-scarred Voxen scrambled past beneath him, whole chunks of body missing, the stumps of four rear legs dragging uselessly behind. You bent the head. It escaped. Tisar looked over and found himself staring into the blue eyes of Ganner Rysode, one of the largest and, to judge by his own attitude at least, most handsome of the human Jedi. Now it will be twice as hard to kill. Hunting season's over, my scaly friend. 
Ganner lowered Tisar to the passage floor, then called into the hole. Come out of there, girls. Anakin wants us on the bridge. In the adjacent sleeping cabin, Renar Thule awoke from his healing trance to find himself watching Errol's bare back as she sat up and stretched on the opposite side of a narrow walkway. Her skin was freckled and milky, with only the faintest hint of the acid scars and claw slashes he had come to know so well during the first Voxen watch. With the others deep in healing trances or busy learning to fly the ship, he and Daryl had spent a great deal of time talking and rubbing back to lotion into each other's wounds. He had a dim memory of a long, lingering kiss just before they finally sank into their own bunks. But it seemed so hazy now, it might have been only a dream. Errol lowered her arms and, glancing over her shoulder, caught him looking. Instead of covering up, she smiled and asked, How do I look? Renar's teeth clacked as he snapped his jaw shut. Then he managed to stammer, Fine. Maybe the kiss hadn't been a dream after all. J just great, in fact. Errol frowned and craned her neck to look down her back, then laughed and, still not covering up, said, I was talking about my scars, young man. Are they healed? Oh, yes. Renar wanted to drop back onto his bunk and sink into a healing trance. That's what I meant. Errol looked doubtful. Sure. She reached for her jumpsuit. But it's okay. After all that back to rubbing, I don't think anyone on the strike team has any secrets. No, I don't think so, Raynar said. Still, as he reached for his own jumpsuit, Raynar did try to hide his disappointment. Errol might be only a year or two older but being called a young man had disabused him of any wrong impressions about their relationship. Tekli appeared from a few bunks down, her brown fur tousled and gray eyes sparkling as she buckled her equipment harness. Sleep well? she asked. Yes, very, Raynar answered. And you? Good. She gave him a tight smile, then lifted her brow as the ship gave a subtle shudder. We must be coming out of hyperspace. Both Raynar and Tekli looked to Errol, who closed her green eyes and reached out with the Force. When she opened them a moment later, she looked just a little younger and more innocent than before. I have to see some stars to be certain, but it feels right, she said. We've reached Mirker. Chapter 26 as the exquisite death sped in system, shedding velocity and swinging into Mirker's gravity well, the planet swelled from a greenish pinpoint to an emerald disk the size of a thumbnail. Though Anakin did not recall the world having a moon, the pearly fleck hanging beside it was too bright to be a background star and too steady to be an optical illusion. He turned to the sensor station, where Lobaka sat with his emergency vac suit pulled over his jumpsuit, his head buried in a cognition hood and his huge hands squeezed into a pair of control gloves. Lowy, anything? Anakin asked. The Wookiee groaned a reply, which MTD, hovering alongside, translated as, Master Labaka continues to apply his best efforts and assures you he will inform you the moment he succeeds. Anakin knew well enough what Lobaka had really said, but he did not remark on the gentle editing or unnecessary translation. Not everyone knew the language, and MTD insisted it was his duty to make certain the whole strike team understood Lobaka as well as he did them. Lobaka growled something short, and MTD added, He also wishes me to suggest that frequent requests for information only interrupt his concentration. I know, Anakin said. Sorry. Though the strike team had quickly mastered most of the exquisite death's systems— Having studied all available data on Yuzhan Vong vessels, and even experimented with a captured assault boat, the sensors remained a problem. In contrast to the externally oriented observation technologies of the New Republic, the Yuzhan Vong gathered information by analyzing the infinitesimal distortions that the gravity of distant objects caused in the ship's internal space-time. Given that the galaxy's finest scientists were still struggling to comprehend the basic science of Yuzhan Vong sensors, it was no wonder Lobaka was having difficulties operating them. Even with Tahiri at his side translating 
and providing insight into how Yuzhan Vong fought. When Anakin looked back to Mirker, the planet had grown to a cloud-mottled circle the size of Yulaha's head. The gray fleck beside it was now a tiny disk. Definitely a moon, Anakin said. At this distance, he could not expect to feel anything through the lambent crystal, but he knew what he was seeing. A Yuzhan Vong moon. Lobaka let out a victorious growl, and MTD reported, Master Lobaka feels it is indeed a Yuzhan Vong world ship. Lobaka grunted and yowled a few more times, and the translation droid added, There are several Corvette analogs in orbit around it, though the diameter is quite large for a world ship, approximately 120 kilometers. That was as large as the first Death Star. Anakin whistled softly to himself, then reached out toward the distant fleck with the Force. Not one to rule out the possibility of coincidence, he was nevertheless suspicious enough of it to inspect it carefully. He felt an all-too-familiar stirring, the feral agitation of a voxen, but also something else, another presence full of terror and pain, and surprise. A clear, sharp presence, not hazy. Jedi, not Yuzhan Vong. Anakin did not realize he had gasped until a hand took his arm and Alima asked what was wrong. Not answering, he continued to focus on the world ship. The presence touched him back, still full of pain and fear, but now also pity. Not for itself, he thought, but for him. He filled his heart with comforting emotions, trying to project an aura of confidence and hope, though he knew the vagaries of the Force might not be capable of conveying the message he wanted. The presence at the other end maintained contact for only a moment longer before abruptly withdrawing, closing itself off to Anakin without any hint of whether it had comprehended what he was trying to communicate. Tahiri clasped his arm. Anakin? There are Jedi there, he said, with the Voxen. Well, that puts Plan A right out the lock, Ganner said. Plan A called for them to sneak as close as possible to the cloning facility and destroy it with a beradium-packed missile, then use the resulting confusion to confirm the Queen's destruction and escape. We'll have to try something else. That is very brave, of course, Alima said. Standing beside the commander's chair opposite Tahiri, she laid a hand on Anakin's arm and turned to him with a look of entreaty. But if we forego our best plan, we stand to lose more Jedi than we would say. Jason emerged from the back of the bridge, his eyes rolling at the Twi'lek's pouty tone. Alima, I think Anakin knows what's at stake here. I can handle this, Jason, Anakin said, doing his best to keep the irritation out of his voice. And there is no need to remind me about the dark side. I understand the consequences of killing our own. Anakin, I only meant, shouldn't you be at your battle station? Anakin asked, deliberately cutting Jason off. He cast a meaningful look at both Alima and Tahiri. Shouldn't everyone? Jason's face reddened, and Tahiri's eyes narrowed, but all three retreated to their assigned places and left Anakin to his thoughts. This was one of those times Lando had warned them about, when any choice he made felt like the wrong one but Lando did not have the force to guide him, and Anakin still had a few minutes before he had to decide anything. If he waited, maybe things would work out for the better. They almost always did. Jaina swung the exquisite death into an approach pattern, and the edge of Mirker's enormous green disk began to slide across the port side of the bridge. From space, at least, there was no visible sign of Yuzhan Vong planet shaping. It remained the same steam-shrouded forest world depicted in hollow vids. The world ship was rapidly filling the viewing dome, swelling from a little smaller than a Kuwati banquet plate to the size of a high-command conference table. A thin halo of twinkling stars hinted at the escape of radiant heat, while blotchy circles of gray and brown began to define the planetoid's pocked surface. Expecting the hailing villip in front of him to activate at any moment, Anakin waved Tahiri close, then used the hollow shroud unit on his equipment harness to cloak himself in the pre-recorded image of a Yuzhan Vong warrior. 
Whether the tattoos and scarrings were appropriate for the commander of a Corvette analog vessel was anybody's guess. There seemed to be the right amount, but New Republic intelligence was still struggling to learn the significance, if any, of individual patterns. Lobaka moaned a warning from the censor console, informing Anakin that a trio of Yuzhan Vong corvettes had just appeared from the far side of Mirker and were lining up for approach behind the exquisite death. Anakin ordered Jaina to continue as before. Though her face was hidden beneath the pilot's hood she wore to interface with the vessel, he could feel her apprehension. Not knowing the proper procedure for entering a Yuzhan Vong base, they had opted to try an open approach, trusting that procedural mistakes would prove less alarming than a furtive advance. Jaina rolled them to starboard and angled into line behind a string of dark specks drifting across the face of the world ship, now so large that it completely filled the dome. Anakin and Yulaha activated a holocam and began feeding mapping information to her data pad. The long journey between galaxies had left the massive spacecraft dilapidated and spent. A few black, jagged scars denoted breaches in the outer shell, but most of the planetoid seemed a mottled patchwork of gray dust and jagged yorick coral. A sparse network of surface utility lanes curved along the surface, occasionally converging in starburst intersections or vanishing down the dark mouth of an interior access portal. The world ship still did not hail them, and the back of Anakin's neck began to prickle with danger sense. No New Republic base would allow any ship to approach so closely without making contact. Jaina maintained her spacing behind the other ships, following them around the curve of the planetoid. A complex of cone-shaped, grashal peaks appeared on the horizon, protruding up through the outer shell, a little to the starboard of the long line of vessels they were following. Even with the naked eye, Anakin could see that the buildings emerged from the surface close to the city-sized square of a huge black pit. Max mag that, Yulaha, he said. What's it like? Yulaha turned her holocam on the complex and increased the magnification. It appears to be some kind of spaceport, she wheezed. Though the bith was much improved after her healing trance, she remained weak and colorless. There is a large pit surrounded by many entrances, with what looked to be loading facilities. Abandoned, empty, Yulaha corrected. No vessels in sight, but the landing pads are stacked with cargo pods and cages. Anakin reached out to the facility with the force. He no longer felt the pained presence he had noticed before, but the hungry stirring of Voxen was still powerful. The tingle in the back of his neck became a nettling, and, noting that their current approach would keep them well away from the complex, he suddenly understood why the world ship had not yet hailed them. They're trying to lead us into a trap. Jaina, turn toward that complex now. Anakin activated the comlink. Ganner, you and Tisar. Ready that missile. Stand by for targeting coordinates. Everybody, secure your vac suits. We're in for a rough ride. As Jaina swung the ship around, Lobaka rumbled an alarm. Oh, dear, MTD chirped at Anakin's collar. Master Lobaka says there's a cruiser. I heard him, Anakin said. A distant ovoid of Yorick coral floated over the horizon moving to position itself between the exquisite death and what Anakin now felt certain was the loading area for the cloning complex. Lobaka warned that the corvettes coming from Mirker were accelerating and spreading out, and the half-dozen vessels they had been following were turning toward the cruiser. When MTD attempted to repeat this information in basic, Anakin switched him off. One of the small villips next to the ship's hailing villip suddenly pushed through its aversion orifice taking the shape of a lumpy Yuzhan Vong head ringed around the brow by goiter-like growths. Gadmadar, Ganner, I sowed. Anakin turned to Tahiri for a translation, but the villip began to speak in basic before she could supply it. Stroke the hailing villip, Jedi, so that we can speak. Before obeying, Anakin said, Jaina, continue on course. Loe, get a targeting lock on that cruiser and feed the coordinates to Ganner and Tisar. The Yuzhan Vong grew impatient. It should be the leathery disc next to this one, Jilai. Anakin stroked the appropriate villip, 
Instead of averting, its central orifice opened and extended toward him a short tentacle with a black eye at the end. The Yuzhan Vong, or rather his villip, raised his brow and started to demand something in his own language, then caught himself and smiled. Very good, Ganar Isod. I see we are not the only ones who use maskers. Seeing no reason to disabuse an enemy of his mistake, Anakin left the hollow shroud on. I'm sure this is more than a social call, shipmaster. Commander, the officer corrected. It is my obligation to recover the vessel you have stolen. Stolen? Anakin asked. We're just borrowing it. You can have it back when we finish. The commander's villip went blank for a moment, then frowned. I fear it is needed now. Surrender to the Matalock ahead, and you will be the only one who suffers for the misuse of the exquisite death. Anakin glanced through the bridge dome and saw an ovoid as long as his arm. The distance between the vessels had to be no more than a dozen kilometers, and still the cruiser had not opened fire. Perhaps the commander had dreams himself of presenting Savong La with seventeen Jedi. Or perhaps he did not think his cruiser had much to fear from a ship as small as the exquisite death. Lobaka growled a report saying there were half a dozen coral skippers and as many corvette analogues moving into position over the cloning facility. It would be futile to make my Matalock attack Jedi, the commander warned. My trap was well laid, and the War Master has said that if we must open fire, the Talfalian hostages are forfeit. Has he? Anakin opened his emotions to the others so they would be ready for what he intended. I see we have no choice. Hoping Luke had everything ready on his side of the galaxy, Anakin snatched his lightsaber from his belt and, thumbing the ignition switch, slashed the hailing villip apart. Full ahead, Jaina. He activated his comlink. Ganner target cruiser. Set fuse to proximity. Fire when ready. Missile loose. The report came almost before the order was finished, but it took Anakin until the missile flashed past to realize Ganner had known what Anakin intended. The strike team had established its battle melt automatically, perhaps even unconsciously, as soon as the likelihood of combat became apparent. The missile's unexpected appearance confused the Yuzhan Vong for only a few seconds. A flurry of plasma balls boiled out to intercept the missile causing the droid brain to activate its countermeasure program. The missile diverted some of its power to shields and continued toward its target in an evasive corkscrew. Anakin did not need to tell his sister to circle around the target. Iridium was the same substance that made thermal detonators such fearsome weapons, and the missile was carrying enough of the explosive to equip an entire assault division. The Yuzhan Vong gunners tried in vain for another few seconds to hit the spiraling target, then gave up and turned the ship's defense over to the shielding crews. A black dot appeared half a kilometer from the ship and sucked the missile toward its doom. As soon as the droid brain detected the existence of a shielding singularity, it used its guidance laser to measure the distance to target, calculated that ninety-eight percent of the mass fell within its blast radius, and triggered a thousand kilograms of beradium. The cruiser vanished in a blinding sphere of white fire that resembled, for a few seconds, a one-kilometer sun. The exquisite death shook beneath the shockwave. Then Ganner's voice came over the comlink. What now? Plan D? Sort of. Anakin looked toward the cloning compound and saw a dozen Yorick coral flecks swarming over the buildings. They were not coming out to attack, so it seemed apparent. They were conserving their energies and would not open fire until the exquisite death reached point-blank range. Given the likelihood of a miss hitting the Corvette analogs streaking in behind the death, it seemed a wise strategy. Here's what I want. Anakin had barely described his plan before Yulaha held out her data pad. What's that? I must be the one to stay with the ship, she said. Anakin felt his sister's alarm as acutely as his own. No offense, Yulaha, Jaina said, but you're hardly up to something like this. Perhaps not, but I am a pilot, and the exquisite death is hardly a starfighter. Yulaha pressed the data pad into Anakin's hand. 
As stated, your plan has a 21% success probability, with a casualty projection in excess of 90%. Without me to burden you on the ground, your success probability rises to almost 50%. That high. Anakin did not even want to hear the casualty projections. Okay, but just drop 2-1-S's shuttle and go. Do you need anything? Yulaha thought for a moment, then said, If there is time, I would like a length of metal tubing from the droid kit. Leave it in the corridor. Count on it. Anakin wanted to hug her, or shake her hand, or something, but that all seemed so final, so irrevocable. Instead, he sent Jaina after the rest of the team, already gathering in the first hold, then paused at the door valve and looked back. No heroics, Yulaha. That's an order. Just drop 2-1-S and go. The Bith nodded at him. It's okay, Anakin. This is the right thing. She turned away and reached for the cognition hood. Now hurry. Every minute of delay reduces the mission's success probability by 0.2%. Feeling a little lonely and hollow inside, Anakin rushed down the corridor into the first hold where the Jedi were already packing themselves and their equipment into five Yuzhan Vong cargo pods. He left the tubing in the corridor for Yulaha, then sealed the whole door and turned to join the others. Zek was packing Tisar in with Ganner, Joven, and Tenel Ka. You are sure we have enough thermal detonators? Tisar rasped. We are going to need many detonators for the Voxen. I packed all four cases. Zek pushed the pod shut. Only four, Tisar demanded. Zek shook his head, then sealed the seam with a glob of blorash jelly and motioned Anakin into a pod with Raynar, Errol, and Tahiri. We're the last. I thought it best to separate families and equipment. There was no need to explain the precaution. Anakin nodded, then pulled up his vac suit hood and crouched beside Tahiri, opposite Errol and Raynar. Zek squeezed in beside Anakin, then lit a glow stick and sealed the seam from the inside. The exquisite death continued forward, unopposed for what seemed an eternity, and through the battle meld, Anakin felt Yulaha's anxiety slowly giving way to bewilderment. They are coming out to meet us, but they do not fire, Yulaha calmed. Now they are spreading out, and the rest tentacles are extending from the noses of some ships. They're still trying to take us alive. Anakin gasped. Why risk so much? They are aliens, one of the Barabel sisters calmed. There is no sense trying to understand them. The exquisite death swung sharply to port, then lurched back onto course, dipped sharply, and began to jink like a fighter. You must start the drop, Yulaha calmed. The ship began to shudder. They are shooting tentacles at us. Projected drop zone two kilometers from spaceport at bearing 122. 2-1-S reported from the shuttle. Surprise likelihood high. Anakin gave the go order, and Yulaha put the exquisite death into a coral crackling climb. At the end of the long line of cargo pods, 2-4-S used his blaster cannon to open a makeshift bomb bay, and the hole decompressed with a tremendous roaring. Anakin's pod began to slide across the floor toward the breach. Decoy away, 2-4-S calmed. Anakin's pod, number five, slid toward the hole faster. Pod one away. There was a moment of silence, then 2-4-S reported. Enemy arrest tentacle has captured decoy pod. Anakin held his breath. He had intended the decoy to detonate on the ground, but as long as it convinced the Yuzhan Vong they were dropping bombs instead of a strike team. A burst of static crackled across the comlinks, then 2-1-S's barely audible voice said, Decoy detonation, heavy damage to enemy vessel. The bear bells sissed over the comm channel. Pod 2 away, 2-4-S reported. Pod 3, Anakin did not hear the next report, for a tremendous growling reverberated through their pod as it scraped over the edge of the hole and fell free. His stomach grew queasy with weightlessness, and all five of them began to float. 2-4-S away, 2-4-S reported. Tahiri grabbed Anakin's arm, and Arrow began an audible countdown. Anakin opened himself to the Force as completely as possible, 
alert to any emotion that might suggest the others had been grabbed by an arresting tentacle or targeted by a defensive blast of plasma. He sensed only apprehensions similar to his own, except from the Barabels, who were radiating the emotional equivalent of a big yippee. Finally, Errol said, Fifteen seconds. Mark. According to calculations, at least, they were now only a thousand meters above the surface of the world ship. Anakin caught their vessel with the invisible hand of the Force, cushioning their descent just enough so that the deceleration kept them pinned to the floor. The war droids had calculated that a deceleration of approximately one and a half standard gravities would not be overly noticeable, yet the resulting landing would be ninety-nine percent survivable. Anakin remained silent through the descent, wishing that he could see the surface or feel the non-existent atmosphere buffeting them or anything. After a few more seconds, he decided that they had to be almost down and began to slow their descent still further. And then the bone-jarring shock of impact slammed everyone to the floor. They went weightless as the capsule bounced, then came down on their side and rolled more times than Anakin could count before coming to a rest in a jumbled tangle. Anakin used the Force to move the others off him, then ignited his lightsaber and hacked through the blur-ash jelly seam. He had barely opened a fist-sized hole before Zek and the others activated the delay on four grenades and used the force to push them up through the crack. Two seconds later, a roiling fireball erupted fifty meters overhead. Hoping the explosion would look realistic enough from a distance, Anakin finished opening the pod and stepped out into a dusty basin of brown, dead Yorick coral. Perhaps three meters deep, the bull was easily three hundred long and a hundred wide. Probably not an impact crater, but the scar of some ancient mishap. In the far corner, almost directly opposite Anakin, sat the broken husk of a distant cargo pod, a group of minuscule figures scurrying around its base. One of the Jedi felt him watching and waved in greeting. Then all four turned and started in his direction. A moment later, the pod vanished in the brilliant flare of a thermal detonator. Anakin's attention was drawn skyward by a flash of movement. He looked up in time to see a small, unidentifiable shape arc into the near corner of the field, then erupt in a tremendous fireball. Thinking they were under fire from a Yuzhan Vong warship, he almost dived for the ground, but stopped when he saw the black star-spangled camouflage armor of a Tendrondo Arms YVHS series war droid emerge from the dust cloud and come toward him at an impossibly fast run. Anakin assigned Raynar and Errol to unload their pod, and sent Zek to the basin rim to reconnoiter, then took a moment to concentrate on the others. He sensed a couple of fuzzy heads and a few aches and pains, but the team appeared to be ninety-nine percent intact, just as the droids had promised. Anakin retrieved the electro-binoculars and turned them overhead. Without the blue glow of streaking ion drives to draw attention to the ships, it took a moment to locate the space battle which had already drifted far across the sky toward Mirker. YVH-21S was just parting ways with Yulaha, his lumpy black shuttle corkscrewing wildly back toward the world ship as the Bith veered off into deep space in the exquisite death. To Anakin's disappointment, the Yuzhan Vong had swallowed the bait only partially. The coral skippers and four corvettes were surrounding 21S's shuttle, arrest tentacles lashing out to capture the careening rock but the rest of the Yuzhan Vong were pursuing the death. A pair of heavy steps came up beside Anakin. Then Ganner said over the vac suit comm net, We're good to go, Anakin. We have the bearings to the spaceport, and 2-4S's sensors show no sign they realize we're here. Anakin lowered the electro-binoculars and turned away. He would have liked to stay and see whether they escaped. They deserved that much. But he knew neither 2-1-S or Yulaha would want that. Every minute of delay reduced the mission's success probability by 0.2 percent. The strike team had traveled only 500 meters when 2-4-S's metallic voice came over the comm channel. 2-1-S reports zero survivability rating, now optimizing. An orange fireball blossomed in the sky drowning the droid's last two words in a tempest of electronic interference. 
Anakin raised the electro-binoculars in time to see a trio of enemy corvettes burst into white sprays of Yorick coral. The fourth vessel, a mere splinter at this distance, spiraled away out of control. Loss ratio optimized, 2-4-S reported. Anakin nodded and said, Maximum efficiency. They all knew from the training sessions with 1-1-A that it was the highest tribute that could be made to one of Lando's droids, and several Jedi repeated the compliment. They continued toward the spaceport, using the force to smooth the dust behind them and keep it from billowing into the airless sky. A few minutes later, 2-4-S detected two coral skippers approaching. The strike team had to conceal itself beneath the dust and wait as the pair swept over in a slow, curving search pattern. Once the pilots reached the drop zone, they would find four huge beradium craters and nothing to suggest the exquisite death had dropped anything but four poorly targeted bombs, and they would return to base laughing at their enemies' incompetence. Until then, the Jedi would have to wait and be patient. Though no one said as much, all of their thoughts were on Ulaha alone in the exquisite death, with five corvette analogues and a host of skips on her tail. Though the bith was growing more distant in the battle melt, Anakin could feel her consumed with the tasks at hand, weary and in pain, but without fear. At peace, even. Daring to hope Yulaha's tranquility meant she was escaping, Anakin raised the electro-binoculars as soon as the search craft were gone, and combed the darkness above for the exquisite death. But it was an impossible task. Even if he were looking in the right direction, by now the Bith and her pursuers would be too distant for electro-binoculars to detect. The strike team resumed its march. Yulaha's presence continued to fade, then finally vanished altogether. Anakin could tell by the surge of anxiety in the battle mount that the same fear had leapt into the minds of all the Jedi. Tahiri asked, Is she? No. Jason interrupted. We would have felt that. Maybe she jumped to hyperspace, Anakin said. 2-4-S? Negative, the droid reported. Exquisite death still within sensor range. Then the music started, a reedy, haunting melody that came to Anakin inside his mind. Though there was a mournful hint to it, the strain was more tranquil than sad, and perhaps the most beautiful thing he had ever heard. He turned and found the others staring skyward, some with heads cocked, listening, others with a tear or two running down inside their face masks. Exquisite death and pursuers decelerating, 2-4-S reported. Analysis suggests tentacle arrest. No one seemed to hear the report. I wish... Jaina fell silent as the song drifted into a flighty passage and began to gather energy. I wish I could record this. Yes, Jason said. I'm sure Tion would like it for her archives. It's a sad loss for the Jedi... Anakin could not tell from his brother's flat tone whether Jason was criticizing or just saying aloud what they all felt. There was no question of Yulaha surrendering the death. Even were she to survive the boarding party's initial assault, she could not endure another breaking. The music repeated its opening refrain, but more powerfully now and without any hint of sadness, then rose to a robust crescendo. In the sudden silence, Tahiri gasped. Chapter 27 In the dim planet glow shining down from Mirker's emerald face, the flattened Senelac shafts looked more like ice spikes than any security system Anakin had ever seen. The rigid stalks were only knee-high, and no thicker than a finger but as Joven Drark's invisible force wave pushed a safe furrow through the field, their blunt blue caps released a meter-long strand of thorns. The barbed cord would flail around in the vacuum for a couple of seconds, presumably entwining and capturing, if not killing, whatever had disturbed it. 
Had Alima not warned them about the trap, the strike team would have entered the security field completely unprepared. Given the trap they had already flown into aboard the exquisite death, Anakin was beginning to wonder if they were really prepared for this. Ulaha had given them less than a fifty percent chance of success, and as far as he could tell, things were not getting any better. He was beginning to wonder if coming after the Voxen Queen had been such a good idea after all. Anakin, this has to be done, and you're not making it any easier with that big negatude. Tahiri was crawling along behind Anakin, her blonde hair spilling out behind her faceplate. So they were expecting us. You dealt with it, and now they aren't. Sorry. Thought I had that stuff closed off. You did. Tahiri rolled her eyes. This is me, Anakin. The last of the Senelax fell to Joven's force wave, and they found themselves at the edge of the spaceport. Basically a huge pit thirty meters deep and a kilometer across. It was surrounded by a cavernous colonnade sealed behind a transparent membrane and accessed by a ring of air-locked valveways. Twenty biotic berthing bays lay spaced evenly across the floor, all covered by retractable carapaces and sized to accommodate corvette analog vessels. On the near side of the spaceport, the latest rescue transport to return from the space battle was just berthing. The two halves of the bay carapace rising up to press themselves against the lumpy hull. Though Anakin and the others had not been able to see the battle as they stole across the world ship's pocked surface, the steady stream of rescue vessels returning from space told them that their comrades had put up a good fight. They also knew the outcome. 2-1-S had burst calmed a final situation report to 2 s and they had all felt Yulaha's death, one of the reasons, no doubt, for Anakin's negitude. Perhaps five kilometers beyond the landing pit rose the hive-shaped, gratial peaks they had seen from space. Anakin did not need to stretch out with the Force to know that was where the Voxen were kept. He could feel their hunger clearly, coming straight from that direction. The Jedi prisoner was another matter. He could not sense him, or her, or them, at all, even when he exerted himself. Isilamiri? Alima asked. She crawled up beside him on the side opposite Tahiri, stopping so that the shoulder of her vac suit touched his. If they've got a Jedi, they'd need Isilamiri. Anakin was not really surprised to have the Twi'lek anticipating him. During the trip from the drop zone, the strike team had found itself acting in such harmony that at times it seemed they were sharing thoughts. I don't think he's dead, Tahiri said. I realize we don't know who he is or anything, but I still think we'd know. Anakin did not think so, but there was only one way to find out. He turned to call for the Isolamiri mating pheromones Silgal had supplied, then grimaced when Jason was waiting to press the capsule into his glove. This is getting weird, he said. Tisar could have said something. A grin showed in Jason's eyes. Try it from my end. He grew more serious, an aura of distress rising around him. Anakin, before we start, there's something not now, Jason. Anakin looked away. The last thing he wanted to do was hurt Jason's feelings, but he had seen at Centerpoint Station what happened when he listened to his brother. I need to do this my own way. I know. I only want to please. Anakin flicked the capsule toward the far side of the landing pit, where a service crew was busy moving provisions out of an open airlock. In Mirker's greenish planet glow, he quickly lost sight of the tiny capsule but felt it stop when it entered the lock and came to the inner valve. A few minutes later, the crew finished its task and entered the airlock together. Anakin started to tell the others to be ready, then thought better of it. They were. The outer valve was just closing when 2-4-S reported, Incoming vessel, enemy, frigate analog. The report meant the ship's arrival was imminent. 
As marvelous as YVH war droids were, their sensor package lacked the power for deep space detection. The news sent a prickle of danger sense down Anakin's spine, but he refused to be rushed. Until he knew where the Jedi was being kept, entering the spaceport would only place the captive and themselves at risk. Finally, a swarm of distant squiggles scurried out of an archway about a third of the way around the colonnade. More than a dozen Yuzhan Vong followed, stooped over and half-stumbling as they attempted to retrieve the escapees. One of the warriors grabbed a squirming form, then jerked his hand back and stomped the creature. Issa Lemiri had sharp teeth. It did not take long before all eyes, at least all eyes visible through the transparent membrane, were fixed on the disturbance. Anakin backed away from the edge and stood. When he turned to order the hollow shrouds activated, he found himself facing a long line of what looked like Yuzhan Vong. I suppose you know the plan, too. Straight to the Isolamiri house. Bella, or was it Kossuth, answered. Then back. To steal the rescue shuttle, Ganner finished. We've got it, Jedi. 2-4-S and I will cover the descent. Well, then. Anakin activated his own hollow shroud and stepped over the edge, dropping alongside the wall and using the force to cushion his landing. When he did not feel any surge of Yuzhan Vong alarm through the lambent crystal, he turned to find himself standing before a ranker-sized airlock, a warren of murky tunnels and murkier doorways, barely visible through its translucent door valves. He could feel a handful of Yuzhan Vong somewhere back in the darkness, but his sense of them was too fuzzy to tell whether they were alarmed by his sudden appearance, or even aware of it. Alima, Tisar, and the others began to arrive beside him. Knowing the Twi'lek to be the most experienced at infiltrating enemy lines, he assigned her to lead the way through the airlock, while he kept an eye on the rest of the spaceport. The landing pit appeared even larger from the floor than from above. In the murky green light, the excitement at the opposite end was visible only as a mass of shadows scurrying around behind the window membrane and even figures in nearby warrens were difficult to see, unless they were silhouetted against a patch of bioluminescent wall lichen. Only the rescue vessel, sitting pinched in its biotic birthing bay, was distinct and easy to see. By the time Anakin had completed his survey, Ganner and 2-4-S were on the floor behind him. They followed the others through the airlock and let their face plates and breath masks hang over their collars leaving their throat mics and earpieces in place so they could communicate quietly. Anakin took the lead and began to hurry along the colonnade at the fastest pace he could without drawing too much attention. The power packs in their hollow shrouds would last only two minutes before growing unreliable and needing to be changed. As they went by the rescue ship, they also passed a rampway leading down to a bustling work level under the landing pit. An unarmored Yuzhan Vong started up the slope, gesturing at them and calling in his own language. A wave of alarm shot through the strike team, but it was quickly quelled when Jason used the battle meld to direct everyone's attention to Alima's unruffled composure. The Yuzhan Vong reached the door and said something more insistent. Tahiri's voice sounded in everyone's earpieces, giving the proper response. Ganner who had the most Yuzhan Vong-like voice, stepped out of line and faced the scarhead. Poldwag, Kaneabar. Kanabar? the Yuzhan Vong asked. There was a moment's pause while Tahiri gave the reply. Then Ganner said, Dwi, Kaneabar. Yadag Dakal, Ignat. The Yuzhan Vong raised both arms in a rude gesture, then disappeared back down the ramp. What was that about? Anakin whispered. Ganner called him the dung of a meat maggot, Tahiri said. I told him to say Kanabar, not Kaneabar. Kaneabar was better, Tisar rasped. How do you say slime under my scales? This drew a chorus of sissing from the Hara sisters and an order from Anakin to save the jokes. 2-4-S reported that the incoming enemy vessel was indeed a frigate analog and had gone into orbit around the world ship. 
the prickles returned to Anakin's neck and did not subside. With a frigate in orbit around the world ship, they would have to be careful about the timing of their escape. They reached the dark archway leading into the Isolamiri Warren. Anakin knew instantly they were in the right place, for the air stank of unwashed bodies, old blood, and even fouler things. The battle melt vanished three steps into the tunnel, and he saw that the passage ahead was lined with walking trees similar to those they had seen aboard the Death. Most had broken claws protruding from the trunks, but a handful of the trees still had Isolamiri clinging to them. A pair of Yuzhan Vong warriors stood behind a Yorick coral lobby counter, adroitly plating a living cord into a braided whip, and somehow ignoring the anguished screams rolling up the corridor. As Anakin approached, both warriors stopped work and crossed their arms over their chest. Ramaga Korlat, Miganyam? The taller one asked. Anakin walked straight to the gateway. Ramaga Korlat? The tallest guard asked again, now pulling his amphistaff off his waist and stepping to block Anakin's way. Anakin's answer was sharp, if not quite angry. Kane Abar. The Yuzhan Vong's saggy eyes looked more confused than angry, but he lowered his amphistaff toward Anakin's chest. Yaga? Anakin pointed his lightsaber and thumbed the activation switch. The crimson blade shot through the guard's throat and came out through his neck, narrowly missing the warrior behind him. This second Yuzhan Vong hurled himself backward and opened his mouth to shout the alarm but was interrupted by the snap hiss of Alima's silver lightsaber slicing through his head. Anakin switched off his hollow shroud and made assignments, sending Jason, Ganner, and 24S to watch the entrance, and Jaina, Raynar, and Errol to dispose of the remaining Isla Miri. Everyone else he led down the corridor toward the torture sounds. When he reached the doorway and peered around the corner, he found himself staring at a Yuzhan Vong's Von Dun crab-armored chest. The warrior gave a startled cry and started to bring his amphistaff around, but Anakin was already slashing his lightsaber across the Yuzhan Vong's throat. He thrust, kicked the collapsing body back into the chamber, then heard the telltale drone of thud bugs coming his way and dived to the floor. He rolled over his shoulder, trying to scan the chamber as he moved. There was an Isolamiri tree in one corner, and two figures spread eagle against the rear wall, and two more figures moving on his right. He came up with his lightsaber in a high guard, then dropped flat as Tisar's mini cannon bolts began wumping past his head. The Isolamiri tree erupted into splinters, and Anakin's contact with the force returned as the Isolamiri itself was vaporized. He heard the drone of a thud bug coming his way and allowed his Jedi senses to guide his lightsaber around to deflect it, then spun toward the source and found a Yuzhan Vong charging him with amphistaff in hand. Before Anakin could parry, a bolt from Tisar's mini cannon hurled the warrior across the room, and Alima rushed in to thrust her silver lightsaber through the shattered armor. Only one Yuzhan Vong remained, smaller than most and thinner, with a spectral female face and a variety of hooked, and serrated talons protruding from her eight fingers, wrists, and even elbows. A shaper. Anakin stood and started toward her, but a web of shimmering energy lines crackled into existence around her body before he had taken two steps. He thought it was a personal shield of some kind, until her eyes widened and she spat something angry. Anakin focused his thoughts on the web and felt the familiar energies of the Force, but colder and tainted with darkness. He glanced toward the back wall, where the two prisoners still hung spread eagle, each bleeding from a profusion of wounds. One, a powerfully built woman with dark hair and darker eyes, was glaring at the Shaper, quietly mouthing words Anakin did not understand. The Yuzhan Vong tried to pluck a strand of the Force energy from her body, and succeeded only in severing three fingers. The Dark Woman smiled, and the web slowly began to shrink, slowly cutting into the Shaper's flesh. Anakin was overcome by a deep sense of wrongness, of hatred and anger, of evil. This woman was acting not out of wartime necessity, 
but out of bloodlust and vengeance. He started toward her. No, this is wrong. She ignored him, and the Yuzhan Vong screamed in anguish. Blood began to patter on the floor, and something larger as well. Anakin glanced back to see small cubes of flesh dropping off the body of the female shaper. Stop! Anakin raised the butt of his lightsaber and stepped forward to enforce his command, but the Yuzhan Vong's scream ended abruptly in a wettish, plopping sound. When he glanced back, he found her body heaped on the floor in diced sections. The smell was as horrible as the sight, and he had to fight not to vomit. That was when Jason's voice came over his earpiece. That frigate's sending down a shuttle, little brother. Oh, okay. Anakin gasped. Keep me. Posted. There was a pause. Then Jason asked, Is something wrong? We're fine, Anakin said. Just a surprise. I'll tell you later. An acknowledging click came over the comlink. Then Anakin turned to find Alima at the back wall, already freeing the dark woman from the blorash jelly holding her in place. A fascinating technique, the Twi'lek was cooing. Do you think I could learn it? No, you couldn't, Anakin said. That attack was cruel. Unnecessarily so. Alima spun on him, her pale Twi'lek eyes as cold and hard as a Hothan lake. You may lecture me about cruel, when a voxen has burnt the flesh from your sister's face. She turned back to the dark woman, who was now free of the wall. Perhaps I want to be cruel. The woman gave her an encouraging smile. There is nothing wrong with vengeance. It is a noble emotion, a powerful one. Spoken like a true night sister, Zek said, stepping into the chamber. He glanced from the dark woman to the young man, who was still hanging on the wall behind her. Hello, Welk. Welk, a blond-haired human a year or two older than Anakin, narrowed his eyes at Zek. Hello, traitor. You two know each other? Anakin asked. Zek nodded. From the Shadow Academy. Welk here was Tamith Kai's best student. After Velas died, of course. After you killed him, Welk corrected, glaring at Zek. And Zek was the darkest knight, our leader until he betrayed the Second Imperium at Yavin IV. Anakin frowned at this. Though he had been too young to participate in the defense of the Jedi Academy when Tamith Kai's Dark Jedi attacked, many of the Jedi Knights on his strike team, including both of his siblings, Lobaka, Tenelka, and Raynar, had fought valiantly in the battle. They would not be happy to learn that they had just risked their lives to save one of the attackers. Tisar, who had never even been to Yavin IV, was the first to object. We risked our lives to save Dark Jedi? The Barabel trained his mini-cannon on the pair. Blaster bolts. Check that, Tisar. Anakin pushed the mini-cannon down, then turned to the Dark Woman. Are there any Jedi? We are Jedi, she replied. Though she was oozing blood from a hundred different wounds, the pain seemed to trouble the woman no more than it would a Yuzhan Vong. But in answer to your question, not alive. We were the ones you sensed when you entered the system. All the same, there's no harm in looking around. Anakin nodded to Tisar and his hatchmates. Be careful. Do as you wish, young Solo. The woman smiled. But there is no need to doubt us. We will be happy to help destroy the Voxen. How do you know you are certainly not here to rescue us? Leaving Wilk pinned on the wall behind her, she started for the door. My name, by the way, is Lomi Plo. Perhaps I should start by telling you what we know of this place. Anakin raised his brow. You aren't holding that to bargain? What makes you think we won't leave you? Lomi regarded him coldly. And who would be the Dark One then, Anakin? 
Anakin was still trying to figure out how she knew his identity when his earpiece activated again. We've got trouble, little brother. This time it was Ganner on the other end. That shuttle? You won't believe who's on it. I don't, Jason added. It looks like no Manor. Chapter 28 Talfalio lay dead center in Han's cockpit display, a point of fire just three light years distant. That meant the light in his eye had been created three standard years ago, before the Jedi had become an endangered species and the Yuzhan Vong had pulled a moon down on Chewbacca. Though seldom one to live in the past, Han would have given his life to ride that orange ray back to its birth, to add one more being to the thousands he had saved on Cernpedal that day. He no longer blamed himself or anyone else for the Wookiee's death, and he was even past wishing he had never tried to rescue anyone in the first place. He only wanted his friend back. He only wanted a galaxy safer for his children than it had been for him, a galaxy where a man and wife could go to sleep at night reasonably sure the world would still be there at dawn. Some things were too much to ask. Leia, who had been curled up in the Falcon's Wookiee-sized co-pilot seat, opened her eyes and sat up straight. There was no grogginess or confusion to her actions. She had not slept, not really, since Anakin's strike team had departed for Mirker. Neither had Han, for that matter. She slipped her crash webbing over her shoulders and began to cinch it down. Han activated a self-test routine to warm the Falcon's circuits. What's happening? You sent something from Luke? Not from Luke. Leia closed her eyes, reaching for her children in a way Han could never share. Anakin and the twins. They're in the middle of it now, something dangerous. She paused, then added, I think our turn will come soon. Han started to activate the intercom, then recalled who would be manning his guns and looked over his shoulder. As expected, the Nogri were standing quietly in the back of the cockpit. Take the turrets and tell C-3PO to lock himself down, he said. We're helping Lando in the Wild Nights with the Yamask hunt. So when Corrin sends us in, it'll be hot. The two Nogri dipped their heads and retreated down the corridor. Han watched them go, a little unnerved by the shadow that came to their black eyes whenever combat was at hand, but still grateful for their presence. Over the last fifteen years, the Nogri had saved Leia's life uncounted times, and rarely left her unprotected, which was more than he could say for himself. He still found it hard to understand what had come over him after Chewbacca died why mourning his friend's loss had meant withdrawing from Leia and the kids. "'Remind me to thank those guys,' he said. "'You have,' Leia said, "'at least a dozen times.' Han gave her a crooked smile. "'Yeah, but they never say you're welcome.' For the first time in days, Leia laughed. Then Corrin Horn's voice came over the comm speaker. "'Time to wake up, people.' Outlying sensors show a Yuzhan Vong assault fleet moving into the Talfalio system. Leia stretched over and armed the depressurization safety on Han's combat suit. I'm scared, Han. Me too. Han reached across and lowered her flash visor. But what can you do? They're adults now. They get to pick their own fights. Eclipse had managed to put pilots in fifty of its new XJ-3 X-Wings, and over half of them were Jedi. Another two dozen Jedi were operating blast boats and other support craft. Given that Luke was risking half the galaxy's Jedi and most of its masters on a single operation, he should probably have been nervous. He was not. The Force was with them in a way he had never before experienced, a presence so tangible he could almost see it shimmering against the velvet starlight. Not too calm, Skywalker. Mara's voice was so clear in Luke's mind 
that it took him an instant to realize that she had not spoken over a comm channel. He glanced at her X-wing, floating close enough that their S-foils almost touched. He wanted to tell her there was nothing to worry about, that Ben would be losing no parents today, but such a thought would have implied a vision of the outcome he had deliberately avoided seeking. If the Force wanted to show him the future, fine. If not, it was better to trust it and take what came. Whatever that was, making this attack was the right thing. He could feel it. So can I, Mara added. Luke raised a brow. Through their bond, each could usually sense what the other was feeling. And it was not even uncommon for them to receive short, semi-articulated thoughts. But this was something new. Luke's contemplations had barely risen to the level of consciousness when Mara sensed them. Perhaps the presence of so many powerful Jedi was gathering the Force, drawing it together in the same way a cloud of gas became a star. More like a lens gathering light, Mara said, the effect of so many Jedi concentrating on a common purpose. This is really something. Luke added a long thought question to test the limits of their mental link. When his only reply was an impression of curiosity— he asked aloud, I wonder if the old Jedi Councils focused the Force like this. It certainly would have helped them see clearly, but it might have had its drawbacks. Luke sensed an uncommon moment of embarrassment in his wife, as Mara's mind flashed from the cognitive union they were experiencing to a more physical kind, and he found himself sharing in her hope that nobody else was picking up the connection. If they were, they had the good sense not to say so. Smiling both inwardly and outwardly, Luke glanced at his tactical display and saw the enemy assault fleet lumbering into the Talfalio system. The deliberate approach, he suspected, had less to do with a fear of space mines or ambushes than allowing the hostages plenty of time to contemplate their doom. There were four cruiser analogues, a warship analogue, a skip carrier, and twenty frigates. The carrier would have at least two hundred coral skippers, and the five largest vessels would have their own squadrons as well. Ouch, Mara thought. Luke was not worried. The Jedi were there to break the blockade and buy the refugee convoy time to escape, not destroy the fleet. There was one aspect of the mission that would need rethinking, however. He asked R2-D2 for an open channel. This is Farm Boy. His call sign had been picked by Mara. Operation Safe Passage is still a go, but there are too many hostels for the Yamask action. Repeat, Yamask action is... Hold a moment, Farm Boy, Corrin said. As the Jedi battle controller, he was aboard the Wild Knight's freighter Jolly Man, using a new subspace eavesdropping suite to monitor the Talfalian sensors. We have company exiting hyperspace. Company? Luke's heart did not sink. There was nothing in the force to suggest an ambush. Who? An old rogue, the familiar voice of Wedge Antilles said, and an old rebel. Though this voice was also familiar, Luke did not recognize it until R2-D2 ran a scan analysis and identified it as that of General Garm Bel Iblis. Luke switched his tactical display to local space and saw a pair of unfamiliar Star Destroyers. The transponder identified them as the Moon Mothma and the Alagos Akla. Moving into position behind his fleet. Accompanied by a cruiser and two frigates each, both ships were bleeding squadrons of XJ-3 X-Wings and Series 4 E-Wings into space. Gentlemen, welcome, Luke calmed. But if you don't mind my asking... We just happened by on a shakedown cruise, Bellibliss said, cutting him off. So close to Talfalio? This from Mara, whose years in Palpatine's service had given her a deep distrust of unanticipated gifts. I don't think so. An old employer of yours recommended the route, Wedge said. He was referring to the infamous Talon card, 
one time smuggling king information broker, and sometime intelligence agent. No one ever knew exactly what Talancard was up to. He seemed to think we would have a chance to test some new weapons. That you might. Luke did not bother to ask how Card had learned the timing and location of their operation. Card always protected his sources. Control will fill you in on the plan. Card already has, Belly Bliss said. We thought we'd let you punch through ahead, then take crossfire positions to either side of the escape corridor. We'd assume lead, but we're not sure how well this new stuff is going to work. And this is a Jedi operation. Luke finished, reading between the lines. Someone wanted to improve their image on the news vids. Thanks. We'd be willing to detach a squadron to support the Wild Knights on their mission. Say, Rogue? Wedge offered. We want to keep them off the net anyway. Though Luke's bond with his sister Leia was not as strong as the one with Mara, it was more than potent enough for him to sense her suspicion. The whole thing was beginning to stink of Borsk Felia's influence, which automatically raised the question of what the chief wanted in return, and of who else he might have told about their plans. A simple battle was beginning to look very complicated, but Wedge's offer was too generous to refuse. Yes, sir. What do you think? Luke asked. Still want to try for that Yamask? By all means, Saba replied. It would be an honor to hunt with Colonel Darklighter. You two work out the details, Luke said. Everyone else, double-check your jump coordinates and blast anything that looks like a rock. On your mark, Control. Broadcasting escape route coordinates to Talfalio now, Corrin said. Dozen squadron, jump on my mark. Three, two, mark. Kip's dozen shot forward in a flash of blue efflux, then vanished into hyperspace. Luke switched his tactical screen back to Talfalio Local, and watched as, a minute later, the squadron appeared in system and streaked toward the yellow shell of Yuzhan Vong blips, trapping the refugee fleet in orbit. At the far edge of the system, the enemy assault fleet began spreading into attack formation and accelerated, no doubt preparing to make a hyperspace micro-jump toward the planet. The Talfalian gravity well would prevent them from jumping directly into battle, but Luke knew Corrin would need to time their own fleet's arrival carefully. As the dozen drew near the blockade, Kip pulled his squadron in tight and angled for the light cruiser. Half a dozen Corvette analogs left their blockade posts to defend the larger ship, and long tongues of plasma began to arc out from the cruiser itself. The dozen merged into a single blip and continued forward, jinking and juking as one the pilots weaving in front of each other to keep a fresh pair of shields always facing the enemy. Kip's squadron began to pour blue lines of laser fire into the light cruiser. More enemy corvettes accelerated toward the dozen, abandoning their blockade stations. So far, so good. The Yuzhan Vong seemed to think this was another rogue operation, a desperate attempt to save the doomed refugees. A pair of proton torpedoes flashed away from the dozen and vanished swallowed by the cruiser's shielding system. There followed another exchange of laser bolts and plasma balls, then an unexpected spray of static as a Jedi shadow bomb exploded. Basically a variation on the tactic Kip used to slip his proton torpedoes past enemy shielding crews. Shadow bombs were proton torpedoes, drained of propellant and packed with beradium instead. They were armed with standard proximity fuses and guided to their targets using the force. The weapons were far more powerful than a standard torpedo, difficult to detect in the heat of battle, and just one of the new tricks in the Jedi arsenal. Kip's squadron finished off the cruiser with a pair of standard proton torpedoes, then raced through the debris and swung around as though preparing the escape route. A steady flow of refugee vessels began to leave orbit and stream toward the flight corridor. It did not take long for the blockade to collapse inward as Yuzhan Vong picket ships rushed to respond. Control, time to swing the hammer, Luke calmed. Concur, farm boy. Corrin actually sounded as though he were cringing when he spoke the call sign. New Republic Task Force, 
shockers, and sabers, jumped to pre-assigned coordinates on my mark. The saber squadron was Luke's personal squadron. It consisted of himself, Mara, seven non-Jedi veterans, and half a dozen newly trained Jedi pilots. Their assignment was to fly cover while the more experienced shockers drove off the assault fleet. Three, two, mark. Luke jammed his accelerator forward and watched the stars stretch into lines. Be careful, kid, Han calmed. We just finished raising three Jedi. We don't need you sticking us with another one. Han, that's... Tofalio's orange point vanished into the colorless blur of hyperspace, and Leia's rebuke was lost to the jump blackout. Luke was aware of Mara beside him, calmly running through last-minute systems checks to keep her circuits warm and her attention focused on the coming battle. There had been no need to discuss the wisdom of flying into combat together. They were a team in a way that even Han and Leia could never understand, and they had seen many times before that each was far more likely to survive with the other present. The blur of hyperspace dissolved into starlines, and Talfalio appeared outside Luke's canopy, a small orangish crescent hanging alongside the brilliant disk of the system's crimson sun. Though the flotilla had jumped as close as they dared to the gravity well, the battle remained a tiny web of laser bolts and plasma trails hanging in the darkness between them and the planet. The enemy assault fleet was not yet visible to the naked eye, but Luke found it quickly enough on his tactical display. It had already made its micro-jump, and was now on the other side of the blockade, directly opposite the Jedi flotilla, vectoring toward the escape corridor. Rigard Mattel led his shockers toward the blockade at near light, a favorite assault tactic that had earned the squadron its name. The sabers shed just enough velocity to assume their cover position. The tactical display showed the New Republic Star Destroyers decelerating alongside the escape corridor in staggered positions, each retaining an escort of a single frigate and two squadrons of short-range starfighters. The rest of their flotilla streaked toward Talfalio, behind the sabers. In Luke's canopy, the battle swelled quickly from a tiny web into a moon-sized snarl of plasma trails and laser flashes. The blockade ships were still constricting around Kip's dozen, pouring fire in on the squadron from every direction. The dozen bounced back and forth inside the sphere, sharing shields and reserving their laser fire for gretchens and magma missiles. There were only nine X-wings visible, but when Luke stretched out with the force, he felt all three missing pilots scattered throughout the battle area, alone and frightened and no doubt in EV suits. He had R2-D2 send a message to the recovery team and tried not to think about what would happen if they were struck by a stray plasma ball or efflux tail. The nearest blockade ships peeled off to meet the shockers, who launched a flurry of proton torpedoes and continued forward. The weapons reached their targets almost the instant they were launched. A pair of corvettes broke apart when their shielding crews missed incoming torpedoes. Eight more began to vent bodies and atmosphere when the proximity fuses detonated close to their hulls. Then the shockers were through, streaking past Kip's dozen toward the opposite side of the collapsing blockade. Luke led his squadron into the hole behind the shockers. They did not waste energy expanding their inertial compensators. The corvette's Dovin basils were more than strong enough to rip their shields. When a pair of corvettes rushed to block their way, Luke dropped a shadow bomb. They were flying too fast to lock their S-foils into firing position, and used the force to hurl it into the second vessel. There was no need to assign the first to Mara. He knew she would take it with the same tactic. An instant later, simultaneous proton detonations broke the spines of both ships. Wow, Mara sent. A corvette's Dovin basil caught Luke's shields. Warning alarms filled the cockpit. Mara slid her fighter over his to protect him for the instant it took R2-D2 to activate the backup charge. The third member of their shielding trio, the young Tam Azur Jamin, blasted the attacker with his own shadow bomb. Thanks, Quiet. Luke calmed. Tam clicked his transmitter, a garrulous reply for the reticent Jedi, and then they were crossing the kill zone where Kip had been trapped. 
Dozens of refugee ships were already lumbering up from Talfalio, in their haste to escape, willing to brave even the heart of the fighting. Still moving at a substantial percentage of light speed, the sabers flashed past a trio of dozen X-wings. Kipteron's excited voice came over the tactical net. Right behind you, farm boy. Neg that, headhunter, Luke ordered. If Kip realized he had three pilots' EV, there was no trace of it in his tone. You're already down three. Stay here and cover refugees. Cover? But we're the most experienced headhunter, Luke said in a stern voice. You have your orders. There was a moment of silence. Then? Copy. Kip's resentment lingered in the force like the after-smell of a bad blaster burn. Luke was troubled by the continued lack of compassion. If Kip was ever going to... Skywalker. Mara's thought was a shout inside Luke's head. The battle? Sorry. Something inside Luke suggested dropping three shadow bombs. He did. He had given himself over to the Force completely, and the battle seemed to drop into slow motion. A trio of black-faceted corvettes drifted in from different angles, filling space with magma missiles and drutchens. Luke continued to fly straight and sensed a question rising in the back of Mars' mind, then felt it change to approval when he reached out with the Force and nudged the nearest magma missile into a grutchen. Luke perceived a sudden need for forward protection and ordered R2-D2 to shift all shielding power to the front. A tiny red speck blossomed from the nose nodule of the closest corvette and, at the squadron's closing speed, flowered almost instantly into a plasma ball. Finding his view blocked, Luke closed his eyes and reached out to the rest of his squadron, using his perceptions to guide his shadow bombs home. He saw the blinding flash of his detonating weapons through their eyes, then felt his X-wing buck as the enemy plasma ball erupted against its forward shields. There came a surge of trepidation from the Mara place in the center of his heart, followed almost instantly by a sharp sense of reproach. Next time, jink. R2-D2 whistled a warning and shut down the overloaded shield generator to begin an emergency cool-off. Luke eased between Mara and Tam, more for his wife's peace of mind than his own. The way he was feeling today, he could have continued without shields. They passed through a field of drifting corvette hulks. Luke was not the only one in his squadron to claim a picket ship. And were through the blockade, following the shockers past Talfalio. The enemy assault fleet moved its frigates forward to form a defensive screen, but continued to withhold its coral skippers. Determined to reach the escape corridor before stopping to do battle. With eight New Republic starfighter squadrons, two cruisers, and a pair of frigates close behind him, Luke carried the battle to the enemy and called for long-range fire support. The New Republic cruisers and frigates laced the darkness with turbolaser flashes. The enemy answered with plasma balls and magma missiles. The Jedi squadrons continued forward, relying on flying ability danger sense and shield-weaving to twine their way through the fiery mesh. A pair of shockers turned back when they were damaged by near hits. One of Luke's pilots lost an S-foil to a Gretchen and went EV. The shockers punched through the frigate screen. Rigard Mattel's X-wing vanished in a ball of fire. The shockers' formation disintegrated into a confused swarm of ion trails as the dazed pilots contemplated the loss of their veteran leader. Luke extended himself into the heart of the fireball and experienced a moment of unbearable prickling, then a strange sense of calm familiarity. He focused on the calmness just long enough to confirm that it was what he thought. Rigard had survived the hit and gone EV. Before Luke could pass on the good news, Rigard's static-laden voice crackled over the emergency channel. Tighten up, shockers. He sounded pained but confident. You're embarrassing. His voice trailed off into sizzle as the assault passed beyond the limited range of his suit's comm unit. But the chastened shockers formed themselves into three shield trios and continued forward. The Force was truly with them today. So far, the Jedi had lost no one.
The heart of the Yuzhan Vong assault fleet lay before them now. Half a dozen Yurok coral pebbles gleaming in the light of Talfalio's crimson sun. The skip carrier and one of the cruisers were slipping behind the warship analog, while the other three cruisers moved out front and began to deploy skip squadrons. Luke had R2-D2 send the coordinates of the Shai cruiser to the Star Destroyers for a subspace relay back to Saba, then opened a channel to both the Sabres and Shockers. Forget the skips. Expand your inertial compensators to full and comet right past them. What we want is the carrier. Of all the ships in the assault fleet, the skip carrier was the most dangerous to the refugee convoy and to their friends from the New Republic. We'll make it look like we're going after the cruiser on the left, then launch everything we have the moment we have a clear angle to the real target. By the time both squadrons acknowledged, the cruisers had swelled to arm-length lozenges of scabrous black York coral. Plasma balls streaked past or blossomed against the shields of the leapfrogging X-wings, and the tiny nuggets of the first distant skips glinted in the flashing battle light. Split by trios, Luke ordered. Do what you can to save your shields. The first handful of coral skippers streaked into range, spitting plasma and grabbing at shields. One pair vanished when they crossed their own cruiser's firing lane, then the X-wings were past the initial wave still traveling at near light, and moving too fast for the skips to turn and follow. The shockers angled toward the cruiser on the left. The Yuzhan Vong captain put his ship into a tight turn, trying desperately to bring his flank around to present the maximum number of shielding Dovin basils and weapons nodules. R2-D2 informed Luke they had reached maximum proton torpedo range to the skip carrier, but the warship analog was keeping its bulk between them and the target, the cruiser's flank weapons began to open up, filling the darkness with clouds of white energy and spiraling streaks of fire. All trios break formation, Luke ordered. He jinked right, checked his tactical display, found the warship still shielding the skip carrier, and the skip carrier slipping past toward the escape corridor. Luke ground his teeth in frustration, then sensed the butt of an idea forming in Mara's mind. Go ahead, Mother. All pilots, target cruiser, she commanded. Fire all proton torpedoes and break for safety. Luke, with me. Repeat. Target cruiser and fire all proton torpedoes. In the instant of hesitation that followed Mara's command, a Gretchen caught a shocker X-wing and began to devour the wing. The veteran pilot popped the canopy and went EV, and the starfighter exploded. Now, Mara growled. Blue tails of ion efflux crisscrossed in front of the cruiser as dozens of torpedoes streaked toward their target. A line of shielding singularities appeared along the flank and began to devour the proton torpedoes, but it was instantly clear the vessel's defenses would be overwhelmed. A long tail of what appeared to be white flame appeared behind one of Mara's engines, then her X-wing spiraled out of the battle plane. Luke followed experiencing the barest instant of worry until he felt her drawing on the force and realized what she was doing. Nice trick. This came not from Luke, but from Tam, still maintaining the shield trio. Learn that from Ezol? Yes, Mara replied. She was a little shaken, Luke sensed, by the idea that Tam was also sharing in their thoughts. How long have you been eavesdropping? Tam responded with a mental shrug. Wasn't trying. A young navigator-turned-fighter pilot, the Duros father, the Jedi Day Azerjaman, had vanished on Nalhutta a year earlier, and since then Tam had been having trouble shutting other people's thoughts out of his mind. You two have just been sort of... shouting. The exchange took only as long as it required the squadron's fusillade of proton torpedoes to hit the cruiser and detonate. A brilliant light flared above and behind the trio, and Luke's tactical display danced with static as R2-D2 struggled with the electromagnetic pulse. 
The force glow trailing from Mara's engines flashed into a fire-like ball that engulfed all three X-wings. Okay, boys, shut down your sublights. Luke was already flipping the switch and drawing an alarmed whistle from R2-D2. It's okay, R2. He flipped the toggle. This is part of Mara's plan. R2-D2 tweedled sharply. Luke checked the readout. Of course you didn't hear the plan, he explained. It didn't come over a comm channel. R2-D2 trilled in doubt. Trust me, R2, there is a plan. Time for a little lifting, Mara calmed. Follow along. Luke felt Mara gathering the force in, then saw her unpowered X-wing rise slowly out of the light ball. He lifted his own craft after hers and glanced back to see Tam doing the same. Mara let the glowing sphere spiral off. When they still did not draw any Yuzhan Vong fire, she dispelled it in a final flash of brilliant light. Luke looked up and saw they were less than a thousand meters beneath the skip carrier's spindly armed form. A full squadron of skips still hung from each of its fifteen arms, and the big warship analog was out in front, paying no attention at all to their dark ships. Luke started to congratulate Mara on her strategy, but she cut him off. What did you expect, Skywalker? Subterfuge is my specialty. R2-D2 trilled urgently and displayed a warning about non-optical sensors. I know they can still detect us, Luke answered, but they're going to be confused for a second, and a second's all we need. Mara dropped her shadow bombs, then used the force to send them sailing up toward the heart of the monstrous ship. Tams were close behind. Luke was still launching his when the first explosion erupted from the carrier's central disk. Danny rose into her crash webbing. Fighting to keep breakfast where it belonged, she wondered if the blast boat's overhaul had been a good thing. With every seam re-welded by the maintenance droids on Eclipse, and the frame inspected by certified space techs, one ton thought he could fly it like the squadron's new X-wings, and he still insisted on keeping the inertial compensator dialed down to ninety-two percent. The brub swung into a vectored thrust turn so tight the blood pooled in Danny's fingertips. She had to squeeze her eyes shut to keep them in their sockets. A bad thing, she decided. Something popped in the system's bilge beneath her feet. Definitely a bad thing. A distant flash shone through the forward viewport. Danny looked and saw the white spheres of three proton detonations winking back into nothingness. The Wild Knights had emerged from hyperspace far above Tofalio's orbital plane and rolled into an inverted nose drop, so she had the sensation of diving down toward the battle. Another proton explosion lit the darkness, vaping the central disk of the big skip carrier. The vessel's arms spun off into space. Burning coral skippers tumbled in every direction. Ah, Master Skywalker, he is enjoying his hunt. Saba activated a targeting reticle and slid it across the transperistyle viewport to a Yuzhan Vong cruiser trailing behind the debris. There is the shy vessel, Danny. See if it has what we want. Danny linked her sensors to the reticle. A dozen gravity arrows leapt to life and began dancing to the enemy code. Affirmative, she said. That ship has a Yamask. Not for long. Saba's sist uproariously, then transmitted the coordinates to the rogues and the rest of the wild knights. There is our target. Be careful of her big hatchmate. The enemy warship was just ahead of the Yamask cruiser, hurling an unending salvo of plasma balls and magma missiles at the New Republic flotilla, blocking its route to the escape corridor. Fortunately, the Moon Mothma and Alegos Akla had made short work of the Yuzhan Vong blockade, and were dashing forward to support the other New Republic forces. A flurry of bouncing data bars drew Danny's eye back to her hollow display. They've seen us. Fifteen seed-shaped lumps of Yorick coral dropped off the enemy cruiser and angled up to meet them, and its weapons nodules began to spew plasma fire and magma missiles in their direction. Danny felt like they were flying into a star. 
One ton put the blast boat into a wild corkscrew and followed the rest of the squadron into battle. And Izal Waz opened up with the big quad lasers. Danny grabbed the arms of her seat, trying to keep one ton's wild gyrations from slamming her against her crash webbing. The gravity arrows in her hollow display went wild. Ready concussion missiles and decoys. Ready. The reply came from Han Solo's Millennium Falcon and Lando Calrissian's Lady Luck, flying behind the blaster boat above and below. X-Wings. Ready all torpedoes, Saba said. Target cruiser only. Ignore skips. Wild Knights ready, Driftledge calmed. The communication was more for the rogue's sake than Saba's. With the force as thick as it was today, the Wild Knights could feel the readiness of their fellow pilots. The rogues had to rely on more conventional means. Rogues ready, Gavin Darklighter confirmed. Luke Skywalker's voice came over the tactical net. The Shockers and Sabres are regrouping below the cruiser. We're out of torpedoes, but we'll run interference when that warship starts shedding skips. Our thanks, farm boy. All of Danny's data bars dropped to near zero. The Yamask has gone quiet. She looked forward and saw the cruiser starting to bank around, trying to bring its flank to bear on the ships, jumping it from above. How it could have more weapons there than the ones firing at them from its top, Danny could not imagine. Something's happening. Yes, the warship is decelerating and dropping skips, one ton added. We have convinced them to stay and fight, Saba said. She opened a channel to the tactical net. Hisser here. That's not it, Danny interrupted. She closed her eyes, using a Jedi concentration technique to help her see the data, comprehend how it fit together. They were too close to Talfalio for a micro-jump, and with two Star Destroyers moving up to support the New Republic, the Yamask had to realize that any hope of punching through to the escape corridor was gone. She patched herself into the tactical net. They're getting ready to micro-jump, away from the battle. Saba turned one reptilian eye toward Danny. Yuzhan Vong, do not run. Kornhorn's concerned voice came over the tactical net. All units break off, he ordered. The Jolly Man was far above the system's orbital plane, using its long-range sensors to monitor and coordinate the battle. They're trying to string you out. Give us a minute, Control, Wedge Antilles said. There's something we'd like to try. Yes, sir. Please have your squadron launch its missiles. Saba did not need to be told twice. She gave the order. The brilliant circles of twenty propellant tails flashed past, then multiplied into many times that number as the decoys deployed. The cruiser completed its turn and began to accelerate, and all of Danny's data bars shot to maximum and the gravity arrows swung their bases toward the New Republic flotilla. The equipment popped and sizzled, then vented a plume of acrid smoke and went dead. Danny slapped the power cut off, though she knew by the smell of scorched circuits it was too late to save her processing boards, and turned to answer the question she sensed coming from Saba. Gravity surge. Something overloaded it. So it seems. Saba curled her pebbly lips and sissed, then looked forward. With one ton spiraling from one direction to another, the enemy cruiser was bouncing back and forth in the viewport. It had stopped firing and seemed to be pivoting around its bow. The first wave of missiles flashed past, their ion tails bending sharply as their guidance systems struggled to adjust course. Danny thought it was some strange Yuzhan Vong evasive tactic until the second wave angled in unopposed and detonated into the hull. Disarm the missiles, Danny yelled. She glanced at Saba's tactical display and saw the warship also spinning out of control. Disarm them now. We're going to vape our Yamask. You must be right about this, Saba warned, already transmitting the deactivation code, or this one will eat your arm. Somehow, Danny did not think the Barabel was exaggerating. I am. 
the cruiser broke into three pieces and began to vent bodies. The next wave of missiles curved in and struck the hull and did not explode, and Danny dared to breathe again. She opened a channel to the Moon Mothma. General Antilles, does one of your ships happen to be an interdictor? That information would be classified, the reply came. But it would be safe to assume that we were just waiting for them to micro-jump. As General Antilles replied, the New Republic flotilla began to rain turbolaser blasts down on the helpless warship, softening it up before attempting to board. Luke and Mara and the rest of the Eclipse X-Wings swung away from the conflagration and headed back to help escort the refugee convoy safely out of the system. With their own target as helpless as the warship, one ton flew a straighter course, and Han and Leia and Lando and Tendra came alongside in the Falcon and the Luck. Saba turned her chair to face Danny. Now we know why your equipment exploded. Danny nodded. Interdiction technology was nothing new. The Imperials had used it during the rebellion to project artificial gravity wells in the midst of rebel fleets to prevent them from fleeing. What was new was that the new Star Destroyers lacked the telltale projector domes of most interdictor ships. By surprising the Yuzhan Vong and timing their attack to coincide with the micro-jumps, they had put both enemy vessels out of control. Danny opened a channel to the Lady Luck. Gambler, can you send your droids into the cruiser now? I'd like to know if there's anything left of our Yamask. After Lando acknowledged, Saba said to Danny, The Yamask will be there, you may be sure, Danny Kui. Flash frozen and ready to pack. She slapped her knee and, sissing for some reason only a barabelle would understand, turned to watch as one ton fell in behind the Luck and the Falcon. The Force is with us today.